and I am uh, muted. Um, that's because we had um, talk after talk after talk back to back. Welcome back to day two of the Secrets of Successful Marriage Conference. Super excited to be back here with you for day two. Um, if you missed this morning session with Khadija al Kadur on attachment styles, I suggest going to the YouTube channel and just going to the live section and watching it because it was, mashallah, very thorough very clearly uh, clearly laid out and mashallah very 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 eye-opening uh, especially from the angle of people taking accountability for the way that they show up in relationships and how this may be affected by your childhood something that we've spoken about often on this channel and that many of us are aware of is the impact of childhood and relationships with parents um, impacting how we show up as adults. So in the sister's talk, in Khadija's talk, she talked about um, how to develop secure attachments, regardless of what your attachment style was or what happened with you with regards to attachment as a child. So mashallah, super, super um, relevant to everybody really, mashallah. So make sure that you get to attend that. Uh, and watch that and leave your comments. We really would love to see what you've taken away from it. And if you watched yesterday's stream, let us know what you thought, what jumped out at you, what stayed with you, you know, what did, were you still thinking about afterwards? I think it was, like I said, it was a long stream. I think most people probably will not watch um, all of it. They'll have to wait until the individual talks are published next year. Um, but we covered a lot. Uh, let me know if you were there yesterday. Let me know, you know, which, which one was your favorite. I would say that um, there was a lot of appreciation for Sister Alia Umrayan's talks. The first one on building a foundation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the foundation of your marriage. Uh, and her second one on how reverts can get married. So there was a lot of fantastic feedback to those two talks, mashallah. Again, lots of fantastic feedback for our conversation about whether successful women in, in the sense of professionally successful women can make good wives. We talked about that. It was a very honest and open conversation. And again, uh, very relevant for today's times. A lot of people loved Dr. Sharifa Carlo Alandalusia's talk on how to find a spouse. Um, she was very direct, very upfront. You know, uh, she didn't like sugarcoat anything. And it's her first time uh, introducing her on the channel. Lots of people went and subscribed to her channel. So I'm really pleased about that. Uh, I met her on a tour. We were on a tour together, um, a speaking tour in August. It was my first time meeting her as well, mashallah. And and I said, I think my people will like you. You need to come and speak. So alhamdulillah, her talk on how to find a spouse was, was really, really good yesterday, mashallah. Uh, similarly, the brothers panel on how young men can prepare for marriage. I thought it was great. What did you guys think? Um, I thought the advice they gave was very practical. It was uh, very doable. And, you know, it it kind of gave a blueprint for, you know, how to spend your years as a young single man, what to invest your time in, what to invest your energy in with things to avoid um, and how to prepare yourself mentally, emotionally, financially, physically to be the leader of a household. And I found the insights of the brothers really, really useful, especially when we started talking about, you know, uh, getting the boys married young. Who remembers, you know, how there was this different take on, you know, the boys getting married young, where in a previous session, sisters had said, I want my boys to marry young and I will support them. And I'll just, you know, I'll be like, I would love that. I'll be fine with it. I would do everything I can to make it happen. And the fathers were like, hold on a minute. They're going to have to prove to me that they have, you know, understood the role, that they're ready to take on the role. And I thought that that was a really helpful balance. Right. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so grateful that we get to have brothers and sisters in this space as speakers and also as an audience. Um, I haven't looked at the stats, so I don't know this, uh, the, the ratio of men to women on my channel, but I know that we've always you know, really kind of made it and, you know, being intentional about having, um, about having 
viewpoints from the male perspective and the female perspective represented and to discuss issues um, so that we can hear and understand each other, right? Because I think the reality is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in pairs. In a family unit, there is ideally a mother and a father. And that's because we bring different skills and talents and, and abilities and perceptions to the table. And children need both, right? Girls need both, boys need both, right? The whole family needs mother and father to come as themselves to the space. And so I love the fact that we got to discuss a particular issue and we heard how a mother would see it and maybe why mothers would see it that way and also how a father would deal with it and how a father would 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 handle it. And I think that that's particularly helpful for Unfortunately, we know that in society in general and in the Muslim community, we have a lot of sisters raising children on their own. And in order for, I thought that it was very helpful to hear the man's perspective because you know, they, they gave, you know, as, as a father, what they would do. And they also advised, you know, mothers who are for whatever reason, raising their children on their own, what they can do and what they should do in order to prepare their sons for marriage. So I think that that's really helpful. Cause I think for many single moms, there is this, that you have to almost, you can't be in your feminine mothering mode all the time because the children need the balance. So sometimes you have to try to play both roles and sometimes you have to make decisions from a place of what would their father do, right? Even if it's just a decision about something. Um, and anyway, and, and obviously involving male, uh, having, you know, trying to get male role models to be involved. But I thought that that was really helpful, mashallah. And then the sisters panel... <laughs> The sisters panel was very interesting. I think a lot of interesting things came up, maybe more than we expected. But uh, VIPs, let me know, were you there yesterday? Uh, which talks did you enjoy? Um, you guys are in the minority today. I'm waiting for our next speaker to come on. Uh, and I'm just going to send a quick message. But I'd love to hear in the chat um, where, where whether you guys attended yesterday. Which talks did you watch? Um, um, which talks, uh, did you watch and, uh, where did you, where did you come, you know, what, what did you, what did you benefit from? Right. What did you benefit from? Actually, the brother is saying that he's trying to get in, but it's not approving him for some reason. So just bear with me. Sometimes we've got these tech things I've got to deal with. All right. So tell me guys, which ones were your favorites? Talk to me. Oof. Okay, trying to get this over to the brother, inshallah. Sorry about this, guys. Right, so let me see what these comments are. Okay. So, <laughs> yes, uh, she said, uh, sis said it was, uh, alhamdulillah, very beneficial. So the solace for reverts was great. Yes, it was a fantastic service, mashallah, that we learned about. And Maryam Lemu and Zahra was really good. Very, very beneficial. Why do you say that that wasn't was really good, sis? What did you particularly take out or take from that one? Uh, what was it that stood out for you? Um, it was, it, like I said, it was, you have to, the thing is, it's so deep into the live stream that I think most people won't even see it until we release it as a standalone video. But I mean, it's, it's worth, it's worth scrolling. In fact, I will put chapters on the, um, I'll add chapters to the live stream so that people can jump. Um, but I'd love to know what you guys thought, um, which ones were particularly beneficial and why, why did you like the one for, um, Yes, I thought that they, yes, sister said they gave solutions on how to change and make and, you know, and gave realistic changes that we can make. Yes, I thought that that was really, really helpful. Um, and it was, uh, it was, it was great to actually have, you know, somebody come on the channel, maybe who's not, uh, who's not been, who has not been watching right, who is not familiar with the content, uh, and not familiar to, you know, our not familiar with with you know the types of conversations that we've been having uh and for them to come in uh and almost in real time 
we have a conversation that we've been having uh, on our channel, but it was their first time hearing it, mashallah. So that was that was that was quite valuable actually, because like I said, a lot of the time we have people who are already familiar with the conversation, who have been part of the conversation, but this was someone's first time hearing, um, particularly that you know that kind of boss babe energy and kind of going into the marriage space with the boss babe energy and kind of how that's perceived and I think that there there, there will be some people who really need to hear that yes uh also the uh different ways that women can be feminine and soft masculine and strong yet how to tone it down when at home yes I think it's very very interesting and and, and needed mashallah so um my uh <laughs> I'm just gonna go with the YouTube comments and see how people are doing there uh, one YouTube uh, watcher says that it was interesting would be an understatement. Yes, <laughs> I agree. Um, the sister Stephanie says that the third, second and fourth speeches were her favorite. I don't know which ones those were, but I'm glad that you had favorites. Uh, sister's Corner was great. Some people love the Sister's Corner ladies and some people were uncomfortable with the Sister's Corner ladies. And that's OK. You know, not everyone's going to be your cup of tea. And not everybody's delivery is going to be your cup of tea either. And I think what the challenge is for us is to come to these spaces ready to hear something beneficial, right? Ready to hear something beneficial and not everything will apply to you. Not everyone will speak in a way that lands well with you, right? And yesterday we had a real mix of speakers that divided the audience, especially on YouTube, right? They really did divide the audience. There were some who were, you know, really gravitating towards certain speakers and others who were like, I don't even know why this person is speaking. Uh, and, 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 and vice versa, there were other panels that people loved and others were like, I'm not feeling this. And that's okay. You know, not everyone will be your cup of tea. Not everyone's style will be your cup of tea either. The question is, are they speaking from the Quran and Sunnah? Are they giving you something that's helpful? Are they giving you a perspective or knowledge that's helpful? Um, and can you make use of it, really? You know, and if it's based upon the truth and it's going to help you, then take it, right? Whoever it's coming from or however they're delivering it, we try to take our emotions out of it as much as possible. And I'm rambling on here because I don't know what uh, what the issue is with our speaker. He seems to not be coming, um, not being able to get in, and I'm not sure why. So bear with us, inshallah. Um, Sis says, this is just so great, extremely beneficial. Uh, and she'd love to, some, somebody else said, I'd love to hear more about how to raise feminine young girls. And this is a conversation that that's a topic that I covered in my podcast with Daniel Hakikchu and Um Khalid. Uh, we talked about that to a certain extent, but Um Khalid, inshallah, will be joining us later so we can ask her that question because I think that she has the traditional wife school. Um, so she'll be able to maybe give us some pointers on that. Um, more that solace was great. Um, Yes. Uh, and we had some uh, subscribers who were surprised by some of the speakers and maybe didn't expect them to, to, to bring what they brought, mashallah. So it's always nice to have our minds expanded a bit. Right. Let me see what is happening with our coach, Nadir. Um, let me send them a quick message, guys. Right. So let's get some more. My VIPs are so quiet this uh, this year. It's <laughs> it's quite uncanny. So let me hear from the others because I know that you guys were there. I recognize you from yesterday. So what were your takeaways? Which talks particularly spoke to you? I know some of you were very active in the chat. So what were your takeaways? What were your favorite um, your favorite uh, moments? Um, yeah, what did you get from yesterday? Inshallah. Let me know, bi'idhnillah. Just joining, yes, mashallah. Oh, subhanAllah, 3 a.m. where you are? SubhanAllah, you've only missed one talk today. You've only missed one talk today, so no problem. 
So Furkan said that today's talk by Khadija was very good. Yes, I agree. It was very, very good, mashallah. Um, so alhamdulillah, I hope people can inshallah benefit from that and go back and uh, um, go back and be able to watch that. Uh, let's see, what else have we got? Yes, it's important information, Yani. So the sacrifice is worth it. Yep, it's true, subhanAllah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 about changing mindsets, isn't it, at the end of the day? Um, definitely about changing mindsets and helping people to have a healthier mindset, you know, so that so that our marriages are based on the right thing and so that our marriages can last, inshallah, so they can stand stand a chance. Oh. Yeah, I've got, uh, um, you know, uh, Google Calendar, there is a, um, they've got this weird thing that they do, which is, um, and uh, they've got this weird thing that they do that if you use Google Calendar to invite people, it doesn't matter what you're inviting them to, it sends you a Google Meet link, so people will see what people think that you're going to be on Google Meets, even if there's another link in there. So I think that's what's happened. Um, okay, so inshallah, he'll be joining now. Bismillah. And uh, our first talk is going to be uh, from Coach Nadir, who is going to be signing on now, inshallah. And he's going to be speaking about, well, the title of his talk is, Bro, are you really ready for a second wife? <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully that's going to be that's going to be able to um you know give us some food for thought inshallah sis says um yeah having honest conversations with my 11 10 year old and i can already see the influence of feminism despite me being more traditional and pushing more traditional values so i got to up my influence and work yep yeah that happens it does happen it's so insidious guys it's so it's so much more powerful than you think. And it's so insidious. Like it's coming in from like the children's programmings. That's how, that's how it starts. Um, that's how early it starts. Uh, so yeah, definitely having those conversations and kind of, you know, like what sister medium said at the end of the night, um, immunizing your children against the influence, you know, uh, giving them the, uh, giving them the tools that they need to be able to smell it out. My girls can smell it out now. They, they're so bored of me mentioning it, but they can smell it out. They can say, oh, that's that, that feminist thing. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Right. Mashallah, Coach Nadir is here. Alhamdulillah. So Bismillah, let's bring him in. So inshallah, we've got some comments here. The first session of doing everything for the sake of Allah was great. Fantastic. I loved yesterday's sessions. Learned so much from Sister Maryam and the other sisters. Wonderful. Sister's Corner was great and enlightening. The Brothers was great. And also uh, impressed um, with the activities of Solace. Yes, very, very impressive. And by Allah's grace, that they've been able to, uh, to go for so long as well, mashallah. You know, it's a long running organization. So alhamdulillah. Uh, Dr. Salah is at one o'clock, guys, one o'clock UK time. Uh, we've had a few issues with, um, with our, our programming this time because we have so many people, so many speakers, so many topics. Literally, it's packed from now until you know, 10 p.m., we basically have talks back to back. And now we have to stop nattering and I have to let Coach Nadir come and uh, and do his thing. Uh, Coach Nadir, are you okay to come on video? Uh-oh. I know you have like a multi-system situation <laughs> set up there. So yeah. my apologies, the, the mix up with the link, subhanAllah. Oh, is that happening? This man, that's all good. Here. What is this? All good. You over here? Oh, what you doing here? Hmm. All right, come on, Zoom. What's up? This sucks. Bismillah. 
Can you hear me, sis? I can hear you, but we can't see you. <laughs> oh, I'm having a great time. This is amazing. Nevertheless, it's the matrix. Sabah, me, it's the um, matrix. Maybe... They got Andrew Tate. Now they're coming after you. That's all. <laughs> I doubt that. Not right now, at least. All right. Give me two seconds. I'm going to go to my camera, maybe just restart it and start there. One second. Bismillah. No worries. Okay, more nattering. Let's see. Tell me more, guys. Tell me more of your takeaways yesterday, inshallah. Uh, love to hear what you <laughs> took from things and, uh, you know, what you'll be sharing with other people as well and what you'll be implementing. I think definitely, I, I, I believe that there's definitely a need for, mashallah, like we did yesterday, orienting some of these conversations to parents. Parents, obviously, for themselves, but also for the children. And even for me, more importantly, for the children um, to understand ourselves, how we're showing up, et cetera, in order to be able to guide our children better, in order to be able to show our children a better example, in order to prepare them better. Um, that's the hope really for the next generation is parents who are more self-aware, parents who are, you know, more intentional uh, and parents who act, who understand their role. And especially the new role that parents have. And I'd like to make this point, right? That once upon a time, the village raised the child. Okay. Parents knew what they were doing. They did what their parents did and what their grandparents did. They pretty much did what their parents did. And then the rest of it was done by the village because the village confirmed what the parents were teaching. Societies were homogenous. Um, people knew each other. You know, if in your house, your children called adults, uncle and auntie, like in my culture, everybody else also called adults, uncle and auntie, right? Pretty much. And all the adults knew that and all the children knew that. And it was a socially enforced norm. In Africa, for example, respect for elders is a socially enforced norm, as I'm sure it is elsewhere. So Parents did not have to work overtime explaining why breaking down the proofs and the rationale behind it. It was just, that's what you do. You notice now with this generation, because of migration, because of globalization, and just because societies have become so much, le you know, so much less homogenous than they were before. And because society's norms have changed so drastically since the 1960s. Society does not confirm what you're doing as a parent anymore. Society does not back up what you're doing as a parent anymore. In fact, society often teaches the opposite of what you and many other more traditional families are doing in their homes. And they could be Muslim, Christian, Jew, Buddhist, Sikh, or just cultural, right? The, 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 the postmodern culture and certainly the popular culture is the opposite of what most traditional families uh, are, you know, have always done, right? So as a result, our parenting has to evolve. We can't do what our parents did. My parents never explained stuff to me. I bet yours didn't either. They just told you that's how it is. That's what you do. And you knew that that was true because everybody else that you knew did the same thing, especially if they were from your cultural group, right? Those of you who grew up in the UK or in the US as, you know, from children of immigrants, you probably noticed that your, you know, English or American peers operated slightly differently. I mean, it's a long running joke, right? Even in African-American families, it's a long running joke that the type of behavior that is allowed in their home versus the type of behavior that's allowed like in their white counterparts home, very, very different, right? So our generation, Gen X, we would have been the first to experience that. And our parents had no clue, right? Our parents did not know that they had to uh, that they had to explain things more, you know, that, and, and, and break it down and make it make sense and all of that stuff. They didn't know that. So they didn't do it a lot of the time. They just expected you to follow along because that's what kids do. This we know better because we know the difficulty that we had navigating between two cultures and society has gotten worse. It's become more permissive, more degenerate, more all of the things. So we as parents have to start to understand our role, our new role as parents in this paradigm and, and, and start learning how to do it and start doing it. 
because that's the only thing that is going to inshallah give our children the tools to at least understand why we do what we do and think critically and have a lens have some kind of a lens in order to navigate the world out there so i've got some comments here yes and exactly and consistent duas as well that was a really important point that i took from yesterday mashallah so this says yes talking back was a no-no for me and she's become more flexible um she says it's dangerous to raise kids who don't question and think critically well you can't in anymore anyway you can't raise kids who don't question and think critically because at school they are pushed to think critically and question everything so they're going to do that to you as well you just need to have the answers there we go alhamdulillah sorry sorry la hawla wa la quwwata la billah apologies for that let's get you unmuted inshallah alhamdulillah that was definitely uh some technical challenges on my end. Don't know what that was about, but hey, alhamdulillah, we're here. You're here now, alhamdulillah. So we're, I'm going to stop nattering now, inshallah, and let you take the floor. Please, inshallah, just, I mean, I think everybody is familiar with, you know, Coach Nadir and his wives from the Outstanding Personal Relationships team. Uh, but you're going to be speaking to us today on the topic of, bro, are you really ready for a second wife? Mm -hmm. Take Indeed. it away, inshallah. Indeed. Take it away, wow. bi'idnillah. <laughs> All right. Again, uh, for those of you whom I have not had the pleasure of meeting just yet, I'm Coach Nadir. All right. And my wife's not. My wives and I are the founders of Outstanding Personal Relationships, where we focus on helping people develop fulfilling relationships, especially in the area of polygyny. Uh, reason being, it does not get its fair airplay. All right. So. I might be moving and shifting some things and making sure um, the dynamics here <laughs> work a little better. Like, let me move my seat down a tad bit. All right. Now, there's a, there's a few things. One, let's just define some terms because we hear the word polygamy quite a bit because polygamy is a general term. That means a spouse who's married to multiple spouses. A spouse married to multiple spouses, as you can see, is genderless. All right. That means the specific terms. Polygyny and polyandry. Polygyny, which is what we practice as Muslims, for those who choose to practice it, means a husband or a man who has multiple wives. Polyandry means a woman or a wife who has multiple husbands, and they are exclusive to that wife or that husband. Of course, we are talking about polygyny. Now, here's the, here's the challenge. The main challenge is introspection. So when we're talking about, you know, bro, are you ready for a second wife? You know, that's a serious question. Now, here's the thing. When I ask you that, that's not coming from somewhere flippant or being sarcastic. It can absolutely be that way, depending on who it's coming from, like mainly your mother or your wife or somebody like that saying it in jest. I'm going to say what's real and I'm going to share with you 100 percent what it's about. Now, I was married to my am married, I should say, to my first wife. And I say first loosely because we use the word uh, initial wife. I initially married when I was 19 years old and been married to Coach Fatima now, uh, what, a little over 27 years, okay? I was practicing monogamy for the first 15 years, and then I married Coach Nyla, all right? And I've been practicing polygyny now over a dozen years. And the reason I want to share that with you is because now we can talk about it. Now we got over some humps and we were helping people, but we were pretty reluctant once we got to a good space, again, key once we got to a good space to kind of really share, because you have to weigh all the extra stuff that comes along with it. But I remember, alhamdulillah, the Prophet said, Islam said, Allah loves the one who is the benefit to the most people. And I suggest that we should all be greedy. We should be greedy in the terms of getting as many blessings as possible, because it's not about the amount, it's about the weight. Our deeds will be weighed. So it's not, again, the amount. Deeds like feathers aren't the same like Mount Uhud. So we need to get as much as possible. And I suggest you be greedy in the respect of getting bought up. Now, introspection. Before it comes time for practicing polygyny, we have to get to this part. Are you really ready? All right. What is your report card? Many of us don't get direction or guidance after we graduate school, whether it's a high school or a college, university. Um, someone else has put an agenda, a curriculum, a semester, grading, quizzes, all this stuff in life. But are we doing that for ourselves? Now, there are two main things that Muslims know all across the board when it comes to fiqh that is required when it comes to polygyny. That's being just. 
All right. And of course, if something requires justice or being equitable, if you will, then there must be some measurements. So what I call those are the measurable. And it's basically two things. There's time and there's money. Both of these can be tracked relatively easy now today with apps. <laughs> right. So time and money is the, is the easy thing. Now, here's the challenge. That's not the main issue we have when it comes to practicing polygyny well and doing it successfully. It's the intangibles, the things you can't see. Now, first, I'm going to let you know something. I'm talking to the men. You were addressed specifically in the Quran when it comes to polygyny. You, as men, meaning Mary 2, 3, or 4. And if you fear you are not able to be just, then only one. And we'll stop there. Of course, that's the abbreviation of the ayat. But you were addressed. Today, we live in a society that is making many things including masculinity, um, gynocentric. So it comes from a more feminized version of wanting to make a man a woman. I'm going to stand on that men are not women and we are not like the women. So many of the comparisons are tit for tat or it's good for the goose, good for the gander. Don't apply here. Men are not simply women that have penises. Yeah, I said it. And women are not men that have vaginas. That's not how that works. We have very distinct roles and Allah Ta'ala knows who he created and what he created and what's best. And if we believe Allah Ta'ala is Al-Hakim, and he is, then Muslim clearly means one who submits to Islam. It is not the other way around. It's not something that we put on our desires or we put more limitations on things or we think we know what's more Islamic than Islam and what the Prophet Lays after Islam did, and he showed as an example. So the very first thing, and I mentioned Five requisites, because my wives and I, we put together a number of different programs and things, right? One is the Polygamy Roadmap ebook. We have one for men and one for women. And I talk about the five requisites for practicing polygamy. So even before you practice it, because there are dynamics that you will not understand or learn whatsoever until you are in it. It's like riding a bike. I can explain it to you all day. I can talk to you about balance. But until you get on it and take your time trying to adjust, it may take you a while. It may take you longer. It may take you a little less time, but explaining it or knowing the rules is not very helpful when it comes to practicality or understanding the different areas that are required to succeed. So, for example, one of them is leadership. One of them is leadership. You are not just simply responsible for you. Now, I have something called the shared marital identity I share with brothers. When you are married in monogamy, it's you, it's your wife. Now, here's the thing. We have to understand when we join together in marriage, we don't simply form one person. No, not at all. I know other religions, another religion, I used to be Christian, you say, you know, the two become one and all that. We don't believe that. It's not, no, no, no. You're still your own individual and everything else. However, now you have this shared marital identity as a husband and as a wife. That doesn't mean you just left behind things that you liked before. You may have compromised or changed or grown up or matured, but that doesn't mean you still don't have your own individuality. All right, very important to understand. Now, here's the challenge. I'm going to say here's the challenge a lot because stuff is challenging. <laughs> and there are many dimensions to it. So when it comes to leadership, are you leading yourself? What are your measurables looking like? Because that's the first thing. If you are going to practice polygyny, then you have to be transparent, be have an open book when it comes to the, your time and your money. What's your plan for the time? Which doesn't really matter until the decisions are to be made to begin practicing. But then what, what is your money looking like? Because we know that we're commanded to provide for your wife, provide for your family. If you're rich, like a rich man, don't be miserly. All right, be generous. Or if you're poor, like a poor man, don't be extravagant and go beyond your means. So what does that look like for you? See, it's different. People say, you know, how much money do I need? How it's not the necessarily the amount that you need. It's that you have to have, you need to be fiscally fit. You have to be fiscally fit when you're looking at taking care of multiple families. Now, here's the other part. When I said Allah Ta'ala talks to you, you have to be the one to make a decision. Are you the one to make that decision? As the man, you are the imam of the family. Many people do not discuss it, men or women, until after it has happened or now it's in the face. Listen, we need to be educating our children on this right away because it's simply a form of marriage. It's an ancient form of marriage that has many modern solutions. Allah Ta'ala would not have allowed it and regulated. Matter of fact, polygyny was already around before Islam. But Islam came and regulated and put rules to this thing for our benefit. 
So now it's a restriction to four. But how are you looking financially? If something happens to you right now, is your family going to have to go instead of a GoFundMe page, a launch good campaign? What are you going to have to do? Do you have systems in place that benefit your family financially? Do you have passive income? You know, what happened during COVID? Did everything get shut down and you lose your income? You have some investment income? What is it looking like? So if you're not studying money, which these two things, Islam and money, are going to impact you and affect you more than most other things your entire life. Because if you're good with Islam, if you have a good foundation with Islam, you're not going to oppress. You don't have to really worry about your behavior because you fear a lot to I. So your foundation should clearly be with your deen. And understanding money, you know how to deal with it. You want to use it as baraka and get blessings. You want to do all kinds of things because we know that we are travelers and that we have an expiration date. There's a date to check out. So one, what are you doing with your money? If you're not studying money, if you're not studying how it works and really not even money, but currency in particular, then some, some of the things I'll give you because we're not gonna be able to handle this in just a short hours of time is rich dad, poor dad, cash flow quadrant. Or one of the best things you could do right now is go to Mike Maloney's channel, Gold Silver, and watch his YouTube series called The Hidden Secrets of Money. That's the first step, okay? The second one is that leadership ability. Again, this all falls under it because as a leader, you have to make sure these things are in place. If you want someone to follow you and support you, you need a plan. When they say the old adage that the person that fails to plan plans to fail, that's very true. Then the Prophet ﷺ let us know that a person will be, be on their deen and practicing it, right? Doing the deeds of the people of paradise till he gets a bow's length from the paradise. He will stop doing those deeds. Start doing the deeds of the people of the hellfire. Die doing that and get Jehanna, get the hellfire. On the other hand, you have the person that their entire life will be doing the deeds of the people of Jehanna, of the hellfire. They would get a bow's length from paradise, stop doing those deeds, do the deeds of the people of paradise, die doing those and get Jannah. So it's not how you start, it's how you finish. So an intelligent person, an intelligent man, one who wants to lead and be more than average and being able to be just has to have a plan in place. That's one of the reasons tomorrow, I mean, my wife and I, we're doing a, uh, you know, it's, it's another workshop. We're really getting things together. But we want to make sure you're having outstanding personal relationships beginning with you. One, financially. Second is leadership. And I'm going to go through, you have to have the emotional courage to have the difficult conversations. See, a lot of times when I talk with brothers, they're like, you know, I don't want to hurt my wife's feelings and this. And they say, oh, you're only doing it for lust. Listen, as a man, you do not have to apologize or be man shamed. There's no question that men have a stronger sex drive than women. Fine. There's no problem with that. Allah Ta'ala created who he did. And he provided outlets, allow outlets for us. However, to think that our sexual energy or sexual drive is only simply to procreate or for our personal pleasure, then we'd be sadly mistaken. Because this drive and this energy in us causes us to move forward, to build, to, con to have conquest, to have all kinds of things. For example, there's a book called Think and Grow Rich that needs to be in your financial arsenal, but it teaches you a whole lot more than just that. There's an entire chapter dedicated to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on persistence. On persistence. But there's also another chapter that deals with sexual transmutation. I believe it's chapter 11, where you can channel, utilize the same energy that we have to build, to grow, and to do things and get it done. So don't be shamed for that. All right, there's no wrong reason to practice religion. There's a wrong, as in oppression, in doing it wrong. All right. Again, that's where your foundation of this dean comes in. Making sure you're mentally, mentally and emotionally strong. This is very important because when it comes time to communicate, no, you might not want to hurt your wife's feelings or you may feel that because there's some type of pain that there's an issue. Check that in. Some type of pain that then everything should go ahead and be pulled back. Not that one. So if that's the case, because there's pain, now we know, Allah Ta'ala already let us know that in translation, with difficulty comes ease, not after, but with. Watch your hand. And I'm talking to my son. He's doing a little bit behind the scenes um, as well. So uh, pardon me with that. But what is your report card is what it comes to. So looking at yourself, gauging yourself, all right, what am I doing mentally, emotionally? How, what are my leadership skills looking like? How's my finances? And What's my emotional fortitude looking like? Am I able to have this conversation? Now, it's not really the, the man's responsibility for a woman is concerned about 
uh, police your husband practicing. Anyone can initiate the conversation. That's actually a sign of maturity. But if you think your husband, your wife is your best friend, you cannot have this conversation, you're not approachable, then they're probably not your best friend because minimally we should be able to be friendly with the person that we are married to. Now, I encourage all men to work to be qualified to marry more than one wife. When I say work to be qualified, that means working on yourself to be a strong man, because of course, a strong believer is better than a weak believer, not only in the fact to be man, but also physically in, ev in every other area of life. But every man should be qualified, you know why? Because we have a whole marriage crisis going on right now. There are many, many women that want to get married that are unable to get married, many chaste women that are out there. And there are very few men that have the leadership aptitude or the courage to do what's right. See, sadly, there are many people that say, you know, it's easier to cheat. So if a man is talking about police, he's talking about stepping up, taking advantage of a, a, a whole lifestyle. And this lifestyle comes with a whole lot of responsibility. For example, when I talk to you, I talk about my wives, right? Well, the fact of the matter is I'm responsible for 12 children. I have 10 biological children with my wives. Coach Fast and I have seven. Coach Nyla and I have three. And I have two bonus children, or some people call them stepchildren. I call them bonus children. There were 12. Now, who's the example of this? The Prophet like, Sattu Salam was a stepfather. He was a father. He practiced polygyny. He's the best example in all of this. And no, you don't need to consult your wives beforehand, but it's best practice too. The world we live in, just for the last couple of hundred years, poly polygyny is no longer the norm. Now monogamy is the norm. However, the challenge with, with monogamy in general being the norm is that now it looks at something as an ancient practice as though it has no practicality today. So it's common to be in monogamy and now you have escorts or you have prostitutes or you have jump downs, bust downs, sugar daddies, and this whole lifestyle that's seen as okay in normal boyfriends, girlfriends, don't know who the father of the child is. It's okay that we have reverted as a society to savage practices. But when it comes to something noble, that person is shamed. No, 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 that's backwards. It's backwards. Weren't we told that the path to Jannah, after Jabril looked at it, that whole path to Jannah is filled with challenges, struggle, things that people do not want to go through, and there will be problems, all of that. Yes? Then perhaps this might be a part of that path. Is it? The number one thing that Shaitan tries to do, the number one thing that he loves his minions do, I should say, and he champions them, is the breaking up of the family. Well, let me pose this question to you. How is it that he champions the breaking up of families, but yet sometimes we, as in Muslims in, in our entire community, shame practicing polygyny, which is the beginning of a new family? Isn't that another way of breaking up? by stopping a family coming together? Yes, no, what do you think on that? See, because I know there's a many difference and you get the people who, who try to shunna, sunna shame. Oh, this brother doesn't pray this and doesn't do these extra uh, salawat, uh, no, uh, all kinds of stuff, right? All these other sunnas out there, but he, won't, he knows the sunna of polygyny. And to that, I say, so what? I say, so what? See, because the sunnah of polygyny, if you know about Islam, you know that every morsel of food you put in your wife's mouth, you get barakah for. Every person, every child you raise, there are three things that fall to you after you go, right? We know the jadir, the money that you spend that continues to benefit people, the knowledge that you leave that continues to benefit people, and the children, righteous children, that pray for you benefits. Tell me of a bigger sunnah than leaving righteous children that can benefit you after you're gone. Remember I said you'd be selfish, be greedy when it comes to getting this barakah. But one way to do it is to also make sure you're able to communicate as a man. Be able to articulate yourself. You don't need excuses for polygyny. There's no need to downgrade or, or dismiss it as though, oh, okay, well, she's a widow, she's a divorcee, and so on and so forth. The only version of the Prophet of Mary was Aisha already law handed. And this is true. However, to simply dismiss Umar had to mean, thinking that they just were all lonely, homely people, is wrong. Let me give you two examples. There was a woman who proposed to the Prophet Sallallahu She stood up in a gathering and she offered herself to him, for him to marriage, right? She offered herself to him in marriage. What did he do? You notice how he, what did he do? He looked at her up and down. He viewed her. He physically looked at, he looked at her and he remained silent. 
So much so that other companions and people that were around started to feel odd, like, okay, she offered herself and he's not saying anything. Another companion jumped up and offered to marry her. And then he helped facilitate that. But he looked at her. You might be like, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, he looked at her, but everyone else, or their widows and so, all right, let's talk about Juaria, Radiallahu Anha. How was she raised? She was raised under the leadership. She sat on gold thrones, right? Yes, she was a widow. She was married for a few months before her husband went out to fight the Muslims, got killed fighting against Muslims, right? Her whole tribe, all of this stuff, they were taking this captive. And Aisha, Radiallahu Anha, let us know that when she first saw her, she said she felt jealous of her because she knew that she was the Prophet's type. She knew what the Prophet liked. She knew it right away and was jealous. And she let us know that. But what happened? See, sometimes we get up in this mix and we, we forget that the Prophet is the best example. He's a man. He wasn't said as an angel. What did he do when she came and she tried to negotiate for a tribe? He, alayhi salatu was salam, proposed to her in front of his wife, said, you know, I'll do you better than that. How about I marry you? And Aisha already allowed and said she was the best baraka to her whole entire tribe. She was a widow for a few months. She was 20 years old. Beautiful, gorgeous woman. We don't need different reasons to practice polygamy. Lots of Allah put it in us, but he requires a responsibility to be there. So are you able to handle the shots from family, friends, relatives, people who like to go with the status quo? or they don't understand the magnitude of blessings that come from it, people that will rather cheat. See, we're pro-morals. It doesn't matter if you're practicing monogamy or polygyny. We want you to be moral. We want you to raise a nuclear family where there's no explanation of somebody needing to know your pronoun. If you need to know my pronoun, we don't need to be having a discussion now, do we? So we need men as strong men and leaders. And many women are absolutely okay with their husband being weak, and not being able to be fair. We should dispel that stereotype and be qualified to practice polygyny, even if that is not our intention, because it's much easier to just be immoral. I don't care if you're talking about politicians or the Jesse Jacksons or the Bill Clintons in America, for example, or the Tariq Ramadans or the Jimmy Swaggerts or Derek Jacksons or whoever it may be out there that preach one thing but do another. Because to practice polygyny is something that is honorable. And after you examine yourself for time and money, and we're talking about communication and making sure you're emotionally stable enough to handle it, because you may be dealing with a roller coaster of emotions. And when you talk, oh, with the kids, nobody talks about the kids. Yeah, absolutely. Talk about. Matter of fact, my wife, uh, a couple of days ago, just interviewed two of our adult daughters who grew up mainly in polygyny. You know, they were around. I had four daughters first, followed by six sons, but they were already born when I began practicing polygyny, though they were younger. So she interviewed them because the stereotype is, oh, the kids fall apart. No, the kids are very resilient. One, that's why children need to be educated on these different forms of marriage, first of all. But second of all, many, many times that's an excuse because a child is going to be number one and mom's a superstar. I mean, we teach this with outstanding Muslim parents. Mom's a superstar. Dad is a star, but mom's a superstar. We know this about the one who is the most deserving of your time is being your mother three times more than your father, according to the proper place so are you ready to deal with the drama? Are you ready to cast a vision for your family? Are you ready to lead without having an answer to anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? All of these things should be answered, honestly. Because many times we are the easiest people to fool. We cheat ourselves. That's why we design different report cards. We want to know, you know, what is your personality type? You know, what is your financial acumen? How are you when it comes under stress? You know, ask people that have traveled with you before or fasted with you before. You know, how is your deen? Because that's the most important thing. Because minimally, if there's not even love involved, you would not be oppressive. But of course, that love and that sakina, that, sakina, that tranquility comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it doesn't matter the reason, you don't have to answer for that. Oh, it's your lowly, lustful desires? Okay, let's not be dismissive either because listen, I married you. Speaking as though your wife said something like that. Oh, you just want to get married for your own desires. I married you. Are you saying I only married you for my desires too? As in sexual desires. Because women also marry for their desires too because we're human. We're supposed to marry for your desires. It's not just, hey, I'm a man. That's a woman. So let's go ahead and get hooked. Let's get hitched. 
There's 20 people that live on my block. There's 20 men. There's 20 women on the other side. Hey, perfect. We got to figure it out. That's not really how it works. All right. So with that being said, I know that there are some questions. I'm, I'm seeing some questions here. Um, but again, to share that with you, because my wives will also be doing um, some things and they'll be on the panel later um, this evening or this morning, depending on where you are in the world. And, you know, definitely excited about that. But I can address some questions if you'd like to, dear sister, um, that may be here on the screen or you can ask them. And for those, again, who want to know where to find us, we're at Outstanding Personal Relationships. Um, that's our handle as well as our website and whether it's the Polygamy Roadmap or Polygamy Bootcamp for those who are really serious and want to start out right or the Polygamy Masterclass where we go from A to Z on a different level. We are the founders of all of these um, programs specifically dealing uh, with polygamy. So if you want, I can go ahead and just address a question. Let me see. So there's a question. The sister says, I believe it's a sister. This is anonymous. It says, any advice for a wife whose husband is taking a second but hasn't told her and uses work as a way to explain his time away from home? The initial wife is certain based on things she has found, communications that she has seen. He has never mentioned warning polygamy and being interested in it to the initial wife as it stands. He spends one night a week at the initial wife's house. Yes, there's some advice. Matter of fact, I did an entire video. Now, to, to sum it up in 30 seconds, won't do it justice. But it's called, uh, I think it's called Walk Through the Fire. Fire. It's on our YouTube channel at uh, Outstanding Personal Relationships. But <clears throat> we come across this, unfortunately, quite often. There have been people married five, six years, have several children and so on. They have not told um, their wives about it. All right. And that's a, uh, that's a sign that a person, one, is lacking the emotional maturity to have the hard and difficult challenging conversations. All right. That's very important. That's up in that, uh, the Wali. And the woman needs to be protected against, especially becoming into polygyny. Now, I talk about best practices because I got married because you don't need permission. And I got married, then I let my wife know afterward. That's not the best way to go about it. All right. The challenges that arise with that is the loss of trust. There's feelings of betrayal, though it's not necessarily betrayal. There are different emotions that you could have taken care of by demonstrating more courage in your conversation to begin with, hence the emotional maturity. Now, myself, for example, I was a leader, take care of stuff with business. No problem outside the home. But at the same time, you don't want to hurt your wife's, your wife's feelings and stuff like that. You know you're going to eventually deal with it anyway. So I went ahead and decided to deal with it and just deal with repercussions later. That was not a smart move. That was a bad move. Okay, it's okay as in doing it, but it was not wise to do. So now this person has to walk through the fire. They need to let it be known. You have to man up because now you're practicing polygyny. It must be done in a just way. Fashion. Now, the time and all that one night a week at his initial wife's house, I don't know where he is the other nights or what the job is, or maybe I missed that. But um, yeah, he has to walk through the fire. You have to be able to emotionally, you have to be able to emotionally communicate to get that stuff done. That's the only, that's what I see right there, sister. I know I came a little late to this format and there was a mix up uh, with the links, but please let me know what you want to do. Jazakallah khair. No, that's uh, amazing, and you know, mashallah, the appreciation in the YouTube is 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 a lot. Mashallah, jazakallah khair. And uh, kudos to you for you know you and your family. I have always, as you know, the ultimate uh, you know utmost respect for the work that you guys do, um, because as you say, it is another form of marriage. Uh, it's an acceptable form of marriage. It is a blessed form of marriage, and. I think you said this best in one of our podcast conversations, which was, you know, and, and we've said this before, monogamous marriages fail because people don't know what they're doing, right? And polygamous marriages or polygynous marriages fail because people don't know what they're doing, right? So it's the individuals, guys, going back again, it is about you taking responsibility, being accountable and doing the right thing. And it's not the context. It's not, it's a monogamous situation or a polygamous situation that means that it will fail or succeed. It's the individuals involved, right? Now, brother, before you go, inshallah, before we hand over to um, Coach Fatima, I believe, uh, could, I, could I engage you on a particular topic that has kind of blown up in the last couple of days, which I think you may have a perspective to offer on? Is that okay? Of course. Of course, I'm at your so, service. So, Bismillah. So those of you who are uh, following on Instagram, maybe you saw the Fair Dinkum podcast and there's a clip from that podcast that was that's kind of gone a bit viral where I was talking about the my my view that if you have to jump through hoops 
um, and, you know, do all of the things and um, tell a woman everything that she wants to hear in order for her to see you as a good option. She probably is not the right woman for you because you're setting yourself up for a lifetime of trying to please her and cater to her and put her on this pedestal where as long as she's happy, everything is okay, right? And the point I made was that society tells women that this is the ideal relationship where the man is working overtime to please you, making sure you're happy, making sure that you have everything you need and all your dreams and fantasies are fulfilled, right? So first, first, before I go on to the bit that was contra- more controversial than that, firstly, <laughs> do you agree or disagree with that? With your perspective or the with what initiative? I was saying, what I was saying is that, that for me, that, that means that that woman is not for you. Cause I say, I say oh, to absolutely. my sons, right. Okay. So why, what's okay. So justify it from your perspective, inshallah. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, men are supposed to be leaders. We're supposed to be the Quran. Women are supposed to be the supporters. All right, and bring the nurturing and the, and the loving and the extra stuff and be your peace, all right? Not just a peace, all right? So we have to understand the difference in that. And that starts with that attitude. Mm-hmm. There's this privilege or this entitlement that just because I am, I deserve. That is not Islamic at all, mm-hmm. <laughs> whatsoever. You know, so just, it, it, it doesn't even matter. When you talk about Islam, since we have this whole, um, science of fiqh and everything else we know was wajib. I mean, we can we can compare it to these different things. There are things that are highly recommended. There's Mubai and so on in my crew. We can look at these levels, right? And there are things that are attractive traits universally to men, and there are things that are unattractive. And mm-hmm. one thing that is very unattractive to women, even, is a man that she could walk all over. She would test them. Yes. She would try yes. them. Right. Mm-hmm. When I heard this woman speak, I forget who it was, but she said, you know what? She got turned on. When her husband checked her, because she knew she was wrong. And he stood up to her like, no, this is not going to happen. And she just said she just, something inside of her made, just felt much better to him to mm-hmm. be submissive. Because she knew she was hitting that boundary. She ste- she overstepped. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Now, an yeah. example from that, from the Sunnah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was praising Khadija. Right? Yes. Again, this is another thing. He was praising one of his wives to his favorite wife. Mm-hmm. Very important things there. People knew that Aisha and her was his favorite. Hmm. Very important, right? Second, he was praising his wife, Khadija, all right, who had passed. And Aisha thought in, very mistakenly that she was better than her. Mm-hmm. And the Prophet Sallam had to check her. We would call that today checking. He, had to check. he got very upset where she hadn't seen him like that before. And he didn't down her and say what she wasn't. He just said what Khadija was and what Allah Ta'ala gave him through her, which put her on such a high level. And that deep love was there for him. So he had to check her so much so she never did it again. She never made that error again. She never put herself above what the Prophet said Islam said at that time. So for some reason, women think that they are perfect wives as Khadija, you know, Radi Allah and And expect that treatment that's not true not today it's not not the, the ball is not in your court in your favor to come with that attitude to begin with that's also another reason i let brothers know they shouldn't sign the no polit not even the no polygyny clause they really shouldn't put that because you're coming into the marriage already capitulating mm. all right already capitulating or making a, a concession and as a man should you want wow. to do it it doesn't prohibit you from doing it because the shawty is not going to allow you to make something haram that's allowed but if you're mm. already capitulated to, if you're already coming in as a concession, you're coming in at, with weakness. Okay. Instead, be the stronger yeah. person and discuss it, talk about it from both ends, and go from there. Sorry, that was just a little bit longer than. Uh, uh, Sprinkle some salt on that. Why don't you? Okay. So, 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 so that was the first thing. So great to have your perspective on that. Then the next thing that I said was that society tells women that, you know, a man's job, you see it through the romance novels and movies and music and everything. It's, it's all about the woman's feelings and how she feels. Now I said, what's interesting is that in the Dean, it's the opposite. Now the reel was cut there. So everyone went crazy right? Because now the the comments are literally jam-packed with women who are very upset, very triggered, saying in Islam, it goes both ways. She's trying to say that the woman should do all the work, you know, that the men don't have to do anything. What's wrong with the man being nice to the woman? You know, all of this crazy stuff. But my understanding 
is that obviously the spouses are obliged to give each other their rights and be good to each other, right? The man is encouraged, obviously there's obligations that he has, and then he's encouraged to be to be nice and sweet and kind and play and all of these things. Although the hadith that we know, the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But I don't know of a hadith or an ayah from the Quran that guarantees a man Jannah if his hmm. wife is happy with him, that his wife is pleased with him. However, we have several that address women that say, this is your reward if your husband is pleased with you. And my analysis is that women are hard to please. And you could be doing all of the things that Allah wants you to do, and she could still not be pleased. So using a woman's happiness as a criteria for a man getting into Jannah, it feels like he's going to be fighting a losing battle. And that was my point, actually. And I was saying that you're just going to be running after her happiness, and she's going to continuously keep you running on that treadmill when that's not your job as a man. Uh, so, so, so firstly, have I, do you think I've understood that correctly? Do you think that that, that that is a fair thing to say? So yes, you're both supposed to be good to each other, but when it comes to pleasing and catering to, I think that women have a degree higher when it comes to what Allah expects of them. I don't know. I mean, am I wrong here? It's, it's funny you mentioned that because there are many more, there are a number of different other examples as well. When it comes to think about the Quran and what men are told. First of all, we know that men are going to, the minimum amount of wives are going to have in gender is two. Right. We know about the uh, Hellraim. Right. But when it comes to looking at the Sunnah, you look at uh, Ismail, right? Allah, mm. when his father came through and you saw a wife that was complaining and everything else, and he told him to change his threshold and change his doorstep. Right. Yeah. These are small things. But Allah Ta'ala also lets you know these women have the success and who are obedient to their husbands. Of course, it goes with their husbands being just. But mm. it's absolutely an entirely different thing when you are the imam, you're the shepherd of this entire family, of this ummah, and then your family, and it grows. But you're not playing the primary role as the woman. It's still the man that has to go and has been given this degree above you, if you will, to do these things, right? So when you put it in perspective, simple, simple things, being a person's peace, watching your tongue, Understanding the warning that came. If you know that we have an open book test and we do, we have this Quran. It's our life, right? This Quran and the Sunnah. It's an open book test. And the worst thing you can do, the worst thing that you can do to, to fail the test, we know the answer as a woman. The Prophet said why the majority of women or the majority of the inhabitants of Jahannam will be women. And then he said, "Did he? I would be asking, if I'm, why? Like, what did they do? What's going on?" Mm. And he talked about ungratefulness. Mm. Ungratefulness. Then describe what they say with their tongues, uh, using them as swords against you because that's their weapon. They can't. And ungratefulness the to their husbands, specifically. Yes. The hadith is specific. It doesn't just say ingratitude. It's ingratitude yes. to their husbands. Wow. Absolutely, and using that mm. tongue as a weapon against them. Mm. And the Prophet Lay Sallam also mentioned that it can be a sound man that can be led astray as well. Mm. So Allah Ta'ala knows what he created. The challenge is we live in such a gynocentric society right now where it's all about the feelings, not the reality of the thing or what our perception of something is, or maybe I could be wrong. No, it's my feelings. Mm. But see, we have less, we, we're equal emotionally. We just show them differently. Process differently. As men, we're mm. built for the battlefield. We built to go to war. I can't, I'm not built to sit there and talk to my enemy while he's wielding a weapon about, you know, my feelings and how we can handle this in other ways. No, the time for diplomacy is over. We need to protect our family. We need to hunt. We need to do that. So our emotions to take a back seat and we need to evaluate things on a rational basis. Mm. Now, it sounds a lot black and white. It's not. So when I talk about emotional maturity earlier, you have to know how to communicate and articulate yourself and your feelings as a man. That doesn't mean anytime there's a problem and you have to sit down, you have to take short, you have to do all, you have to get all of the information is that as much as you can in your best ability being objective and talking to Allah Ta'ala and making a decision of what's best for your family and your vision. Because ultimately every one of your relationships except the one with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is going to end tragically. It's going to end tragically. We are going to die. You before me, me before you, we consider that a tragedy. 
But that does not have to be the end of that relationship. It's the end of this earthly relationship. Yes, no doubt. But every one of the relationships that we foster, it's over until that day. And if we understand that we're on that mission, we're, we're just floating through space, and we think about 100, 200, 500 years ago, a woman was just complaining about this, not doing that. Her man had means, maybe today, speaking surgeon, maybe had all kinds of things going on, right? Had the ability to do it, but he didn't want to hurt his wife's feelings, so somebody else continued to suffer. He still has to answer for that. Though. He still has an ability given to, about, given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But did not Allah to Allah tell the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Quran, do this, you do this to please your wives? This is explicit. There's no See, ayat, that's no more proof. Words. That's but Allah more proof. Allah says, you doing this to please your wife. Because the Prophet, he's a human. Wow. He wanted to please his wife. And it was not about honey. It was not about the honey thing that people try to say was about honey. It was about a, a, a different situation. Uh, at least from what I see, auth authentically speaking, it was about when he had sex with Maria in one of his wife's houses. And I believe it was, um, uh, I forget which wife. Um, um, no, it wasn't. I forget the wife's name. But basically, he had sex with, you know, with one person who, again, the whole status of wife, concubine, gift comes into play, who had his only son that was born to him as a prophet, mm -hmm. okay, in her house. He told his wife, don't tell Aisha, don't, don't. She went right to him and, I, and then asked him, how did you know? He, Robin, <laughs> Angel Jabril gives revelation to him. What do you mean, how do I know? Like, come on, subhanAllah. But Allah Ta'ala revealed an ayah regarding this, and of course, it's guidance for all of us, but you're doing something that's halal. Don't make something haram for you that's halal simply to please your wives. We have to be very understanding of that, brothers. So when I talk about leadership, that's very important. So much so that the prophet still took 29 days, an entire month away from all of his wives during the time of the mission. Right? They will get us off track rather easily because we want to please them. We want to demonstrate our love. We want to feel valued, needing all this kind of stuff. And then we can get back into this little punkified way it being soft. And then we start having these concessions. And that works on your strength, works on your manhood, works on your courage. Well, now you can't even have a conversation without somebody throwing pots and pans and getting all in your face and all that kind of stuff, but you're a man. So we have to return to the masculinity of the prophet. Establishment. The same person who was fierce in battle, who spoke directly with brevity, but the same man who cried and his tears would hit the ground, his beard would be soaked. So today you get this thing with these Muslims, you get overly masculine, always want to fight and be strong and show the muscles and pose and all this kind of stuff because you got to be a man, alpha, da, 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 da. But when you understand the guy who came up with the whole alpha term a few decades ago, and he wrote a second book to dispel it because that's not how wolves actually act in their back in the wild. But the, the term took off because we like to believe it's this certain type of person. Mm -hmm. then, you then you have the other ones who capitulate to stuff and they want to sit on, do YouTube shorts of, oh, we can knit, we can do this and all these feminine little things. We can do this because of some patches clothes, patching your clothes and sitting back, getting soft and fat and everything else is not from the sun. So anyway, it's having that balance of being a man and being courageous, but not being oppressive at the same time. But you have the That's ability the balance. to mm. oppress. You have There's the ability, but you restrain it. Okay, so this reminds me a little bit about, um, well, I haven't watched the whole thing, but Jordan Peterson talks about a man having the capacity to be dangerous and the strength yeah. of a man being his ability to control that, that danger. And as a man, if you cannot be dangerous, it's like you're useless because it's like, okay, well, you know, that means that when the situation arises, you cannot defend, you cannot protect, you cannot make boundaries, you can't take a stand. Would you agree with that? Hey, I agree 100%. Matter of fact, it reminds me of the Prophet said Islam when he said that the strong man is not the one who can wrestle one to a ground, but it's one who can control his anger. Mm, 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 mm. I think Jordan you know ripped it off the Prophet <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where Dr. Peterson got it from. Okay, so, okay, so just before we wrap up, a, a question because we have a lot of sisters watching and it's I, from what I can see, and we've been having this conversation, right? Women want masculine men, but can't deal with what a masculine man comes with. So they ask for less masculine men and then complain about what a less masculine man comes with. 
right uh, and i'm of the belief that ladies like if you if you want a man who has true qawwam yes some of it you're going to love it like the provision everybody loves it we already did a poll on this channel 100% everybody wants a man to be able to take care of business everyone and no one is no one is ashamed of that interestingly enough everyone's like yep i want my man to take care of everything no problem but understand that that ability to take care of things and taking on that responsibility it comes with certain res more responsibilities and also privileges right so what i'm seeing in in these comments obviously i think that most of these girls have their ideas about relationships and have taken their ideas about relationships from hollywood and songs and films and everything and they are stuck on this idea that the man and the woman are equal and that we are equal partners and and that is where the discomfort comes from to even imagine that your husband is over you they can't they, they, they can't stand it mm -hmm. and anytime you try and bring anything that says sis you need to work harder you need to bring more value you need to actually make an effort not just be in your awesomeness and magnificence but you actually have to work for this you know within this role it's it's like what, what do you mean you know, this whole thing about, you know, I am the table, right? Which I still see people saying, right? It's like, how dare you ask me what I bring to the table? I am the table. Sisters have this too. This, And again, you use the word, it's the entitlement, isn't it? Um, but okay, so the question was, for if you can help us understand from a man's point of view, what, if, if your wife is submissive, and is and guys, we we did this exercise yesterday. Remember how we broke down the word obedient and we looked at it from all these different angles, agreeable, willing, able, cooperative, and all of this. And people got very happy about that. So if your wife is that and she supports you and she's loving and she's she's all of the things, right? Dare I ask, what does she get out of the relationship? Because that's what everybody wants to know. So I'm gonna do all this stuff. Well, what about me? What about my needs? <laughs> what does the woman showing up in that in that energy what does that bring out in a normal man that brings out the best in him and she'll get everything she wants that's the thing that's the trade-off hmm. as a man i'm gonna have to go deal with negativity and i have to deal with the world anyway i don't care if it's business a job i have to get out there and demonstrate my value to be able to provide and protect and exert my personal power so I don't want to come home and I'll have to battle. Now there's more uh, drama and my day continues to go on. But the only time I get solitude is when I'm praying or when I'm away from home. Hence, you get the happy hour or people think they have to go stop off at these other places that they call it the old ball and chain or the nag. But the reason to do it, the what drives a man to do it, again, going to that sexual transmutation, is you being able to do that and demonstrate that Men need to feel needed. In Men order to, to perform. Women need to, in order need to perform, wanted. right? Right, exactly. Mm. You know, even just the way we're biologically made up is, is totally different. Where women are seduced by their ears and men are seduced by their eyes. Mm. So it's not an attractive trait for a man to be primping and getting all cute, as they say. Right? That's an insult to a man. I talk to my young sons and it's handsome. You say cute's the problem. They already know just at your early age the difference between the, the feminine sound of that. But a woman that provides peace will get whatever she wants. See, here's the thing. A lot of times, let you know in Quran, let the man know what he's going to get in Jannah. He talks about these beautiful spouses and all this stuff and how they look and all of these things, right? But he doesn't tell the woman exactly. Hmm. doesn't tell the woman exactly. And a lot of things that you say, you also say about not saying. The wisdom is women don't want the same thing. It's hard to put on, you know, what it, what it is that a woman may want. She wants so many different things. And a lot of Allah is the creator. Right? He knows this. And her needs and desires for stuff are different than men's in general. So she will get, she, if she's that type of woman, one, that's a special woman. That's a woman that deserves the above and beyond treatment from a husband. That's not somebody who is entitled to it. That's someone who has already demonstrated in being your peace. In being the peace, men don't have a lot of peace today. That's why we're having this discussion. Now men are finally stepping up about it, saying, you know, you've been lied to. You've been listening to Derek Jackson and people been lying to you the whole time. You know, they commit Zena, they're on this. And all, you know why? Because polygyny is something that's noble. It's something that builds the legacy. It's something that grows strong and everything else. And we also forget in, in the early days of Islam, even just a couple centuries ago, you don't 
men is not restricted to only being intimate with four women, mm-hmm. all right, with four wives. That's not the case. Because you forget all about the concubines. Mm-hmm. All right? Your Lord knows what he created. So let us be that champion of the heart and be able to bring that peace. That right there is everything. What would she get? Whatever she wants. And it won't be my manipulation. All right, it's not just transactional. If I do this, then you do that. Well, somebody have to start it first. I have to wait on you. Well, if you're submissive and you're leading and you're supporting, all right, and you're correcting when need be, but you correct in that feminine fashion to help him understand. When you look at the Prophet Salaam, Islam, you look at one of the most challenging days, you look at uh, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, mm-hmm. right? The time, mm-hmm. all of the companions that we know, that we honor, disobey him. Only time that we know in the Sunnah that happened. All of them. He didn't know what to do. He confided in his wife. I love she told him what to do. Oof. Peace. What did, she, what did he do? What did he do with Khadija after Jibril first came down? What did he do? Where did he get advice from? Mm. That peace. And they said they only had one argument. And this is the perfect time of year, especially for those who want to celebrate their celebrations. The, there was uh, reportedly only one argument the Prophet Lisa Islam ever had with Khadija, mm. our mother. And that argument was before prophethood. And it was that she wanted to go visit her relatives during their holiday season. Mm. All right, well, they would be worshiping our lap. Now, those are not in, she was like, yo, we're just going to spend the time. We're not going to work. And he disagreed. That was the only disagreement that they had had. That's it. So even though it was before prophethood, maybe we should consider, even if we're not celebrating those things, to be around that. Mm. And as a man, if that's my decision in my family, and I feel that's better for his protection. I don't expect any type of blowback because any type of blowback coming from the one that's supposed to be my friend, supposed to be my lover, supposed to be the one that has to be raised children, shows me that there's some defiance there. And I don't need any of that when I'm dealing with it outside. Mm-hmm. So anyway, prayerfully, that answered the question. Barakallah, Fik, that's, I think that's a good, that's, that's really a very, very, I like the answer. Very helpful. Last question, because I know so many sisters have had proposals to be second, third, fourth, whatever. And I think the general uh, idea or the general kalam in the community is that a lot of those proposals are in bad faith. So let's not get into the issue of, is he doing it for his lusts or whatever? Let's, let's leave that to the side. I think you already dealt with that. Mm-hmm. But if you can tell us, how can a sister know? And let's, let's make some assumptions. This sister wants a husband. She doesn't want a side piece. She doesn't want like, you know, just like a fun friend or whatever, she would like a husband, ideally. That's that's what she's going for, right? How can she tell that the man who is approaching her about being a subsequent wife genuinely wants to marry her and build with her? One, by following the prophetic advice of making sure you have a wali or wakil. Thank you. See, women, sadly, are some of the easiest to manipulate. Now, they can Im- manipulate mono- emotionally like no other, but very easy to manipulate. Let me just give you some facts and change this whole thing up. The bikini, for example, back in the 50s was seen as something that was obscene. It was crazy and all this type of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And it was. And it was created by men. And we think of men, men want to see, they want to look and everything else. Just normal stuff, right? Uh, there's no, the woman's outer being out. It was a big fuss about that, but then women seeing it, 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 just, it was getting pushed as some sexual liberation. The women need to be able to do whatever they want to do. Now, covering up like in France today, oh, that's a problem. But uncovering is pleasurable to me as a man who came up with this idea. And, you know, high heels, for example, they're great for your feet and your posture and everything else. And I'm, they're very, very comfortable, right? No, not at all. But still, Crazy. women do this, even though a man yep. came up with that idea. Mm-mm-mm. So very easy to manipulate in certain areas, mm-hmm. all right? But with that being said, men are seduced by the eyes, women are seduced by the ears. Many times we get sisters that, that come to us in our community and they're like, yo, um, you know, he said this and that, and I'm not really sure. And he's been, I'm like, okay, what is your Wakil saying? You know, is he being mm-hmm. proactive in what he's doing on his job as your, your representative, if you will? Because good game recognize all game. Yeah. And even if you cannot articulate it, it could just be something that hits you instinctually because we have the ability to discern before we have the ability to verbalize and speak in our brains. It was developed yeah. prior to. So one, is he involved? All right. Two, you don't need to know. Well, what you should be looking at is his track record. See, that's one benefit someone has when they're looking at polygyny over monogamy. 
Uh, you can roll the dice on somebody you don't know. And look, the fact of the matter is statistics are going to say you're most likely going to fail because over 51% of marriages fail in monogamy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So does that mean you throw it out the window? You say, no, let's work on each other because those who work on each other and in, in men in particular, I talk about increasing your GQ, your growth quotient. Okay. So working on each other matters, but what's the track record of the individual? What's going on? You know, what can you see from the outside? Cause you're not really gonna know on the inside. You're not part of that marriage. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's being investigated? How's this financial? You know, what are those looking like? What's the credit like? You know, does he own any property? Does he have any extra money? Is this something that, well, I'll come by once a week or do this or that? Or is this somebody that's going to be like the question that, that was asked here that, you know, okay, well, he married me, but she doesn't know about me. And, you know, it's his job to tell her. So now we have a baby and all this type of stuff. Okay. Okay. On. So he... okay, wait, wait, wait. I want to, I want to just jump in there. Okay. So are you saying that for somebody who is, is considering a proposal, should she be expecting equal financial support right off the bat? Should she be expecting? That's what's, yeah, of course, that's what's required. Now she can negotiate outside of it. All right, mm. that's up to her right. and her Wakil. They can. Okay. However, just like I encourage men, don't go into it with concessions because right. then you get comfortable. Oh, if you go I into see. your marriage with a concession of never practicing polygyny, now she want to bring that up where well, you're going back on your word. Well, you've evolved. You know what I'm saying? But still, you gave your word. Now, can yeah. you change your mind? We have a right to do that. Yes. But you know what? If you go in with that concession, they can try to hang it over your head. You know, especially yeah. if you're single, never been married. You're just trying to get married. You're not thinking about marrying two. But if a woman's coming into polygyny, mm -hmm. you know, Islam, again, has those measurables, time and money. Mm. So that's okay, the expectation. So, right, right, right. So then I'm, I'm assuming that you don't you do not, you would not advise sisters to go for kind of the kind of conversations we've been having, making a deal, um, maybe just like a few times a month, maybe just like a little bit of like change, you know, just like it some, depends. go on. No, no, it depends on circumstances because mm. now if you're somebody, again, looking at the, the goals, because if he wants to come in, he wants to have four children, but let's say you have four children or two children already and you 35, 36 years old. Now we're looking, mm. okay, now it's considered geriatric pregnancy. This is more high risk. Mm -hmm. You know, or like, for example, if I'm gonna marry another wife, right? I don't have plans to, but I do have two spaces available. And as my mm -hmm. wife say, you know, I'm married, but available. <laughs> but let's say I'm married. I'm not looking at, I don't want to have any more children. I'm good. Yeah. Okay. So for me, it'd be someone that either already has children, they're either grown or they're taking someone like that, right? Mm -hmm. Versus, or somebody who's never been able to have children. Right. Versus somebody that's like, look, I want to get married. I want to expand the family. I want to have more kids. I want right. to have three kids, more kids. I want to have 10 or 20 No, then children. there's a mismatch there. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so if you're that person, you have to evaluate where you are because all are not equal. Mm -hmm. All are not equal. So that's very important. So yeah, you can make concessions. You can. But if you're coming in it from the rip or they're only approaching you because they're expecting you to make the right. concessions, mm -hmm. that's a sign right there that the man is like, oh, okay, because that's predatory behavior. But that's the case with, with, I'm so sorry, but certainly the temperature that I've taken and certainly what brothers have been very open about is that if a woman has children, if she's been married before, they're not coming in saying, I'm going to look after you like my first, my first is my first, that's my family. This is something else. So you feel that that's predatory? Not no, no, feel, no. think. <laughs> if those are the women that are being mm. targeted. Mm, 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 mm. They That's are. That's what's predatory. Oh, they are. They are. Because men they do are that. Ones. Oh, yeah. this, look at this new Shahada, for example. Yes. She doesn't know her dean. So we, we I encourage new Shahadas. They shouldn't get married for at least two years. They need to understand their dean. Yeah, we talked about well, that. Some could be desperate, mm -hmm. be taken advantage of, and everything else, and not know it. Now they're stuck. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so that's what I mean by predatory day. behavior. Yeah. Now, again, they can make concessions. So if you are coming and you have children, you have these other things, you can make a concession. That's not a problem. The challenge becomes when now, if somebody who's unable to do it otherwise is now mm -hmm. targeting it. Now they couldn't even practice religion anyway, unless you went ahead and helped. Oh yes. That's very common. That's very, very common. You know, a man will say, I want another wife, usually because they have needs that are not being fulfilled. I can't afford it, but you have your own house and you already have like your salary and everything. So like, is that mm -hmm. cool with you? I don't know. Right. That's something that's, no, that's something that's transactional. Like, okay, so we just marry for companionship and I get one day a week. Mm -hmm. I mean, the alternative is like, okay, what's the difference between zero to one? 
Is that really advantageous for something long term? Are you going to be able to build love like that as you build a relationship and want more? You're coming in with a concession that's not healthy for you. Either make yourself more attractive Mm -hmm. when it comes to this peace and being mature. That's more attractive and taking care of your business. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But having that man involved is crucial there. Because I give an example. My daughters, I'm responsible for five baby girls, right? Mm -hmm. Four daughters biologically and then one bonus daughter. Two of them are already married. All right. They want to monogamy and stuff like that. No problem. They wanted the clause up in there. No problem. I even asked their potential husband, like, you sure you want to put this in here? Because I advise people not to. They did. OK, whatever. But we put it in there in such a way that if you do want to eventually practice it, you need to speak to her. You all need to talk yeah, about it. And everything. it. I mean, yeah. Okay? So that that condition is in there. However, the other three they want polygyny. Mm-hmm. They want polygyny. They want to either be a first wife, a third or a fourth. They don't want to be the second because they want to make sure the man has already had that <laughs> when he's joining family. The track they want record. To make sure yeah. He's mm. good. You know what I'm saying? But they've never been in relationships. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So they're not bringing any baggage. Mm-hmm. So the person that, oh, you know, I, I don't have the money. No, you ain't going to qualify at all. No, 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 no. You know what I'm saying? So there's no concessions, not coming into it with concession. But you have to evaluate it. Now, if you're in your 40s, your late 30s or something, this person wants some children and so on. And you're, you're established over here with something. Yeah, again, you can make the concession. Islam allows for that flexibility, which is beautiful. Mm-hmm. But understand what is the vision of the family and the marriage? It's not simply a sexual companionship thing. I mean, yeah. it can be. But is that something that's healthy for you, healthy for your children? Is that another bad decision? I think I, 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 th- I think I agree with you. I think what we've seen and certainly my view on it is it's a short term solution. It's not usually... Mm-hmm something that's done with a bigger vision. Um, now it could be, of course, we could be wrong, but I think that those uh, unions that are made to fulfill a, a an immediate desire without a plan and a vision for how, how this is eventually going to come together, uh, then right. they typically end up being short-term solutions. But we've taken, subhanAllah, so much of your time, and I know <laughs> that the miss is in, in the wings, mashallah, so we need to let her in. But uh, Coach Nadir, how can people find you, inshallah? They can find us on Outstanding Personal Relationships. Um, that's the handle. That's the website. Of course, uh, polygamybootcamp.com. I would encourage everybody, especially if you're interested in learning the basics, get the polygamy ebook, which is the polygamyroadmap.com or polygamy masterclass. If you really want a deep dive um, course that goes deep, whether you're a man or a woman, my wives get together and they do it as well. Or they can find us tomorrow where we're doing a four-hour workshop as well. So, Definitely appreciate you, sister. You know, Jazakumullah khair for everyone um, paying attention. And if I say anything wrong, of course, that is absolutely for myself. Ask your forgiveness. Please keep us in your du'as. And we look forward to seeing more of this wonderful event that you put on. Jazakallah kullu khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum Jazakallah khair. I think Coach Naila is backstage. Assalamu alaikum, sis. So sorry we kept you waiting. Uh, we've had a late start today, as you know. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I know that we haven't been able to, you know, uh, be involved in the chat uh, in YouTube, but hey, that's what happens. Say, hey, assalamu alaikum, sis. What's this fancy thing that you got going on here? A little bit of a presentation, I guess I should say. That's nice. <laughs> I love that. Okay, sis. Um, this okay. This is Coach Nyla. She was mentioned earlier by Coach Nazir. She is. Uh, what do you what, she's the other missus <laughs> she's the other <laughs> missus guys so inshallah ta'ala sis i'm gonna let you go right away i'm just gonna get off here my video and i'm gonna record and then it is all down, down to you and i will be paying attention to the chat and everything if there are any questions that come through inshallah okay okay sounds good Alright, so assalamu alaikum to everybody i'm coach nyla <laughs> one of the co-founders of outstanding personal relationships um, as well as co-author of the book, Let's Talk Polygamy Uncensored, uh, with my husband, Coach Nadir, and a wonderful co-wife, Coach Fatima, who you guys will be seeing later, inshallah. So, and Coach Nadir, you guys just watch. <laughs> so, um, in this, I'm going to get into the mindset or how our mindsets are mutilating our marriage. This, now, if those are those who are familiar uh, with us at um, Outstanding Personal Relationships, um, they do know that we practice polygamy, <laughs> polygyny, uh, which is a uh, man being married to multiple women. So, but this training, um, this talk, this presentation is not just about polygyny. This can, in with a lot of things that we have in outstanding personal relationships, 
we just do a lot of focus on polygyny because it doesn't get as proper airplay. It doesn't get as proper time in the spotlight, so to speak, because it is so taboo, so to speak. <laughs> like we will feel that it's um, just a taboo form of marriage. And we know that it is a form of marriage. We know that it's a form of marriage that the law allows and that um, the, prof, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam practice and the companions practice, some companions practice, you know, so it's just because of a lot of, I don't want to say a lot of societal input <laughs> that it gets really, um, this really bad rep and not just societal input, but sometimes just because we don't have a lot out there that shows us how to do it right, so to speak. And um, alhamdulillah, we decided to um, put <laughs> our faces out there after learning and growing and going through ups and downs and challenges and types of things like that to decide to, you know, put our faces out there and, and teach others and let people know the practical ways of practicing polygyny. However, that's just a little piece, <laughs> a little bit. And a little bit about me. Um, I'm a mother of five biological children, uh, seven bonus children, so it's 12 children between us. And uh, yeah, and I'm the oldest of nine. So when it comes to what I'm going to talk about here as far as mindset, as far as being held accountable and holding yourself accountable, it's very, very important. And I'm so used to it because of pretty much the position um, of my life, you know, as far as being a, uh, a the oldest of nine, and then um, I was a single mother, like two times around, I divorced, and then, you know, all these different things um, in my life. So this is not something that you can just be, oh yeah, well, you have it because of this, or you were born this way or whatever. You can learn how to <laughs> how to fix your mindset, so to speak. And I'm going to get into that um, because there's a couple of types of mindsets, two types of mindset. And I'm going to get into that here. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, here we go. what I don't think it's moving so I'm just gonna just talk to you about it because apparently I do not see it moving it usually does I'm still here okay there we go two mindsets we operate on two types of mindsets we have a limited mindset and we have a growth mindset and the limited mindset is one that will kind of keep, keep us stagnant or it'll allow us to just kind of decrease in our lives. The other one is going to allow um, our mindset or um, it can actually um, improve, um, improve us. The mindset of the growth mindset is going to allow us to in, improve ourselves. The, uh, the limited mindset, it will hinder our progress. So we have these different mindsets where I call it the mutilation mindset as well as the maturation mindset. I'm not on my own. So, so I'm just going to get this off of here. I'm going to just talk to you guys normally, and I'm just going to go through and probably share my screen with you because it would be a lot easier to do so. That's fine, sis. No worries.
Okay. So, like I stated before, I'm just going to go through it because it is not exporting. So, hope you guys can just, just follow along with me just listening to <laughs> what I'm saying. Inshallah. So, the two mindsets. We operate in those two mindsets. And in the in the mutilation part of the mindset is the, uh, that's a mutilation part, right? The mutilation mindset has to deal with scarcity, fear, lack, uh, the solo strife, the competition. So this is, I, I call it for the four S's in the, in the mutilation. So a scarcity, solo strife and sufferer. The scarcity mentality, you have the fear, you have the lack, and the solo, you have like, is no one but me, it's all about me, 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 nobody but me, um, and the strife is more of conflict, and it's constant competition, and the sufferer is the victim. So when we get into that, you have, uh, when it comes to scarcity, this can go whether you're in monogamy, whether you're polyg in polygamy, or in polygyny, and the interesting thing is, we hear that a lot when it comes to those who are under, um, who husbands say that they want to marry again. It's like a, a big fear. And it's like, well, we don't have, we, it's a, we don't have like, or he doesn't have, he doesn't have enough money. Um, he doesn't have enough time or he doesn't have this. Um, so that mentality can actually cause some strife in your marriage. Because, and we go in on, minding your marriage and what minding your marriage really actually, what minding your marriage looks like. Give me a second, I really feel like I'm probably off the screen. Okay. Let me, let me change my video real quick, guys. Da, 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 da. Cause it don't make sense. Okay, there we go, I'm back. So <laughs> when it comes down to it, you have this, um, the, the me, me, nobody but me mentality, that scarcity mentality too. And um, the nobody but me mentality means that it's only about you. You know, it's only about your feelings. And I know a lot of times people really don't like the way I, I speak about really holding ourselves accountable. I, of course, like I stated before, the oldest of nine, so... <laughs> I'm kind of that 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 mom figure to some of my my siblings, and I'm the oldest. So my mental is like, look, whatever happens in our lives, that we, of course we're not in control of everything. You know, I'm the black quarter of a law for a number of things, but how we respond, how we react, those things, we that is up to us. You know, so we can have a very um, a very good life if we want to. We can have a very bad life. If we want to, we think about when it comes to uh, people who have experienced like death and you know trauma and drama, and for some reason they still do very well in life. And then you have other people who may not have had as much trauma or drama, or people who have had trauma and drama, and they're doing they're depressed or they're they're not moving forward and they're arguing and their marriages are failing and these different things like that. A lot of it has to do with our mindset. It has to do with what type of mindset we have. Do we have this limited mindset that is never enough, that it's only me and only my feelings matter and I can't grow and learn from other people? Uh, is that, you know, I'm always in constant competition. I talk about a lot that competition is, you know, competition is a thief of joy or a comparison is the thief of joy. So a lot of times, I'm not saying that you, you don't have to compete because there's some healthy competition out there. I mean, <laughs> you know, you can do that when you always want to strive for better and you want to have better. It's very unhealthy when you strive to tear someone else down. It's like, okay, well, I want to be better so you can be, you know, you know, I'm the winner so you can be the loser um, type of thing. And um, then you have the sufferer when you have that victim mentality. It's like, well, I have no choice in my life. I have no type of 
not just choice, but I like I have no control over the things that are happening to me, you know? So it's not always about something that's happening to you sometimes it's, or happening to us. We can be allowing these things to happen to us. So we want to shift that over to a winning mindset. And what does that look like? Well, it looks more like abundance. You know, you have abundance, accountability, legacy, and team. That's the type of mindset. And what I do is I kind of um, put it as, let me show this. I, I put it in the mindset of um, alt. So it's an alternative mindset, even though it's A-A-L-T. I just put it as alt. It's abundance, accountability, legacy, and team. And with, with that mindset, that growth and fulfillment is inevitable. Hold on, my, so I think it's setting up. <laughs> Camera stuff over here. It seemed like I was going to be using. Were you supposed to set this up? Okay, so, <laughs> so I want to get started, but it seems that he was setting some um, setting some other cameras up. Let me share something. Yeah. Oh. Then if you could, if it's, a, if it's possible, if you can um, enable screen sharing for me. Inshallah. There you go, sis. Hmm? No, I don't think. You okay, yes. yes. Can you see? Yeah, we can see the uh, list of um, folders. Oh no, that's not it. Can you see the, the screen right now, where it should have, where it says "mini winning mindset"? No, no, it's a list of your folders, your desktop. Okay, well, I don't know why it's not sharing because I see the other stuff. So let's stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> No worries. Sure, because apparently I see it. I see what it's supposed to be sharing, but for some reason you don't see it. Okay, no worries. So let's go. Let's keep going. So here's the thing. I'm going into mindset. I wish you guys could see it, but for some reason it's not acting right. But that's some that's how it happens sometimes with this. I wish I was able to, to show you better. But you have your I have it where you have mindset and you have manipulation, and then I have a case study or some case studies for you guys, and then also the next steps. So um, I got into the mindset, and then next is the manipulation part. And the manipulation is usually, when I utilize um, the word manipulation, it's kind of like action, the action steps that you take um, for the mindset. However, there's another way of, of course, manipulation. And if you guys have heard this, let me know, of course, you know, raise your hand or put a thumbs up in the chat. Um, happy wife, happy life, that saying happy wife, happy life. And that I really saw over the years, over the time that I've heard it has been like forever. That is, um, that mentality has been detrimental to mar many marriages. <laughs> and there's a number of things that um, there are women that do not care too much for me <laughs> for saying so, stuff like that. Oh, so sorry. Oh, my bad. <laughs> I said no. And um, um, so that, that is a, a very detrimental um, mentality. And I have to say that, and I have to say that as an accountability coach, because we as women really have to hold ourselves accountable for what our marriages are looking like. And I mean, no, we can't control our husbands. We can't control what they do and these different things like that. We can barely control our children. <laughs> um, and sometimes we can't even control the things that we say. We be looking at ourselves and say, please don't say that. Please don't say that. And then we'll say something like, why did I say that? So when it comes to control, you have to be <laughs> really careful with that. But 
being an accountability coach and uh, holding myself accountable first and foremost and being able to help others hold themselves accountable. The thing is, is that that saying happy wife, happy life doesn't allow us to hold ourselves accountable because it shows that our husbands are the ones that are responsible for our happiness and no one else be responsible for our happiness but ourselves. And being able to hold ourselves accountable help will really help us in our marriages. It'll help in having great marriages. Give me one second. Drink some water. So um, when it comes down to it, when we are <clears throat> holding ourselves accountable for the things that we do, for the things that for the choices that we make, our lives can be so much better. Our marriages can be so much better. Coach Nyla, your video and sound have gone. Well, I'll make it easy. Today is a test. <laughs> Today we are having real tech challenges. Are you back? I'm back. <laughs> All right. So, um, yes, I'm actually having voice challenges today <laughs> as well as tech challenges. However, um, when it comes to the uh, that holding each other accountable, holding ourselves accountable. As I stated before, when it comes down to when we, when we um, are choosing people for our winning team, so to speak, I did a video on that um, on our YouTube channel. Is uh, are we choosing losers for our winning team? We do have a choice. I'm stating as a person who was a single mother um, and you have, <laughs> you people say that, well, I'm a single mother. Now these people are looking at me as, um, you know, as to be a second wife and they look at it as it, as it being a negative thing, you know, um, <laughs> because they look at it as hierarchy instead of as a timeline. The thing is, that we can still have amazing marriages. It doesn't have to be just in monogamy. We have amazing marriages in polygyny, regardless of what your timeline looks like. But it got to be what you choose. You have to think about your choices. And I did see something pop over and say, we choose, sometimes we choose the wrong people, which is definitely true. It was like, why are we choosing the wrong people? It does say a lot about us. You know, so what does that look like um, when we're choosing, <laughs> you know, people for our winning team? We're choosing the people that um, are going to be the, <laughs> yes, the hardest lesson. Yes, you have to choose the people that are going to be beneficial in your life, be beneficial to the growth and the legacy of your family. So, and you are a part of that as well. So those decisions, we have to hold ourselves accountable because people can say, oh, well, you know, my marriage has failed or my marriage is in the dumps or my husband and I were not connecting and these different things like that. And it's like, why? You know, you can't just blame it on one person. You know, it has to be, it's a two-way street on a number of things. And I want to get into a little bit more, uh, um, a little later of how to kind of change those mindsets. Because the thing is, is that, no, we cannot change another person. But if we already were on the right track with the person that we chose, even through challenges, even when things are crazy, we will be able to find our way back to the right path. We'll be able to find our way back to um, a great marriage, an outstanding marriage, those type of things. And when it comes down to it, it's it's knowing what each other, knowing, knowing each other's likes and dislikes, um, knowing uh, what buttons <laughs> to push and not to push um, type of things. And sometimes because of those, men the mentality that I stated earlier, when I talked about the scarcity, the me, me, nobody, but me, the um, strife, where it's kind of the competition, the anything you can do, I can do better. I can do better. <laughs> I can do anything better than you, you know, type of thing. Um, the 
it, you know, to build, you want to tear people down in order to build yourself up, those type of things, um, or the victim, or uh, what, did, what did I call it? The victim or the sufferer mentality that, oh, I'm just, you know, it's, woe is me type of thing. We don't hold ourselves accountable if we're in, if we're stuck in those mentalities. And when we have those type of mentalities, we are not moving forward in, in our relationships. We're not moving forward in our lives. We're, and I'm not going to say we're going to be stagnant because you're either growing or you're dying is one or the other, you know? So if you're not growing, you're dying and your marriage would die as well if you're not growing. So sometimes we may have to, so sometimes we may have to hold ourselves accountable. And sometimes, I mean, all the time we have to hold ourselves accountable, but sometimes we have to give ourselves the, the hard talk, so to speak, ourselves the hard talk. Um, we talk a lot about, I train a lot about having the hard conversations with our spouses at, at OPR, but sometimes we have to have, our, have the hard conversations with ourselves. And sometimes those conversations have to be, you know, about the choices that we made. And we may have to go back on those choices that we made because it was a wrong choice. You know, we're not perfect. We do make mistakes, but the bad part about making mistakes is not the making a mistake part. The bad part is when you don't hold yourself accountable for making a mistake. When you hold on to the mistake because you're so stubborn <laughs> that you don't want to change the trajectory of it all. And the next thing you know, you're in a downward spiral and you're wondering why, or you already know why, but you don't want to take a responsibility for it. And then you're blaming others. So we definitely want to be uh, careful when it comes to those things. Um, let me pull my notes back up. But um, I want to get into um, a couple of case studies too. Uh, one case study has to do with what I call the loss of identity. Because we tend to, when we get married, we tend to do a number of things. And Coach Nadir does a wonderful training on marital identity and individual identity and different things as far as that. And I take a lot from that. And when when I made the choice to embrace my individual identity so I can improve and increase and have fulfillment in my marital identity, that's when a lot of things changed for me. Because coming, being an incoming wife, okay, that has been a, a, different, <laughs> a different dynamic than being you know, an only wife in monogamy. And my marriage in monogamy failed. <laughs> but I cannot only look at it is that it was, you know, it failed because of the other person. I also have to look at it as my choice in the person that I married, my um, choice in how things were going in my marriage. Was it, um, what a community, was the communication there? A number of things. So case in point, just a really quick thing before I get into the case study, uh, for my first marriage, the communication started to dwindle, was almost non-existent. I felt that I actually did the things that you should do um, as far as trying to keep lines of communication open when things are not ideal, so to speak. Um, I would write letters. I would send email. I would do post-it notes on the refrigerator or the, the microwave or whatever the case may be, you know, when you get on, let's talk, we need to talk about certain things and da, 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 da type of thing. Because I have a, when it comes to hierarchy of values, and we also train on that too, um, the hierarchy of values, mine, I have three, so my top three is communication, respect, and trust, you know, and the thing is, is that if our communication is not good, I stop trusting you for the most part. And then I start trusting you, then I stop respecting you. So it's those type of things. But I know that because I know and I embrace my individual identity. And I had to make the decision that this is not going to be profitable. You know, this is not going to be beneficial to the legacy 
and the long lasting, you know, fulfillment of my life. It's just not. And I have children on top of that. And I don't want to bring my children up into those things. So this is what I mean when it comes to the mindset of it all. So um, I could easily had a, well, you know, um, the victim mentality and stuck in state and just continue to play the blame game. And I wouldn't have been able to be where I am today. Um, I have a number of clients who have to make different decisions and some have to make the hard decisions because they say, well, what does that look like for me? I have to take control over my decisions, the decisions that, you know, I need to make to have winning, you know, members and have a strong leader on my winning team. So, and as I went in my brain, I went on into um, the support systems and different things like that. I don't want to um, have this talk go too on too long about different things because, um, because of the, the information. And um, I actually do a training on that in our Women's Polygamy Masterclass, so it goes deeper into that. But definitely the mindset um, of being able to have that growth mindset is very important. And being able to, to understand that you may have, uh, like Coach Nadir said earlier in his training, he was talking about concessions, but he also was thinking, talking about you know change. You change your mind later, you grow, and certain things happen. So if you're in a limited mindset, if you're in a, a mutilating mindset or a mutilation mindset, your mindset is very limited and your limited mindset will mutilate your marriage because it won't allow it to grow. It can str strangle it and it won't allow it to grow. So if you're not growing, your marriage is not growing and it's definitely not going to grow to you. Um, but if you are in a growth mindset, it doesn't matter. The challenge is you will find, you will find solutions. It, it would Solutions will come to you because your mindset is consistently looking for solutions. I had a number of people say to me, I've had, <laughs> I've seen it in, in comments on the YouTube channel and different things. It's like, well, Coach and I love things that, you know, things are so easy or it's easier said than done. Or you have that mindset or you have that, you can say that because you're an incoming wife or anything like that. Why A wife is a wife is a wife. I don't look at like hierarchy or different things like that. I look at timeline and sometimes the timeline, depending on your mindset, can cause you some issues because you'll say, well, I came in so much later and I have to play catch up and I'll never catch up or I'll never be this way. And if you're thinking in that mindset, you know, then you won't. <laughs> it's just like, I want to say it's Henry Ford that said, whether you can, when you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So if you think, you know, things are bad, it's going to be bad. If you think it's going to, you know, look up somehow is going to look up not saying that everything's going to be all sunshine and roses and kittens and unicorns <laughs> because it's not it's our mindset can help us figure out how we are going to respond how we're going to cope so to speak how we're going to grow and learn from the situations i love that my co-wife she said um turn the losses into lessons um because if you're thinking about things on a losing end, you don't learn the lesson. You don't move forward. So being able to change that uh, when things are going rough. Uh, for example, as let's say, and I'm gonna give um, an example in polygyny, I'm gonna also give an example in monogamy because I know everybody is not you know, practicing uh, polygyny, but I do want to I want people to understand that it doesn't matter you know, a marriage is a marriage. So whether you're married in polygyny, whether you're married in polygyny, or whether you're married in monogamy, marriages can have its challenges. But being able to have a growth mindset and a mindset that's open enough to say, you know what, how are we going to grow through this? How are we going to get past this? How are we going to, you know, learn from this? Is beneficial regardless of what marriage, what type of marriage it is. So, um, in polygyny, say that um, I had a, a number of people say, "Well, you know, um, our marriage had 
I, we were so good at first. Everything was fine before he got married to this other person, before he got married again. Now I don't feel like the love is there, or maybe I don't love him anymore, or whatever the case may be. But we hear so much of that part. And a number of things come from um, a number of things. It, it depends on how it, how it happened. But the thing is, regardless of how it happened, how we take it and what we do with it is what's important. If we knew that we married a person, and as I said before, when it comes to polygamy and polygyny, <laughs> I say polygamy because, of course, it's the blanket term of it all, and I'm so used to saying it now, but uh, when it comes to polygyny, if, you know, um, if your husband marries again, and it's just, it's like, okay, I don't know how to deal with it because you have this mental or you have this society that says that if a person is with someone else and he doesn't love you or he loves you less or whatever, he, you know, this is the new one and that's the old one, whatever type of thing. And I'm going to state from a uh, initial wife's standpoint. And I can say that because I've spoken to a number of them um, and coached a number of them. And of course I speak to my co-wife a lot. And I know that there are different things that um, initial wives can go through with their feelings and you know, the mindset and the different things, especially because of what we are used to. And I remember my co-wife stating, she said, how things changed for me because I changed, because I grew, because I decided. That's the mindset. That's the growth mindset I'm talking about. We decide if we want to stay in and wallow in self-pity, if we want to um, look at things in a negative perspective, or if we want to say, you know what, let me understand that in polygyny, my marriage is still my marriage. Can no one come in and destroy anything that they have no part of? So when a, a man marries again, he's not bringing another wife into your marriage. You know, and I know a lot of times we put the sharing, you know, the husband thing out there. And I'm going to actually try to change that mindset uh, as well, because your husband is not a proper piece of property. <laughs> Technically, you're not actually sharing him. He's actually sharing his time, <laughs> you know, of, you know, with other people. And the thing is, he's not, you're not sharing him. You still have your marriage. So you're not sharing your marriage with him. So you're not sharing him with anybody. He just happened to marry some, he's married to someone else. And so she has her marriage, you have yours. Your focus is on your marriage, regardless of what that time looks like. Because even if he didn't marry again and he got another job or his mother became sick or anything like that, that would still take that time away. It's the mindset of it all. So my thing is that we can really change our mindset and we can shift our mindset into having things look bleak and negative, or we can change it and have it look promising. Where we can sit there and say, how do we build this? How do we you know, grow? And that comes with heavy communication with your spouse and having that mindset that my marriage is my marriage and can no one take the place of that? Can no one replace that? Can no one come in and disrupt that? Only I can or we can you know, my husband and I. And sometimes people will say, well, he did because he married again. We want to change that mindset too, because he, he did something that was, was allowable for him. And that in itself should not be looked at as something that's going to be detrimental to your marriage. Now, there may be different ways and certain things may have happened that could have caused some distrust or mistrust or certain things like that. However, we still have to say, you know, what did it look like before? Why did I marry this, this person? How are we doing, you know, how are we doing before he married and before this mission or anything? Because I can go into monogamy and say, well, if there was some mistrust that happened along in monogamy and a wife is filling away. And I'm talking just to the wife because it can go vice versa um, as well. But stating this, and I'm saying stating so much to the wives because 
we are not only are our husbands have heavy emotions too, but the way we deal with it is so totally different than the way they deal with it. And they're more logical <laughs> with how they deal with things than we are. And so when I talk about mindset, when I talk about these, these are very logical things and they help and they work. You know, when we really look at things in a way where I have some type of control over how it's going to affect me or infect me, how it's going to affect or infect my marriage. So being able to have that conversation and say, well, what are we going to do? How, are, how is it going to look for us? And I go really deep in the Women's Polygamy Masterclass about different things as far as agreements, having a marriage mission statement, having a progressive plan of action, which these are things that you'll be able to do on your own. And then you sit with your husband and you build it together. And when you build that together, that is your mission statement. That is your progressive plan, you know, for growth in your marriage. And it should always be about a growth mindset. Now we may fall, you know, into the, the trap of, you know, into the limited mindset again, because, you know, fear comes up and we, it's okay <laughs> to, to have the fear because that's natural. That's normal. That's a thing. However, courage is not the absence of fear. It's still pushing on outside of that fear, you know, so being able to do those things and have that mindset that, you know, I want to be courageous. You know, I'm going to have a courageous communication with my husband. It may not always be, you know, the happiest moments because sometimes we have to, you know, grow through the, the, the challenge in order to get the success. We have to do the work <laughs> before, you know, we have the success. We can't just let everything just fall, think that everything is just going to fall in its place. You know, so having that, that, that strong mindset, having the mindset that, you know, there's an abundance, you know, there's abundance of love <laughs> because I know that's the thing too. It's like, well, you know, you know, how can he love this person and that person and this type of thing like that? This isn't polygamy, of course, and polygyny, um, but there's an abundance. You have an abundance of love. You know, we all have this abundance of love, but men and women are not the same. So that's another thing too, that mindset of seeking first to understand and then be understood saying that, you know what, I want to understand, you know, or I'm trying to understand his plight, but I also understand that we are just different people. We are different. So the way and the reason that I can move forward on a number of different things, I mean, I can talk about a lot of different challenges that I had, a lot of different challenges I had in my first marriage in monogamy, a lot of challenges that I had in you know, in polygyny at the beginning. And it wasn't until I shifted my mindset. It wasn't until I learned about a number of different things um, with, my, with changing my mindset and shifting it and learning more about me that things have gotten better. So that's the thing. Uh, one of the case studies um, happened where it was a woman who used to really love, uh, um, I'll call her Sophia because I don't want <laughs> to change the name. She really, um, she used to be a fitness instructor. She loved to work out and she loved to make these meals and all these other things. And then she became, uh, she got married and just let life kind of happen, so to speak. So it wasn't intentional, so to speak, with how she was moving about her life. And those who know that when you get married, things change. You know, you have that marital identity. When you become a mother, things change. You become mommy and wife. And Sometimes you forget who you are. You forget your identity. And it's important to remember that identity. But it started to infect her marriage where um, she didn't work out as much, kind of let herself go. And a lot of things were just a complaint, but she felt into a depression because she, her husband fussed about how she is not like how she used to be. And she used to have this vigor and these different things. And the intimacy was kind of lost um, after a while. But um, after some coaching sessions, she was able to get herself back because she just realized she forgot her personal identity, her own individual identity, and that she felt a victim. She felt like all this stuff was happening to her. She, she couldn't do anything else because she's a mom and she's, she's, you know, a wife and got to the point where, you know, we created a plan for her 
to still have her time and you know gain that individuality back and that helped her marriage so it's a beautiful thing and that you know we really want to hold on to our individual identity but not hold on to it to it so much that is being detrimental to our marriage because we are still you know wise and we still have that marital identity but not we have to realize that we're multifaceted you know so we still have to have our own um our our own likes our own dislikes those things like that <laughs> and excuse me our own hobbies and and then we can incorporate those things into our marital identity, learning more about our spouse and our spouse learning more about us, you know? So, inshallah, um, you guys got some really good information from this. I do want to give you guys a really good um, challenge. Um, the challenge is a bird's eye view challenge. So the bird's eye view is that you look at your life kind of in the bird's eye view, because sometimes we're so stuck in it. We're so in it. We're so close to it. But look at your life in a bird's eye view and rate it and split it up. What does your marriage look like? What does, you know, your, your family dynamic look like? Um, what does your, you know, personal life look like? This is where that individual identity come in. You know, on a scale of one to 10, what, how is it looking to you? After that, you know, uh, look, think about the mindset that you've had in order for that to, those numbers to be true and create a plan in improving that mindset as well as improving those numbers. And even if your numbers are high, there's always room for improvement. You know, we wanna be in a state of constant, um, never ending improvement. So can I, <laughs> constant, never any improvement. So we definitely want to be in that. And in order to do that, we have to stay in the growth mindset. So again, um, thank you guys for having me. Jazakalakaya Naima uh, for having me on and helping me in doing with some of the technical <laughs> difficulties I had at the beginning. Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah khair and thank you. You pulled it off, Alhamdulillah. Sometimes the tech just presents those challenges. So what can you do, Subhanallah? But Mashallah, Jazakallah khair and for your presentation and for uh, shoring up the same message that we've had, right? Which is the personal accountability, which is taking responsibility and working on the self, right? Working on the self, working on the self. If we can all make the decision to understand and work on ourselves this will have a knock-on effect on our marriages, our families, our communities, our societies in general. So Jazakallah kullu khair sis. May Allah continue to bless you and your family. Uh, and we'll see you very soon, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Okay. Stop recording. Assalamu alaikum sis. Have a fantastic day, inshallah. Right. Okay. Where are we at, everyone? We are chugging on. We, we carry on, inshallah. On we go, onward, onward, bi'ithnillah. Firstly, I would like to do a bit of housekeeping. First and foremost, if you are watching and you have not yet subscribed to the channel, please do so now. I think you will agree. Alhamdulillah, we've had some fantastic speakers. We've had some really good information information and expertise shared if you agree then please do subscribe to the channel as it really helps and we are just a few people away from 49,000 and the goal is to get to 50,000 right by the end of tomorrow inshallah so please if you are watching and you haven't subscribed take time to subscribe now definitely like the video I'm not happy with the number of likes on there okay too many people watching not enough likes that means that not everybody who's watching has liked please take a moment to like the video and share the link guys share the link this stream will be going until 10 p.m today so share the link throughout the day send it to your whatsapp groups send it on your whatsapp forward it on your socials let everybody know what's happening here and bring them all over inshallah so that they can benefit bismillah right also, super chats are available. So all you need to do is click on the little icon uh, in the chat and you'll be able to send a super chat if you appreciate the work that we're doing and you'd like to support the channel, inshallah. Uh, our next guest is Dr. Muhammad Salah. And I'm not sure whether the 429 uh, name, is that you, sir? Brother, please, if you can let me know if that's you, inshallah, then I can uh, bring you in as uh, a panelist. Uh, inshallah, just let me know in the chat. But um, today, the focus for everybody is on the actual 
showing up within the marriage, right? So yesterday we talked a lot about the foundations, uh, our own foundations, uh, what we need to work on for ourselves, um, how to prepare, what to expect, you know, kind of the, some of the things that we want to do before we get into uh, into the, the state of matrimony, mashallah. So we did that yesterday. Today, the focus is on in the marriage itself, right? But there is a topic that came up yesterday that I had been wanting to speak with somebody of knowledge about. Um, and Dr. Muhammad Salah was very kind to indulge me on this topic um, because it's an area that I'm particularly interested in. And it's an understanding of the hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu says a woman is married for four things. Now, those of you who attended yesterday, you know that we touched on this um, in a very practical way. But I wanted to get a scholarly breakdown of criteria for choosing a wife in light of that hadith. So I'm very honored and we are privileged to have Dr. Muhammad Salah, who we all know, um, to address this topic for us so that we can get a true Islamic grounding in what that hadith means for us as women as well as the men who are watching, as well as those of us who are raising the next generation, the sons and the daughters, the future husbands and wives. Again, yesterday, we talked about the importance of taking what we are discussing here and using it to raise the next generation in a better way, to raise them to be the husbands and wives of the future, to understand their role, to prepare for their role, to be excited about their role, um, and to be able to step up, inshallah, as the future husbands and wives, and importantly, mothers and fathers of the next generation. So what we're doing here, we're not just here chilling, spending time. These speakers haven't come here just because they have nothing to do. They've come here to share their knowledge, their wisdom, their expertise, so that we as individuals can be better and so that we can bring up our children better, inshallah ta'ala. Dr. Muhammad Salah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, sister Naima, all the viewers, may Allah bless you all. Jazakallah kullu khair for making time out. I know that you had a very big uh, job to do today, subhanAllah. And uh, I really sincerely thank you for making time for us uh, and allowing us to benefit from your knowledge, inshallah. It's welcome to my platform. It's your first time on the channel. So jazakallah kullu khair for, for, for the indulgence. Jazana iyakum. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us what we don't know and to benefit us out of what we learn and to enable us to pay its due zakah by imparting it and sharing it with others. I mean, inshallah, I will give you the floor bi idnillah if you'd like to take it away, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wal aqibatu lillah, wal a'udwana illa ala al-zalimeen, wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidi al-awaleen wa al-akhirin, nabihina Muhammadin, Alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba'd with praises due to Allah alone. We praise Him and we seek His help. Whomsoever Allah guides is a truly guided one, and whomsoever Allah leaves us say, none can show Him guidance. May the greatest peace and salutations be upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My dear viewers, welcome to this very interesting and special meeting about marriage in Islam and marriage maintenance. And uh, allow me to begin by thanking the host and thanking all the viewers who are sparing time to learn about one of the most important topics in our deen. Because marriage is not just joining uh, a couple, a man and a woman, a husband and wife. Rather, it is something that, that is really sacred that the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, described it in the Quran and described the marriage contract as which means a grand bond. It is something that Islam appreciates so much and it perceives as sacred. To the extent that when the Almighty Allah in Surah ar rum chapter number 30, counted in a series of ayat some of his countless blessings, how he created us, how he made us diverse, mother tongues, ethnicity, backgrounds. 
He also, in ayah number 21, he listed one of his major blessings and bounties upon us, which only people who ponder, only people of intelligence will pay attention to, will not just take it for granted, will perceive it as a great na'mah and approach it as a great act of worship. In this ayah, the Almighty Allah says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And it means, and among his signs, the signs which prove and indicate that he is the only creator and he's the only one who's worthy of worship. The previous ayah talks about a great sign that how he created us and he spread us on earth. And then he said among his signs that he's the only one who should be worshipped. He said that he has created for us from among ourselves as wajan spouses, what is the purpose of creating these spouses and actually prescribing marriage? It is simply in order to find, in order that you may find repose in them. Sakina, a sakina which is mentioned in the Quran, like when the Prophet was in the cave with Abu Bakr Siddiq, and Abu Bakr was so afraid that the Meccan pagans were chasing them. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, if any of them look down to his feet, they will find us. They were very visible to them. So uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ya Abu Bakr, don't you worry. What do you think of to whom Allah is the third? Allah is with us. So the Almighty Allah says in ayah number 40, chapter number 9, Anzal Allahu sakinatahu alayhi. Allah sent down the sakina, the tranquility upon his heart. So he was calmed down and he was confident. He was certain that no matter what happens, no one will dare to touch them because Allah promised to protect them and to deliver them safely to al Medina. So as sakina is this peace of mind, is this assurance, is this tranquility, which you find if you observe khushu' and salah, which you find whenever you're sitting in a halqa and you're learning the word of Allah, then the Prophet وسلم, says every time people get together in one of Allah's houses to study his word and recite it, Allah will descend his sakina upon them. They will find peace of mind, comfort for their eyes, and then shower them with his mercy, envelop them with his, etc. The four privileges. So what is sakina? A sakina is this peace of mind, this saraha, this comfort, this delight, this comfort for one's eye. So he or she feels like, finally, I came home. Finally, home sweet home. That was the purpose of prescribing marriage. Not to fight among each other. Not to hire lawyers to sue each other. Not to break the ties and become enemies after Allah said, if you examine all the ayahs in the Quran, all the verses, whether in Surah Al-Baqarah or Surah Al-Nisa or Surah Al-Talaq, pertaining to marriage, pertaining to marriage maintenance, pertaining to reconciliation, or even pertaining to khulah or pertaining to divorce, you would only find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking about al-ma'roof and al-ihsan. Even in case of separation, be kind, be gentle. Remember those all good days. All of that, brothers and sisters, could never have been achieved without choosing the right soil to plant the right seed and irrigate it with the right water. So it is pretty much similar to uh, those who go to the lab, uh, the chemistry lab, and they add some reactants to each other and the expected fine product would never come out unless if they add the reactants, the desired reactants with the desired 
amount or volume according to a certain scheme. If you do otherwise, something completely different will come out of that. So the equation is balanced if you were to follow the guidance of what Allah Almighty said in this regard. Beginning with love at the first sight. And guess what? Islam does recognize love at the first sight. And we will learn shortly what the Prophet Sallallahu said in this regard. But before that, when you examine ayah number 21 in chapter number 30, Surah of Rum, a list of bounties that Allah reminds his servants with. And he says, if you examine these bounties, you will realize that Allah is the creator and he's the only one who's worthy of worship. And in this particular verse of وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا And he said the purpose, the effective cause of prescribing marriage, he said, لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا In order to find repose in them, men and women, husbands and wives, to find repose, to find sakina, to find comfort, peace of mind. And the means of discomfort and sukoon is جَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And he placed between you mawadda, which is compassion. Ar-Rahmah, mercy. And he did not mention love. Subhanallah, it's a fact that love comes and it goes. It increases and decreases. And in many, many, many cases, I was actually working on a study before where I, I was shocked to find out that most of the marriages which were, uh, you know, based on love, like college students, co-workers or whatever, when love was the only factor, they did not last. Because when the person expects a particular expectation and that was not met, they think that they failed to choose the right person. Rather, the Almighty Allah spoke about what maintains such marriage at all times and during all conditions. al mawadda and Ar-Rahma, the mercy. Let's talk about that in the light of the beautiful hadith which our respected sister Naima brought up in the beginning, the criteria for choosing a wife, which is not any different than the criteria for choosing a husband. But in the case of choosing a wife, because it is mainly the man's duty. And I will tell you why. The Prophet Sallallahu put a lot of emphasis on it and prolonged the specifications versus when he spoke about accepting a proposal of a man. He said, if he is man tardawna deenahu wa amanatahu, if this man is good to his Lord and he's good towards others with regards to his akhlaq, bismillah, facilitate such marriage. And in the case of the woman, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said in the sound hadith, which is collected by the two great imams, Bukhari and Muslim, what does it mean? It means it is agreed upon its authenticity. And narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. So we have a highly profound hadith. In this hadith, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, تُنْكَحُ الْمَرْأَةُ تُنْكَحُ الْمَرْأَةُ لِأَرْبَعَ A woman may be pursued for marriage of the reasons why any man on earth, Muslims or non-Muslims, Okay, both may pursue a woman for marriage. These common factors, these four factors are the most prominent factors which attract a man to choose this woman, to decide that he wants to spend the rest of his life with her, whether for worldly benefit or for benefits that would last not only in this dunya, but extend it to last in the hereafter as well. Listen to this. He began sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by saying, لِمَالِهَا Because of her wealth. لِحَسَبِهَا Because of her family lineage. She belonged to a powerful family. All her family members are members of the Congress, the Senate, police officers in the army, chief judge. Uh, yani big family, noble family, prestigious family, powerful family. 
So definitely they will benefit me. I would have good connections. Limaliha, number one, because of her wealth. She's wealthy either because of her own wealth or because she belongs to a wealthy family. Maybe she's the only child. Oh, maybe even she is having several siblings, but look, her father is very wealthy. If she were to get a share of the inheritance, it will be in millions. So this is a very tempting reason for many people to pursue this particular girl in marriage, even though if there is no connection and no chemistry. But this is a factor by itself. So wealth, family lineage and position, and beauty, which is the most prominent factor. This is what we call it, love at the first sight. Some people, when they see each other, they like each other at the first sight. Does this happen? It happens. And it happens a lot. How does Islam actually value this? And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَا رَأَيْتُ لِلْمُتَحَبَّيْنِ مِثْلَ النِّكَاحِ If a man and woman happen to fall in love, so here Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam acknowledged there is something called love. And in most cases, love happens because of the, uh, what do you say? You guys call it chemistry? He sees her, he likes her, she likes him, even from the first sight, the first meeting. So they start approaching each other, okay? The beauty is the cornerstone in this entire story. And that's why in many cases nowadays, because of the cosmetic surgery and because of uh, the makeup, sometimes the person ends up on the night of consummating the marriage with a person who is entirely different. She looks completely different. In many cases in court were because of that. It happens, no doubt, you know? With makeup now, they can make a male a pretty female. So what about a, a, a female who's already a female with a little bit of makeup? So here, well, that's a factor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acknowledged that and this is a reality. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam listed it. So wealth, family lineage, and the beauty. And the fourth, and he mentioned it last. He said, walidiniha, and because of her deen. By the way, before I uh, proceed forward to discuss um, the four qualities, I would like to mention one thing. Whenever the deen is mentioned in any hadith or in any ayah, it does not simply address the relationship between the servant and Allah. You know, a person can be a devout worshiper, having a huge prayer mark, but he is a monster with his mother, with his siblings, in business, in dealing with his students or with his teachers or with his colleagues. He is a monster. So there is a complete disconnection. Supposedly, one's relationship with Allah and one's ibadah is supposed to reflect on how he treats others, on his manners and akhlaq, but not necessarily this is the case all the time. And that's why you may see people uh, who are going to the masjid back and forth, back and forth, umrah back and forth, but you deal with them in business, Allah. You think that no way those are the same people who pray next to us in the masjid. And that's why when Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an happened to overhear a conversation between two people where one was making a recommendation of a third, said, this guy is cool, man. This guy is really good. Yeah, I watch his credibility. So Umar ibn Khattab intervened and he said, oh, do you know him? He said, yeah, I know him. He said, how, how good you know him? Uh, is he your neighbor? He said, no. He said, did you travel with him? He said, no. He said, did you do business with him? Selling and buying and trade. He said, not that either. He said, oh, perhaps you vouch his credibility and you admire them because you see him going to the masjid and coming from the masjid. He said, yeah, exactly, that is so. He said, you don't know him. In order to judge a person, deal with them, in this, cash, money, finance, business. Allah the Almighty says, The human nature is inclined into stinginess. He wants everything for himself. But he says in Surah Al-Hash, 
وَمَنْ يُوقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ And whoever is protected against the covetousness of his own self, such people are the successful ones. So somebody is proposing to you, sister, and you came to know that he doesn't speak to his siblings. Why? Because he did not give them the rights of the inheritance from their father. Everybody knows that. But mashallah, every Ramadan he's going for Umrah. Never, ever allow him to visit. From the beginning, don't even talk to him. So I mean, when we say, it is not because she's wearing niqab. And it is not because she's wearing hijab. Look the way that she's wearing this outfit, the way that she speaks to people and deals with people. Because I'm sure you've uh, gone for Umrah and Hajj, and you have seen there are a lot of sisters who are performing tawaf, wearing abaa from head to toe, and uh, their eyes wearing full makeup, and uh, the abaa is very tight, revealing the details of the body. So I can assure you this is pure culture. And if this girl were to have a chance to remove her hijab off completely, she would not hesitate. Uh, how does she deal with her mother? How does she deal with her parents in general and the mother particularly and the rest of the people? Uh, when she speaks, how does she speak? Is she open-minded and she likes to joke and laugh even with non-mahram? But this is not the type of girl whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to marry at all. Even though you like her, she's a lot of fun, Sheikh. She's a lot of fun. She's hilarious. She's a, she's a character. She's a character for you and for others as well. You know, she doesn't waste any chance. Everybody likes her because she's open-minded. She talks to everyone. Now I want the one whom Allah the Almighty says, فَلَا تَخْضَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ فَيَطُمَعَ الَّذِي فِي قَلْبِهِ مَرَبَّ When you speak, when a woman speaks, to foreigners, the word foreigner uh, doesn't mean uh, the, somebody who doesn't speak the language or is not an American citizen. No, a foreigner means he's not mahram. But he's my cousin, yo. Your cousin is not mahram. Don't you know that? And your brother-in-law is not mahram, so don't be easy going with him. Don't take it easy and be loose in dealing with the Allows, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, Alhamun Maut. I love this girl who's shy, who's having the quality of haya, shyness, bashfulness, and when she speaks, she doesn't look to you in the eyes, like she's challenging you. This is the woman whom the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, if you happen to win such woman, then this is the greatest Ken's treasure. Because when you ask her to do something that is hala and within her capacity, she will not give you a hard time. And when you're gone to earn your provision, even travel abroad, she will guard not only your wealth and your house, but her chastity. Anyone, whether a cousin or your own brother or whoever would not enter your house without your permission. And this is not a sign of superiority of the man. This is a sign of, imagine, imagine. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِذَا كُنْتُمْ ثَلَاثَ فَأَمِّرُوا If we're traveling, if we're going for a field trip, if we're doing any project, and it is only three of us, then we should choose an Amir. We will make mashura to decide everything together. But by the end, Al Amir, will collect these opinions and then will weigh one of them or the vast majority and say, this is it. A husband and wife share everything, even, and do mashura, even in naming the child, even in weaning the child. Allah the Almighty said in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَالْوَالِدَاتُ يُرْضِعْنَ أَوْلَادَهُنَّ حَوْلَيْنِ كَامِلَيْنِ لِمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يُتِمَّ الرَّضَاعَةِ in the ayah in which Allah the Almighty says that the, the breastfeeding is recommended for complete lunar years, uh, and then he says, 
فإن أرادا فصالا عن تراض منهما وتشاور فلا جناح عليهما He didn't say if the mother decided to wean the baby, if the mother decided to stop breastfeeding, or if the father says to his wife, enough is enough. No, rather, even the weaning is a matter of mutual consultation. The decision is not to be taken by one of them. Subhanallah. Yeah. So we share everything together. But there must be a driver. There must be a person who would be responsible, make the decision and responsible and bear the consequences. Have you ever seen any vehicle with two steering wheels? Not yet. Oh, wait a minute. The guy who used to drop the mail, the mail truck in the States used to have two steering wheels, one on the right and one on the left, but never two drivers. It is the same driver. So if he is dropping the mail to the house on the right, he will drive uh, and use the steering wheel to the right. To the left, he will drive from the other steering wheel, but only one driver. Or otherwise, they will split the vehicle. They will split the house. The relationship between the husband and wife should be complementary, not based on competition. Here, Nabi Wasallam says the four qualities, the four factors which every person uh, desire either all of them or some of them or focus on a particular one of them uh, whenever they want to get married are the wealth, family lineage, the beauty, and the religious commitment. And I explain thoroughly what does it mean to be religious. It doesn't mean that she's wearing niqab only. It doesn't mean that he is having a huge prayer mark and every Ramadan goes for Umrah. It's very comprehensive meaning. Akhlaq comes on top of the factors which decide whether the person is mutadayyan, religiously committed, or not. The hadith which I mentioned earlier, the four mentioned hadith, is one of the most misunderstood hadith. How come, Sister Naima? The hadith is very simple. How come, my dear audience, why do you say that it is broadly misunderstood? I'll tell you why. Because unfortunately, there are a lot of people, a lot of youth, they misinterpret the hadith. And he comes to me and says, Sheikh, Wallahi, and even sisters, this guy is proposing to me, I don't like him, but he's religious. Uh, he's kind of short, and his nose is this and that. I don't like his complexion. I don't like his smell, but he's religious. Don't take him, honey. Don't say yes to him, honey. Please, for God's sake, do not accept such proposal. But the hadith says, Fafar bidati deen, taribat yadak. So if you're going to choose, choose a religious woman. Taribat yadak is a phrase that is used in Arabic, similar to thakilatka ummu. Like, may you lose if you don't make the decision. May you lose if you don't marry a religious woman. Or for the lady, if you don't marry a religiously committed man. From Turab, may your hands stick to the dirt. So they say, that's it. Sheikh, I don't care about beauty. I don't care where she's coming from. I only care about one thing, that she prays and she's wearing proper uh, hijab. I want her to be wearing niqab and on the manhaj. What manhaj? Do you know the manhaj yourself? Do you know whether she's on the manhaj or not? Yeah, because she's following Sheikh so and so. So accordingly, she doesn't listen to this guy and she doesn't listen to this sister and she's boycotting. Mm, is this the manhaj? Listen to this. The hadith, in order to be properly understood, is these four qualities the family lineage, the wealth, the beauty, and the religious commitment is what you should look for upon trying to get married. So if you find a girl who belongs to a noble family, mashallah, she's Hashimiya, beautiful, mashallah. And she's pretty too, Allahu Akbar, she's tall, beautiful, this is exactly what I want. She's slim, she's fair, or whatever your choice. 
And guess what? Her family are very wealthy. They're living in Mecca. They will give me iqama in Mecca, so I'll be able to do Umrah and Hajj. What are you waiting for? If you're not interested, pass on her information to me. So the meaning of the hadith, if you can find the four qualities, seize opportunity. Bismillah, propose to her walay. Propose to the wali right away. I'm interested in marrying your daughter. And the decision is in Allah's hand. MashaAllah. But unfortunately, Sheikh, she's beautiful and she's very religious. She's actually a hafiz too. And she's from Islamabad. She's not Arab at all. But only one thing that her family are very poor. No problem. Bismillah. The Quran handles that. The Quran says, "In Allah min fadli." Surah An-Nur. Allah said, "If they are poor, Allah will enrich them out of His bounty." This is Allah's promise. And if you think it is not that clear in the Hadith, the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "Thalathatun haqun ala Allah awnuhum." Allah promises, Allah vows to help three categories of people. Al-Mujahid fi sabilillah, al-Mukatab, and al-Nakihu yabghi al-Afaf. A person who wants to get married in order to guard his or her chastity. They're broke, they don't have the means. Allah will enrich them out of his bounty. How? My income is limited. I can barely live providing for myself. Now I'm going to add another member to the family. I was hoping that her family would be rich so they can help us. What about if I tell you that better than their family, Allah will help you. And for those who keep postponing the marriage because what they have is barely sufficient, so they're waiting until they make a fortune, you'll keep waiting until you miss the train. And Abu Sallallahu Alaihi said, Annaqihu yabghi al-afaf. Allah will open the doors of provision for him and her will pour the rizq on you. Because marriage is a great act of worship. Is what? Is a great act of worship. We don't marry just because we have to get married. No, marriage is, look, look at this. Wallahi. Imagine when you're married somebody to somebody in the manners of Khadija radiallahu anha. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decides to go up in the mountain 700 and, uh, 748 meters above earth. In the cave of uh, Hira, you know, several months before he was commissioned with the Prophet. Rasulullah, you're busy, you have a family, you have kids, and you have business, you have trade. You have, uh, but he says, Khadija, I'm going up to the mountain. Why? I'm going to ponder. This is a kind of ibadah. She says, have a safe trip, honey, and she will pack the food for him and the drink. Then he will stay for a week or two or weeks, the whole month of Ramadan. And when he comes back, she's got the provision ready for him and says, goodbye, ma salama. That's it. She's not upset with him. She doesn't say, you're crazy. You're going to lose your mind. And then when he comes down running and shivering, he says, oh, this one that happened to me. She doesn't tell him that. I told you, you're going to lose your mind. You never listen to me. Rather, she receives him saying, Wallahi la yuhzik Allahu abada. I swear to Allah, Allah will never let you down. Then she starts counting his merits, reminding him with his virtues. You're a man who's very helpful to everyone. You uphold the ties of your kinship. You take care of the family members. You provide for the poor. You help those who are in need. How could Allah, how could God ever let you down? I love this kind of wife. Not the wife that if the husband is hired or lost his job, he's afraid to go home. Why? Because his wife is going to make his life miserable. So what are we going to do now? Who's going to feed us? And uh, the rent and the mortgage and, and, and. No, you need one like, like Khadija radiallahu anha. She will bear the burden for me. She says, honey, don't worry about it. Allah will take care of it. Alhamdulillah, you're doing your best. 
You're not mutawakil. You're not a lazy or lousy person. You're a hard-working person. Maybe Allah will give you better than what you lost. Wallahi, you would say, I'm not going to sleep. I'm going to go out and work and find a better job because you have this backbone. You have this beautiful wife. That's why he didn't say, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَحَبَّةً وَرَحْمَةً Most of the marriages which are based on dating, going out together, loving each other. Look, wallahi, even if you meet any woman, and you go out and you exchange uh, the love words, you know, there will be what people mistakenly call it love. But it is not actually love, it is i'jab. And why? Because you desire the haram. I tell my kids, had Allah the Almighty made milk haram and made wine halal, people would have desired milk and lose interest in drinking wine. Because a shaitan makes them desire what is, what is forbidden, what is haram. Al mamnu'u marhu. Then once we're married and in lihaf in wahid and we're together, if she doesn't uh, continue these love, sweet words, exchanging roses and, and and so on, then love fades, love vanishes, and that's why a man came to Umar bin Khattab radiyallahu an and said, Ya Amir al muminin I'm planning to divorce my wife. He said, what for? What did she do? What room she did? He said, I don't like her anymore. I don't love her anymore. Umar Khattab used to have uh, something called derra, a rubber stick, that short. He used to walk around with. So he beat him with it. I said, yeah, look out. Aren't there anything in marriage but love? Where is? the compassion, where is the mercy, where is helping one another to raise and upbring goodly offspring. Habibi, imagine, imagine on the wedding night when it is already the prayer time, Maghrib, honey, let's go pray Maghrib before Ash. I can't, Habibi, why? Because of the makeup. Actually, the makeup needs to be scrubbed with a knife. It's very thick layer. You know, so makeup is given precedence accordingly and the nail polish to the ibadah. And then, subhanAllah, on the other hand, the Nabi Sallallahu says, Naddar Allahu Mra'an. May Allah brighten the face. And Naddar, yani to go to Jannah and will be among Al-Wujuhu Nadara, Ila Rabbiha Nadara, who will get to see Allah in Jannah. May Allah make us among them. Who are they? Naddar Allahu Mra'an. May Allah brighten the face of a man who wakes up at night to pray to have a couple of rakas. And then he says, in his state of prayer by myself, he wakes up, he says, honey, honey, uh, let's pray to rakas. And if she's too sleepy, we'll wet his fingers. Please, not pour a jug of water, wet his fingers and sprinkle some water. and said, honey, bismillah, bismillah, wake up. We need to pray to rakas. And we'll go back to sleep. وَنَبْدَرَ اللَّهُمْ رَأَةً and may Allah write in the face of the wife who does the same. In, in fact, without any compliment, I do not know whether the viewers mainly sisters or brothers, but I can assure you that most of those who wake up to pray at night are the sisters. And the brothers are snoring. This is in most cases. I'm a marriage counselor, so I know what is going on. So she wakes up at night, she says, Ya Aba Ahmed, wake up. It's been a while since we prayed together. I want you to lead me in, uh, in the winter prayer, even in the winter prayer. And she does the same if he's too sleepy. The Prophet says, Allah the Almighty will record their names among those who remember Allah much, men and women, Ahlul Jannah, for a simple act. This is the kind of spouse whom you should shoot for, aim at. I'll tell you one nasiha before I finish because I was given uh, 40 minutes and I think uh, I'm a few minutes over or that's exactly 40 minutes. Here is one nasiha. Before the nasiha, I'll tell you what happened with Umar al-Khattab when a man came to him and he complained that his son is being rude to him. He is not being dutiful to him. 
So Umar Khattab collected him. He said, is it true that what I heard about you, you're not being dutiful to your father, to your parents? He said, yeah, Amir al muminin before you ask me, I have a question for you. Don't the children have rights upon their parents too, or is only one way? He said, of course, the children do have rights upon the parents too. He said, would you please educate me about my rights, our rights as children upon our parents? He said, yes. Number one, it is the duty of the father to choose. Please pay close attention to this, brothers. Pay close attention to this. To choose a good mother for him. So when I choose a wife, not only because I like her or she's pretty or she's tall or she's curvy or she is a citizen of that country, you got to think deeper and aim higher, which is high to the extent that you ask yourself, who's going to be the uncles of your children? And when your children will be born, your child will say, uncle to whom? A Muslim or a kafir? A Muslim who's practicing or the family is messed up, you know, because she will say, I need to go and visit my family. Why? Because it is Christmas Eve. It is Thanksgiving. It is uh, whatever. We get together and we party. Uh, my cousin is getting married. But honey, last time everybody was dancing, men and women. She says, we have fun. You're close-minded. So from the beginning, you know that you're not the type of this family. Say goodbye. Goodbye. You know, you're not for each other because it's not only about you. In many cases, when I'm teaching at various universities in the States, I meet, more, I meet a, a college student, girls. I ask the girl because I can tell from the complexion. So what is your name? She says, my name is Nadia. Oh, that sounds like an Arabic name. She says, yeah, actually, my dad is Egyptian. And I know the rest. The rest is history. And your mom, uh, she's looking. And uh, mashallah, it's a beautiful name. And what about your religion? Well, I'm following my mom's religion. So you as a Muslim put a seed in the wrong soil to bring a kafir. Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu an said by Allah, inni la ukrihu nafsi ala al-jima' raja'a an yarzuqani allahu bi nafsin tashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Omar grew old and he doesn't have time for sex, sexual relations. You know, he's managing the affairs of the huge ummah, which is covering almost two thirds of the entire universe. So he's too busy, but he says, I spare time for that, for this relationship. Why? Hopefully Allah will grant me a child, he or she would say, la ilaha illallah, a believer would come in the scale of my good deeds on the day of judgment, and not only him, him or her, and their offspring, their offspring until the day of judgment. And many of us desiring the green card or the residency of any country, it doesn't matter. He may spread his seeds in any soil in order to obtain the papers. And then what? Now you have the uh, blue passport. You're an American citizen and you have three kids. Do you know what are they? No, I have no idea. As a matter of fact, their mom put a restraining order on me. I cannot even approach them. You see, you're a loser. Wallahi, you're a loser. So what did you win? How much did you gain? You brought to this dunya people who refuse to believe in Allah. And you knew it. We've been telling you. You know why the Prophet said, and he said, Why? In case that I died today. I married someone whom, if I die today, she's a man. In what sense? She's responsible. She will become the family mother and father. She will raise my children the way that the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. Will be she will be everything to them. She will dedicate her life to raise goodly offspring. You know, I love this hadith so much. I keep telling you that, inshallah, I'm wrapping it up, but there are so much to talk about, subhanAllah. I love when uh, Abu Darda radiallahu an attended a halqa in which the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, 
المرأة لآخر أزواجها في الجنة. This hadith is very fascinating. I'm very fascinated with this hadith. يعني a woman would marry the husband whom she was married to last in the dunya. A sister may be very righteous. She got married to somebody, the husband died. She married somebody else and the husband died. And she married for a third time and the husband died. Like Asma bint Umais. She was married to Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, a great companion in Ahl al-Jannah, Ja'far al-Tayyab. And then when he got martyred on Mu'ta, she got married to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, the Khalifa. And when Abu Bakr died, she got married to Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al-Mu'mineen. So now, they're all in Jannah. Asma bint Umais, sahibat al-Hijratayn, admired by the Prophet Sallallahu she's in Jannah. Ja'far fil Jannah, Abu Bakr fil Jannah, and Ali fil Jannah. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said. Whom would she marry in Jannah? Ja'far, and she have children with Ja'far. Or Abu Bakr, who's the best of this ummah after the Prophet ﷺ, and she also have children from Abu Bakr. Or Ali ibn Abi Talib, and Abu Sallallahu ﷺ said, Al-mar'atu li akhiri azwajiha fil Jannah. She would be married to the last husband she had in dunya. So she would be married to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Abu Darda heard this hadith and he ran home. Yeah, Umm Darda. What? He said, I heard the Prophet Sallallahu say this and this and that. I'd love to be your husband in Jannah. She said, Wallahi, if you happen to die before me, I would never marry after you because I want to be your wife in Jannah. And eventually Abu Darda died. Look, this is what we call it, Mawadda wa Rahma. After Mawadda and Rahma, you want to add love? It's okay, be my guest. But when you say it's only based on love, so if you don't like her anymore, then we want to separate? No. Here, she said, by Allah, if you die before me, I will never marry after you, so that I will become your wife in Jannah. Very high determination, very zealous, Sahaba. And Abu Darda died before. Years later, when Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan happened to be the Khalifa of a huge empire, he heard that Umm Darda is single. She's a widow. And the Sahaba would not go to marry like a Nabi would not marry Umm Salama because she is limb and tall and no, because she's a widow with a bunch of kids. So he went to propose to Umm Darda. She's old, she has kids. And she said, I would like to marry you, Umm Darda. She's the Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Khalifa. And she says politely, beautifully, مِثْلُكَ لَا يُرَدُّ يَا مُعَاوِيَ Such a, a, an honorable proposal. It should not be turned down. It's only that I promised Abu Darda to be his wife in Jannah. This is the kind of wife whom you and I should be looking for. Not the wife who would sue you in order to take the kids away. And then she would make them kuffar or make them whatever. You would know that your daughter is having a boyfriend and you do not dare to open your mouth. There is even a restraining order. You cannot visit her at school or here or there. And guess what? It was all your fault. You made the mistake, even though you heard many shiuch, many people have been warning you, but it was a desire overwhelmingly made you forget about all of that and said, not me, I'm different. I'm gonna make her Muslim. Like many sisters, they convince this guy to become Muslim and say, I'm gonna make her Muslim. And he never actually becomes Muslim afterward, even though he said the Shahada verbally, but he doesn't practice his that. So when the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, far be that he did, not only the label, not only the morphology, not only the name, rather, the deen is in the heart, is in the practice. The deen is loved, is, mashallah, you see the sister uh, reciting supplications at all occasions, before eating, after eating, before drinking, upon entering the house, upon having sexual relations, you know? Uh, whenever she's afflicted with a calamity, you say, alhamdulillah, Allah bless me with one of al hur Al-Eid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh, I didn't continue with Umar al-Fattab. I'm so sorry. So he said to choose a good mother for him and to give him a good name and to teach him the Quran. He said, Ya Amir al muminin look, my father chose the worst mother for me. My mother is such and such. 
and he chose a terrible name for me. He named me Mujual. Jual is a cockroach. And some people name their children awful names in order to protect them against the evil eye. Stupid. And then he did not teach me a letter of the Quran, an ayah of the Quran. So Umar al Khattab turned to the father who's complaining about his sons being uh, disobedient to him and undutiful and said, Aqaqtahu fa'aqaq. You get paid for what you did. You were undutiful to him. And now it is time to get paid the same. So he will be undutiful to you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to what is best. Brothers and sisters, the best dua in respect of getting married from a good spouse, do you know it? Do you know what dua is it? Write it down if you know. The best dua ever to get the right spouse if you're not married yet, is to say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adab al-nar. And Sam, the following dua, the first dua I mentioned is the Surah Al-Baqarah. The second is the Surah Al-Furqan, one of the traits of Ibad al-Rahman to say, Rabbana hadha lana min azwajina wa zurriyatina qurrata a'yuni wa ja'alna lil muttaqeena imama. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. Questions? سبحان الله جزاك الله خيرا يا شيخ. Um, I'm sure the people in the VIPs will uh, say the same, but everyone is just delighted with your presentation, found it succinct, balanced, funny. Uh, you've given us so much to think about in this session and I'm really grateful for you taking the time to break down that hadith Alhamdulillah um, Inshallah we will all be encouraging our daughters to be marriageable in all four areas uh, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and your family we appreciate your time and may Allah bless you everybody please make dua for the Sheikh inshallah and hopefully you'll be back on the channel again inshallah Inshallah. Barak Allah. Jazakallah kullu khair. All the viewers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to stop the video, inshallah, because we're going to go on to the next one, guys. It is time for our next talk. As I said, we are nonstop today, subhanallah. Uh, and I do believe, inshallah, we have our next speaker in the room. So let me just check. Yes, there she is. Alhamdulillah. Um, fantastic. Uh, feedback in youtube and uh, and just as i said in youtube i'm just very very happy to have finally been able to get dr muhammad salah on the channel it's the first time and um it it did not disappoint I, I knew that it would be good i knew that it would really give us lots of food for thought and be very grounding for everyone and i think the room agrees inshallah so next up we have ustadia dalia ayub who was with me uh, in Australia, alhamdulillah, that's where we first met, mashallah, and uh, just took so many gems from just my time with her, mashallah, tabarakallah, and she kindly agreed to come on and speak on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's marriage to Khadija radiallahu anha, and Khadija radiallahu anha has come up a lot. <laughs> She's come up a lot over the last couple of days, mashallah. Uh, so, sis, we're really looking forward to you giving us uh, an insight into that. Um, if your video is working, bismillah, you can go ahead and uh, alhamdulillah. Lovely to see you, mashallah. Sis, do you mind just turning your phone so that it's not portrait, but it's landscape instead? Barakallahu fiki. Alhamdulillah. Just tilt it a bit so we can see you nicely and not see the table, if it's okay. possible, Yanni. Maybe, yes, I'll just get that. Sorry about that. No worries, no worries. Is it? Yes, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Perfect. Yes. Jazakallah kullu khair. I'm sorry that we kept you waiting. Uh, we had a late start due to tech difficulties, but it's so wonderful to see you again, mashallah. 
so wonderful to see you. Hope you've been well, Sada Naima. Jazakallahu khair for the invite. My absolute pleasure to be here. You can see the bags in the background. I haven't unpacked yet. So no, you know. I appreciate it. I know <laughs> you're in a transition. So I appreciate it so much. Okay, so I'm not going to take any more of your time. Let's get you started. Let me get off here. Let me. Uh, We're having a conversation, Naima, correct? Oh, are we having a conversation? Okay, cool. Yes, yes. I'll come back on again then. But we have, I must start the video, inshallah. So yeah. everybody in YouTube, like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already uh, and definitely put your comments in the chat we are paying attention to it and of course any super chats or super stickers they are more than welcome if you're appreciating the content guys okay bismillah Bismillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Ustada Daria welcome to the secrets of successful marriage conference Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dearest Naima. Jazakumullah khairan for the invite. I'm sure now uh, it's not a secret anymore. Um, you know, what makes a great marriage after all these amazing talks. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and accept from everybody. La, alhamdulillah. We, we're getting there, inshallah. You know, what yeah. we what we wanted to do with this conference is we wanted to talk about, as I, as you know, mm -hmm. the stuff they never tell you. Um, but also mm -hmm. something that's emerged as well is encouraging those who are watching and listening to not just listen with regards to their own marriages, but also in how this can benefit the next generation, how this can impact what we teach, what we show to the next generation and how we train them to be able to have better marriages, inshallah. So, what you got for us? We've been hearing about, mashallah, actually Dr. Muhammad Salah uh, mentioned uh, that he gave a little bit of a, a, a talk, a part of his talk where he was sharing about having a wife like Khadija radiallahu anha mm -hmm. with regards to being supportive of all this time being spent away in the cave um, yes. and not, you know, kind of responding the way maybe some of us would respond. So when yes. you think of, you know, because I remember you came up with this, you wanted to talk about this. Yes. Uh, the story of this marriage. What was it that you wanted to share, inshallah? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه الأجمعين أسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى to bless our time together and make us sincere يا رب العالمين and open our hearts بإذن الله so the story of خديجة رضي الله عنها and the رسول صلى الله عليه وسلم when we think about their marriage people have to understand that we are speaking about the best marriage that has ever existed on earth. So subhanAllah, that's something that we tend to, you know, we get busy and we get distracted sometimes thinking about Khadija عنها, as a businesswoman and, you know, this and that. But, you know, going back to the basics, this was the best marriage on earth. And as human beings, we always need a measure or a standard to measure ourselves, our relationships with, you know, subhanAllah. And that's one of the ways uh, for success. If you want to become a great sports person, you have to model someone. If you want to become a great half of you have to have a role model, subhanAllah. And there's no one better. There's no better model than the model of the Rasul and Khadija radiallahu anha in their marriage. So this marriage started, um, I, th I, just, I think it's important to go a bit back. Um, and speak about Khadija's personality before the Rasul even met her. Because that's something a lot of people um, miss as well because we're just focused on course the marriage. Khadija radiallahu anha was a woman in Quraysh. She had amazing characteristics. And again, amazing characteristics do not come because you have amazing characteristics. You build those characteristics, you grow, you become that kind of person, subhanAllah. In a time where women used to be buried alive, she used to read and write. She used to go to um, uh, uh, her cousin, Waraka, and actually learn from him. And she knew a prophet was actually coming. Very, very few people actually knew that, subhanAllah. Subhanallah. She would go and learn from him. So she was a learned woman. She was married twice. By the age of 24, she was widowed twice as well. And that's, wow. again, something that can be can relate to a lot of sisters, subhanAllah, with it. Khadija, Allah, her life was not easy at all. Imagine being 24 years of age, and some of the scholars say 25, widowed twice with three to four kids. Again, she had um, two children from the first marriage, and then um, shortly after, a year or so after she remarried, and her husband, again, um, you know, she had another two, one or two kids with from him, and then they died. So by the age of 24, 25, a widow twice, a single mother Subhanallah. Subhanallah. with four children mm. in a mm. society that has no mercy on women on your mm. own. Subhanallah. Can you imagine the environment that she actually had to be in? 
yeah. then after that, subhanAllah, after her second um, uh, husband died, she actually took a decision to not get remarried for some time and just focus on her children because her family was big now and her business was growing. And people speak about um, how she inherited money from her late husband and her father. Khadija radiallahu anha invested in the money. Okay, because there's so many people that inherit money and the money gets lost. So yeah, she was she was very smart with it, mashallah. Absolutely. Yep. So because she was learned, she was somebody mm. who worked on herself. She's a person who knew who she was, subhanallah, that she invested that money. And later on, she actually found the Rasul, they got married through her looking for somebody who's trustworthy. So um, obviously, Radita, subhanallah, people do not really take into consideration about who she was. So for 15 years, she actually um, said no to many proposals of marriage, including Abu Jahl, by the way. Imagine if she had married Abu Jahl. Wow. <laughs> I know, the enemy of Islam. So she had to make, because she was, you know, an esteemed woman in Quraysh and she had a lot of uh, proposals, but she decided, she took a decision to focus on her family and herself and her work, subhanallah, because that's what she knew that she needed best at that time. So when she met the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, at the age she was 40, and we all know the story that he was 25. I want um, the audience, inshallah, whoever is listening here, to just imagine that we're not speaking about Khadija and the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imagine that you actually go to a wedding, okay? Because it wasn't, it, you know, it, it wasn't conventional, it wasn't the, the, the norms, it wasn't their marriage, was actually, you know, did not tick the boxes <laughs> that people usually look for in a marriage. So when they, imagine that you go to a wedding, and I'm not sure about how you guys have weddings in the UK, but usually we have them in those um, receptions where we've got the mizze, it's around table. And imagine that the groom, the Aris, is 25 years of age. Okay, you're invited to a wedding where the Aris is 25 years old. The Arusa is 40 years old. The bride is 40 years old. She's been married twice before. She has four kids. He's single. He's going to be working for her because it's her business. So he's working with, you know, for her. She's his boss, basically. And he's going to be moving into her house. Hmm. Just imagine. Just, <laughs> that interesting <laughs> dynamic there. Very imagine interesting what dynamic. what the woman on the table would be talking about. You know, just imagine. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to get into, you know, but let's, let's be honest with ourselves, subhanAllah, and think about what sort of conversations are we going to have about this couple? What sort of future uh, are this couple, a couple going to have? Is it going to work? You know, is he marrying her for the wrong reasons? Is she marrying her? What is this about? So, so many question marks, subhanAllah. So there's yeah. a lot. There's a lot, subhanAllah. Because yeah, these things were not norm in their society either. You know what I mean? Like, And the idea, the message I'm trying to send across is that um, sometimes, yes, compatibility is very, very important. But we're going to talk about that soon. Between Because what made this marriage the best marriage on earth is because they were very, very compatible. They were, um, uh, you know, they had a great connection, but it had nothing or little to do with what we tend to, as human beings, look for in a relationship. You know, our, our checklist mm -hmm, mm -hmm, is different mm -hmm. from, you know, the, their checklist, the Rasulullah's checklist with Khadija and in their marriage was different from what we look for in a checklist. Do we have any information about why she picked the Prophet Sallallahu and why he accepted? Do we okay, know? Okay, so yeah, we do, subhanAllah. So uh, she, radiallahu anha, um, as we all know the famous story of how she, there's a, she had a lot of wealth, a lot of wealth. And actually the, the ulama say that um, at that time, if you, if you measure Khadija's wealth compared to all of Quraysh's wealth, her wealth would actually, you know, would be more at that time wow. so she was mm -hmm. that wealthy and mm -hmm. uh, because she was a woman she wasn't she was working because people talk about she's a businesswoman she's a, but she wasn't doing a nine-to-five okay so some people might get upset with me <laughs> when i speak about that but not she on wasn't this channel somebody. my dear not on this channel she, she, <laughs> we're fine she, to say that alhamdulillah that's good to say but because she was sending men to do her business she was investing her money and she was managing it on her own terms and in her own time because she was looking after her family. She was raising her family, subhanAllah. So in saying that, um, a lot of men would come and take advantage sometimes of that. So they would come, take her wealth, and instead of taking it to trade over, you know, to a sham, to Yemen, they would never come back. They would sell it, take the money, steal it, never come back. So she was in constant lookout for somebody who is trustworthy. And this is, please underline sisters and highlight trustworthiness. Trustworthiness is strength. Um, when Musa alayhi salam, you know, uh, you, we all know the story, left uh, uh, Fir'am because he was scared and he met the uh, two sisters. 
one of the sisters told her dad, hire him in the khayra man istajart al qawiy al amin. The best that you can hire is the strong and the trustworthy. Strength and trustworthiness. And again, these were qualities that Rasulullah had. So you all know the um, story where you know he went to trade, he took her uh, wealth, and he actually came back with so much profits that he um, he doubled her profits, and no one has ever done that, subhanAllah. And her um, one of her, uh, uh, the, the, the men, the young men that used to work for her, Maisara, he went on a journey with him, and he came back and said, this man is unlike anyone I've actually ever worked with or seen or dealt wow. with. Mm. So, and sorry, and by- sis, can I just jump in really quickly to make yeah. a connection for the viewers? Because uh, Dr. Uh, Salah just said to us about, you know, giving taskia for someone, giving a reference for someone. And in this case, Maysara had traveled with him and done business with him, mashallah. So, ate with him, traveled with there. him, everything. Mm. And by the way, from the time she started, radiallahu anha, working, like when the Rasulullah started working with Khadija, um, and the time she married him, do you, does anyone actually know the period, how long it took? Because people imagine, because we, we read the story in the Sira, we think it's like a month or something like that. Yeah. Three years from the wow. time Spanala. he started mm. working for her till they actually got married. Took three years. And I'm not saying, you know, you need three years to, um, you know, suss someone out or, uh, uh, you know, study them and ask about them. But it actually took her three years to make sure that his character and his ability and him as a person, subhanAllah, is that trustworthy person. So it took three years. And then the marriage happened, the blessed marriage happened. And um, some people say in terms of qualities, Khadija had all these qualities. She was rich, she was beautiful, she had status. And the Rasul like nowadays, sometimes I reflect on the marriage and think, subhanAllah, would it actually be possible for a man, you know, with those qualities? To marry a woman with those qualities, you know, like you know, well, she is- she hit the four, didn't she? She hit the the wealth, the lineage, and the the beauty, uh, <laughs> and potentially Dean in terms of character. So, uh- mashallah. Absolutely. But in terms of, um, you know, a 25 year old marrying a woman who's 40 years old with four kids would do twice that that part, subhanAllah, unlikely, you know, we have to be realistic, like it's, it's unlikely we have to, you know, subhanAllah. And um, the reason for the one of the main reasons for the success of their relationship is that, um, and I always subhanAllah uh, say this, it takes a really big man to embrace a big woman. A great woman like you have to be great yourself to be able to embrace somebody who is that great he did not have insecurities he didn't feel less that he was working for her he never mentioned anything about you know him uh, moving into her house it was none of that subhanallah they both went into this relationship equal from inside from the you know the the the, the connection to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala later on prove, you know actually emphasized it proves that but the idea is that the rasul Hassan was comfortable with who he was he knew he, who he was and she did as well. And that's, you know, when we think about what makes a great relationship, what makes a great marriage, people think that love does. Um, I disagree because love in its nature is actually not something that lasts. It's true. Love is not enough. In it's just, nature, just what Dr. Salah said in the talk before. Yeah. Exactly. Subhanallah. Love in its nature, like in its mm. nature, like we, you know, and we've seen people who loved each other and they did crazy things towards each other. Like we've seen that. Love is not enough. It's not enough at all. And we've, you know, we've seen love stories that went, you know, south, subhanAllah. So love in itself is, is not enough. What is enough then if love is not, is not you know, sufficient? Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions those things in the Quran. The mawadda and rahma, and I, you know, the Sheikh Jazallah Khair actually mentioned that. And that's actually, a, it's about character. You have to have a good, you have to be a good human being. being. You have to be a good person. It's character and deen. And that's why, you know, for the qualities of choosing the right man, it's not love. It's not that, you know, khuluq wa deen, character and deen, and then you have to love him. Love was not even on the list because um, it's not going to be enough at all, subhanAllah. Love can come and go. And I tell sisters all the time, you might love him one day, you love him this next day, you might find your husband the most attractive one day and then the most disgusting the next day. It's normal. Like, it's just part of, it's absolutely, like, honestly, subhanAllah. So don't, you know, this realistic expectations in a relationship are extremely important. And I think we watch too many movies and we've, you know, heard so many wrong things and we didn't have, you know, modeling. That's why it's important to go back to the story of the Rasulullah and Khadija to see that, to, to have that standard and have that measure. So she was 100%. really... Can I just say as well, just to, just yeah. before you, uh, you carry on, what's interesting to me is that you know, just as you said, I mean, certainly from the outside, the power dynamic in the relationship was like way off balance, right? Mm. But within the marriage, we saw Khadija radiallahu anha 
able to be a wife to Rasulullah yeah. sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he was able to be a husband to her in spite of all of that. Subhanallah. A hundred percent, Subhanallah. And, and if you dig deeper into the, um, you know, it was the greatest love story ever on earth, Subhanallah. That whenever he would come back, I did, I, I read once in a in a, um, a, a book that she would actually leave everything, and when she would hear him coming, approaching the house, she would leave everything that she was doing, she would get up and greet him at the door. She would put her hand on his chest and make dua for him. And she would say, you know, know. imagine if, if, you know, she was a wife, she was a a phenomenal wife, subhanAllah. She, you know, imagine if a woman actually greets her husband. Imagine if wives start greeting their husbands at the door. And I know this is, you know, something that a lot of people are like, oh, you know, what do you mean? I'm going to be, I'm busy with the kids, I'm cooking. But you know, giving no, sis, husband... on this channel, we give okay. realistic, real advice okay, and we cool. don't sugarcoat and we don't not say things for fear of offending people. Like we tell it as it is. And, you know, sis, you know, we, you and I have spoken about yeah, yeah. this. The problem with a lot of sisters nowadays is they've been told lots of lies and they are used to the sound of the lies. So when they hear the truth and the haq, it's like, it uh, you know, yeah, yeah it hurts. Yeah. Right. Be comfortable but, subhanallah. If we don't say it from a place of love, but being fair and honest and just, they'll never hear it. And then subhanAllah, like, you know, where will we be just with our heads full of lies and a lot of the time messing up our marriages in the process? When we instead could be building, we could be nurturing, we could be strengthening if we allowed ourselves to just get a bit calm, a bit humble, and maybe listen to say, maybe I'm not doing it the way that is most pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way that is closest to the sunnah, maybe I can make some adjustments here and there to make my, in, you know, my, my action for the sake of Allah, to make my husband feel more appreciated, to honor him more, right, than I do right now. But anyway, carry on, sis. I don't want to I agree, subhanAllah. And I think that that's where we need to be doing a lot of unlearning, Naima. Wallahi, there's a lot of unlearning. Like, there's a lot of pollution. There's a lot of um, dirt. There's a lot of dust that we need to clear the air. We need to cleanse our hearts from. Otherwise, we're not going to be having those deep, meaningful relationships, especially like in a marriage, which is the most... Uh, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Rasul called it mithaqun ghalil. It's a you know mm-hmm. strong covenant. Mm-hmm. It's a trust mm-hmm. that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's serious. Like the Rasul said, you know, everything you can joke about except talaq and zawaj. Like you you know, it's it's a a um you know covenant that a lot of people take lightly. You know, a lot of people take lightly. Yes, uh, your husband can be your door to Jannah or your door to hellfire. Yes, yeah. you know, obedience to husband is, you know, important. Yes, all these things are in our faith and it's our lack of understanding. If something doesn't feel right, if you don't yeah. feel right about something in marriage or in the deen or, um, you know, you feel like it's against women or it's oppressive, it's one of two things. It's either you've seen it modeled in the wrong way. So you kind of like, oh, you've got trauma from mm-hmm. that growing up from your parents. <laughs> Yeah. Honestly, and it triggers you, subhanAllah, or yeah. you just don't know how, you're just ignorant. So you just yeah. don't have the knowledge to understand that thing. That's it. One right. of those things. And I love that you said that because another thing that's really important for us, particularly as women, to appreciate and understand and accept, your feelings are not the barometer of truth. No. Your feelings are not the barometer by which you judge whether this is true or not, whether this is good or bad. It's not to do with your feelings. It is, as you said, it is to do with the haq. And remember that your feelings are impacted firstly by your thinking. But a lot of the way that we feel is nafsi, as you said, right? It's to do with the self, the ego, all of that stuff. And we're asked every single day in our askar to actually seek refuge from the nafs. Allahumma la takilni ila nafsi tarfata ayn. The Rasulullah yeah. sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is to actually make this dua. Yeah. Ya Allah, do not allow me to my nafs a blink of an eye. It's the nafs. You yes. know, when you're arguing, yes. when you're seeking things, it's, is it you? Is it is this really you? You're, mm. you, you know, or is it your nafs? And the nafs yeah. desires things. We need to, you know, uh, pack it away. Honestly. Yeah. Your nafs we need to get it under control, right? And, and I think the, another thing. Sorry, go yeah, ahead. Go no, ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just want to say that, that, you know, that one of the things that we as Muslims, Muslims in general, need to appreciate is that we live in a time that is nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. Mm-hmm. We live in a time of worship of the self. Absolutely. The self, is, it's, you know, like, I mean, it probably goes back to the man is the measure of all things, right? But now yeah. it's me, myself, 
I am the measure of all things. I'm the measure of all things. If I like it, it's good. If I don't like it, it's bad. If it makes me feel good, I do it. If it makes me feel bad, I don't want to do it. And it's everything about how I feel and how I process and my truth and all of this Mm -hmm. stuff. People need to understand that 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 I that people are talking about is the nafs that we that we discuss in a hadith, right? That's the nafs talking right there. It's the self, it's the ego, it's all the desires. And that's not meant to be a barometer for anything. You're supposed to be getting it under control, subhanAllah. A hundred percent. And because if you going on that track of nafs, nafsi, subhanAllah, it's a it's a road to disaster. Because the nafs la tashba, the nature of the nafs doesn't ever get fulfilled anyway. So it should never be the measure. It should never be the mm-hmm. thing that I'm trying to fill. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, don't trust yourself. Don't trust your nafs. Trust mm-hmm. the measure I give you. The yes. measure I've given you is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make Allah the center of everything. Make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the deen, the khuluq. So you actually have, so when we even say, you know, when you understand, uh, and, and from that, you, know, you need to know your deen. You need to know Islam. You need to know your, your, your you know, your, your wants and your rights and your responsibilities. You need to understand that the relationship is not even about haq, my haq and your haq, my rights mm-hmm. and your rights. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Al-Talaq, even, wala tansaw al-fadla baynakum. Not the rights. Do not forgive. Don't forget, uh, forget the fadl. Al-fadl is like the graciousness between you two. Subhanallah. Not, not the rights, not the responsibility. There's wow. graciousness. There's, <laughs> just be graceful. La, don't forget you know, that he's That he makes right, all you know, the that, difference. That makes you know, so much difference. In, wow. in, in, uh, once in the seerah, you would find the Rasul speaking to his wives and telling them my rights. Or that's your response. Not once. <laughs> so which, because, which is crazy to me, actually. Because in a, it's, in a it's, healthy relationship, wow. because, you know, sisters, you know, we were discussing <laughs> this. I was discussing this once with a sister. And she was saying how, you know, obedience to the husband, obey me. Like, you know, I'm not, she actually said I'm not a dog that, you know, to obey anybody. She actually said that, <laughs> that word. <laughs> and subhanAllah. And, um, you know, I was like, sister, mm. do you know the condition for this obedience? You know, mm. that will liberate you. The condition for this obedience, which you don't have a problem with when it comes to your parents, by the way. Like we're asked to obey our parents. We're okay with that. Like no one You've got no problem with your job be... or with yeah, the yeah, traffic officer boss. or with the government. And oh, you, you, you had your, Diani. After your own children, like you know, children have to obey their parents. I'm happy my children obey me. You know what I mean? Like it's actually yeah. you know, they're part, they're called good kids, they're good um pious kids. You know, it's you, I said your only problem with obedience is because you don't understand what this obedience means this obedience yeah. is conditional to that man fearing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's conditional yes. to that so it's not yes. like unlimited but is, is, it's deeper than that i think as, because i and again i could be wrong but i mm. think that you know we always talk about outliers right and i think mm. the the consensus is that the abusive situation are the outliers it's not the Absolutely. norm right yeah, yeah. but i think sisters and we did an exercise yesterday that I think you'll find quite interesting where remember guys, when we looked at the word obedient and asked the audience, what comes up for you? Right. And some people said, I feel like rebelling. Um, I'm, I'm triggered or I feel fine or I feel uncomfortable, whatever. They came up with, you know, different ways that the word obedient made them feel. And obviously, as you know, the way that we understand language is based on our thinking about it, our past, our ref- Princes, our programming and everything. Exactly. Right. So we had the word obedient. And then I put a new slide with all the synonyms for the word obedient. Words like submissive, willing, um, cooperative, um, gracious, uh, you know, different, different words, Yanni. And it was almost like he could feel everybody just like taking a exhaling and just like relaxing. relaxing. <laughs> yes. And I said, like, which of these words makes you feel good? Right. And they've said, I love agreeable. You know, I love willing. Um, I love helpful. You know, all of these things that were not helpful wasn't one of them. But people were able to appreciate that the reason you're feeling some kind of way is because of the negative association that you have Absolutely. with the word obedient. Then we flipped it. So I then brought up all the antonyms for all of those words, disobedient, mm. unwilling, uncooperative, uh, you know, all, all of, yeah, 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 exactly. Right. Combative, all of these things. And I said, okay, if, if, if obedient doesn't feel good, does the opposite feel good to you? Is, is that the kind of rebellious was one of them? You know, would you like to, if you, if someone asked your husband, like, you know, what kind of wife do you have? How would you feel if he said, no, my wife's rebellious or my wife's really, you know, unhelpful or unwilling or whatever the case may be. If your daughter got married and her husband came and said, mom, you know, 
like your daughter is this, this, and this, she's really disagreeable. She's really disrespectful, whatever the case may be, how would you feel? Mm -hmm. And alhamdulillah, like it really got people thinking through their own feelings about the obedience. Because if your child says to you, mommy, can I have a sandwich? Most moms are going to make that sandwich. And obey the Well, child. how come if your husband says, babe, can I have a sandwich? You're like, make it yourself. What? Yeah. Can't you see I'm busy? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put a duty on us, right? to mm. obey and to, to look after our men, just as he's put a duty on them to provide for us and protect us and everything. So I think it's just like a bit of shaking we knew it to do with the sisters, like stop resisting pleasing yeah. your man, especially those of you who've got nice men, man. Oh. And I keep saying, subhanAllah, <laughs> all these ideas and all these feelings and all these thoughts come from the fact that we are ignorant about understanding our deen. Like, you know, you know, we've all heard of obedience to the man, but do you, do you know, for me, I actually think women, that's my thing. That's what I think. That's my opinion. In a marriage, she actually has more rights than like, not in terms of, but more rights. Because yeah. even so, the men got the got a good life. Word. Got a good we life. have got a, a word. Life. We also have a word. That <laughs> we have a word. Women even even know what their word is. Like what is your, people? Everybody knows the man's word is obedience. You know, and everybody uh-huh, can yeah. use that against us. But do you know, as sisters, our word mm-hmm. is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in the Quran. And by the way, Ta'at Zaj was a hadith by the Rasul But our how they should be dealing with us is mentioned mm-hmm. in the Quran, not just uh-huh. in the Sunnah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, This is a command, mm-hmm. like pray, like fast. It's a fard, it's obligatory. What's yeah. ishra bil ma'roof? Honestly, that mm-hmm. is scary for a man to treat his wife with ma'roof. You know what ma'roof is? The good, word for goodness. Is, there's actually no translation for the word ma'roof. Ma'roof is all goodness. Mm-hmm. Ma'roof from arifa, arifa to know of all goodness, like everything good. This is how you have to deal with them with all goodness. Mm, so you know mm, you're mm. you're actually obeying somebody who's dealing with you with who's all who's looking after you and giving you all of this good stuff, right? <laughs> and subhanallah says Allah. we had a brother earlier on today, and we were talking about um, you know, uh, because I we, he was talking about how you know for a man having a supportive and agreeable and submissive woman who who's on board, um, mm. who who basically is, you know, the, the one who obeys and is chaste, right? As is mentioned in the Quran, you know, kind of what that means for a man. And I said, okay, so what if I have a young girl or a woman who says, well, what's in it for me? So mm. I'm supposed to support you and 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 back you up and, and, and you know, do all the things. What is yeah. in it for me? And it was really great what he said, which is, he just said, whatever she wants. Yeah. Because wow. a man who feels appreciated and respected give you the world. A hundred percent. And I was like, Absolutely. I like that. We like that. Absolutely. And that we was subha- with that. A hundred percent subhanAllah. And I think so, subha- you know, this is why um, you know, I keep saying, you know, go, to go back to going back to Khadija and Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu you know, marriage. Yeah, when it was they a person who asks these questions, they're struggling with themselves. Period. Like that's from the end. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Like, but so many of us have, are struggling to be honest have, right now. <laughs> yeah. 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 We just, you know, you're going to have a problem with, if you're not married, you'll be having a problem with someone else, whether yeah. it's your mom, whether True. it's your sister, whether it's your friends, colleagues, there'll be trouble in relationships yeah. because mm-hmm. you need to understand that, you know, the way you deal with others, despite who they are, reflects how you deal with yourself and reflects your relationship mm-hmm. with your creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The yeah. ulama yeah. say, rectify that which is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. And Allah will rectify that which is between you and the creation. This so is the qaida. This is the formula. This is the, mm. يعني, this is the foundation for all successful relationships. So when Khadija married the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she was okay with like more than okay with who she is and herself, subhanAllah. She, you know, and, and, the and okay was, with who he was. And as okay well, with which who is he huge. Was. If you think and, about and nowadays, you know, a sister, if she marries a man who she thinks is less than her, if yep. she even accepts the proposal, she struggles to be yep. the wife, struggles and, to respect him, struggles and, to and appreciate. And whatever happens is always going to be issues with that wife because, you know, with Khadija's example, uh, for example, subhanAllah, um, when she married the Rasul and she helped him and, and you know, Absolutely. and whatnot, and then later on, he actually started just before the da'wah, as we all know, he started going to Ghar Hira, to the cave of Hira, to, um, you know, ponder and to do itikaf at that time. 
the woman of Quraysh used to actually say bad things about him to her. They would say, really? look, yeah, yeah, yeah. They would say, look, you know, after you've t- taken him in and after what you've done to him, <gasps> now he leaves you. No he way, goes, really? Okay, yeah, yeah. That's I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Sirat ibn Hisham mentions that in, the, in their story because he would go for weeks away from the house. Yeah. And Khadija at that time, she was a 60-year-old woman with a lot of children because can you? she, she had her children and then she had five children, seven children from the Rasulullah two who have died, but five. And then she was a foster mom as well. She had wow. Ali ibn Abi Talib living with her at this, because the Rasulullah Oh Salam. my goodness. Yeah, can you imagine the household? <laughs> Allah, <laughs> God, I love the Sira so much. <laughs> can you imagine this? Because when the Rasulullah married her, he actually asked for her permission to bring Ali because his uncle, he had 20 kids and what, one yeah. of the ways that he wanted to honor his uncle and thank him is to take Ali yeah. and just take, you know, take care of the masarif Gosh. and the expenses. And wow. That. So this household was full of people. <laughs> you know, she was a foster mom. She was a mom. She had people in and out. And she was 60 years old. And at 60, she was still taking food for him. So mm. she would calculate. She would calculate his his raha was her mission in dunya, like her, you know, him, you know, mm-hmm. being rested, subhanallah. She would calculate, okay, it's been three, four days. Now the Rasul, he wasn't the Rasul then. Now Muhammad yeah. would, you know, yeah. his, his um, food would finish. So he would actually, would actually go up. And if those of you who've been to Umrah or, or Hajj mm. before, and you've been to Jabal al-Nur, Jabal al-Nur is like a yeah. three-hour climb. And it's very steep. So can you imagine a 60-year-old woman carrying stuff Subhanallah, and taking um, up the mountain and taking food to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And a lot of the times um, it was mentioned that he would actually meet her halfway because it was just the perfect time she knew when he'd finished the food, Subhanallah. And when those women would actually say bad things about the Rasul and say, look what he's left you, look what you've done to him, what, would you, what was her reaction? Nothing, no reaction. No wow. reaction to you don't exactly no talking back, no responding, no um, you know supporting your. Well, who do you think I am? Well, I didn't sign up for or, this. Or trying to <laughs> nothing, nothing it was just ignorance because you don't get down to the level of the ignorance. Yeah. You know that's all they've got. Subhanallah, and you know so just she actually used to just ignore them and continue to do what she knew was right for her husband, despite the chit chat and the talk. Wow, subhanallah, subhanallah, subhanallah. No, yeah. Okay, carry on. Yeah. Tell us more. And Tell so, us more stories. We want more stories. So, um, very important. Before the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the ulama also mentioned that just before he became a prophet, his household was at the most peaceful ever. You know, established home, you know, good wow. relationship with his wife, children, yes. subhanAllah, everything is going really, really well. And that's a very interesting point to take that, you know, for those who are in da'wah, you know, for those who are preaching to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, whether women or men, if you go outside your home, and you uh, spread the deen and you want to contribute to da'wah and you have an in, you know this instability inside your household, it's not going to work, subhanAllah, because yeah. your household needs to be the foundation. Only good comes out from that household, subhanAllah. Yeah. You know, it's the basis. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when, he, when Islam was revealed and when, you know, the deen was revealed, the Rasul was told by Allah to start with your family. Like, don't yeah. go out there trying to help other people when you've got, we all have issues. I'm not saying that we have perfect times. None of us do. We all have struggles. But if you're taking time away from the time that you should be investing in nurturing, loving, supporting, looking after your house, you know, it's okay, study, go become a scholar, uh, work, do whatever you do, but you need to understand your priorities and Khadija understood those priorities. Yeah. And the priorities go like this, sisters, in terms of like, if you want to, you know, t- <laughs> you know, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then yourself and then your husband and then your children, that is for the woman, then your children and then your parents, you know, family, siblings, and then the ummah. So the ummah is there. The ummah is on the list. You have a duty, but you don't go and helping the ummah when you're, you know, taking, you know, right away from yourself or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's haq or your husband's haq or your children's haq, you know? Mm-hmm. And when people start doing, when this, when this priorities list gets messed up, that's when the trouble starts happening. And that's when yeah. we start feeling overwhelmed and burnt out and things are not working out. And that's when we people, you know, people tell me I'm doing da'wah, I'm doing halaqat, but my husband's not supportive. You're so lucky. Your husband is supportive. There's no luck. There's no luck. I don't mean there's, you know, preparation and there's tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no yeah. luck. You just have to do 
what you need to be doing. You have to be organized. You have to be, if you, you know, want to do that, subhanAllah, but you have to get your priorities right. And it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before anybody else. So your connection to him is paramount. And Khadija's mm -hmm. connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can only imagine. We don't even have enough information because in that pre-Medina time, very little um, was little that was written on what was happening in Mecca because they were being mm -hmm. persecuted. There was no Medina afterwards, subhanAllah, we had all the information and the knowledge. But just to, to give you guys, subhanAllah, and you, we can't even imagine what, yani, when I think about what was Khadija radiallahu anha's daily routine, knowing what I know about her lifestyle mm -hmm. and who she had in the house and what she did and how she supported the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how she used to actually, what she did just thinking about the ulama say, the three years in the boycott, when the Muslimin were being boycotted, she spent every bit of money she had. The wealthiest woman in Quraysh, you know, died, ultimately she got sick and she ultimately died from starvation because yeah. she was eating leaves from the trees towards the end of her life. This she is the wealthiest. of starvation? So she, she got sick afterwards from starvation because she did not wow. eat yeah the three years that um you know she was tested when i think of khadija's life i actually get emotional because yeah i don't think there was a day that she lived in a there wasn't a normal day per se there wasn't a day without hardship there wasn't a day she was living you know from the age of 40 when the rasul you know became the prophet can you imagine like people were not even just saying bad things when somebody says something bad about your husband you get upset her husband was, you know, they were trying to kill him. He was enemy number one. <laughs> enemy, number enemy number one. one. Everybody's yeah. making um, fun of him. Everybody's mocking him. Everybody is, is swearing at him. Everybody's fighting him. Everybody wants to kill mm. him. Can you be, can you imagine? And what having, how, having gone from having that status and that respect within your own to community that, to now you're the wife of enemy number one. And wow. then having to worry about that and live with that every day. You know what I mean? Like how hard, you know, and this is somebody yeah. that, you know, subhanAllah, we can't even imagine how difficult it was, subhanAllah, for her at that time to deal with all of this. But, mm -hmm. you know, so I sometimes reflect on what sort of daily routine did she have? We don't know that. Maybe inshallah we will ask her in Jannah when we meet her, Ya Rabbil Alameen, inshallah, because she is our mother. And um, when sisters tell me, you know, my, I don't have a good relation with my mother, I'm like, you have another mother. Her name is Khadija. And she'll be waiting mm -hmm. for you in Jannah. So we all have a mother that is different from our own mother, subhanAllah. That's why they're called Ummahat al mumineen the believers, mm. the mothers of the believers, because everybody has another mother that is different from their mother, subhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says about Khadija that kamula min al nisai arba, only four from women have actually perfected their faith. So she perfected her faith. So this mm. is a woman who perfected faith. Mm. So can you imagine what type of personality she was and what she used to do? And by the way, she perfected her faith in a time where a lot of the fara'id were not even compulsory yet. SubhanAllah. Mm. There was no hijab. She died before hijab was compulsory. Wow. She died before a lot of the fara'id, siyam, fasting. This is a woman who perfected her faith. I'm not saying like fard, hijab is fard, and fasting is fard, and, but I just want to give the, the audience, inshallah, just to get deeper into what faith you know how could you perfect your faith without doing all these sort of things yes you can mm -hmm. yes you can because faith is in the heart she had it was in her heart you know these things were not obligatory then that's why she you know but subhanallah what i'm saying is that this is a woman who perfected her faith and that's why subhanallah Allah, you know the rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam you know later on when you fast forward after her death uh aisha radiallahu anha said that in the 15 years that i married the rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam not a day not a day would go by except that the Rasul وسلم, would mention Khadija, عنه, not a day. You know, the, the, the loyalty, the connection, the true love, subhanAllah, because Khadija was Khadija, because Khadija was the one, and he would get upset if anybody would say anything negative about it in any way, shape, or form. As we all know, I used to get very jealous from Khadija, yes. and she would say to Rasul, you know, so didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replace her with somebody better? Yeah. Um, and younger and this and that and he would and he went when she said that he said la wallah she was no, she did not replace me with someone who was better he mm. she was the one who supported me when everybody left me she's the one who believed me when no one else believed me she's the one who was there for me when the whole people my own people were against me 
you know, and then she actually said after that moment, I was like, I don't want to get the Rasul angry. So she never mentioned Khadija except in good. Yeah. Subhanallah. Yeah. So, and, um, you know, just talking about people thinking, ah, oh, you know, to have an ideal marriage or ideal relationship, which is what was the Rasul Hassan's relationship with Khadija, requires that you have an easy life. They had no easy life. They had, mm-hmm. they did not, they had the most difficult life. And yeah. yet with the most difficult life and the most difficult mm-hmm. circumstances, they had the greatest marriage. It's because not about the circumstances, It's guys. not about the external circumstances. It's not about what happens. It's not about if he has a job or not. It's, it's not about his status. It's not about his degrees. It's not about whatever, you know, stuff that, you, again, the checklist, subhanAllah. And again, to just give you, to get into this a bit deeper, one of the ways that we can know that their life was very, very hard is towards her death just before she died. She was the only person, you know, who was actually, only woman who was sent a salam from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Jibreel. Jibreel and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She was walking to the Rasulullah just before her death with some food. And then Jibreel mm-hmm. came in man form. This is in Hadith Sahih. He came in man form. And he said, Assalamu alaikum. And he, he, he said salam to her. And he asked her, how are you? And that time they were not doing well. Like, you know, they were being persecuted. It was hard. It was just, you know, after the boycott. And they've gone through so much, subhanAllah. And she said, bi khayr walhamdulillah. That's all she said. We are good, alhamdulillah. Mm-hmm. She bent it. It wasn't like a lip. You know, it wasn't like a, alhamdulillah. <laughs> you know, you say yeah. it from your heart and you just. So Jibreel went to the Rasul Sallallahu before he reached the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi before her. And he said to the Rasul, Ya Rasulullah, Khadija is coming toward you. Aqri'ha minni salam. Say salam to her. Say that Jibreel is saying salam, peace to you. Wa aqri'ha salam from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And tell her that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, Allah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is sending her the salam and giving her glad tidings and giving her bushra bi qasrin la sakhaba fihi wa la nasab her glad tidings her bushra her gift her reward i actually th- when you think about uh, like a, you know the reward in jannah you think about you know mansion with pearls and gold and for khadija radiyallahu anha this wasn't the description of the mansion and the house that she's going to be in in jannah the description was la sakhaba fihi wa la nasab it has no more exhaustion and no more noise. Mm. Mm. And if anything, this reflects that her life was full yeah. of exhaustion. You can tell that. And noise. You can tell that. Yeah. You it was just tell. chaotic. It was loud. It was heavy. So, oh, no, the, no. you know, when you, the incentive was no more of that. Hmm. Because of her patience, because of her faith, because of her connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger, وسلم, because of her journey, because of every good that she has done to the ummah at large, subhanAllah, radiallahu anha. Radiallahu anha, subhanAllah, sis. Jazakallah khairan. Again, another time, another talk that we need to go back over and take notes and really reflect on how we can actually learn from the example of Khadija radiallahu anha and, you know, inspire our daughters with this, uh, with this, um, this example, mashallah, sis. I am so grateful for the time. We are going to take a short intermission. Inshallah, people need to pray. We've been literally nonstop for the past few hours. Thank you so much. That was beautiful, mashallah. So so where can people find you? Instagram is the Facebook and Instagram. Um, I was away for a month. I'm taking a break, but alhamdulillah, I'm back now. So inshallah, we'll stay connected there. Alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. Okay, so that's Dalia Ayub, guys, on Instagram and Facebook. I believe you have halaqat and you have programs, etc. So guys, if you enjoyed today, follow the sister, find her, find out how she can help you, inshallah. And up next is Um Khalid talking about how to be a traditional wife. All right, guys. A <laughs> uh, couple of minutes break, inshallah. Jazakallah khairam. Jazakallah khairam. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah reward you. Loved every minute of it. Salam alaikum. Everybody. I mean, thank you so much. Jazakallah khairan. Well, All right, guys. It is uh, time for our next speaker. As you know, we are going hard. We're going straight through all the way to 10 p.m. Allahumma barik. May Allah make it easy. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. Please continue to, uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. If you haven't liked the video, then please do. Uh, and share the stream. Yeah, share the link to the stream. Share it on your socials. Uh, share it via WhatsApp, as I said. Put it in your status. Um, we'd love for more people to come on. That was amazing. I really learned a lot, uh, a lot of things that I did not know, mashallah. So Um Khaled is due to come in. So I'm going to turn my video off for a few minutes, guys. I need to pray. So just get up, stretch, get some water, get some tea, get some coffee. I think we need to have a little bit of a break. Okay, so my video is going to be off and sound off. 
while we, uh, I'm going to pray and then I'm going to let Um Khalid come in, inshallah. We've got a five minute break, inshallah.
Bismillah, assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome back. Let's see if we've got, um, inshallah. Uh, Umm Khalid, is that you as Daniel? If so, let me know and maybe change the name on the Zoom, inshallah. Uh, temperature check, everyone. How are we doing? My VIPs, how is everything? How is the day so far? How have the talks been so far? I'm super excited. We had loads of new people on the channel, people who haven't spoken before, mashallah. Um, and uh, that's, in fact, we had lots of people who haven't spoken on the channel before. Uh, so that's wonderful. Can you guys hear me? Just give me a yes in the chat if you can hear me, please. Um Khaled is just setting up, so she'll be joining us. Just give me a yes in the chat, guys, if you can hear me. Yay! All right, come on then, guys, give me some feedback. <laughs> what has stood out for you so far? Which has been your favorite talk? Which one did you enjoy? Which one did you feel was just for you? The talk on mindset with Coach Naila. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. That has been very beneficial. Yes, mindset is always, always beneficial. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Right. Okay. So what else, guys? Uh, there's seven of you here. So let's hear from everybody and let me know, guys, in YouTube, which one have you enjoyed so far? Yeah, the love story of Khadija and the Prophet Sallallahu That was beautiful, mashallah. Uh, very, very nice. Yeah, Tika says yes to. <laughs> and yeah, that's what we truly want, right? But, you know, this is the thing. It's like, that's what we want. We have to be prepared to be that woman you know that's the thing is that we 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 want the love story but are we prepared to be that woman that 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 attains the love of her husband in that way you know that attains the respect and appreciation of her husband in that way are we prepared to do the work to be that woman um that's that's the question we need to ask ourselves um alhamdulillah uh saying it's more than awesome uh sheikh dr salah and coach naila someone said they that those are their favorites and uh doc, yeah dr salah's session was 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 awesome mashallah i loved it um true but when the effort interest and understanding is one-sided it's difficult 100 percent 100 percent and you know the thing is that obviously men like women are not a monolith so they do appreciate different things and they want different things you know some men want a deeply connected you know passionate relationship that's what they want and others don't you know they're happy to be together you know respect each other and be cool but not necessarily dig deeper or grow or anything like that so yeah it's true when one person is striving it's hard yes it is hard but uh you know obviously choosing the hard is what we need to do um so let's see what's happening she says the link isn't working <laughs> um so it's uh, not working so let's see let's see what they're doing inshallah tech challenges today allahu akbar i'm so i'm so surprised by this normally we have just like very smooth sailing allahu akbar anyway qadar allah ma shafa'al may allah allow us to get the reward for persevering in spite of the challenges and even with regards to like email delivery email delivery has been really bad um this time round uh, compared to other times so um may allah make it easy uh, but anyway we were saying that um yeah i mean there are a lot of uh, coaches and therapists who will say that uh you know a marriage can be saved by one person and that it doesn't it does it's not necessary that both people be putting in the work for the marriage to be saved or for the marriage to actually be good um and they 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 teach about this i don't have a lot of knowledge on that so i can't really speak too much about it but i do know that there are many in fact majority that i know of will say it is possible to salvage a marriage with just one person who's doing the work uh, and that it's not always a case of the two of us have to put in the work so allahu alam 
Uh, my mom told me you have to be patient in learning how your spouse wants to be loved. Yes. And he has to be patient in teaching you 100 percent. Uh, and yes, we tend to think if they love me, they would know what I need. Not true. Oh my gosh. Especially not as women, because men always say the same thing that we're not mind readers. We don't know what you want. So you just have to be really upfront and tell them, you know, if you have a decent man that he is going to want to, you know, he's going to want to do things to, to, to make you happy. Right. Even though that's, that's quite a hard, <laughs> that's quite some, sometimes for some of us that can be quite a hard a hard task because maybe we ourselves don't even know what we want right in that moment right but if you do know then communicate it you know communicate it in the best way that's what you need to do so isn't that being taken advantage of if one tries to save if you save the marriage or if you manage to preserve the home why would you have been taken advantage of especially if you did it for the sake of Allah and not, you know, it's, it, it, I, I take it very, very, um, look, we got married. I feel I'm putting in more effort, but I know that the effort that I'm putting in is what is keeping this marriage together and is what is allowing my children to have a stable home and is, 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 is the backbone really of this family, right? I have a few choices. One, I can just say, you know what, if it's not going to be reciprocated, I'm not going to do it, right? I'm not doing it. Fine. You won't need to put in the work anymore, but then what is the outcome? What happens on the other side of that? Um, does it lead to the breakdown of the marriage? Does it mean that you get a divorce? In which case now you're single and looking for somebody else who you're hoping is going to be a better fit than the one you had before. Anyone who's out there who has single, has been married before, knows that it is not an easy feat. So there's that choice. Then you can make the choice of, you know, having the conversations trying your best to get your other person, the other person involved, getting family involved, etc. So there's, that's another route. Okay. And just not giving up with that. Another route is to say, I'm going to do all that I can, can uh, that I am doing now, but I'm going to make sure that my intention is for the sake of Allah so that I get the barakah from this. Um, and I don't feel like I've been taken advantage of, or I'm being taken the mick of because I'm not doing it for this person. I'm doing this for the sake of Allah, because this is a, this is a union and there's blessings in it there's barakah in it if there's no blessings in it if there's no barakah in it whatsoever on any level right uh you're being neglected you're not being provided for you're not being protected there's no physical intimacy you know he's 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 worthless he's this he's that he's all of these things then sis you need to make the decision to say you know this is this relationship is not worth salvaging right and there are some relationships that are not worth salvaging mentally draining is as a result of your thoughts and that is go back into the videos on this channel and talk you know and watch some of the videos about you know, emotional regulation and stuff like that that we have mashallah um mentally draining usually is because you're overthinking or you're focusing all your thoughts and or it's occupying a lot of your thoughts the fact that i'm doing i'm doing i'm doing you know and i'm not getting back i'm not getting back and that is probably what is causing the mental draining and the feeling of of being drained so something to think about inshallah all right let's go so uh are we in do we have um khaled in the chat um right Da -da -dum. the link isn't allowing me to join whoa okay there you're there <laughs> so you are there you've been there all this time okay alhamdulillah that's what i thought all right i'm gonna bring you to be a panelist now i didn't know that was you <laughs> alhamdulillah <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, um Khalid is in the building. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Apologies for the the steps and misstarts, guys. May Allah help us in every way. Alhamdulillah. May Allah accept us and forgive us our shortcomings. <laughs> right. Okay. So Um Khalid, I'm going to make sure that you are able to uh, put your video on. Inshallah, you should be able to. Yes, you can. So Bismillah. I'm waiting for you. Ah, there she is. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly, mashallah. How's it going, girly? Good, alhamdulillah. I'm so glad to be finally on. Um, sorry yes. for the 
technical issues, but alhamdulillah, we're, we're good now. Alhamdulillah, girl, we've been having them all day. <laughs> we've been having tech issues literally all day from the beginning oh. of the day. Walilah, alhamd. All right, oh, so we don't want to take any more of your time. Guys, uh, take the pics for the socials. I am, okay, because people need to come in and see this, inshallah. Uh, and uh, sis, you're going to be talking to us about how to be a traditional wife. Is that true? Yes, it is true. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. I love so, it. And we've been touching on this ever since yesterday. We yes. did a really great live yesterday about um, how, can successful, professional, successful women make good wives? And there was a lot of a lot of uh, interesting uh, conversation. So should I leave you to it, inshallah? Um, yes, inshallah. Uh, should I, am I speaking for um, 30 minutes or how, how long should I speak? And then is there a Q&A? Go to the hour. Go in. To go into the hour so 45 okay. minutes and we can if we can if there's q if there's questions i'll let you know so you know to kind of wrap up and make time for questions inshallah all right that sounds perfect okay. jazakumallah okay. Allah, sister naima for having me Fiki. bismillah uh-huh. recording now bismillah Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wahda. Wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiyya ba'da. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. I'm very, very happy and excited to be here to join this um, amazing conference and this really nice lineup of speakers. MashaAllah. Um, so today, inshallah, in this segment, we are talking about the beauty of being a traditional wife. And this is one of those things that Given the times that we live in, sometimes it, um, it's, a, it's a difficult topic to broach for some of us, given the conditioning, the cultural conditioning, the social messaging that we have received and we've been receiving for years and years and years. Some of us from the time we were little girls and the times we were young for both you know, men and women, boys and girls, but especially for us as women, because this is a topic, of course, that is addressing my fellow sisters and myself. So for us, from the time we were little girls, we've been uh, hearing certain messaging, we've been hearing certain things and being told certain things um, explicitly and implicitly, directly and indirectly. Um, And most of that, for most of us, has not involved being told that it is beautiful, that it is important, that it is worthwhile to be a wife, never mind a traditional wife. So let's delve into um, some of these ideas, inshallah, over the course of this hour. Um, And I want you to engage with me. I want you to put comments, you know, share your comments, put your questions in the, um, you know, in the chat, and we can have a discussion, inshallah. Um, this topic tends to be kind of sensitive for some people, for some women, and I understand why and I appreciate that. Um, just because of the, the backdrop that we have, there's a specific backdrop to this conversation. This conversation has, um, as I said, it's just the backdrop of the times that we live in, the feminist um, ideology that we're surrounded by, the gynocentric world that we are in. And so just the times that we're living in. So if you, you know, feel any sort of way, if you have any comments, just put that in the um, chat and we'll have, inshallah, a productive and interesting discussion. Okay, so for me, if somebody were to ask me, why is it good to be a traditional wife? Why is it beautiful? Is it beautiful to be a traditional wife? And if so, why? So I'm going to give you one reason And I'm going to substantiate that reason with five different uh, levels or five different kind of pieces of detail that inshallah are going to support my overall argument. So here we go. The reason that I'm going to give, it's an overall kind of general overarching reason, again, with five different points under it. Um, So the reason that I find traditional wifehood, traditional marriage, traditional uh, motherhood to be absolutely beautiful is that it gives you peace. It gives you peace, tranquility, and serenity as a woman. As a woman, you're not in a state of constantly feeling like you're at war. That's the whole thing. You're at peace. You're not at war. You're not at war with reality. You are not at war with your own nature. You're not constantly railing against men, men in general, the patriarchy, or men in your life, your father, your husband, your mother, your son, you're not constantly thinking that you're a victim that has been wronged and oppressed for centuries and millennia. 
you are not in a state where you are denying your own fitrah and ignoring or suppressing your own biology. You are not defying your creator. When you, when you don't, when you're not doing all of these things, and you're not in this state of constantly being at war, constantly clashing with yourself, with others, with life, with reality, then you are at peace. Why? Because you've accepted reality. You're not trying to ignore basic facts, again, of biology, of your own nature, of, of life, and you've accepted certain things. You've accepted reality and you've embraced the role that you are made for. And there's something very beautiful and very liberating and freeing in that in the truest sense, not in the freedom, the vacuous freedom that we hear about in the Western feminist sense, but truly genuinely freeing for a woman. Um, and then when you accept life as it is and you embrace what you've been given with a certain level of grace and a certain level of gratitude to Allah who made you. And then this basically uh, acceptance of reality is the opposite of what we see around us with many modern women who are fighting this traditional way of life, who look down on it, who dismiss it, which is they tend to live very often in a state of delusion, delusion, right? You don't, we don't want to live in delusion. We want to live in reality and accept and embrace reality. So, and this, when we do that, when we accept ourselves as women, and we see that as enough, as worthwhile, as significant, and as important, then this leads us to have deep feelings of contentment, which we call ridha, ridha, or qana'a, right? Qana'a, contentment or uh, satisfaction. Um, and we have these feelings of fulfillment, right? You feel deeply fulfilled on a very um, instinctive and deep level. It's not a superficial fulfillment that things like money can bring or a job or a degree, right? It's a deeper level of fulfillment than that on a kind of a fitra level, like the level of the heart, right? The heart and the mind. And you don't feel when you are, um, when your actions are congruent with your purpose, um, and your underlying, again, biology, underlying human nature, then you don't feel a sense of anxiety. There is no angst, that modern angst, right, that many of us feel, many of us go through. Um, there's no depression that is born of misaligned priorities or a disordered life where things are in disarray, right? You don't get any of that, or it's very rare, it's very difficult to have this kind of anxiety or depression. Um, because that those feelings usually stem from that modern way of life that modernity has pushed on us. It's a liberal understanding of life, which is you do you do, you know, do whatever you want. Don't have any, um, don't have any restrictions. You don't want any burdens like kids or a husband or marriage. Just do you and be free and all of these things. This very damaging um, indoctrination, this messaging that we receive. The, the, our anxiety as women often comes from that. And we can't usually place it. Usually we don't correctly put our finger on why we feel so anxious or we feel so tense or we feel so depressed about life. But it, you know, in the end, most of us find that it comes from this modernity, um, this modern way of life. And this is the modern condition. It's one of unrest, unease, anxiety, lack of peace, right? So my overall point um, is basically that being a traditional wife and um, existing and acting in a traditional way, in a traditional marriage with a traditional masculine man and living as a wife, living your roles fully um, and completely as a traditional wife and a traditional mother and a homemaker, those things will really bring you a sense of peace that cannot be found anywhere else. Um, so we, you have that peace, you have that sakina, we call that in Arabic sakina, right? And sakina is a really beautiful word and it comes from sakana, right? The verb sakana, which is to be still. It's a certain level of stillness. And I find that so beautiful. Basically, um, or even if you know anything about Arabic, like the vowel markings, right? We have fatha um, dhamma kasra, the, the a, e, u sounds that you put on Arabic letters when we write. And there's something called sukun. Sukun is the absence of movement. It's the absence of the fatha or the kasra or the dhamma. It's just a circle. And it, in it, what it signifies is a stillness, like a lack of a, e, u, there's no movement. The other things we call harakat, literally movements, these vowel markings. 
And sukun is a, an option where you take away all those vowel movements or those vowel uh, markings. And this is a special vowel marking that connotes stillness and a lack of motion. And this is related to the, the word, as you can hear, just the sound of it, right? Sakina comes from sukun, sakana. And so it's a, la it's a stillness. It's a certain peace, serenity, quiet, right? And I love that. So this is what you get. This is at least has been my experience and the experience of many, many women who are like me or traditional women, um, you know, traditional Muslim women in their traditional roles as wives and mothers and homemakers. So that is my overall point. This is for me, the beauty of being a traditional woman, a traditional wife. Now let's give examples. I'm gonna give you five different levels of why this happens, why we have peace when we are at peace with our roles and our uh, identity as Muslim women in a very traditional sense. The first reason that I'm gonna give is basically you are serving Allah. So this is the level of your creator. The first, uh, the first thing that we all wanna do as Muslim men and Muslim women is we want to serve our maker. We wanna serve and worship Allah in the best way possible, in the most pleasing manner, right? And Allah has given us specific things that um, you know, show us the way. Allah has guided us. Allah has given us guidance and has not left us to our own devices to just do whatever we want and kind of grope around in the dark blindly, right? We have very specific guidance. So what does Allah say when he, when he tells us about or when it comes to uh, being a, a woman, being a man, um, marriage, right? How the two genders should relate to one another, what they mean, what a man means to a woman, what a woman means to a man. Allah has given us guidance on that. So basically, Allah has created us as men and as women. Allah has created two kinds, right? Two different types of human nature. There's the male human nature and the female human nature. And what does Allah say about each one? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الْأُنثَى, right? An ayah I'm sure we've all heard many, many times. الْأُنثَى, the male is not like the female, right? And this is one of the most matter of fact statements that, you know, in the modern, you know, mumbo jumbo of gender neutral, this non-binary, that this ayah cuts through all of that, right? All of that nonsense. We can cut through that very directly and very bluntly with what I said, the male is simply not like the female. Those two are very different. And Allah tells us that clearly in the Quran, in um, Surah Ali Imran. Now, another uh, uh, set of ayat that I find incredibly beautiful is the very beginning, the first four ayat of Surah Al-Layl. Surah Al-Layl, what does Allah say? وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى إِنَّ سَعْيَكُمْ لَشَتَّى And the surah continues. But those first four ayat of the surah, um, the general meaning of the verses are by the night as it covers, as it covers or shrouds in darkness. And and by the day, by the daylight, as it uncovers or as it shines, right? The third ayah, uh, and by he who has created the male and the female. Uh, verily, definitely, certainly, your ways are divergent. Your ways or your paths are very different. And uh, when you look at the tafsir of the beginning of this surah, these four ayat, what the mufassirun tell us is something really profound. The difference between the male and the female is very similar to the difference between night and day. Allah starts off with a contrast, the contrast between the night and the day. And then he gives us another contrast, the male and the female. And then he follows it up with um, uh, your ways, your paths are very divergent. They're very different and that's okay. So subhanAllah, this is a description of life, but it also gives us an insight, like a glimpse into the nature of the divergence between the male and the female. They're like night and day, and that is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not an insult to anybody. It's not offensive to anybody. It simply is. It, as we said, this is just reality, and we have to accept reality instead of railing against it or fighting it, right, or being offended by it. So... Uh, and then another, the final uh, set of ayat I'm going to give you. There are many ayat, but I'll give you a third example. Basically, in the beginning of Surah Al-Fajr, 
Allah says, by the dawn, by the Fajr, Allah swears by the time of Fajr, uh, and by the 10 nights. And then here's the third area. This is the part we're going to focus on. And by the even and the odd. And now what scholars say, المفسرون, when you look at the tafsir of this area, what the mufassirun tell us is that um, the even and the odd has many meanings. But the main meaning that we come away with is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is singular, right? Allah is one, right? Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah, the singular, one. There's nothing like Allah. He is He is the only one who he's unique in all of his attributes and all of his you know, characteristics, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he draws a contrast here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says by the singular or by the even and the odd. Allah is odd because he's one. That's an odd number. The rest of creation has been created in pairs, the even. So we're created in twos, right? In pairs. And the, the Mufassirun will say something really beautiful. He'll, they'll say like, الشمس uh, qamar, the sun and the moon. Um, والأرض, the, the sky and the earth. Um, by the, um, the, the sea or the water or the oceans, the seas and land, right? So things like this. And then they'll say, وَالذَّكَرْ وَالْأُنْثَى The male and the female. So these pairs, these pairs that are opposite but complementary, right? These opposite but complementary pairs, like the sun and the moon, the earth and the sky, the sea and the land, the male and the female, right? And when you think of it in this way, you kind of think, okay, so the male and the female they're different in the same way that night and day is different. Sun and the moon is, are different. And the sun is not necessarily better or worse than the moon. The moon doesn't have to feel less than. The moon doesn't have to feel inferior to the sun. They just are different. They have different purposes, but they work together beautifully in really amazing harmony. But they are not the same, and that's okay. And uh, the earth and the sky are different. The earth doesn't have to feel inferior to the sky. The sky is not necessarily superior or oppressive, right, to the earth. They're just different. They're complementary pairs, and they work together beautifully, and that's okay. And things like this, right, the land and the sea. And then we come to, when you bring it back to men and women and male and female, it kind of solves some of that tension that sometimes we as women might feel. Right? Like, well, who does he think he is? And why do men think they're better? Men are not better than me. They're not. And there was never that tension. There was never that riddle that we have to solve. This is part of modernity that pits men and women against one another. And it makes us have this beef between, like, amongst ourselves, right? But there's really no beef. There's no beef between men and women. We don't need that. It doesn't have to be this way. In the same way that there doesn't have to be issues between these complementary opposites, these pairs that we're talking about, right? because everything has been created in pairs. And I find that very beautiful. When you bring it back to elements in nature and other creations of Allah, the sun and the moon, the earth and the sky, land and sea, male and female, there doesn't have to be a comparison or like a value judgment, right? An inferior and a superior. It's just two things that are different, but they're working together and they complement one another. And Allah has created that. So, um, and uh, oh, Allah, another quick ayah is uh, in Surah An-Naba, Allah says, وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَزْوَاجَةً, right? وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ أَزْوَاجَةً, we have created you in pairs. Also, azwaja comes, uh, or it's the same word for mates or spouses. But in general, it's a general word for pairs, that things that come in twos, as we said, uh, just like the ayah with the even and the odd. So these are all things just to get us thinking and to frame our um, kind of thinking about this topic that can sometimes have us feeling intense and and you know maybe indignant maybe a little bit angry so we don't have to have that basically the, the quran comes and it softens our stance a little bit it softens our heart especially when you think of it in a natural beautiful way with no assumptions and no biases and without that feminist baggage that some of us come with myself included i had i had to go through this myself and reading the quran was actually one of the keys that unlocked something in my brain that basically helped me get rid of this baggage, stop the comparison, stop comparing myself to men. There is no fight. There's no war. We don't have to be at war, you know? So anyway, so let's go back to this. So this is the first level. We are here to worship Allah. 
And we want to live our lives in line with what Allah has created. So Allah has created the system of having men and having women. And men are male, and they are very different from women who are female, and that is okay. And Allah has created, so each one has a different nature, masculinity versus femininity. And they're both important, but they are incredibly different. And this gets rid of the idea immediately, right off the bat, of androgyny, right? There's no room for this messy, kind of silly idea of androgyny. Um, I'm, I'm non-binary. I'm gender neutral. I am asexual. I am, you know, literally people say things like I'm asexual, like a plant, right? Um, SubhanAllah, we're Muslims. We have femininity and we have masculinity. And yes, of course, there's a spectrum. As Sister Naima was saying earlier, we're not a monolith. Not every woman is like, is the same. Women are not all identical. And that's okay. Men are also not identical. And that is okay. But in general, women in general have this quality of femininity. And men, by and large, have this quality of masculinity. And, and it's on a spectrum, but it is still very much the case that women tend to be feminine to varying degrees and men tend to be masculine. So we don't have this, um, again, this kind of amorphous, ambiguous idea of androgyny, oh, I'm neutral, I'm right in the middle. I'm neither feminine nor masculine. No, none of that. This is not how Allah created us. He created us with you know, masculinity and femininity by design. So basically, when you have that and you accept that, then you understand that Allah has created a specific system, a perfect comprehensive system for how men and women are to live with one another, how we are to relate and understand one another, um, and how we can build a stable relationship that basically is mutually beneficial for the man and the woman and brings joy to the man and to the woman. And this is Islamic marriage. And marriage in Islam is traditional marriage. It's basically the same idea, the same concept of marriage as has been held by all traditional societies, including non-Muslim societies, but traditional societies, which basically means patriarchal marriage, right? A traditional patriarchal marriage, which means the man is in charge. The husband is in charge. Um, and we can, you know, there's a lot of details here, but generally when we hear the word patriarchy, it's another dirty word in you know modern times and it's like oh you're trying to bring back the patriarchy are you trying to drag us back to the 1950s etc cetera, etc cetera, right patriarchy is another one of those much maligned terms and generally it just means that the man has a certain degree of authority because he's in charge not because he is superior or he can he gets to boss around everybody and act like a tyrant and a dictator or whatever right no it just means that Allah has given him a certain degree of responsibility above and beyond the responsibilities that Allah has given to the wife so whoever has more responsibility also it, it's it's fair to give that person more rights and a certain level of authority so they can enforce the rules because imagine if you have a lot of responsibility over somebody you are responsible to take care of them, to clothe them, to feed them, to shelter them. But you also have zero authority over them. You also have zero say over them. They, you can't control anything that they do. You, you're nobody, but yet you're responsible for them. And so if you, are, if you are in this position of a lot of heavy responsibility for another, then you also, it would stand to reason that you also would have more rights over that person. Because otherwise, it's not going to work. The whole system, the whole system is going to come crashing down. Everything will collapse without that person who has more responsibility having more rights. Because rights and responsibilities go together; they go hand in hand. Again, that's just a fact of life. And some uh, people who have basically have been uh, affected by feminism, they'll get mad at this thing, this this basic fact of life. And so we don't want to do that. So. Um, for feminists or this modern uh, time that we're living in, what people want to champion and endorse more than a patriarchal traditional marriage is this idea of egalitarianism. Oh, we, we have an egalitarian 50-50 marriage. My husband and I are the same. Again, this idea of androgyny, right? We're both, you know, I'm not masculine or feminine. My husband is not masculine or feminine. We're both just identical partners and we just do whatever we want. And I work and he works and I raise the kids and he raises the kids and I do laundry and he does laundry and I wash the dishes and he does the dishes and I sweep the floor, he sweeps the floor, right? 
So this is silly because this assumes a certain similarity between men and women that is in fact non-existent. It's not true. That's not how Allah created us. So to make, to force a woman to act just like a man is unfair to that woman. And to force a man to act just like a woman is unfair to that man. It's unfair because we are incredibly different. And so the things that we do that come naturally to us, that are easier for us by nature, will also be different. SubhanAllah. So um, we can talk a lot more about this, but I want to get to the, I have four other things that I want to get to. So as a traditional wife, you understand all of this and you accept it with a kind of a clear eyed um, dignity and, a, and, a, and just an acceptance of what reality is and an acceptance of who you are and how Allah created this system and where you fit in this really beautiful, perfect system. So you say, okay, so I'm female. Alhamdulillah, I am feminine. I have all these things that come naturally to me. And this is where I fit in the system of this beautiful Islamic marriage that is filled with harmony and wisdom. My husband has certain responsibilities and he has to answer to Allah for them. And I have certain other responsibilities that are different. And I will also answer to Allah for them. And so I work on my stuff, he works on his stuff. And the way Allah created us, we are both equipped with for like internally equipped by Allah for the optimal performance of our roles respectively. So my roles come more naturally to me and become a little bit easier for me because I'm a woman. And his roles come a little bit easier and more naturally to him because he's a man. So it works beautifully and then we, you know, life can can happen and the marriage keeps going. So basically you as a traditional wife are acting in accordance with Allah's system and fulfilling the role that he created you for, that you are perfect for, alhamdulillah. So it's not a struggle. And of course, that's not to say that it's all roses and sunshine every day and it's never hard. No, it can be difficult. It can be tiring, but for you and for your husband. And this is what the dunya is. We're not in Jannah, we're in the dunya. So there will be some difficulties that are just natural. And we accept that as Muslims, right? We don't live for the dunya or in the dunya as Darul Ibtila, right? This is the abode of Ibtila, of tests and trials. And we just want to do the best that we can in the place where Allah has placed us. So we can go to Jannah, inshallah. And then that is the abode of luxury, of no hardship, of perfect ease every day, right? So, well, basically, you are seeking the pleasure of Allah, your creator, as a wife and a mother and a homemaker. And the final thing I'll say about level one here, the level of pleasing Allah or um, seeking the pleasure of Allah in your role as a traditional wife, this also shows a certain level of tawakkul. Tawakkul ala Allah. Trust in Allah. You trust his system and you trust his, the perfect wisdom that with which he made that system. So that is the first level. And that gives you peace because you are in line with the way that Allah has created the system of marriage, femininity and masculinity, and you've accepted all of it and you're thankful and grateful to Allah and you're functioning perfectly within that system. So that's the first level. The second level is it, it brings you peace. Being a traditional wife brings you peace because it's you're in sync. You're acting in sync with your own fitrah. So this is a concept that I'm sure we've all heard before. The idea of fitrah. Fitrah is... Your, um, your natural disposition, your very instinctive, intuitive inclinations that Allah has embedded deep within you as a human being, not just as a woman, but as a human being, every human being has been born on the fitrah, right? And we have, a, you know, the fitrah is a larger idea that has to do with, um, we are all inclined towards tawheed, towards monotheism. We have an inclination towards God, the existence of God and the oneness of God, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah, so that is all part of the human fitrah. And then specifically, again, we said there's a female human nature and there's a male human nature. And so the female human nature, part of that, your fitrah as a woman is to do certain things and to play certain roles. Again, that Allah has designed for us, as we said. And so you yourself actually are happier embracing your femininity. So aside from the first level of serving Allah himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and seeking his pleasure, the second level is you're making your own self in, like genuinely happy. On a certain level, you are um, happy because there's no cognitive dissonance. You're acting perfectly in accordance with your fitrah and your nature. So you're not fighting yourself. You're not fighting your nature. You're not constantly, it's not like a battle to do what cognitive dissonance, basically where that comes from, is a feeling of unease and a feeling of tension because there's a, 
conflict between the things that you are saying and doing, like the way that you're acting or the way that you're living, and the way that you internally uh, feel and the way that you actually, like your, your instinct, right? So if there is, you're acting in a way that is in this direction and your instinct is telling you to go in this opposite direction, you are going to feel the pain of cognitive dissonance because you're acting one way, but you really want to go in a different way. And that kind of conflict is, is unbearable for human beings. It's unsustainable. So as a traditional wife, a traditional woman, you're basically going in the direction that you're meant to go in. So again, the cognitive dissonance is lifted and you don't feel that. Um, so basically you're, yeah, you're, you're, there's no, there's no conflict. There's no clash between your actions and then your deepest desires or your most, your most natural intuitions, which is the fitra. You are relieved of modern dictates that forfeit, that, that basically force you to forfeit your natural femininity, that kind of force you to pretend to be this pseudo masculine entity, this being that is very, um, like, more masculine than even men, right? Or you're disagreeable, you are aggressive, combative, argumentative, ruthless, no mercy, things like this, right? Which is how many women, sadly, are forced to be in the corporate world, like in certain environments, right? To get ahead, you have to be cutthroat. You have to be uh, more competitive than the men in order for you to make it as a woman in certain fields, right? To be a CEO, like a female CEO or a female... Um, you know, a female judge or a female, um, you know, president of a company or whatever it is, right? You have to almost outperform the men and you have to outman the men. You have to be more manly than they are so they can take you seriously. Otherwise, if you're soft and feminine, you're not going to be taken quite as seriously as the men that you're surrounded by. So you take on, you begin to take on a certain level of masculinity and, and you begin to harden yourself a little bit to match them. And again, that is a reversal of your fitra. That is a suppression of your true feelings and your true identity as a woman. And your femininity starts to get tamped down or um, kind of suppressed. And you do that because you feel like you have to because of the environment where you are. Um, and so being a traditional wife, it gets rid of all that. You're basically freed. You are freed. You are liberated. And you can, you're allowed to embrace your femininity, your natural state of being, your human nature. You are allowed to be as Allah has made you to be. And that feeling is really beautiful. You can be naturally feminine. You can be soft, nurturing, dignified, um, loving. You can be uh, empathetic, have empathy, sympathy for people. You can be nurturing and nourishing. And you can be peaceful and soft and sweet and all of those things, right? You don't have to be hard and you don't have to pretend to have no weaknesses and you, you don't have to pretend to be invulnerable. No, you're free to show your vulnerability naturally with your, the people that you love in the environment of your own home, your own family, your own loved ones. And there's something, again, beautiful and freeing and peaceful about that. Because basically, it's almost like you're wearing a mask at work. In, or in that corporate environment, or in that aggressive environment, you're, you're wearing this mask of like pseudo masculinity, right? And then you can take off that mask when you go home and you're allowed to be feminine. So there's something, again, beautiful about that. And you feel free, like genuinely free, not in that fake modern kind of freedom way. So you don't have to hide any parts of yourself to project a certain false image or a certain fake bravado that you're not really feeling, but you got to put on, you got to project that bravado, bravado for people to take you seriously, right? So your role as a woman lets you do all of these things, a, tr a traditional woman. And your role models for this, for how to be soft, how to be feminine, how to be beautiful, internally, I mean, externally beautiful, but also internally uh, beautiful and how to be kind and loving. And again, this very distinctly, specifically feminine way, your role models are, you know, none other than the best women of mankind. The best four women, who are they? There are four women who are the best women that Allah has ever created in this dunya, right? Can anybody, anybody name them? You guys know? I'm sure you guys are already know this. Yes, Khadija, radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the first one. And then Maryam, Maryam, uh, Umm Isa, radiallahu anha, Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, radiallahu anha, and then Fatima bint Muhammad, alayhi salatu wa sallam, radiallahu anha. Yes, so the four best women, they were all known, not as CEOs, 
not as business women, not as Harvard professors or Princeton professors. Um, they were known as wives first and foremost, and some of them as mothers. Um, uh, uh, Maryam is the only exception, obviously, who was not a, she was a mother, but she was not a wife, but that's part of the miracle. The miracle of uh, the birth of Isa, alayhi salam, and Allah has made this, he has made Isa and his mother Maryam an aya for all of mankind for all time, right? Um, so, but she was known and revered for her role as this amazing mother of this blessed, blessed son, one of the best human beings that Allah has created, Isa alayhi salam, right? In Khadija, known as a wife and a mother, the wife of the best man Allah has ever created, Rasulullah himself, alayhi salatu wasalam, and mother to six children. And she cooked and she cleaned and she raised his children and she, she was a traditional wife. And um, uh, Asiya, radiallahu anha, she was also the wife, but of a dictator, of a tyrant, of an unjust man who was out here saying things like, Ana rabbukum al right? I am your highest Lord. But she, she would have none of it, right? She was having none of that. And she understood that Allah was her Lord. Her husband, Fir'aun, was not God. And she was worshiping God himself. She was a monotheist. And she raised, she was the foster mother of who? One of the best men to ever walk this earth again. Uh, and this, this time, it's Musa, alayhi salam, right? One of the Rusul. And so she raised, a, uh, she was a believing woman who raised a beautiful, blessed, believing son who grew up to be a prophet, a messenger of Allah, Musa, alayhi salam. And of course, we have Fatima, radiallahu anha, bint al Rasul, the daughter, the youngest daughter of Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And she also was a wife and a mother, like very devoted, very dedicated, a very traditional woman. She, we have so many narrations where she was um, cooking and cleaning, grinding the wheat, um, making bread, um, taking care of chores at home, and running her household, and raising Al Hassan and Hussein. And her, she had four children, two daughters and two sons, mashallah. And her, she was the wife of one of the most righteous, most beautiful companions of the Prophet وسلم, Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, right? So again, wives and mothers, traditional wives, traditional mothers, traditional homemakers. This is part of our fitrah and these are our role models. So we don't have to go far to look for role models or women for us to emulate. These are the best women from the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, These are the four women that Allah has elevated uh, above the rest of the human women that Allah has created in this dunya. So it's re really beautiful. And these were the roles that they are known for, known for, that they are cherished for, that we all respect them for, mashallah. Okay, so we talked about the first level of worshiping Allah and seeking his pleasure through these roles. The second level of being in sync with your own fitrah, being in line with your own internal human nature and your femininity. And so that gives you a certain pleasure and a certain fulfillment and a certain sense of freedom to be yourself and to be who you really are. Now, the level that is next, the third level, is being a traditional wife brings you peace because it brings peace to the marriage, meaning your husband is happy. As a traditional wife, if, again, if he's a sound man of sound fitra and sound intellect and sound character, he's a normal, healthy man, he is going to be a traditional Muslim man who wants to be a traditional husband. And he wants you to be a traditional wife. He's hoping for a traditional feminine wife, right? That's what he is looking for. That's what he prizes more than anything. That's what he wants from his wife above all else. So he's going to be happy because he gets what he most wants and what he most needs. A feminine, soft, uh, agreeable, you know, uh, compassionate wife who is nurturing and supportive of him. And he basically, he will get from you certain things that he like critically needs that are vital to his um, performance of his role. And those things that he needs from you are his, your respect, your support, your nurturing, your validation of him, your emotional availability your loyalty and your love, right? These are things that he finds absolutely essential. And without those things from you, his wife, he suffers. He really suffers. He needs those things. Because I, th I think something that we overlook maybe as women is sometimes we think, well, men, 
do they even have feelings? <laughs> like those creatures that Allah created, I mean, God knows what they're thinking. God knows how they feel. Do they even feel anything? You know, because they sometimes they can be stoic and they're not as talkative as we are. They're not as communicative. We communicate. We talk. I talk a lot. You know, um, I talk a lot more than my husband. And so sometimes I think as women, we fall into this mindset of like, do men even feel anything, you know, but they do, they feel deeply, just as deeply as we do, but they don't talk about it as much as we do. And they don't feel everything in the same way that we feel, of course. Again, we have to respect their masculinity and respect our femininity, but they certainly do have feelings and they certainly have needs and they need us to fulfill certain roles and play certain roles in their lives as our husbands. And without us doing those things for them and with them, the men really suffer, even if they suffer in silence. But your husband really needs you to do certain things and to help him with certain things in your beautiful, soft, feminine way, right? So, um, and so the idea is he, he, he needs you to be trustworthy. He wants to trust you and to depend on you. And this is something that you also want from him. It's mutual, right? It's a two-way thing. The wife wants to be able to trust and depend on her husband and rely on him um, in a very specific way that we're all aware of, right? Financially, uh, physical protection for him to be the provider. So we depend on him for that. And it's actually one of those things where modernity will have you scared. It'll have you like not really trust him. Like those men, these men out here can't be trusted. These men, uh, he's going to be like a deadbeat husband, deadbeat dad. You better go out and work, make your own money, stand on your own two feet just in case, right? But so there's no trust. So this idea of feminism, modern liberal feminism, it eats away at that trust that we women have in our men. But also the man, he also wants to be able to trust you. And what uh, the irony or the sad part is, a, a, you know, a non-traditional kind of feminist liberal woman is usually not very like the man is afraid to trust her. Why? Because she can use the system against him. Again, we talk, we're talking about this feminist age that we're living in, the gynocentric system that we're embedded in, which you know can turn a wife like that. She can flip on a dime and take her husband to court, divorce him for all he's worth, take him to the cleaners, et cetera, et cetera, right? So he wants to be able to trust you. That's one of the most precious things to him in this day and age. He wants to be able to depend on you. And what people call this, a wife that is trustworthy and loyal to her husband, and she'll stick, she'll stick by him no matter what. One thing that people call this kind of in like the pop culture reference or like a, you know, modern reference that we hear is she's a ride or die chick, right? You as a wife are like a ride or die chick. You're with him. You're inshallah, like with him for the long haul. You're in it till the end. Inshallah, you're not, you're not fickle. You're not going to turn on him any second and say, ha. Huh, this is over. I'm out. You know, I'm taking the kids. I'm taking the money. No, yani, this is um, not the idea of Islamic marriage or a traditional marriage. It has, well, there's a longevity there and a mutual trust where you trust him and he trusts you and you're both loyal and you're both in it for the long term. And then what happens when you give him these things? What does he give you? You know, subhanAllah, I know there's different sessions that Sister Naima had that you guys have already um, heard and seen where different speakers, especially our brothers, the males, were talking about exactly this. But just to summarize, a man, a husband who gets this type of love, devotion, and respect from his wife, he will give her literally everything that he's capable of giving. He will lay down his life for her, very literally, because he is going to protect her you know, including to the point of sacrificing himself. Again, why do men do this? They're different from us. Allah has created them with this instinct, this protective instinct, this masculine protectiveness, where they are compelled to protect their women and their children and their families, in, you know, to the point where they might self-sacrifice. And they that's okay. This is how men are. This is how Allah designed them. And it's really beautiful. So this is a part of masculinity that is incredibly beautiful and powerful. So he'll give you that. He will protect you with his life. He'll give you everything he has to give. He will treat you with love and kindness and kind of cherish you and um, show you like how much he appreciates you. You know, when you show him how much you respect him and how much you're in it with him and how much you're basically, you're all the way, you're going to go all the way with him. And he will give you that back in spades. So subhanAllah, this is, it's really beautiful. Um, I've heard, uh, I was watching a YouTube video recently and it was something about like, something about this, the topic of masculine men and what men look for in, you know, 
uh, a wife, you know, especially in this day and age where it's hard to trust and it's hard to find someone who's compatible, etc., in this traditional way. And it was non-Muslims. But one of the comments that stood out at me uh, under the video, somebody, a man said, it was a, like a non-Muslim man. And he said, if I find a traditional feminine wife, I will give her everything. I'll lay my life down for her. And if she says, if she just cooks me a warm meal and just like is at home taking care of the home and the kids. And if she just like, will cook me a, you know, a warm meal for me to come home to after a long day at work, I will go outside and shoot the sun down for her. If she says that it's too hot, you know, as subhanAllah, this is hyperbole, but it really stuck with me. This is the sentiment of a man. This is the sentiment of a grateful husband who is grateful for his wife, for her being feminine, for her being traditional, for her being womanly and being in her role that Allah has created her for. And again, this is not just for us as Muslims, like it's just like just in our deen. No, this is human nature across the board. This is all traditional societies, Muslim, non-Muslim societies. This is Allah, how, this is how Allah created human beings and how he created men and women. Okay, so that is how your marriage basically becomes peaceful. You will become his peace, his serenity, his tranquility. He'll come home to you tired, exhausted from a long day of work, and you can kind of soothe his worries away. He can find comfort in you. This is what Allah tells us in the Quran. There's many, many ayat that point to this, but basically and for the sake of time, um, what Allah points to in the Quran very often to describe this sense of peace and comfort that the husband finds in a wife, Allah says, لِيَسْكُنَ إِلَيْهَا لِيَسْكُنَ إِلَيْهَا So he can dwell in serenity and tranquility and find comfort in her and with her, right? And again, it comes from the word sakina, remember? So I said, being a traditional wife, it gives you that sense of sakina. And part of that is this level number three, where you are your husband's sakina and you find sakina with him. You find comfort and tranquility and serenity with him. And you also give that to him too. So now the fourth level, the fourth different tier that we're talking about here of why being a traditional wife, a traditional mother gives you peace and it brings you this contentment. It's because you are functioning in your role. That is um, one of the most important roles that you have, which is raising children well. Your children are your biggest priority once you've had children. And of course, once you've taken care of your rights towards Allah, your rights towards yourself as, as a slave of Allah, and your rights towards your husband, then your children have one of the greatest set of rights um, on you or over you, right? You bring children into this world, mashallah, you become a mother. There's a lot that you have to do. There's a lot of different things that you have to give to those children, um, as of course Allah tells us. And of course, your children have, you have rights over your children, obedience and goodness, and they have to be dutiful to you, but you also have to raise them well. You have a big job uh, ahead of you. And when you, when you are a traditional mother, you are allowed the time and the space to be fully present, right? You are fully, you give your children the gift of your full presence, your full attention, your full intentionality, and your full love. And this is something that children absolutely need. They feel a certain level of security and warmth because you're present in the home, because you are there to raise them and not have you know, outsource basically the raising of your children to other people. Sometimes, very often, it's to strangers, right? Strangers at the daycare, the stranger who's uh, a nanny coming in to take care of your child while you leave to go to work or a babysitter or whoever, right? So children, they need the security of having a trusted adult, i.e. their mother or their father, but usually it will be the mother because the father is out working. Again, if we're talking about the traditional um, lifestyle, that's how it's going to be. And it gives them so many things. That's kind of we don't like this by itself. Raising of children can be its own separate topic that we can go on for hours about. But for now, we'll suffice it suffice to say that um, children Basically, they suffer a lot when the mo their mom is not there, uh, especially if she, the more she's absent, the more they suffer. And there's so many different ideas that we can talk about. One idea is orientation, which is um, Dr. Gabor Mate talks a lot about this. But the idea of orientation is it's a basic human need, basic human instinct that we all have at birth. When we're born, we need um, someone to orient us in the world. It's almost like if you were to travel and you were to go to a city, 
in a country where you have never been before, you don't speak the language, you can't read the street signs because you don't know the language, and you don't know a single soul in that city, you have no idea where you are, and you're disoriented, right? You know that feeling of being totally disoriented and like completely lost, and you look around, you don't recognize a thing, right? In that scenario, even as adults, you will need orientation. You want somebody to come and orient you, to show you the way, give you directions, tell you where to get food, tell you where to get something to drink, tell you where you can go to you know, uh, sleep or rest, where you can find shelter, things like this. This is how a baby feels much more intensely upon birth, upon entering this dunya. The baby needs a, an adult, a human being, to orient him or her when they enter this dunya. Otherwise, they're completely lost. A human baby is completely helpless and dependent totally on uh, the mother and the father to not only orient them in the world, but also for sheer survival, for food, for shelter, for care. Otherwise, the baby won't make it, right? This is how Allah designed the human being. Or unlike other animals who are born and they already are able to stand up or they're already able to walk, right? Human beings are not like that. We're totally helpless when we enter this dunya. So the role of the mother is so significant because you're giving your child from day one that orientation that they so desperately need on a very instinctive, basic level. Um, and then another thing called attachment. Of course, um, I think there was a session already done about this idea of attachment, how to create secure attachments. And there's a lot of different things with like um, different studies in psychology and different researchers who have looked into attachment theory. But basically, attachments are how we relate to other human beings in relationships that we're in. So, for example, in your marriage or in your friendships or even in your relationships with your siblings, some of the most chaotic, dysfunctional relationships that we have, platonic or marriage kind of romantic relationships, they, those uh, dysfunctional relationships, they come from us having unhealthy attachments. Or basically, we are unable to attach in a normal, healthy, sound way to the other person. So we either are too clingy and we suffocate the other person, or we're too distant and we push away the other person because we don't really know how to attach because we don't have a secure attachment system. And this comes from very, a very, very young age. This comes from very often, you guessed it, our childhood and how we were able to attach or how we were unable to attach to our mother. And that's the first, uh, basically the first relationship that precedes all other relationships, but it affects and it significantly impacts all other relationships. And it comes from the attachment between the mom and the baby. And mom and baby, they have a, a unique, amazing bond that Allah has created, and we have to respect that. And so again, as a traditional wife, a traditional mother, you are allowed to fully embrace your role and fully take on the responsibility of you know, um, producing that love and trust where your baby learns secure attachment with you. Your baby and your child, as he grows older, into a toddler, into a young child, into an older child, a teenager, and then an adult they can learn how to securely attach to people, how to trust, how to love. And then they can move on from that and be sound, upright, normal, healthy adults who can enter into functional relationships of their own. And it has to do with you. It goes back to mom, you know? Okay. And so in general, not only attachments and you're shaping the child's personality in this way, but you're also shaping their character and you're influencing their, um, how they communicate. And the biggest thing, the biggest piece, most important, is you are teaching them their deen. You are passing on to them Islam, teaching them how to pray, how to read the Quran, how to make wudu. Can you imagine the ajr? Can you imagine the, yani, subhanAllah, the level of reward that you get from Allah, inshallah? Again, if your niyyah is there, your niyyah is pure, it's for Allah's sake, you teach your child how to make wudu and pray. Every time that child makes wudu and prays, you get some of the edge without, of course, your child losing any edge, um, as we know from the hadith, right? The person who guides to or shows the khair, the good, is like the one who does it, right? So you showing them how to do khair, like pray, read Quran, anything, any act of worship, you are like the one who is doing it, which is when your child does it, you get the same edge. Right. So it's really beautiful. Um, and so in the end, your mission as a mother in this fourth level here, when it has to do with children, you are raising strong, morally upright, 
uh, believers, mu'minin, who have good physical, emotional, mental, psychological, and spiritual health. And there's something very beautiful in that. And there's basically nothing more worthwhile than that. And then the, the fifth and final level that we want to talk about is um, something much bigger than yourself, much greater than even you raising your generation of children, like the next generation of believers, which is so noble and so beautiful. But there's actually something more noble, more beautiful than that, which is when you think long term, thinking strategically well into the future about your progeny, about your descendants, about generation after generation after generation of your descendants and your lineage. Basically, the, the, the word for this in Arabic is dhurriya, dhurriya. Your dhurriya is your lineage, generation after generation after generation, like years and years from now. Your dhurriya is not just limited to your children, your biological ch children that you yourself give birth to. They're part of your dhurriya, but also their children, so your grandchildren are your dhurriya as well. And their children and their children's children, that, that is your dhurriya, your nesl, basically, your lineage. All the people who come from you. Right. So this is now we're thinking super far into the future and it's much um, higher and much more um, lofty than even just thinking about uh, not only yourself, but even your own family, your own nuclear family. Now we're getting a lot more um, comprehensive than that. We're zooming out. And when we zoom out and look at the big picture, the, there's we see that this is a pattern in Islam, and it's actually mentioned very, very often in the Quran. There is a focus, a very specific focus on future generations, on progeny and offspring, this idea of dhurriya, um, by all of the biggest prophets. And it's uh, so amazing to see. But basically, Ibrahim, alayhi salam, he was focused on his dhurriya. Dhurriya. When Allah in Surah Al-Baqarah, when Allah told Ibrahim alayhi salam, inni ja'iluka lin nasi imama. Allah tested Sayyidina Ibrahim, uh, Sayyidina Ibrahim passed all of the tests with flying colors. And Allah says, inni ja'iluka lin nasi imama. I am making you an imam for all people, for humanity. And Ibrahim, you know what the first thing that Ibrahim says? He says to Allah, wa min dhurriyati. And what about my descendants? What about generations of the offspring that I will have, not just my own children now, but my dhurriya, right? Again, this idea of generation after generation into the future. This is something that was a, law, a main, like looming concern that Ibrahim alayhi salam always had. And um, we see this also with Yaqub. Uh, when Yaqub also lay on his deathbed, he says, to, he gathered his sons around him and he said, مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِي Right? And the ayah continues. It's a longer ayah. But basically, when Yaqub السلام, lay dying on his deathbed, he asked his children, what will you worship after me? And he was basically wanting to make sure, he wanted reassurance that his children were going to stay on Islam and pass on Islam to the progeny, to the descendants and the future generations. And they said, they answered correctly, mashallah, the answer that we all hope to hear as parents, as Muslim parents raising Muslim children. They said, we will worship, we worship your Lord and the Lord of your fathers, Ibrahim wa Ismail wa Ishaq, ilahan wahidan wa nahnu lahum muslimun. Um, the, a single God, one, one singular God, ilah, and to him, we are Muslims. To him, we are in full submission. And this is what we want. This is what we are trying to do. This is our same mission as Muslim parents in our day and age today. SubhanAllah, it's the same as in the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam, wa Yaqub alayhi salam, wa Ishaq alayhi salam. And we see the same thing with uh, Zakaria alayhi salam. Zakaria, when he was getting older and older, he had no children, he had no dhurriya. He didn't want the line to end with him. His wife was barren. He says, And my wife is barren. She is infertile. She's unable to have children. And he says, he laments to Allah in this amazing, beautiful dua. He, he laments his old age, you know. He describes, you know, his state of old age and his, the state of his body. Now that he's, he's an old man, he says, my bones have grown weak and fragile and my hair has become white. And then he says, it's, This is really beautiful. Zakariyah, or alayhi salam, he tells Allah, I've become old, my wife is barren, but I beg you, Allah, I ask you for the gift 
of a child, an heir, who is going to inherit me and inherit from the people of Yaqub, the tribe of Yaqub. Why? Because he wanted to um, pass on Islam. He wanted Islam to move through the generations, passed as accurately and as clearly and as faithfully as he received it. And this is exactly our mission, right? So when you zoom out, you see this big picture, you see how important your role is, how worthwhile this whole endeavor is. You basically, you want to be able to stand before Allah on the day of judgment and truthfully say, you know, I have, um, I have accurately and faithfully and fully delivered the message to the best of my ability. I have passed on Islam to my children and my progeny, and I've done that for your sake, ya Allah. We don't want Islam to end with us. We want to pass the baton and kind of continue the legacy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his sahaba, everything they fought for, everything they died for, everything they died upon. We want to die upon the same thing, you know, and just carry on that same mission as Muslim parents, but specifically for us as Muslim mothers living in this day and age where everything is so crazy and subhanAllah modernity is, you know, telling us certain things and life is the way that it is and society is set up the way it is. Even despite all that and all those kind of realities and all those setbacks to traditional ways of thinking and the traditional mindset, we still want to do the same thing and we do it for the sake of Allah. And so that's what I'm going to leave you guys with. So I hope that that made sense. I tried to organize my, my kind of argument or my line of thinking in the most uh, hopefully organized, coherent way so that you guys can uh, you know, understand it and grasp it. So the idea is being a traditional wife and living this, basically in this traditional type of marriage as a wife and a mother and a homemaker and a woman at home who's queen of her own domain. This is so beautiful because it brings you this amazing level of inner peace, tranquility, and uh, sakina that is impossible to get from anywhere else because of these five levels that we talked about. So jazakumullahu khair and um, we can take any questions or uh, whatever you guys have. Uh, I love the way you said, oh, I hope it made sense <laughs> when you had, mashallah, like, you know, when you started, I was like, that's the Harvard grad right there. She's just like, I'm going to put this in order, mashallah. Says, I think the, um, some really great um, comments in the YouTube, mashallah, mainly because as we all know, you know, the whole idea of being a traditional wife is something that is almost a taboo topic now. Um, and it's definitely not something that is respected in general, in general society. Uh, and, and, you know, people don't want to do it, you know, mm -hmm. just, just don't want to do it. They'd rather be doing something else. Subhanallah. It's, it's, it's not um, glamorous. No, it's not cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's not glamorous. It's, it doesn't have, you know, the the the. It's not in Instagram worthy, as they say. <laughs> um, but khair, inshallah, we keep having these conversations. We keep, um, you know, talking to the adults, the parents, but hoping that that's going to trickle down to the children. So before I let you go, inshallah, and we we move forward with the program, I just have one question. If you could indulge us for a few minutes. Yes, absolutely. The younger generation coming up who did not grow up with the tarbiyah that maybe your children, for example, have grown up with, mm -hmm. especially the daughters. Mm -hmm. What do we tell them? Is there a conversation starter? Is there somewhere where the whole conversation needs to start? Because obviously these are girls and, you know, we were talking about this yesterday. Mm -hmm. The programming in terms of the feminist programming starts very young. People mm -hmm. think that it's a teenage thing. It's no, it's from the cartoons from when they're young. The whole, uh, everything in the society is basically built in from, you know, from, 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 from very young childhood. So we've got girls been through school. They're clever, educated, you know, they've got prospects and that kind of thing. And, you know, I had girls come to me from practicing families and they've uh, been to university. They are working, still living at home. Good girls, mashallah. But they did not understand why they should get married at all, let alone be what their mom is, which is a traditional wife. <laughs> right. So what's how do we start having that conversation? 
That's a, it's a very big question. It's a very important question. I think this is the question, actually, that we should be addressing because this is the, the dilemma of our times. How do we make it interesting again? How do we make it something that anybody would want to be, right? Any girl in her right mind is like, I would be, I would be caught dead, you know? I, I wouldn't be caught dead being a wife. Other than that. Housewife. <laughs> I would, even the words like homemaker or housewife, they're so like quaint and old school and old fashioned like right so all of what you're saying is true because it starts very very young we're indoctrinated before we can even realize what is happening to us and i've been there done that myself so i totally understand um i don't have the perfect answer but i would say that it like one way to go about this is to engage in the feelings of the woman that you're talking to the young girl or the young woman that you're addressing because Mm -hmm. I think sometimes what happens is we have learned to suppress our feelings. We have learned to suppress, and this is my whole point about suppressing femininity and having this projected image, we project outward, this bravado of masculinity. But what happens, what rea- in reality, what happens is we basically, we are turning ourselves as women, we are turning ourselves into subpar men, but not good men, not strong men, but because we're not men. So these sub And we don't want that anyway. We don't right. actually want to be that strong man who protects and provides and is responsible for everything. We don't want that part. It's not in our nature. It's not in our yeah. nature. We don't want it. We don't like it. But we are forced by circumstance, again, by all the indoctrination, all the messaging that goes in here. So we are forced to suppress our inner human nature, our inner female human nature, the femininity that we're basically overflowing with, but we're all, we're forced to just put a lid on it and, and like tamp down and pretend I did this for years. That's how I know I did this when I was, alhamdulillah, it didn't take me too, too long, but you know, throughout my high school years and most of my college years, I was just like, yeah, I'm a feminist. I don't need no man. I'm independent. I'm empowered, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to graduate college and I'm going to get my PhD and all of these things. Right. So But what I learned is it was exhausting. It's emotionally draining because my emotions internally are saying the opposite. They're telling me the opposite from what I'm Mm -hmm. saying with my mouth. And it's that cognitive dissonance will drive you crazy. So what I think we should do with our young sisters growing up, I think we should just say, look, I know what you've been told makes sense. We've learned to rationalize certain things. Well, I don't need a man because he can cheat on me or beat me up or be abusive. What if he's toxic masculine? What if he married a second wife? What if he, what if he's a deadbeat, right? So these are all fears and they're seeds of mistrust that have been kind of placed in the hearts and minds of women. But they are also, um, and, and you know, there's the risk in everything, but we've learned to hyper-focus on that risk and we've learned to rationalize things like, okay, therefore, just like rationally, if I don't want those things to happen to me, then I'm going to be on my own. I don't need no man. I'm not going to get married. I'm not going to have kids. I'm going to have my career and blah, blah, blah. I'm going to travel, go with my girlfriends. And they have this mental image of what their life is going to be like. But again, it's all rational. It's all like they're trying to rationalize certain things. So I would say one tack, one path that we can take is say, okay, I understand why you feel, why you think that and why you believe that because of everything you've been told and all your fears. But how do you feel? Like, how do you actually feel? I know part of it is you feel fear. I get that. I totally respect that. But aside from the fear, if we can peel back the layer of fear, how do you feel underneath? And the fitra will come out. I I hope, I suspect, and I genuinely hope that if the fitra is still there, if it hasn't been totally corrupted or completely warped, it will kind of bubble to the surface. It'll be allowed to breathe and finally make it to the surface and say, I want to be happy. I want to fall in love. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we're not allowed to say that because that denotes (laughs) weakness. You know, you want want a man? Oh my God. That's like, you're too weak and feeble to figure out life on your own. Gross. Mm. You know, (laughs) like, you know, that's how I used to think. Well, I used to think that, oh, marriage is for women who are too weak to figure out life on their own. And they're too stupid to like make it by themselves. So they need to like depend on a man and like cling to the arm of a man. No, thanks. That's really what I used to think. Like freshman year of college, that was me, you know? But it's not about being too stupid. It's not about being too weak to make it on your own. It's like, what will bring you happiness? 
You want to be alone? Is loneliness going to make you happy? Or is being with a man who loves you, a strong, masculine, you know, righteous man who loves you and showers you with love, gives you compliments, is romantic, it's, you know, this and that, having children, having a baby of your own, is that going to make you happy? Or being tough and strong is what's what's going yeah. to make you happy? Fighting your what way through life. Mm. Exactly. What does yeah, your heart truly of- want? And I think hopefully the conversation can kind of start moving along, but I would start it in this way as opposed to, well, why don't you think about this and the statistics? Because I think if you fight. So not the logic base. So not like a rational argument for not postponing marriage. You don't think that that's the way to go. Well, no, I think that also has its place, actually, that actually, I think I actually admire that a lot and I respect that. And I think that is very, very important because I think sometimes the other side of it is that we as women, we are emotional beings and we sometimes think too much with our feelings. In fact, that's one of the main problems is we are <laughs> over feeling and our feelings, my feelings, are everything, you know, like, oh, yes, yeah. yeah. don't even get me started on this. Like, feelings. you know, we like, can't do that today. Next time, <laughs> yeah. inshallah, yes. right. <laughs> we exactly. will do the dissection of that, inshallah. Right. But, um, but, I, but yes. I think to start like just to, to tr- it's almost like you just want to scratch the surface. Yes. And I think you can disarm a lot of people because they have, they have this armor, right? Like, no, no, I'm, I'm never going to be vulnerable i'm, I'm gonna keep yeah. myself safe by god whatever i have to yeah, do yeah yeah it's that's that's the the, the the armor isn't it right yeah. so you want to take off that armor very gently and very slowly and just say look i get it i get how you why you're thinking the way that you're thinking mm-hmm. but if we can put that aside for just a second just take off your armor this iron yeah. that you're wearing around yeah. your entire body and your head and your heart if you could just take it and put it take it off and put it aside for one second and just tell me about your true feelings and maybe yeah. that can bring what about really certain want? kinds of instinctive feelings and the intuitions that are natural to any woman and then I do think that once someone kind of is allowed to is given the space and the kind of permission to talk about that Mm -hmm. and get in touch kind of get back in touch with their roots and their femininity and say no I want to I want to experience love I would love to experience romance I want to be married happily married to a good man I want children you know then you can Mm -hmm. say okay okay and then there's also other things, the rational, logical stuff of, you know, we all have to die. Do you want to die alone? <laughs> These are the statistics. You know, <laughs> is your PhD going to be with you on your deathbed? Is it going mm. to carry the legacy, your legacy? Like, what are you working so hard for? What is what life about, about, right? What is life about? You know, uh, we have Coach F- uh, Fatima in uh, waiting in the wings. So, sis, I've just uh, yes. like, brought you yes. on as a panelist. But um, I wanted to share with you something that I said to, you know, some young girls that were speaking to me. And I said, you know what? You know, they're saying, look, I've got a great life. I've got my degree. I'm in a great field. You know, I'm, I'm making progress in that field. I live at home. So I've got tons of money. Um, I go out with my friends. I have a great life. Like, why would I want to get married and stop all of that? And I said to them that you need to think strategically as a young woman, right? You don't have forever for your peak years, especially when it comes to finding a mate and having babies, right? We know this, guys. We don't have to rehash that. Mm-hmm. You're now about 22, 23. You're like at the ideal time, okay, to find the kind of man that you're looking for and to have babies with ease, inshallah, right? As many as you want. Now, you could invest the next five to 10 years of your life in your career, But all that will happen is that by the end of that, you have gained uh, maybe more in your career, maybe more money, um, lots of memories, but nothing else. So you've traveled and you've done this and you've done that and you've got loads of memories, but you have nothing else. Beyond that, you haven't invested actually in your future. Whereas if you spend the next five to 10 years of your life securing a mate, building a family and having babies, you have actually invested in your future in a very real way. You will still have memories. They'll Mm -hmm. just be different memories. You may still work along the side and you can go back to your position. You can go back and you can retrain and you could go back into your field. But what you'll have at the end of that five, 10 year investment, career or family, incomparable. Mm Mm-hmm. I think they got they, it. They always say, you know, you're reminding me of the kind of, you know, everybody, we, we hear this sometimes and I agree with it. Like um, you are not irreplaceable at your job. In fact, yeah. you're quite replaceable. Mm-hmm. If you quit today or you're fired, they'll get rid of you like that and replace 100%. you with someone just like you yeah. uh, tomorrow. But yeah. you are irreplaceable at home. If yeah. 
you are not a mother, you are not a wife, we can't replace you. We can't just say, okay, bye, you're fired. We'll get another wife and another mother. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, it doesn't. Well, Ilal, alhamdulillah, until they start delivering wives and mothers on Amazon, I think we have uh, we have this position on lock, inshallah. Uh, um Khaled, jazakallah khairan, guys. Um Khaled is on Facebook only, right? Yes. yes. And uh, okay. Alessna Institute is where I have wife school. Um, Jazakumullah for mentioning that as well earlier. Um, but yes, wife school is, um, it's, if you go to alessna.org uh, or alessnainstitute.org, that's the institute that I have, I help my husband with. And it's just online. You can take courses on demand. And one of the courses that you might be interested in, if you're interested in this topic, is wife school. Basically, Put the daughters in wife school. <laughs> Enroll your daughters in the wife school. If you cannot teach her, let Umm Khaled teach her. Yes, yeah, we'll put the links to that, inshallah, in the description. Jazakallah khairan, sis. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. May Allah bless you with every khair. And inshallah, bi'idhnillah, Allah gives us tawfiq. Maybe end of next year. You and I can do our thing that we've been talking about, inshallah. I would ta'ala. love it. I would love it. Jazakumullah khair, Sister Naima. Thank you so much for having me. It's been my pleasure and honor to join. And Jazakumullah khair for everything. Jazakumullah khairan. Fantastic. Yay. Alhamdulillah. All right, guys. Cool. On we go. On we go. On we go. Coach Fatima, where are you, my dear? Let me bring you on, inshallah. Those of you who are on YouTube, if you're watching and you haven't subscribed, you know what you need to do. Subscribe to the channel, like the video and share the link. Coach Fatima is here. We had the pleasure of her husband's company in the morning and her co-wife's company in the morning. And now she's here, mashallah, talking about how to share your husband without losing your mind. So as soon as Coach Fatima's video is on, inshallah, we will start and <laughs> we will start the recording. But in the meantime, guys, I uh, would love to see your takeaways from Um Khalid's talk. And definitely do look out for Al Asna's course, Wife School. Um, very, very beneficial course, inshallah. And um, yeah, and also my podcast with Um Khalid about what, you know, what, on what is a woman. Very, very uh, interesting conversation there as well. And uh, yeah, put. Um, Put a, uh, not yes, put a defo in the chat if you'd like to see Um Khalid and I do a show together. We are thinking of doing a show where we react to um, videos, TikToks, um, articles, specifically on this issue of womanhood, femininity, feminism, etc. So put a defo in the chat if you guys would like to watch that. We have a lot of fun talking about this stuff. So I said to her, you know, why don't we do something together, inshallah, so uh, we can, you know, have these conversations within the community uh, and uh, bring some of this stuff to light, inshallah, some of the madness that is out there. Uh, VIPs are so quiet this year. I can't believe this. Where are you guys at? So is that a no from the VIPs? The VIPs are like, no, I do not like the sound of that. Not interested in that at all. <laughs> so alaikum, Coach Fatima. How are you? Uh -huh. There you are. There you are. <laughs> Apologies for the wait. Yes, yes, I'm here. Alhamdulillah. How are you, sis? Alhamdulillah. You uh, can I just say, and I think everybody will agree, your camera is the best camera in the family today. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, if, if it wasn't for my family, it probably would not be. <laughs> so, there you go. Oh, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. All right, let's let's do it, inshallah. Let's we're going to be talking about how to share your husband without losing your mind. So let me start the recording. Yes. Bismillah. And all of you guys buckle up and share this link. Oh, yes. not to complete. I, I don't want to share. I will be um, sharing my screen momentarily with everyone. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt. I'm going to attempt it, sis. <laughs> sis, let's say my... inshallah, because today has been one of those days when it comes to tech and this is the truth. Inshallah, I, I believe it. I believe it. So off we go. But before we do, we're going to take a, a deep breath. This is heavy. This is a heavy topic. We know that. I'm not going to act like it's not, um, but this is a safe space for us to talk to one another and for me to talk to you all and us to have this platform. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm glad to be here. And again, for those of you that might not know who I am, I'm, I'm Coach Fatima, one third of our stand in personal relationships. So yes, we're going to start right now. And I've been in polygyny 12 years with my awesome co-wife and our wonderful husband, Coach Nadir, my co-wife, Coach Nyla. So shout out to them and our family. So off we go. All right. 
We're going to share the screen now. So, okay, let's begin. Let's begin, let's see, let's see. Okay, now okay. we're gonna start. So how to share your husband without losing your mind is the topic. It is something that can happen. I'm not gonna act like it doesn't. However, however, placing things as Muslims in the proper perspective is always important. So what does that mean? If we talk about ownership and who owns or possesses the souls of another, who has the ability to control and possess another one's soul and have ownership of it, it's a law. He's the only one. He owns our spouses. He owns everything in his creation and beyond that. So when I was uh, asked to be on this platform, I said there are so many sisters that this is a difficult topic because change is scary. Change can be scary because we don't have control over change. So when we know that we don't have control over it, we get nervous. We don't understand what to do. We kind of like a deer in headlights. Our emotions can be all over the place because the perspective that we're presenting our own selves with can change. It can go through, oh, I feel great. This is going to happen. This should happen. Alhamdulillah, it's no problem. And then when you get to it, when you get down to polygyny and you're actually actively in it, your feelings might change or even your logic around it or surrounding it might change. I had to do something that was very important in my own life. And that was being very careful about what I said to myself about myself, about my spouse, about my co-wife, about our family, about polygyny. Because I said, well, polygyny, does it really have the power? Or was it sent down to hurt me? Was it sent to destroy me? Was it something that this word, did it have so much control over my behavior? And then I discovered it doesn't. I have control over my behavior and how I perceive my marriage and how I perceive polygyny, something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed. So sometimes the argument is not whether it's okay or not. It's how to be in control of ourselves when we feel like we're on that emotional roller coaster. And one of the major things, this was huge that I actually did in my own life was that I said, well, what is the timeline? What is the color of Allah for me and for not only me, but for my husband? So I said, okay, if my life was written already and I knew what was, we knew what was going to happen already in our lives, then why would I think I could erase certain aspect of someone else's life and go, well, no, I'm supposed to be here, but no one else. That's not how it works. So if I'm sitting in my own marriage and then my husband says, you know, he wants to practice polygyny or he does practice polygyny, then I go, okay, where, where does that leave me? What do I need to do? And what I learned that I needed to do was become closer with Allah in this, in this journey. And I said, well, Allah's constantly redirecting me my whole life. And especially as I became Muslim and I understood He's going to redirect me in many different ways. He might redirect me in a car crash that I had many, many years ago. And I said, "Ooh, I'm glad I'm more grateful for my life that I made it out of it because I hit my head pretty hard. And then marriage, that was a massive milestone because the family I came from didn't like religion. They didn't like polygyny, they didn't like Islam, they didn't want me to be a revert, none of that. So it was difficult. That was a trial. So I said, well, these people love me, they'll accept this. No, that's not how it happened. That's not how it worked. And I said, well, this is what Allah wants for me. This is what I want to be. I want to be Muslim. Well, why? This is oppressive. This is, you're going to have to cover your hair. You're going to have to cover your body. Why would you want this? So moving forward, having a child and experiencing that pain. You know, and I asked my grandmother, how bad is this going to be? She said, well, when you feel like you're going to die, that's when the baby will come. And I said, this is going to, this is going to be bad. <laughs> this is going to hurt really bad. And I felt very close to my end <laughs> as my very tiny 
oldest daughter was born, but it, it, it stretched me. I said I had to go through that pain and bring forth life to experience motherhood. So years down the line, when Coach Nadir decided he was going to practice polygyny, I said, I can't ex be accepting of, of all these things in my life. And then I get to this point, because I had to call myself into account for how I felt. I said, I can't accept all this stuff and all these people are supposed to be here. But at this point in his life, none of these people are supposed to be here. And that's not true. It just was merely, it was simply not true. And it wasn't from Islam. I said, this is on his timeline as the man in the family. He was going to have two wives, no matter what, in this moment. Now, the future, we don't know. And I love that quote, your future needs you, your past doesn't need you. That your, your past, although we don't ignore our pain, what we've been through, what we've overcome, but we just can't stay there. And I learned how much staying in the past and staying in pain from the past was detrimental to my present and my future. So that quote made a lot of sense. And I know that that Rasulullah Islam, he dealt with the hearts and the souls of his wives. And I said, well, if they went through so much as, as the people that he loved, who am I to think? that that's somehow going to pass me by, or I won't be stretched that way or tested through marriage, just as husbands are tested through marriage, because I'm a wife in Islam. I'm not a husband in Islam. So I don't know his world. I don't know the world of men until men share it, or I hear them talk about their worlds, like my grandfather, and my dad, or, and they were not Muslim, they were very far away from, from Islam. However, I could hear some of the stressors that they had as men, some of the pressures that they had, some of the fear, some of the things that made them happy, and then wanted to say, okay, I might be a questionable husband and, and, and father. However, I want to be this kind of person, but I'm just, I don't have the tools. But to know I have Islam and we have the tools and we have the sweetness of Islam, I had to start asking myself as an initial wife better questions about what was supposed to be, which was always supposed to be on the timeline of Coach Nadir, on my timeline. This was always going to be. This one comedian said, you think that you work within this world and you're sitting in the middle of this auditorium listening to me tell jokes to you. And he said, we're on a, a space rock that's just traveling so fast. He said, if you don't believe me, he said, zoom out because we're, we're in the middle of space and we're spinning, spinning, spinning. So his perspective was different than that of his audience. And he's not Muslim. And I said, so I need to broaden. I need to broaden what I was allowing to hold me back. I said, you need to think deeper 10 levels deep into what this really is. So the color of a law and timelines is important. So what I was speaking about earlier was the intersection of intersecting or the intersection of fate. We share intersecting time and space with our husbands, but this is from a law. So the timeline they have, the people, the children, the wives that they have, the things that happen to them in their lives, just as things happen to us in our lives, was written. It was going to pass. It's about how we're going to respond to the tests that we have, because we're all going to pass away. We're all going to die. We're all going to die. And placing it into the proper perspective matters. So I said, okay, Fatima, how much more time do you have to heal? How much more time do you have to learn? How much more time do you have to be accepting? How much more time do you have to forgive? How much more time do you have to become the best you that you can be in order that you, and I'm not there yet. I'm not saying I'm there yet. Inshallah, every day, every day I'm learning I'll forever be a student. But I said, how much more time do I have? And then I said, you don't know because you don't own time and you don't know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to take your soul, your husband, your co-wife, your children. You don't know. Because if we control the people, if they belong to us, then we could stop whatever they've done that we don't feel even slightly comfortable with. They belong to Allah. The people that we love and that love us back belong to Allah. My children, my, my extended family, they all do. They all do. 
and understanding the importance of that matters to not losing your mind or losing yourself to what your husband is doing that is halal for him. The questions we ask ourselves matter. So we don't get to, we don't get to dictate what Allah allows and we require him and Allah does not require us. I didn't realize how close I was gonna become to Allah after polygyny or during polygyny or once it was announced with early years of polygyny constantly making dua and I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for two things I asked Allah for knowledge and I asked him to understand it to be understanding to be understood and understand why this is occurring and I said this is what Allah wanted this was always going to happen I don't care if I was the best wife on planet earth. I don't care if I was um, 19, 20, whatever the case may be, it was happening at the, at the time it was to happen. And to be accepting and know that he knows what we know not. When I started to grasp what that really meant, instead of scratching the surface, I said, all of these people, all of this big old family is supposed to be here, period. So I didn't get to say, you know what? I'm not accepting of that. So for example, if, if, if people approach me and they have, oh, what do you do if your husband dies and there's two of you and one of you is the legal and the, one of you is the, the lawful wife or whatever, or the religious wife, or whatever, what do you do? What do you do? What are you gonna do? You've been here longer. I said, I do what Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells me I must do. So I'm not gonna be, on my soapbox and acting like, well, you know, he's gone now. So you run away, you get away and you don't get anything. That's not my job. That's not my job. It's never been my job. It will never be my job. Because I'm being intentional about knowing, okay, this is something that Allah put in the lives of many people, not just three, not just the OPR coaches, but more than that, our children, polygyny is happening to them as well. So that's important to understand that. So mastering of our mindset. This, this particular slide really keeps my head on straight when I feel as though I'm dealing in this dunya too much. Indeed, we will, we belong to Allah and indeed to him, we will return. Mm. I remember going through polygyny um, initially and I had to kind of get these, these little pet, pep talks from my grandmother who was not Muslim. And I asked her about some of the difficulties she had been through in life. And she said something to me and she was like, I buried my mother. I can do anything I set my mind to, heal, whatever. And she had such an extreme response or reaction to her mother's death that my grandmother was a nurse, so she worked in a hospital. And upon her mother's death, she was so distraught by her mother's death that they had to give her a sedative and put her to sleep because she went screaming. And I said, this, this is what I think about when I heard the title of this particular event where I'm speaking at this moment, losing one's mind and loving so deeply that when, when her mother passed away and my grandmother stayed in like this kind of haze and this worship kind of mode, burning candles and things of that nature for four years, for four years, I remember a dark home around the fall because she could not deal with that death. And she, although it was not sudden, her mother had a stroke and they knew she was gonna pass. They just didn't, again, know the hour. They didn't know the time, but she was not prepared because guess what? She had never experienced the death of her mother. And someone said to me, well, Fatima, isn't this, isn't polygyny for you like death? Isn't it like your husband died? And I said, no part of him died. He's full well alive. Alhamdulillah. Did it feel great initially? No, because I didn't feel like I had the tools, but I knew that I had du'a. And I've said it before. I didn't understand that 
I was like, oh, I'll make the offer for him. I'll make the offer for the situation, co-wife, children, all of these people, except for me. And then I started to make the offer for myself too. That I needed help, that I needed to cry, that I needed to call on a law because I couldn't and didn't have the tools at the time to, to be productive in it. Not right away, not right away. But I said, if I keep praying and if I keep asking a law to it give me understanding of polygyny, not my husband in polygyny necessarily, but polygyny as a subject, as a lifestyle, how can it be done in a way in which it would be uh, in a healthy way? Because we hear so many horror stories. So I didn't want to come from that space and, and stay there because it didn't feel good to stay there and hurt there. And one day I said, no, I'm not doing this. This is not healthy for our family. This is not healthy for us. I need to get in, in my life and be a solution within my life. And I had to move on from there. And I, again, it's still a work in progress. So submission, this is where I talk about submission. Muslim means to submit to the will of Allah and the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must come first before none other. And I said, well, how good have I been at doing that? How good have I been at showing up for the relationship I'm supposed to have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And I said, well, right now I give you a C minus because you're not taking advantage of what is before you and calling on Allah. You're not staying in that space enough and you're dealing in the dunya and dealing in your nafs and dealing in your pride and your desires and what you want and what you don't find comfortable for you. Someone said to me, I don't know how you say co-wife, Fatima. I said, if you think I said co-wife overnight, then you are sadly mistaken. She said, well, I just can't do it. It's been such and such years, it's been over a decade. I can't say co-wife. I said, well, the great thing is you don't have to say co-wife. If you all are not ready, you have names. You have beautiful names you can use. But I don't look at it as a bad word, but I remember a time I said where I felt kind of like you did. I wasn't ready to say that word yet because then it was a trigger. And then once I dealt with the fact that I needed to fully and 100% submit and accept this timeline of the color of Allah, then my healing, and then I felt better. And then I was able to communicate with my co-wife and get to know her outside of being Coach Nadir's other wife, you know, because we'll get dubbed yours initial wife, yours subsequent wife constantly for years. It was, oh, he, she's his second wife. Oh, that's his first wife. And it just, that just felt like our only attribute, although it wasn't that. So it felt good to sit down, have a conversation and get her perspective. And she was transparent, honest about it. And I felt better by saying, OK, I need to get in here and this needs to happen, because if she's willing and always has been willing, where do I show up at? Because, again, I don't own time, so I don't know how much time I have to foster a good relationship with her. That doesn't mean we have to be besties. I'm not saying that any co-wife has to talk to each other, but being cordial matters. It just does. Our children are watching us. And one of my daughters gave me such a wonderful reminder. And I didn't even realize I was doing this in all my hurt and all my pain. And she said, I like that you never said anything bad about her to us. Like as they were younger, they're, all my daughters are grownups now and two are married. And, but to have that conversation and I was like, oh, it felt good to hear my daughter say that. So moving on, to submit is to, to place the ones we love in the prop, proper perspective, right? So understanding that once I didn't allow people to say baby mama, side chick, ain't that his baby's mother, da, 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 things like that. I said, no, that's his other wife, actually. And you could sell them for a nickel because I said that's his other wife. That's not his baby's mother. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, is right. Oh, no. You made a mistake when you came on and into my space and said, baby mama, because see, Islam puts honor and we're pro morals. So I'm not going to diminish her by calling her something other than the title that Allah allowed her to have. So that's what I mean about dealing in 
this world and the people in this world, when they call you, and some are shaitan's foot soldiers. So they want you to say these things and they want you to get into this banter with them. See, I told you, she doesn't believe she's a wife either. See that? Because then we're giving them information that is inaccurate and it's not for, for us to give that and be under that belief system. Islam is clear about polygyny and there's no reference to side chick, baby, mama, you know, one night stand. She's just nobody. Girlfriend, girlfriend has been used. It's absolutely 100% disrespectful on so many fundamental levels. So when we engage in it and we don't submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and the qadr of, of, of what he has in store for us, we don't know who we're gonna need. We don't know who we're gonna need. I've had some very dark times and people say, you got a dark time, turn on the light. But I've had some times where I felt hurt or I felt sad and it's not something that happens often, but when it does, it does. And my co-wife was there. She was the one offering a hug. She was the one offering a conversation or some understanding or something like that. And our family does that for each other. However, in that specific moment, and the moment is private to us, so I won't go into details about that. In that specific moment, she was there. And I, years prior, would not have known that in that moment, guess who you're going to need? And it's been many moments like that on both ends, because that's what family and loved ones do. They're there for one another. So when people say, how's Coach Nadir's other family? And I had this asked to me recently, and I said, no, we're one big family. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, oh, okay. You guys are like, he does the thing and you guys are one big family. Did it happen overnight? No, it didn't. So we love to say it and we always mean it. Don't compare your year one with our year 12 because it was rocky. However, we didn't disrespect each other, Coach Nile and I. We didn't call each other names. We didn't treat each other a certain way. We didn't treat each other's children a certain way because we're Muslim and we're accountable. We're accountable. Regardless, we're still sisters in Islam. Even though we are still, we're married to the same man, but we have rights and we're still sisters in Islam. So Allah forbid it at this particular moment, because I don't know when Allah is going to take any one of us. And we don't know in this family who's going to go first at all. But just as an example, um, and that's another very important question. Well, what will happen if something happens to Coach Nyla? What will you and Coach Nyla do? We'll continue being family, inshallah. We'll continue on with our children and raising them, inshallah. Because it's not just about being married to the same man. It's about knowing what Allah put in front of us, all of us, and embracing what he said was going to be. And this is one of those things that was going to be. I had no idea. No one had any idea. You could look back and we go, you can't make it up. You can't make it up because it's already written. So no, we don't break apart because he's not, he's not the one like holding it together like that. We still are sisters. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. So there's some, there's some things that there's some areas, different areas to work on. And many of the areas to work on is that, again, putting things in the proper perspective, right? So when we look at the people in our lives, especially our husband, I said, is my mind, is, am I allowed to lose my mind over something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed him to do? Am I allowed it? And I had to ask myself that more than once. And then I said, well, is this supposed to be hurtful to me? Is this supposed to hurt me? Would Allah want me to hurt because of this? Or is he putting it in my life, polygyny, 
so that I can become a better person or as a test or as to help me get to Jenna. Maybe it's all these different things. And I'm so busy dealing in what I feel like I'm going through that I specifically couldn't see it. So I said, I have to put this in a proper perspective and ask myself and say some different things that made me not feel that way. So for example, I would say, instead of saying, my husband's got, gotten married again, he's not here. I can't believe he left me. I turned it into, he's supposed to be at the home he shares with his other wife. This is the day that he's supposed to be over there. Allah allows this for him. When I would do that and switch the question, then I felt better. Then I knew, I said, this is doable. And once I saw my husband pray so much, and he's always has, but when I saw it in this instance, he was doing so much more. And I said, his relationship, he's taking care of the relationship he has with Allah. And I said, and if he's taking care of the relationship that he has with the law, then this family is going to be okay because that's the most important relationship. He wasn't dealing in so much of the, what people thought and what would people say and what people be bothered by and all these different things, these external things. I said, he's working on that relationship. And I said, I need to be working on my relationship with the law. And I knew this. But to see the intensity in which he was doing it, I was like, mm, that's leadership. That's what husband, uh, being a really healthy husband looks like. His family will be fine because that, and that relationship with Allah was important to him. Now, is that like that with everyone? No, it's not. We don't know where anyone is in their journey. We don't, but it was difficult to sit there and go, well, what, you know, what do I do now? What do you do now? We do what we're supposed to do as Muslims. We submit, we ask Allah for help. And we get to this point, some people get to this point where these things that we know we should do sound cliche to us. That's because we're dealing in this world and we're not giving the proper respect that we're supposed to give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we're, we know what we're supposed to do when we're having hard times. When we're going through difficulty challenge. Are we making wudu? Are we making dua? Are we praying to hajjud? Are we asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during Ramadan to help us? Are we becoming closer to him when it's not Ramadan, when we're not going through a challenge? And understanding that one major thing, and I love repeating this because it is the truth. When men marry again, <laughs> When men marry again, they don't just dump all the love that they have for their wife or wives out of their heart because they marry again. They don't go, well, you, you know, you're trash. I'm dumping the love out. See ya. If he fears his Lord, his movements, his actions will dictate such. He'll move like that. He'll offer salat. He'll be a good mentor, a good leader. He'll guide his family. And it feels good and you'll feel it in your heart. You'll see. And I've said it before. I didn't fear polygyny because I didn't feel like my husband could handle it. I, fe I feared it because I said, well, shoot, I think he could kind of pull it off because I've seen him show up in such a way with that relationship with the law that I said and being consistent with it consistent with it for over, for almost 30 years. I was like, woo, mm -mm. I said, he cares very deeply about this. And I love that he trains and, and we'll have our event January 1st. Um, and I'm really, really excited about it. And it's crafting the new me for 2023. And we've been asked so many times, well, how do you do it? How do you make it work? It's really working in different areas, having goals, building a life for yourself outside of your husband's identity, having a life. Because in monogamy, I had a life, I did things. And then poly polygyny came and I went, yikes, what do I do now? No, what you do now is work on personal development, see your friends, see your relatives, play with your children, mother, you know, the same things, spend time with your husband, the same things I was doing before. 
but having more gratitude for those things, for those attributes that the goodness that people brought into my life, having so much gratitude that I said, well, Allah chose us for this, not just me. He chose us for this. And there must be a reasoning behind it. Even if I don't know what that is right now, there has to be some type of, there's his logic behind it. It's what he wants done. And to step out of my own way and my own pride and go, okay, this is what it is. He is where, my husband is where he's supposed to be. This is what he's supposed to be doing in his life right now for, well, of course, for the past 12 years, over 12 years. But I'm like, this is, maybe this is his test. And who am I to disturb, create, I mean, a massive disturbance within this test? Maybe if I learn a little bit more and study more and read more and understand and listen more, maybe I'll find benefit in it, inshallah, inshallah. So um, working on me, because you can't control anything else. It's not my job to raise him. It's my job to be the best Fatima that I can be, inshallah, and focus my energy there. And once someone says, this is what it was like for me, or these are the areas that I'm finding difficulty with, being accepting of that and understanding the magnitude of that, inshallah, inshallah. So taking care of the relationship with Allah, taking care of the relationship between yourself and your husband, knowing that you have your own personality. We're not the men, of course, and the men are not the women. We know this. And making sure that, as you know, staying in our own lane and working on those things. Once we work on so many things in our own lane, we have no time to like veer off in the oncoming or getting into someone else's lane. And understanding, we don't need to understand everything. We don't need to know everything. It is a mercy that we don't know all the stuff that goes on in the world of our husbands. He can handle that. And whatever concerns we have versus complaints, whatever concerns we have, we can let him know. And then have the hard conversation, be willing to have the conversation, getting the clarity, because with those difficult conversations, you might not like every answer, you might not be comfortable with everything. But knowing there's so much liberation in speaking to our husbands about what's going on with us behind the scenes and what we're going through or experiencing, they might be able to offer some type of solution, listening ear, a hug telling you he's making the offer you, praying together, offering salat together. It's probably one of the most beautifully intimate things you can do with your husband is offering salat together. Holding on to one another, giving some reassurance, some words of affirmation matter as well. Inshallah, inshallah. So that is what I have to pretty much say on that. Inshallah, Let's, let, me, let me just check something really quickly. Okay. That is pretty much what, and remember, make the offer yourself, make the offer your husband, that it not be such a difficult journey. It doesn't, polygyny is not impossible. It's not an impossibility. Is it easy? No, it's, but it's not an impossible feat and it's not sent to destroy who we are. Inshallah, we, we understand that as Muslims, that Allah does not seek to, to just destroy us and hand us polygyny and we feel destroyed by it to the point and to the brink um, of losing our senses, inshallah. So um, there she is. Jazakallah <laughs> khairan. Jazakallah oh, khairan, yeah. sis. Thank you so much. As always, it's wonderful to get your wise and grounded perspective mashallah um many people in youtube were saying you completely changed their perspective they've worked with you they've learned from you and uh alhamdulillah may allah bless the work that you're doing we already heaped duas on your family earlier today so <laughs> inshallah um listen i hope that the session goes great tomorrow can you just um maybe put in the chat the link that people can follow to find out okay. uh, more about the class tomorrow uh in no, is, it, oh, is it tomorrow yes it is it's, it's tomorrow, tomorrow isn't it yes tomorrow is okay. tomorrow okay inshallah May Allah inshallah. put all the barakah in it, inshallah. Jazakallah kullu khair. 
much appreciation for you guys and we'll see you next year inshallah at some point inshallah jazakallah khair sis barakallah fiki okay i'm gonna keep it moving guys thank you so much sis assalamu alaikum uh okay guys take a deep breath <laughs> take a deep breath get up shake all right get some water hydrate inshallah we continue with the program i told you it's non-stop today back to back to back to back until 10 p.m inshallah and our next speaker is um uh, mashallah an esteemed sheikh that we have alhamdulillah i've been blessed to work with um and um been able to do a lot of good programs with mashallah and he is none other than sheikh abdullah hakim quick again it is his first time on the channel so i'm very excited uh, i love that we're getting you know a real variety of speakers this year mashallah so um sheikh if you are happy to uh, put your video on then we will definitely hand over to you because you're going to be speaking to us on the importance of akhlaq in marriage assalamu alaikum ya sheikh wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Jazakallah kullu khair for making the time to be with us today. May Allah bless you and your family and give you long life and long health. I mean, can I leave you to it? Uh, yes, yes. I so will we'll, start recording. So we'll time, the, time, the time framework we're dealing with minutes and then 10 minutes question. Barakallah fiqh. Jazakallah khair. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa usalli wa usallam ala Sayyid al-Awwaleen wa al-Akhirin. Nabiyana Muhammadan. All praises are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. Peace and blessings be constantly showered upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad, the master of the first and the last, and upon his family, his companions, and all those who call to his way and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. As to what follows, my beloved brothers and sisters, to those who are viewing and listening, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, um, I want to congratulate uh, Sister Naima and the team uh, for putting together this series of talks, interactions. It's not an easy thing to do with the technology. And I pray that Allah would bless you for all your efforts and your team and all those who are involved in this very critical topic uh, of marriage and Islamic nikah. And I want to talk to you today not just from the mind, but from the heart. And that is because the issue of marriage is very intimate, very important to me uh, as an individual. And um, I want to be practical in this. I know that you've heard a lot of information, a lot of verses from the Quran, a lot of Islamic uh, <clears throat> texts and uh, positions. But I want to be as practical as I can uh, in this area and even leave the floor open uh, for a few comments and, and questions. Uh, coming from the practical side of this um, is not something I'm just saying lightly. Uh, I've been married, alhamdulillah, uh, for over 50 years. And that's to the same system, uh, my beloved wife, Sister Karima. 50 years, uh, we have nine children and eight of those children were actually have, have gone through the marriage process. There are five girls and four boys. Okay, there's one boy left who's, who didn't get married, but we've gone through this marriage process eight times. And unfortunately, even we've had the dilemma of a marriage and a divorce and then another marriage. So this has been an emotional roller coaster for us. And I want to just share a few concepts with you uh, that maybe you know, it can have an impact upon you and you wouldn't have to um, reinvent the wheel. Why did I choose character and black itself? Um, and the title of the importance of akhlaq or character in marriage. That is because character itself in Islam really is one of the most important issues. People tend to put a lot of emphasis on the clothes that we wear, on the family we come from, on the Arabic that we can recite, how many times we made umrah, 
what jamaat are we in? But the reality of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is that he has informed us in different traditions. And I'll read one from the Muatta of Imam Malik that people don't usually hear, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Husnul Akhlaq. Now you may have heard another riwayah, Inna ma But basically what this means is the Prophet Sallallahu is saying that uh, verily I have been sent to complete the best in character. So, so the essence of the message itself is character. It's not a political thing. It's not just a social thing. It's not an economic thing. But really, it is the character. And, and the character of an individual is something that is directly connected to the heart. And so the essence of the person is coming from the heart, which is like the conscience, and then through the character, which actually puts into practice what is in the heart. And the Prophet ﷺ was asked one time a very serious question. And the hadith goes, Su'ila Rasulullah an akthari ma nas al jannah faqala taqwallahu husnul khuluq wa su'ila an akthari ma yudkhil an nas al nar faqal al fam wal faraj. The Prophet ﷺ was asked, what is the main reason why people will enter paradise? And he said, taqwa Allah wa husnul khuluq. It is the consciousness of Allah and good character. He didn't say a long beard. He didn't say a full covering, tall hat. No. He said, taqwa Allah wa husnul khuluq. Then he was asked, what is the main reason why people will enter hellfire? And he said, the mouth and the private parts. So, so this hadith has got a lot of uh, ramifications in it, which some may come up as we go. But the point that I want to stress is the fact of the character itself. And connecting character to marriage is so important today because I would say to a certain extent that the, the, the institution of marriage is, is really in, endangered, like, you know, the endangered species. So this institution in the Western countries in particular is, which is under an attack. And you could say it's a crisis. And what is happening is that the process of marriage, the institution of marriage is being torn apart. And so to a certain extent in the Western countries, we have to sort of reconstruct uh, marriage itself or the process of marriage in a way uh, that we can survive in this onslaught of anti-marriage uh, type of politics. In the classical Muslim societies, we had our families, we had villages, we had um, natural interaction. We even had expectations that were developed by the culture itself. So if you came from a certain village or a certain city or a certain area, you generally followed a certain pattern. You generally had a certain trade. You, you generally had certain um, intentions or aspirations. We're in a totally different situation. In the Western countries, we've been thrown out of the Muslim world into a melting pot. And this melting pot is actually in a confusion itself as, as to what it's supposed to cook. So we're inside of this confused melting pot. And um, the whole issue of marriage is going out the window. The roles of male and female are being blurred. And immorality is becoming like a norm. It's a normal thing. Being a moral person, having haya, having modesty, is becoming strange uh, in some parts of the Western world. So the issue of Islamic nikah is something that we need to solidify in our mind. And, and try to be as practical as possible and see how character in, interacts with this. I, I want to emphasize, and again, we're talking about secrets here. And this is after years of marriage and, and, and looking at my daughters and sons. And I also opened up a social service agency and ran it for over 12 years in Canada, and then went to um, South Africa. And I've done hundreds of counseling sessions 
hundreds, literally, and most of them are dealing with families. And so the issue of marriage, the, the process, we have to realize it's not just a ceremony. When some people think of nikah, they think of the ceremony, they think of the big party, the, the walima, and the reputation, the name, pleasing the family. No. It is something totally different. Because what we are talking about is finding a suitable companion to live with you in an Islamic lifestyle, hopefully, inshallah, for the rest of your life. And that could actually be extended to paradise. So we're talking about long-term relationships. Even though, again, the world that we're living in, short-term. Everything is short-term. And the reason why we see our internet, Facebook, you know, Instagram, TikTok, this, that, it's getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And so marriage is also falling to this plague of shortness. And so to, to actually have an Islamic nikah, to go through the process, it, it, it's important. And I want to just slightly review this, you know, in light of the issue of character itself. And again, when we talk about character, we're talking about a person's ethics, their behavior, the interpersonal relationships. This is the crucial point that we're actually talking about when we talk about character. And, and, and so, um, um, you know, that behavior, that, that pattern, this is the actual essence of the message of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And the, 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 the process of nikah itself. And again, I've gone through this process over and over again. And again, secrets without going through all the trappings and whatnot, there's, there's a special area which is called kafa'a, and that is suitability. And, 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 and suitability is so important when we're dealing with the marriage. Because again, what we're talking about is finding a suitable mate, a suitable companion to live with in an Islamic relationship hopefully for the rest of your life. So there's a whole process that's involved in this. And, and, and the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was reported to have said, and it's been mentioned by other speakers, that a woman is married for four things, her wealth, her family status, her beauty, and her religion. So you should marry according to the religion, otherwise you'll be a loser. And, and this, um, these four areas can actually be applied to males, uh, as well. And, and to deal with the character, you know, because sometimes people think, well, the whole thing is on the women. And no, it's on both sides. Because the Prophet Sallallahu has said, if you find a boy whose character, whose akhlaq, right, his ethics, his manners, is good, and who follows the faith properly, give your daughter in marriage to him. If matches are made without considering the aspects of akhlaq, and faith, it will cause mischief and disturbance in the societies. So this is dealing with the male too. So this area is, is, is Bab al kafani This is suitability. And I literally went through this and, and, and used this as a template for who you want to marry, whether you're male or whether you're female. Part of it is to do with the wealth. And we'll follow the chronology, you know, of the, the hadith itself. Well, when dealing with the male, naturally, that has something to do with, can he provide and protect? Because the man is supposed to be kawam. He's supposed to be providing and protecting his wife. Of course, the situation that we're living in today uh, di dictates the fact that in many cases, both sides have to work. But the chief responsibility is on the man. Now, where is the secret in this? The secret is that it doesn't mean that he has to have a, a, a large amount of wealth. And, and, and brothers who want to get married, don't think that you have to have everything, the house, the car, you know, money in the bank, everything before you even think about marriage. No. Imam Shafi said, you know, it's enough to actually have uh, a place to stay for the night and, and the food to eat. 
that's really enough if you really depend upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in our case, especially in the Western world, when we are looking at, and I'm looking now as a wali, as a father, looking at a prospective young man, it's not just the amount of money, but it's his attitude, it's his character. What is his ethics? What is his manners? How, what is his body language? He may not have a lot of money, but he has good intentions. He has skills. He, he, he has the drive to provide and protect. And something like that, we can work with. And, and I've seen cases where, you know, the, the, the young man and the young woman, they want to get married. They don't have uh, exactly enough. So the families or one of the family then helps them, give them a place in the basement, help them in the beginning because they're suitable. You know, once that suitability, once you feel some confidence there, don't let the wealth hold you up. However, the wealth is important. And if the brother comes and he talks about, well, um, I'm going to do to Hajj and prayer. I don't have a job. I don't have direction. I don't have skills. But I got my turban. You know, I have my my, my, my dough. And I'll make to Hajj as though the food will come flying through the window. No. This is where the wali has to step in and make sure that either he has something going or he has the right potentiality. The second point is the nest. And this has something to do with genealogy. It's not just status in that sense. It's really the genealogy. Where do you come from? Like, what is your background? And that is important. We are living in a melting pot. So therefore, um, people's background is not as critical as it was when we were living in Asia, Africa, in the Arab world, you know, where your personality is really defined by your village and by your people and whatnot. Uh, but your nesib, it does have some sort of importance. And I'm, I want to look at this in a practical way. Now, when you look at the character, how does this interplay with Nessa? Because the genealogy you have, the family you have, will have an impact upon who you are. For instance, if a person comes from a mountain area, the person's from Afghanistan or from Chechnya, from Dagestan, and they are mountainous type people, to live in that mountain, or to live in a desert, a nomad, you got to be strong. And, and so the people's personality tends to be um, a little rough because conditions are really cold in the winter. You know, you feel a lot of pain in your life, um, you may have some violence. And so the personality tends to be rough. And it's not a negative thing, but, but it's sort of a rough way of going about things. Okay? That's just a character. Whereas in another case, you, you will have a, a situation of a person who comes from Malaysia. And, and people who come from Malaysia and tropical areas in general, and I'm not stereotyping, tend to be more easygoing because the climate is the same all year round. Fruits are there. Rain is there. So, so the people tend to be a little bit laid back um, and a little bit softer in how they go about doing things. So if a person who comes from a mountainous area wants to marry somebody who comes from the tropics, from the nice seashore, you have to check them out. Because the rough way that he has, or the rough way that she has, because maybe it, it's a mountain woman and not a mountain man who wants to marry a Malaysian uh, young man who comes from that easygoing nature. Are they going to be able to overcome it? It's definitely possible especially if they've lived in a Western country and they've picked up the, the, the general body language of the society itself. But that's something that has to be worked out. And, 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 and the more that we can understand about the character, and, and I'm saying this in, you know, in a practical sense, that when somebody wants to you know, get married, we're dealing with this first process, you know, it, it's not just a matter of what he says about himself but it's actually what he does. What is his track record? And, and, and what I like to do and I advise people, you know, is that 
you need to talk to somebody else who has lived with that person and not just get it from the person's mouth themselves, but you talk to somebody who's done business with them, who has uh, lived with them, right? Somebody who knows their inner character. So this is really important because then you'll, you'll see from a third party that doesn't have any interest in the marriage itself. And, and, and that person should be able to give you an objective understanding. If they give you some warning signals, then deal with those warning signals. If they give you an okay, then that's a plus. And so this is really important. And the wali then needs to set up some sort of way to come together. And, and, and this is an issue again where character comes in because you can't just theoretically know about a person's character. I was counseling on, on, on one case and the sister came you know, and said that um, I want to marry this brother you know, he, he's from, I'll just say it, but he, he's from the Arab world. He speaks Arabic so beautifully and he knows the hadith, you know, minister Tommy, you know, whoever, you know, has the ability to marry, but they must get married. So it's soon that get married immediately. And so, you know, he wants to get married. He's a handsome brother. He has nice brown curly hair uh, and nice eyes. I want to marry him. I said, sister, do you know his family? Do you know his character? Do you know somebody who's lived with him? She said, no, but he, you know, he, he knows the hadith. You know, he, he, he was such a good brother. And, and he wants to get married this weekend. He wants to go to Niagara Falls and finish. Because, you know, Niagara Falls is where many people go, you know, for their honeymoon. He wants to go to Niagara Falls. I said, sister, follow kafa, Follow the suitability. The Prophet ﷺ said, al-ajala. That haste is from the devil. So don't be hasty in this. And check the person out. She didn't do it. And unfortunately, he turned out to be the opposite. I won't go into the details, but it turned out to be a, a, a train wreck. It was a very difficult situation. There was another case where the sister wanted to get married. She was a new Muslim. And, and, and the brother was, you know, from a Muslim country. I won't say which one it is. And she liked him. You know, he said the right things. And I said, okay, bring him to my office. And we sat together and I talked in general, you know, to the person. I knew the person's country. I had been in this country before and I know sort of the personalities. And so we began to talk. So I just threw out the question. I said, you know, if you have a difference of opinion on things, uh, how, how are you going to solve that problem? And, you know, he said, well, um, well, I, I'm the man and I will make the decision. Uh, it's important. And she said, well, you know, in, in Canada here, you know, women uh, are very strong. And, you know, I will give my opinion and, um, you know, we will function together, you know, as a jama'a, you know, because it's important for, you know, the sisters, you know, woman's voice to be heard in marriage, you know, because we're, we're together. His face was getting red. He was getting angry. He was about to blow up. Now, for the first time, she was able to look at him from the outside. It wasn't just him with his dashing personality and his, and his nice words. Now she's looking at him. He's looking at me. He's angry at me. He, he, he's blowing up. Now she realized his character. There's something. He's not able to deal with conflict in a, a balanced, soft way as a Muslim supposed to do a Muslim male in the marriage itself. You see? So this is important. And, and this is how the, the character, the akhlaq, it does mesh with this part of suitability. The other is beauty. And of course, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. But beauty is an important thing. And, 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 and this is something, I'll, I'll leave this one open to the individuals, um, because I wonder that with the melting pots, some of our standards, you know, are changing. We're realizing that the real beauty of a person is not necessarily on the outside, but it's the inside. See where the character is? That's the real beauty of the person. But the outside is important. And, and people tend to want to marry somebody who sort of looks like that. Uh, there are very few who can actually continue to deal with opposites. 
in race, opposites in skin color. I'm just being realistic. Okay, so beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, but the real beauty that is on the inside. The fourth part is the dean. And the dean, of course, that is uh, the religion, that is the practical way of life. And when we say dean, we're not talking about religion in a Western sense. We're talking about a way of life. And so this, again, is where the character meshes right in with the dean, because the Prophet them said that he has been sent basically to bring out the best in character. So, so that is the crucial thing. What is the ethics? What is the morals? How does that person deal? What is his behavior? What is her behavior in certain circumstances? This is why it is important for them to spend some time together. I know that we, we came from uh, cultures that have arranged marriages and within that context, it might be uh, possible or within the Western context now and now even the Eastern to a certain extent, they have to sort of get to know each other, not completely, but at least have time together. This is where we need to be inventive. And this is where the Walis, especially those who are coming from uh, uh, Muslim environments, they have to lighten up, they have to ease some of their cultural uh, ways, their cultural traditions, and realize that there are more important issues. Some cultures, when they look at these four areas, the most important is the money and the family. You see, so, so, so they're putting the deen on the bottom instead of putting the deen on the top. But the Prophet Sallallahu said, if you marry according to the deen, then you will be successful. If you don't, then you can be a loser. So the deen is, it, it is crucial. And this is where the family needs to try to be uh, inventive. I, in, in, in one case, <clears throat> I'll be personal, <clears throat> wanting to marry my daughter. <clears throat> we were in South Africa at the time. And the person is coming from out of the Muslim world. And, and so we had to check the brother out. So not only did he come to me and to talk, but he needed to bring his friends. So I could understand his friends and, and what they were saying. And then to try to contact somebody who knew him, not just a friend, but someone who did business with him, somebody who had some kind of relationship, to know more about his behavioral path, to know more about you know, how he deals with his, his ethics, his morality. This is the character. Because this is really the issue, I believe, that, that, that is going to be crucial in the long term. How can our relationship stay for a long period of time? It is that suitability that the two now with each other. And the more suitability you have, you know, the more issues that you have, which are uh, comparable, you know, your, your intentions um, are, are sort of the same in terms of your practice of Islam. So, so this is really crucial because the essence of the marriage, you, we have to realize what the nikah is in Islam. You know, and Allah tells us in, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 187, in part of this chapter, Allah is telling us, Unna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahun. They are a clothing for you, O oh men, and they are a clothing for you, women. What is libas? And this is a very interesting term that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used in order to get this across to us. Because your clothing describes you. Your clothing protects you. Think about your clothing. And we think about it now, especially now we're going in sub-zero temperatures, you know, here in Canada and in America. Your clothing keeps you comfortable. Your, your clothing hides you, it protects you. All of these aspects are so important. Think about how character comes into the best. Because the, the, the protection 
it, it is that it is the morality, you know, it is the, it is the behavior of that person that we feel comfortable with each other. We protect each other, even if we we, we disagree on certain points. Then, then we will agree to disagree, and that's something that's not easy for, for you know for people in many of the relationships. It's not easy to agree to disagree. But how can you have a disagreement in a marriage, in a relationship, and you don't allow that disagreement to break you up or the shaitan when Iyadu Bilah comes in and then uses it to destroy the relationship? How can that be possible? This is when the character is there. This is when the person has the taqwa. Remember the two things, taqwa Allah and husnul khuluq. Main reason why people will enter paradise. So the consciousness of Allah is there. And the character is actually bringing it up. And so we feel comfortable around each other. We, we protect each other. We have a relationship, not just a, a relationship on paper, but we have a relationship. And so these are the crucial things in finding the marriage itself and, and setting up and going through it. And, and this will take us right through the process itself and into the marriage. And, and this is where, and again, what, what are some of the secrets? I think, you know, the secrets and, you know, some of the advices may be more important for some of us and all the verses and all the different hadiths. But to be honest with you, one of the most important qualities, I believe, between the husband and the wife is friendship. That might sound like a simple thing, but you know, your friend is somebody you can be walking along the beach, you can be walking outside. You don't even know exactly where you're going. You're just on a hike. And because you're close, because you're friends, because you're comfortable with each other, you can talk about things. You can look at the, the trees, the birds, because you're comfortable, you're, you're friends. You're not struggling against each other, like they say in the West, you know, men are from one planet, women from another. No, it's not a bad thing. It, it, it's because there, there's a love, there, there is a true relationship, and there is compatibility. So you're compatible with each other. And, and you'll tell right away when you meet that person, and, and, and we say, uh, yes, uh, not only you know have a meeting um, in a special area, what we would do, we would open up our house and the, the family is able to leave the sitting room and they can sit inside here and they can talk and they can interact. And then, you know, food is served and whatnot. And then we get uh, one of our family members or somebody else known to be a third party and they will go out together. And this is not a date, like a Western date. They will go out to a lecture. They will go out to a restaurant. And there's a third party with them. And even maybe there's a couple that's with them. So, so the two couples are together. And as they're walking along the corniche, you know, they, they, you know the, the, the two who are ready to get married, um, they get a little distance and they can walk with each other um, within sight of the other ones. And they can function with each other. And this is important because I've seen cases where um, the sister is with the brother and, and, and she looks at him and he's very tight and he's very, you know, formal and, you know, he's not relaxed and, and everything is a struggle. And if she makes a point, he wants to overcome her in the point. And, and so she realized immediately that um, there's no compatibility, that this is going to be a war, that the home is going to be an arena of war. And, and, and not a place, uh, you know, of love uh, and of friendship, because we have to realize, and again, with the oft-reported verses um, and, and read verses in Surah al rum you know, where, is, where Allah is telling us, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمًا إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَا آيَاتٍ لِقَوْمٍ يتفكرون. And one of his signs is that he created mates for you from yourselves, that you may find rest in them. And he put in between you love 
and mercy. Surely in this are signs for those who reflect. See, this is what we have to start doing now. What is Allah saying? The purpose of the marriage, the purpose of you coming together, litaskunu ilayha, you, you're supposed to have sakina, and sakina is tra tranquility. So the home needs to be a place of peace, not a place of tension. So if that tension is there, and sometimes the tension starts, you know, even before the marriage, and something's wrong, and you have to be aware, you know, of the tension that is there. And the two qualities that Allah said, He has made mawadda wa rahma. And these are the two qualities which, if you could put a sign over your matrimonial home, you know, for two qualities, it would be the love and mercy. Mawadda wa rahma. How does this interact again with character? Because when we are talking about wood, when we are talking about wood, we are talking about uh, not only love just in, in a physical sense, but, you know, we, we are talking about an intimate love. We are talking about, you know, a, a, a love, of, of a type of kindness, a type of lovingness, a type of compassion. So wood has got compassion in it. So this is where there's some emotion, there's some compassion. It's just being loving with each other. And, and, and that is in good times and in bad times. So that means that, you know, as, as time goes by, you know, and that beauty that you had um, in the beginning starts to fade. So this is the test now. This is the test. So the lovingness, the compassion always reminds that individual where you came from, how you started. The compassion, you know, keeps you together. Because there's emotion, there is a feeling in between you. And it's interesting because Allah said, Mawadda wa rahma. So it's almost like the, the wood is it's leading into the rahma. So the compassion as the marriage is going on and it leads to mercy. And that is coming near the end of your lives when you are there. I myself, we have been married for 50 years plus. This is where mercy comes in. Because the man is not the same man that he was. The woman is not the same woman that she was. But that compassion and that mercy helps them to deal with the changes. It takes them over those rough moments that, that people will go through near the end. And, and, and so, mawadda wa rahma, that feeling, that, that, um, that compassion, that the people have, it's so important. Another secret is that um, it's preferable for the husband and wife to have a cause. I mean, our main cause should be to be Muslim. Just to be Muslim in these times when there's a tidal wave of anti-Islamic lifestyle, that is a struggle in itself just to be able to maintain halal food, halal living, to maintain halal dress, to maintain our prayers, to maintain fasting, to maintain you know, our, our calling to the good and forbidding evil. That is a major struggle in itself. That's a cause in itself. So, so even just to survive as a Muslim, if that's your cause, then at least it's a cause, but even higher than that. If there is a cause, for instance, there's a community. So you work together in the Muslim community. And as you're working together and you're doing relief and you're working in the masjid with children, you know, you're, you're calling to Allah, you, you can sort of see each other working in the movement. And, and you can begin to appreciate that aspect of the person that's different than what's in your house. You see, we get caught up sometimes in being inside of the house. Everything is based upon this arena of war this struggle that goes within the house. So what do you like outside? When you have a cause, then you can see that individual in relationship to the cause and not in relationship just to the marriage itself. And, and, and this especially uh, would apply to those with polygyny itself. Um, 
our previous speaker spoke about polygyny, which in traditional Islamic societies that, that fostered multiple marriages you know, can be easily done. But within um, Western societies, and that's now spreading around the world, is much more difficult because of the financial challenges and because of what society is so-called dictating. When you have a cause, then some of those petty issues that the shaitan will iyadu bila can blow up to destroy the relationship, they become petty because there's a cause. And especially when you reach the point where it is like fadawa and, and, and where lives are on the line and where we see people entering Islam, we see people leaving Islam. And so that cause is there. And so you will see your husband, you will see your wife in relationship to the struggle. So, so this is so important. And, 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 and one of my secrets is that I was involved you know, in the struggle, in black consciousness struggle, even before I was a Muslim. And my wife, alhamdulillah, was involved in that struggle as well. So calling to the good and forbidding evil in a different sense, and then entering into Islam. And so that struggle mentality, right away there was suitability because there was a struggle mentality. And so we were able to maintain that struggle mentality and apply it to the Islamic community, to the Islamic world, to see sort of what you could call a mission, that we had a mission to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to serve Allah, and inshallah to die in the path of Allah. That can help you to rise above the petty differences that are there. And that is where the character is so important of the individual. Another important uh, issue is the quality of shura. And Allah says in Surah to Shura, wa amruhum shura bainahum, that their affairs are dealt with in mutual consultation. And, and, and this is a quality. You know, there are some societies where people are very individual and, and, and whatnot, but that quality, if the person doesn't have it, it needs to be developed. It needs to be fostered or it needs to be taught to that individual that when there's a difference of opinion, we don't go to our corners. We talk it out. I know it's difficult, especially for the males, but we talk it out. And if we cannot solve the problem, then we will bring in somebody from our families and we will talk it out with, with the family members. Maybe there's a close friend who knows you know, both of us. And, and, we can, we, and we can talk it up. And this is so important to us. The character is so important in, a, in, 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 in this struggle that goes on within our relationships, which is part of the process of life because there's ups and there's downs and, and, and I ha we have had ups and downs. There's no doubt about it. But because there's something there, there's something of, of the consciousness of Allah there's, there's something of the character, there's something of this wood, this compassion that is there, and this rahma, this mercy, um, that can keep you going in, in, in the darkest of times. And, and so these are crucial qualities, crucial qualities that need to be developed, and it is part of the character that is so critical in Islam. So again, character is not just a saying. It's not just a word. It's not just hadith that you spout out. It's what you do. It's, it's your body language. It's your practice. And, and that is so critical in the process of marriage. And that is before the marriage, try to get it as clear as possible as to who that individual is, who that brother is, and what is his family, who that sister is, and who is his family. Because you have to remember that, that sometimes the, the character of the family will have an influence on the individual himself. This is where character in, in, interacts with Nesab, with the genealogy. But there are cases, many cases, where you know the young brother or the young sister, they have the fear of Allah and they act totally different than their family. And that is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we have to have this hikmah, this wisdom, for the suitability and, and the wisdom to put that character 
on one of the highest levels, put it above just physical money, put it above just physical looks, right? Put it above just the family. Is this person from a certain country? Does this person speak a certain language? Is this person Sharif, noble, Sayyid? Because these are all just material constructs in a sense. And I say this with all respects to the family of the Prophet Sallallahu which we which we put in a high uh, place. <clears throat> but we have to realize <clears throat> that the bottom line is not just the blood running through the body. The bottom line is the practice. It's what is going to come out of that individual. And so these are a few uh, observations um, after a, a long struggle. And I pray that Allah will help us to continue and all marriages to help to continue. You know, and I pray that Allah would help our ind individuals to be able to find, you know, the right spouse and to stay within that marriage and go through the roughness. Uh, these are a lot of points that I brought up. And I want to open up the floor to see if there's any uh, questions, anything in the chat room, uh, anything that people, you know, have to ask uh, in, in terms of uh, the 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 concepts of the importance of character itself. Jazakallah kullu khair, ya Sheikh. That was uh, really grounding and beneficial and uh, people really loved the practical examples that you gave, mashallah. And the, the, the uh, request is to have a Wali masterclass. <laughs> if you would teach a Wali masterclass just because many people were saying that, you know, this is the job of the wali. This is, you know, this is exactly what the wali should be doing. And a lot of people don't necessarily know that or haven't experienced that before, mashallah. Um, so, yes. yeah, maybe you'd consider doing that, inshallah. No, I, I will consider doing it. I mean, if anything, I can leave of my experiences. Uh, the experience of wali is one of them because I have five daughters who were married. Yes, yes, yes. You know, and in some so, cases, you know, a daughter married and then remarried. You know, so yes, being Wali, in a practical sense, having actually gone through this, um, yes, um, this yeah. is critical because people don't. Inshallah, understand. we will do that. No, it's true. Subhanallah. So I have a question here um, where one of the participants asked, how many times should we involve family members to resolve conflicts, especially if there's a high frequency of conflicts? Do you have any advice on that? Of course, this, this has something to do with um, the nature of the conflict itself. Um, if, if the conflict is just like intellectual one or verbal or, you know, just some petty things, you know, then the family can, can, can solve this. They, they can come in a number of times. But, but if it starts to reach the point of abuse or even possible violence or violence, well, yeah, there'll be left. You know, then, um, you know, it, it shouldn't even go past one time. If it can't be resolved, then you have to bring in authorities. You got to bring in the imam. You got to bring in, you know, somebody who has authority within your community. And we have different individuals, not necessarily the imam in the mosque, because sometimes he just leads salat. But it's usually the wise person in your community, you know, to come in and really try to deal with this. Um, and in, and in some cases where violence is involved, you know, it it may even mean the authorities themselves. To come in, so it, it, it you know it, it's the nature of the conflict uh, itself. But try to resolve it, you know, within you know the family, uh, if, if possible. Jazakallah khairan. Uh, one of the uh, panels that we had yesterday was about the um, preparing for marriage. Uh, we had one for young men and one for young women. So there was a difference of opinion between the sisters and the brothers about early marriage for boys. So um, the sisters wanted to marry their sons off as quickly as possible. And uh, the brothers felt, no, they need to, to basically mature more in order to take on the responsibility of a family. What's your, what's your view on early marriage in today's age? Do you think that it's still viable? Do you think we should make way for it or make room for it? Or do you not recommend it? Well, of course, you know, within traditional Islamic societies and the way it's supposed to be even here, you know, that there is no teenage life. You know, they have this false construct, you know, of a teenage. But really for us, it is a person who reaches puberty, you know, and then when that person reaches puberty, they start, 
they, they are being trained as to how to be a man and how to be a woman. Right. So 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 then so once that comes in within within that type of society and with that type of training, it is possible, you know, for a, a, a young man, you know, to you know to to take on responsibilities at an early age. Um, and that would be, of course, with guidance, you know, from the families. Um, you know, my you know, issue is, and 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 I have this personal issue, you know, myself, because you know, young males are reluctant to get married these days. I'm being practical now. Very because true. To be honest, Very to be true. honest yep. with you, I have 21 grandchildren. You know, and you can imagine you know, what goes through my head and my wife. I have 21 grandchildren. And there's a lot of young males, and they don't want to get married. And to be honest with you, and I say it to them straight, I don't know how you survive. I mean, I'm coming out of the 60s, you know, America you know, whatever. I mean, you had to hold me back from getting married, right? Even if I just have enough to stay for one night. Okay, but this pie in the sky thing of I've got to have a home and I've got to have a degree and all that. No, it's not necessary. And, and, and sometimes to avoid adultery, and I'm being straightforward, because, you know, some societies I've seen, you know, you, you know, young, you know, people come here, and they play around, they think that they can play around when they're, when they're young and then suddenly get married, you know, you know, to, to somebody, you know, from their, their, you know, their clan, their cousin. Yes. You know, from back home married. or somebody. You know, mm. It doesn't work like that anymore. And it was a case of a mm. young man, you know, I won't say which country he comes from, you know, very intelligent, whatever, you know, and he played around, you know, when he was young and then, uh, you know, he, he started to mature and, you know, he became a big, strong scholar, whatever, you know, and then, you know, he wanted to get married, but then he told me, that he has genital herpes. He has herpes. So when he played oh. around, he got herpes. So he said, Brother Abdullah, what am I supposed to do? And he's a good looking guy with knowledge. All oh, the sisters want him. No. So he comes to me and he said he got herpes, right? So I said, okay, wait a minute. So then, he says, wow. so, then, so then he says to me, uh, can I get, get, get you prepare for the marriage? And just before we say I do, can I say to the sister, uh, oh, by the way, um, I have herpes. I said, no. That has to be known to the sister and the wali from the beginning because we don't have a cure for this thing right now. She's going to get it. She is. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and so why? He played around in the beginning. So this mm -hmm. issue of playing around, you know, as Allah said, don't come near fornication and adultery. It is an abomination. And it is today. And by playing around, we're getting socially transmitted diseases. We, we are, our minds are getting the wrong concept of, you know, what a man is and what a woman is, you know. And so therefore, there's, there's some cases, I, I knew one case, you know, where the young man and the young woman, they wanted to get married. You know, he, he was a little bit immature, but mature enough, you know, but he was, he was a man. He was ready to get married. And the family said, no, I don't want my child to be in adultery. You know, he's a young man now. We can teach him certain things. So, so and the other family agrees. So we will sort of hover over them, you know, let them mature, you know, under the protection of the family until, you know, they, they can continue on. And at least in that way, they avoid, you know, the plague of fornication and adultery. So really, you know, it's, 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 it's not black and white type of situation. There are some young guys who are so immature, caught up in this teenage type of, madness that really it would be injustice to marry him you know to a muslim sister. i hear that yeah no i hear that that and makes in that sense. case no but there are mm -hmm. other ones who have good intentions a little bit immature and he, he can develop save him from fornication and adultery that Alam. makes total sense. No, Allahu uh, Alam, that makes total sense. I think, as you said, it is, there isn't a black or white answer, right or wrong answer, but more sort of a guidance and guidelines. And I think that one of the, the challenges for parents is to start looking at our children and saying, am I doing justice to my young son, my young daughter, uh, in actually giving them the tools they will need if they do want to get married, at least they're not completely clueless. At least they're not a complete waste of space. And that may 
look like a little bit of tough love. It may look like having some hard conversations and maybe just like the brothers were saying yesterday, encouraging them to get out of their rooms, to come off their screens and go out into the world and actually start interacting and making something of themselves. That's right. That's right. No, that this is a very serious situation, but we need to, again, the more we involve our families and our youth in education of the process of marriage. Yes. So they can understand that it's not some major event with thousands of dollars and some scary thing. No, it's it's part of life. It's just like you know, puberty that you've just gone through. You yeah. know, it's it's a process of life. If they can understand yes. that, yeah, then it's not so frightening. And, yes. and if the family can be, you know brave enough you know and 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 positive enough to give support to give yeah. them support in those early days then you know it is possible for us to have this process you know even in these very difficult economic times i agree subhanallah and i just want to say as well uh, just to wrap up inshallah uh, and this is something i said yesterday brothers and sisters don't look at the society and say oh but the society look at your family and say in my family, right? Because if we look at society and judge what's possible or what's likely by society, then we might as well give up. But if we say, okay, that's happening out there, but in my house, in my family, this is what I'm going to strive to do. I'm going to take ownership. I'm going to take responsibility, right? I'm going to step up to the plate, do what I need to do, do my part. And then the more of us that do that, the more of us will We'll have children that can marry each other. That's what I'm thinking right now. Subhanallah. So may Allah make it easy. Mashallah. Jazakallah khairan ya Sheikh. Thank you so much. And uh, one of the comments that's come through is we want more of your stories, but I think we have a solution for that, don't we, inshallah? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And I'm 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 waiting. I'm waiting for us to come together. Yes. You know, to, so to, everybody to, watch to this space. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has facilitated for Sheikh Abdullah and I to be able to work on his memoirs, bi'idhnillah. And you can already see how many stories he has to tell, mashallah, of decades in this ummah, in the da'wah, in the deen, as well as a family man, you know, father, husband, grandfather, soon to be, I'm sure, great grandfather, bi'idhnillah, ya Rabb. Inshallah. Sheikh, jazakum alaw khairan. May Allah bless you and the work that you're doing and your team, you know, and, and may Allah make it easy for this younger, this I mean, generation coming up I mean, uh, and, and protect us from, from the scourge of immorality. So please have a cup of tea inshallah thank you so much everybody follow sheikh abdullah on socials he's on facebook he's on instagram he has amazing programs and master classes and books and tapes and videos a real wealth of knowledge mashallah tabarakallah so you know we need to make the most of the resources that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us right now. You know, the, 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 the people of knowledge who are still alive, who are still around, who are still talking and teaching and sharing. Let's make the most of their experience, inshallah, to help us to move forward. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. Barakallah. Okay. If you haven't liked the video, like the video. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe to the channel, guys. Jazakallah khairan. We hit 49,000 subscribers today. Thank you so much. Jazakallah khairan. I appreciate you. Um, inshallah, we'll get to 50K if we do. Alhamdulillah. If we don't, I'm happy with 49K. It has a nice ring to it. Alhamdulillah. But now it's time to move on with the program. And if you were following the emails, then you'll know that the program now is all about qualities of a Muslim husband with our brother's panel, mashallah. So coach Nadir is in already. Brother Saeed is here coming through and I'm just going to message brother Muhammad uh, to see where he's at, inshallah, because he's on this panel too. Yeah, he says two minutes to go. All right, we are waiting. Alhamdulillah. 
Alhamdulillah. Um, how else, how are my VIPs doing, guys? Are you still okay? Uh, have you got up and taken a stretch like I've been saying to do? Um, what <laughs> what have you got to say? The only people, the only like a couple of you that are active in the chat today. Maybe you guys are busy or doing other things, but I would love to hear from you so far. You know what stood out for you so far? Do you feel like it's too much and you just like had too much to take in, or do you feel that you are actually getting some benefit? Or is it one of those situations where you're going to have to watch back um, in order to be able to actually capture, you know, some of the jewels that have been dropped, mashallah. Uh, Rafia says, just mashallah, alhamdulillah. Okay, so, okay, I've got Muhammad Malik's in, Brother Saeed is in, yeah, and Coach and Nadir, Nadir just dropped, just dropped out. out. So inshallah, he will, uh, he'll come back in again, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khairan. Brothers, welcome back. It's another day. Another so day, another presentation. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. How's the energy level, Sister Naima? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. We're all good, MashaAllah. I think there's definitely some Papa John's that's coming on the scene shortly, but Alhamdulillah, um, all good. And um, I really wanted to thank you for the presentation yesterday or the conversation yesterday. So many gems dropped, mashallah, tabarakallah. And something that I'm encouraging all parents to not just watch by themselves, but watch with their sons. You know, mm-hmm. it was that kind of advice. I'm sending it to my boys as soon as I have the um, as soon as I have the recording. I definitely will be sharing it with my sons because it was practical. It was practical. It was realistic. It was hopeful, um, and it was you know from the foundation of the dean. So what more can you want? You know, what more can you ask for? Um, the outstanding personal relationships family have had tech challenges today. May Allah make it easy, mm-hmm. uh, Coach Nadir. I think you need to speak with Coach Fatima because she had the best camera today. Uh, her camera was the only one that was mashallah on point so inshallah maybe you need to just grab her camera inshallah so that you can join um but so brothers inshallah what we'll do today what we did yesterday is that okay with you um brother muhammad are you okay to um to moderate alhamdulillah yeah inshallah ta'ala inshallah so the, the the topic of conversation today is all about the qualities of the muslim man which is a follow on i guess a muslim husband a follow on from yesterday so yesterday mm-hmm. was about preparing um and i guess now it's more a case of okay so in the situation in the marriage okay you've secured the wife you're mm-hmm. married now you know mm-hmm. what are the qualities um that you should be developing still working on that you will need as well like maybe we didn't talk about it yesterday but you know tools skills knowledge that you will need inside the marriage um and then also what sisters should be looking for as well when they're looking for a husband right what are the mm-hmm. signs that they should look for to say yeah this is this is you know this is husband material um i think maybe a, a continuation of yesterday's conversation inshallah inshallah should we wait for coach nadir to come on or should we kick it off and let him come in and um <laughs> We can jump in, inshallah ta'ala, and as soon as kind of, you know, technical issues are sorted, and I'll, I'll just debrief what you mentioned, inshallah ta'ala. Okay, so let's oh, do that. Just... Let me come off and let me start the video, inshallah. Inshallah. All right, we'll just wait for the sound. Let me just... Um... Mashallah. We just lost your sound. No sound for the moment. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I think you plugged something in. Yeah, it's now fine. It's better. Now. We got you now. Oh, no, alhamdulillah. Oh, okay, exactly. let me, I'll, I'll start the video again, inshallah. All right, bismillah. Bismillah. This meeting is being recorded. All right, bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen sayyid al-awaleen wa al-akhirin al-abiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh, everybody, you know, joining in live or watching this replay as well, inshallah ta'ala. We have with us our dear beloved brother, uh, Sheikh Saeedu, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and look after you. We've got a very, very interesting conversation today and hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, we'll be joined by Coach Nazir as well. Uh, we're talking about, so it's a continuation, as our dear sister Naima mentioned, of our conversation yesterday that was like preparing Right. In terms of, you know, uh, when you're on the search and now you've 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 bagged <laughs> the wife, the, the, the Zoja. And what yeah. uh, what is what are the qualities you know to develop in a man? Subhanallah. And as we say, you know, men 
mature like fine wine, they say, right? So what are those qualities that we should be maturing in and developing in, inshallah ta'ala? Uh, yeah. Over to you, my dear beloved uh, brother, hayakallah. Now, um, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, for me, it started with, like I t- said yesterday, my father as an example. I was too young at the time to start studying the seerah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But right from the onset, he was honest enough to tell me what he was doing wrong as a husband. And I could see where the fault lines were and the kind of problems he was encountering. And his conversations with me were, you know, do not do what I've done, so be sure to do the right thing. One of the very first questions, Brother Muhammad, that I asked my father was, I wanted him to distinguish between what was traditional or cultural and what was religious. And in our society, there's the problem of deferring religion for cultural tradition. And that became became so entrenched in so many families that people were actually offending Allah in the way the husbands were relating to the way relating with the wives and with the children. So his warning um, really struck a nerve. And then my curiosity got the better part of me. And then I started studying the Sirah Prophet Muhammad to see how he related with his wives. And when I got married, and actually before I even got married, um, like I said, I took a journey of self-discovery, a journey into the self to find out where I was short, where I was found wanting, and tried to correct them even before the marriage. Now, after the marriage, there's a natural learning curve. You get to know yourself under those conditions, those circumstances, and you get to learn the, know the wife under those same conditions and circumstances. You're coming from two cultural backgrounds and you're coming together to create your own unique culture. What I didn't want to do, and I caution Mariam, is to take a blueprint of how it was in our family and say, this is going to be how our marriage life is going to be like. I also cautioned her not to bring the blueprint of her family and say, that's how our marriage life is going to be like. So there was the issue of learning, of studying, uh, researching what the best qualities are of a Muslim husband from Rasulullah and then the guy Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the guidance given to us by Allah in the Holy Quran in different verses about the role of the man, the kawamun, the maintainer, the caretaker, the protector, the shepherd of the flock. Now, all these things require knowledge. You just don't become a good husband by happenstance. You study, you research, you sit down, you discuss. Ultimately, like I said yesterday, Ultimately, it's starting this family, building this family on the most solid of foundations, according to the Quran and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, raising children that would become assets to society. We as a family strive to become exemplary, worthy of emulation. We're following the Quran and the Sunnah. So even in the community, people could see these are the guidelines we're following, not culture, not real, not, not tradition, not the instructions of parents, particularly if they go against the teachings of Islam. So we, 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 you, you find yourself in a tight spot, people who have great respect for parents and value their opinion. But when they start giving you instructions that are contrary to the teachings of the religion and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you find yourself in a delicate situation where you're trying to not offend them, but educate them in a very tactful, respectful, courteous manner and say, that's not the way I am going and these are the reasons why. So the biggest challenge we had to be, my, I had to becoming a good husband is first of all, seeking the knowledge, disabusing my mind from what I grew up observing because it was the natural default. And I had to tell myself, I'm not going to be judged based on my culture or my tradition. I'll be judged based on the guidelines as they stipulated in the Holy Quran and according to the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that, that, that learning curve, once we got over it and we understood each 
person's own peaks and valleys, we then decided to learn and grow together as we build a family. And inshallah, we impart those qualities to the children as they come. And inshallah, ultimately, they also live according to those guidelines even better than we did. And in the process, be our secretary. Like I said yesterday, the ultimate goal is to be in Jannah together. I think we will fill in the gaps as we go. I just want to stop there, Brother Muhammad, and let you take Brother Muhammad, and let you take over. Jazakallah khairan, subhanAllah. Really, really personal points. I wanted to have a warm, warm welcome to our dear brother, uh, Coach Nazir. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Jazakallah khair for, for joining us. Um, mashallah, I think we've got a few mutuals, uh, my, my dear brother Nazir, and we haven't really touched base, but inshallah ta'ala, hopefully we've seen each other somehow. But, but uh, pleasure to have you, my, my dear brother. I'm just going to quickly mention a few points and then hand over to you the, 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 the discussion today um, my dear Akhal Karim uh, Coach Nazir is around it's a, it's a build up on the previous conversation we had which was first how should a young brother develop in, in terms of character in terms of you know assets to have in order to get the get a, a good Zawjat al-Saliha a good, a, 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 a good righteous woman inshallah ta'ala we spoke about uh, you know uh, Sheikh Saeedah he's mentioning how you know, being an asset to society, each, each, you're essentially laying a brick, can't you, by, you know, the, the, the woman that you marry, the children that you have, inshallah ta'ala, that all come together to develop this home that we, we call the ummah, essentially, this building, this brick, essentially, and each of those bricks are very, very important to be very solid, inshallah ta'ala, and I think, you know, mentioned a few points there, what's really interesting, I work in, uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a very strange environment whereby, you know, there's there's always this uh, shifting dynamic uh, paradigm of diversity and inclusion. And we talk about cultures like icebergs. So you've got this 10% at the top, which is what seems to be on the face uh, value of a culture. You've got certain quirks, but there's so much underneath the culture. Sorry, underneath the, the, the surface level of what we see, which drives the culture, you know, beliefs around gendered roles beliefs around you know self-narrative all that type of stuff so it's a very interesting thing that uh, our dear brother Saidu mentioned about coming together to create your own culture what is it within our cultures some of them are very conducive to a good islamic home and mm -hmm. some of them subhanallah cannot be so conducive how do we come together to you know build our own culture you also mentioned about obviously the the idea of the man being the qawam you know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the, in the Quran, in the, uh, in the al -qawi al -amin, being strong and being trustworthy as well. How, how do we develop this within within the marriage, being an asset to society and going beyond uh, what we, these models that have played up in front of us, of our fathers, uncles, and going for the ultimate archetype that is, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the perfect example in Nabiyana Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And would love to go over to you, my dear brother, uh, Coach Nazir, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, uh, definitely a, a pleasure being here. Appreciate uh, you brothers uh, willing to drop knowledge and, and share uh, really what it takes to succeed at a high level. A uh, little background about myself. Uh, when it comes to culture, I'm probably have, probably the only person on the panel that has a, a unique position when it comes to that because my culture was stripped from me um, through my ancestry. All right, so I'm Black American. All right, now according to my DNA, my people came from North Africa. So Alhamdulillah, I'm sure that I am the answer to some ancestors' du'as to return to this deen before my people were stolen and enslaved in the United States. So what happened for me was I was studying, I was raised Christian throughout the church, um, saw a lot of stuff going on. Long story short, I disowned organized religion, but I said, you know, I believe there's a guy, just what I'm following right now is not it because I was deep diving into the Bible. Uh, and alhamdulillah, I ended up finding Islam as a teenager, about 16, 17-ish, and I um, accepted Islam in my late teens. So what occurred though, is there had to be a shift in my life. See, where I grew up is normal for the dysfunction of alcoholism, uh, domestic violence, drug abuse, these things to happen in America. And I mean, the belly of the beast, I was in the, the Midwest, or what's called Jim Crow North <laughs> um, versus Jim Crow South, very, very racist. I mean, the state I was living in locked up black men, um, number one, per capita throughout the entire country. All right, with just on, only have a 6% of black people in the entire state. Now, the reason that's important is because, yeah, we have a culture as black Americans in general. Matter of fact, we're the only 
group collectively outside of Africa that had come from directly Africa, where there was just mass conversion to Islam. I mean, Dr. Sherman Jackson really breaks the history of Islam from slavery to hip hop, actually before slavery. And alhamdulillah, you know, uh, our good brother, Abdullah Hakim Quick, definitely good to see him, uh, Fidullah, breaks that down even that much more. So I had to learn an entirely different culture, but I was thirsty for that culture. And I got married young. So as he was speaking about marrying young, I initially got married at 19. And the reason was, this was a new way of life. You can't continue living in a certain fashion, being with women, and I love women. I haven't found any better creation than that. So I was trying to do what's right and got married initially at 19. And after 15 years of marriage and having, um, what, six children, I chose to practice polygyny. So now I'm married to two women and have 10 biological children. And for the last 12 or so years, I've been practicing polygyny, married to both of my wives, because I wanted to taste, one, the sweetness of Islam and what it requires of men. And I encourage men to be qualified to do so, especially in today's time with the marriage crisis that we have. So one, getting married young, we have the uh, ability for my wife's grandmother, at least my grandmother-in-law to allow us, she had a basement, but in the basement had its own kitchen and different area. So we were able to get young and still have somewhere to kind of live and build a life from. And then as I got better with employment, got a little bit more money, we moved out about a year or so later and moved on. So the thing is, when we're talking about foundationally, there's two things that are going to impact you. And I'm talking to the men more than anything else throughout the rest of your life. One is your deen, your Islam. That's your foundation. With that, those people are successful no matter if you fail in everything else because there's absolutely no reason to be successful in anything other than Islam and still considering yourself a success. That's an abject failure. All right. When we look at things and sometimes we get this imagination and say, oh, well, I was going to make the work this out for me, work this out for me, it's going to turn out good. Maybe it won't. But Allah, Allah still will work it out for you if you look, for example, at Surah Tuburuj, right? We look at these Africans. All right, and I believe it was in Habashi, at least from the different types of that I've read. You look at the people who were successful were those who jumped in the fire and kept on to their sweetness of the Iman. That was success. We, not, we may not look at that as success, but only Allah Ta'ala knows what success is. And that sweetness of Iman, number one, that's the first thing. Get your deen right. Understand it, who is the best example ever that has walked this planet. We have an open book test. So as a man, that's the first thing. That's the first thing. And we're taught protect, provide, and exert your personal power. At least that's what I was taught. That's what I also teach. Mm -hmm. So the second, money. Money is going to impact you and affect you. Everything you do. How much you can give. Look at how um, the Sahaba looked at it. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught some of the poor companions about this, you know, this test B, they were saying, SubhanAllah, 33 times, Alhamdulillah, 33 times, Allahu Akbar, 34, right? And they, they were taught this and they knew it. But then the, the companions came in who had money and then they learned it. They got jealous, right? They got jealous. You know, but the ones who came in didn't see that as something beneath them. They wanted to get more baraka. So if three things follow us after we're gone, and they do, a righteous child that prays for you, money that you spend, that continues to benefit people, continues, right? And knowledge that you leave that continues to benefit people. Then be greedy for those three things. But those two things will determine your options with your family, where you're able to live, how you're able to feed them, what your health looks like, you know, compromise your principles, your integrity. If your children have to go and work for somebody else versus working for you, if you're able to travel, if you are able to perform Hajj even. So learn these two things as soon as possible. Make them a lifelong study. And the sooner, the better. Because of course we know with the Sunnah, the best. SubhanAllah, I love that. The sunnah, the best. Allahumma barik. And just on that note about knowledge, SubhanAllah, one, one thing that came to my mind is how we as men should lead with knowledge, essentially. Uh, we Leading with knowledge. An example Sheikh gave to me was, imagine your ghira, your sense of protective jealousy, in that something were to happen to your wife in terms of the thick of menses, the thick of menstruation, and you don't know where to go to. You know, you don't, you don't know the sources you're completely out of it. You're not in touch with knowledge. And you're having to call up a sheikh and say, look, sheikh, this is happening with my wife. And imagine your sense of, him, you know, how, how, how he, you know, it is, is a humbling situation. So having that, being in touch with knowledge, continuing your, your, your growth in that regard and other things as well, inshallah, you know, brothers, alhamdulillah, they're doing jujitsu, they're, they're excelling within these various fields. And inshallah ta'ala, you know, us brothers, we, we, we mature like fine wine. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a slightly a different 
uh, timeline, alhamdulillah, and, you know, keeping us, not losing that edge as well. This is a separate topic, but, you know, not losing those connections, those, you know, iron sharpens iron. So making sure you're with solid, you know, masculine, dominant, you know, brothers around you, inshallah ta'ala, that are on the deen as well, that can, you can keep that edge and you don't lose it completely by being over, you know, having too much of a uh, closeness with your, with, 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 you know, with the w- women that you're, you know, married to essentially. And, and you, you essentially, you know, desire is like a fire. It requires a bit of space to burn, right? So inshallah ta'ala, uh, over to uh, any, any brothers that would like to jump in, Sheikh Saeedu will go over to you. Um... Like I said, given my background, what I uh, grew up seeing and the cautionary advice that my father gave me, he was a polygamist, like I said yesterday. Throughout his lifetime, he'd been married to seven women. And uh, I remember I was about 16 and uh, he often between Asr and Maghrib, he'd be reading the Quran, have a tendency to just sit next to him as he reads. And he just looked up one day, just finished uh, what we call secondary school here. Uh, preparing to go to a uh, university. And he, he called me by my name and said, if I live long enough to see you married to a wonderful woman, and then you come to me and tell me you need my blessing to marry another wife, I'll go down on my knees and beg you not to. Now that, that struck me because at the time my father said that he was married to four wives. Now, I never got a chance to say, why did you say that? But what I realized later is, and I, I, I am really happy to hear Coach Nazir saying what he said because, and he made a point earlier when he said, for those brothers who have the ability and the knowledge to go into polygamy, he encourages them to do so. We have a situation in Nigeria now where the ratio of men to women is really very skewed. There are much many more women than there are men. And I advocate the same thing. But the caution that Brother Nazir, that phrase, that clause, if you have the knowledge and the means, it's very critical because you go to sort of Anisa where Allah said you can marry two or three or four, but if you don't have the ability to be just stay with one. And the aspect, Brother Muhammad, that you talked about, that knowledge, seeking that knowledge, is so crucial for the success of our marriages. And that is lacking. There is a lack of continuous positive curiosity in our ummah, especially by the men. Knowledge that would benefit you. So Rasulullah so, so said the husband is like the shepherd of his flock, right? Whatever direction he goes, they follow. Ultimately, he will be held accountable on how he managed his wife or wives and children. How knowledgeable, knowledgeable are you to be an asset to society? Are you on constant quest in seeking that knowledge and in imparting that knowledge? And in what manner do you impart that knowledge to the wife? Is it in an authoritarian manner? Or is it no? Come, let's grow together for Allah's sake. And yes, let's come together, grow for Allah's sake, and raise our children in the best manner possible. The challenge, one of the challenges is, I observed also, I am the first of 26 children of my father. Being the first, I got an advantage because I I had everybody's attention. I was nurtured by everybody. Everybody was, how, how did you do in school? This and that, you know, what games do you play? How good are you? And this and this and that. Then I, as I grew up, I realized those in the middle were kind of left out. Then the ones to the end were pampered and spot and they became a problem. Now you think about 26 kids, it's not easy. <laughs> I hear Brother Nazir saying 10. And that I have a family friend who had, Family, family friend, they have 10 kids. And the father, when he comes back from work, believe you me, brothers, he calls each kid one by one to know how that day went. This is a father that is deliberate, that is intentional, that is present and is involved. Now, with the 26 of us, some really fell through the cracks. And I, I just you know, where we're talking about how to be a good husband and Brother Nazir hit hit the nail on the head, you know, and people don't really think about this. That knowledge aspect and the capacity aspect, Brother Nazir talked about the financial aspect, having the ability to cater and care and nurture your children and provide for them. Those are serious issues that brothers need to think about. And what my father said, I realized later why he said it. he observed me. 
I have a very soft heart and a gentle heart and I pity women. And I think my father's love and care and concern for women led him to marry so many of them. And I realized I, I can't be the same way because he realized and said, no, don't do what I did. That's his nature. And that's something I inherited from him. And he just, he was right in saying, don't, because may Allah have mercy on him. He had his challenges. But again, going back to the point Brother Nazir made, those that have the capacity and the knowledge, please, we do encourage. I'm not discouraging polygamy. I don't want to be misunderstood. But there's some of us that don't have the ability to do it and execute it in as good a manner as is possible. The likes of Brother Nazir should be heard more often so that they talk about how they are managing this complex relationship because it is complex. You know, you have to know how to manage and be just and be attentive, be nurturing, be supportive, be encouraging, be motivational to them, and so on and so forth. And characters, personalities being different, you have to also know how to manage the, the differences, inshallah. I'll stop here. I don't know what Brother Nasir wants to add to that, inshallah. <laughs> I, I will say we have to be clear, though, yeah. um, when it comes to knowledge, because knowledge is only one thing. And if you look at the ulama, for example, you look at Ibn Mubarak, rahimahullah, yeah. or Allah, he said, um, you know, we people are in greater need of little manners than a great deal of knowledge. Yes. But the challenge comes with our ability to have that good character, to yes. have that hayat, to have that gentleness when it's time for gentleness, Yes. but to have that courage and bravery when it's time for that as well. Yes. Because you can, we can, we can, and sadly, I'm sure you've seen it as well as I've seen it. You have some people that have lots of knowledge, but they adapt, they beat people over the head with knowledge. Absolutely. Well, you can't leave the house without my permission, therefore this. And that technically is correct, but it's horrible application. Yes. So sadly, when we're talking about manhood, if we don't start with ourselves and our own GQ, our own growth quotient, so one of the things I ask people that I coach, because my wives and I, we do coach that. We know that sat, polygyny, where are people going to learn it from? So we started a whole company with it called Outstanding Personal Relationships. So we teach people about polygyny and its different dynamics because it's important because people will say, oh, I support it when it's done right. But yeah. where do you go to find it? We have many people doing it, but they're not teaching it. It's taboo in today's society. It's looked at as backwards, even though it's an ancient solution to a modern day problem. Now, I encourage men to strive for it even if they don't intend to practice it. But I encourage them to strive for it because what it will make of them. Because if you have to be dealing with different dynamics with different women, and women are women, there's some of the most challenging, beautiful things that Allah Ta'ala created, right? <laughs> so we have to be able to effectively communicate with them, articulate ourselves, to be gentle at the same time having the strength that we need to have, to not capitulating to every single thing and having concessions while at the same time, sharing with them what we need, our needs and our wants, and at the same time providing theirs, okay? And being that cover for each other. No. So if you are striving to do so, no. then you fit the category to when that decision comes, it's something noble. You know why? Because not having those manners, even if we have the knowledge, not yeah. having those manners, there are people that are addicted to porn, they have prostitutes, they have escorts, they have all kinds of stuff. I don't care if we're talking about people, Muslims, imams, different no. shuyuk, People on the circuit, or you have these uh, serial polygynists, they, they've married 25 times in 25 yeah. months. Yeah. You know, yeah. so we have all of that going we on, all, but we must recognize we have to take that internal growth, growth quotient. Mm -hmm. What's going on with that? What are the next five books you're reading? You know, what have you read on leadership? Mm -hmm. Teach me something. What are you te telling your sons? What is a good age for them to get married? What is considered a man? Mm -hmm. What are we teaching our daughter? See, as the father of 10, I have four daughters first. All right. And then six sons. And I have two bonus children from my uh, my other wife. Bonus children is considered stepchildren, if you will. So there's a dozen children. That's my okay. responsibility. Yeah. Right? yeah. So we have to be the ones to quiz them and to teach them. But I'm going to pause there. But I absolutely encourage everybody to strive for it, even if that's not your goal, simply mm. for what it will make of you. Because we have too many men. OK, mm. with being unjust. Or feeling, oh, I can't do it. I'm unjust. Or too many women that are okay with the husband as weak, even though he may have the mm. means, even though he may do it, but he feels, oh, I, I can't be just. I can't do this. When our women are the ones who are suffering, and in turn, how are we going to be kawam if mm. we're not stepping up to the challenge that Allah Ta'ala has given us? 
Coach Nazir, I really love this concept, subhanAllah. It's striving for ihsan. You mentioned the beautiful hadith of the people who complain to us وسلم, about, you know, these men, these people, they have more wealth than us. Give us something to give us an edge. Uh, Rasulullah he said, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this, this is the, the blessing and the fadl of Allah, and he gives it to who he's wish, he wishing. You're talking about the resources. Similarly, you know, if, a, if, a, if it's a righteous man with more than one wife, more than, you know, more than 10 children, as you're saying, that, that is a good righteous man. So all of us, if we, if, even if we don't intend, even if we don't end up getting there, yeah. striving for that to be an excellent man to, to have more resources to be the multi-millionaire to have many inshallah ta'ala women and many many children inshallah ta'ala should be the basis should should be something that we should strive for that there are a few uh questions inshallah ta'ala uh from from the sisters and from other people that are tuning, tuning in as well inshallah uh and, and, I, and I, but before that if, if there's any if there's any points you, you brothers wanted to mention feel free to then, I, then i'll hit you with the questions or should i hit, hit you with the questions now no no very very, very quickly brothers who talked about character yeah. which we touched upon yesterday um in preparation and we emphasize the importance of parenting and proper parenting when we talked about if you're looking for the ideal wife are you a potentially ideal husband and that we there's a lot of focus on what a man wants but we don't spend time on what a woman also wants so it's not a one road uh, kind of street, one way street where it's only as the man defining what he wants, what he this and this and that. You cannot say I'm out there looking for the right wife when you're not the right husband. And so what Brother Nazir is saying about character and knowledge, absolutely, because we talked about this yesterday and said parents have a responsibility. What did Allah say is our responsibility as parents to kids? Good terbiya, good education, Islamic and secular. So it starts from the home, from the father, making sure. And if you were raised without that, then you, of, of, of course, you're obligated to seek it out and see how do I change. And yesterday we talked about examining yourself. Uh, do you, what are your challenges? What are your shortcomings? What are those areas that you need to improve upon to be an attractive person to another woman? I mean, to a woman or an extra woman, <laughs> going by Brother, Brother Nazir is saying. But um, we have this issue where Brother Nazir talked about serial poly polygamists or polygynists. We have that problem in Nigeria. And one of the big problems is he also touched upon it, the Adam. And you go to many places where imams are saying, marry two, three, or four. But Allah himself, in such himself, said, if you cannot be just. And there are people who honestly say, you know what? I don't have it in me. I can't. And I'm not ashamed about it. That's People forget. People forget. When they talk about polygyny, they forget. For 25 years, Rasulullah was only my to Hadith Rila Anna. That was a sunnah. He did not marry anybody for those years. Then later, after her passing, then he married more wives. So I want us to be careful so that people don't feel we're pushing them in a corner that they have to be polygamist or polygynists. We have to be mindful of that. Uh, coming back to the issue of Adam, as men, as fathers, I had a very intense conversation here in our society in Nigeria. And men were admitting to me, these are people with three, four wives, admitting to me that in all honesty, they are failing their children. Now that's a worry. And we need to be careful. We're not producing children that end up becoming liabilities, problems to society. I just want to say that before we start taking the questions, shall we? Um. Coach Nazir, is there anything because uh, subhanAllah, even though the, the asal, as we say, the de facto, according to many of the salaf and many of the scholars, is ta'addud, is to have kathratul zawaj, to have many wives. Yeah. Imam Ahmed, his opinion was that one uh, is better. And I think subhanAllah, even my, one of my ustads, he's, he's mentioning in the problem we have in London, in particular, you know, some parts of London, mm -hmm. is that the brothers are putting their women on dole. So they're marrying multiple, alhamdulillah. However, mm -hmm. they don't have the resources and not the emotional intelligence. The, yes. And this ties in perfectly to the question from one of the sisters is, uh, how do you advise brothers to deal with their wives' emotions as this causes many conflicts? So if the brother's not even able to emotionally cater to, to the first, subhanAllah, and he's, you know, stretching way beyond 
uh, his yes. means. But 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 Kosh Nazir, um, any thoughts on, on what was mentioned over there by our dear brother Saidu as, as well as this question or on emotions? Yeah, absolutely. First, I would let you know that there's this book called Muslims Parenting on Purpose because the brother really hit it on the head. It's our responsibility. And I wrote this book. <laughs> it's like a dozen years ago. It's not a, a plug for the book. But the point is, I started with that. And the, the reason my wives and I even started talking more about and going into the relationship part is because many of the children are coming from dysfunctional parents. All right. They are products of an, an environment that is extremely dysfunctional. Yes. Okay. So if we don't deal with the crux there, it's going to trickle down. It's going to cause all kinds of issues. We'll be dealing with different types of traumas and all kinds of other things later on in life. So you absolutely hit it right on the head. Now, again, with polygyny, I strive that everyone should be qualified to do so. Not everybody can do it, first of all, because there's not enough women in the world. Okay. But it is a solution to a major problem. Yes. And it shouldn't be looked at as a taboo. So if no. it's normalized for those who are already doing that growth work, it's very important. Now, when it comes to it, we have to understand whether the principles are in polygyny or monogamy or whatever, when it comes to dealing with their wise emotions, because there's a few different things. When I talk about a man being ready and being more attractive, this doesn't have, this is period working on yourself. When I talk about GQ, I'll talk about five things, right? And what we wrote about it in this polygamy um, roadmap, but I'll talk about one, your mental and emotional health. We have to check in on ourselves. There's something called ACEs or advice, uh, adverse childhood experiences that uh, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris uh, really broke it down, even her TED Talks or her book called The Deepest Well, to find out if we have our own triggers and our own things that affect and impact us that can still be coming out, yes. all right? And coming out negatively in marriage. So your mental and emotional health. Then of course, you have to have some leadership skills, beginning with leading yourself, yes. all right? And you leading yourself by submitting, and that's what Islam is. Islam is submission to the will of Allah Ta'ala. A person who submits to Islam is a Muslim. We know, you know, we know this in general as a term, but we also have to remember that Allah Ta'ala had called some Muslims out and said, no, they're not believers, they're just Muslims. Yes. This is a very distinct difference that we must be careful of. Simply being Muslim is not enough. That's not good enough. I mean, it's better than Kufr, of course, and being a Kafir. But we must understand the first person who is going to be thrown in Jahannam is a Muslim. A hafiz. Okay. So being Muslim is not enough. We have to be working toward that ihsan. Nevertheless, so of course you have to have some leadership skills. Then you also have to make sure that you're fiscally fit. Yes. Dealing with money, understanding that. All right. You have to be physically fit. You have to be strong somewhere, not being weak. You know, a strong Muslim is better than a weak Muslim. But the most important part is having those noble core values. And that's where our dean comes in. So these are five things. So if you're looking as a man to be more attractive, whether it's to attract one wife or more, right now you have the advantage because there are more women than men in general in certain areas. Across the world, it's like maybe half a percent more men. But it's not like we just match up because, oh, here's a man, there's a woman. Oh, we'll just go ahead and get married. That's not really how it works. You have to be marriageable. There's all kind of other qualities and attributes. And as uh, Sheikh uh, Abdullah King Quick was talking about just having that chemistry. But let me talk about the emotional challenges. Since we are different, one, we have to understand we're different. Yes. For example, no man wants to, a woman, no man that I know that has any quality or, you know, some noble values, want a woman that he has to handle. You handle a car. Yeah. You handle a horse or a camel. Handling another human being is problematic. Yes. All right. Many times there are temper tantrums, there are emotions that are over the top, and then excuses. And there are many different things. Now, we know in the wisdom of Islam, subhanAllah, the different hormonal challenges throughout the month and these different things that happen with women. And we're advised to be gentle and be the best of them. But let me read this. Uh, this translation is hadith in uh, Nisa'i, where narrated Abu Huraira, and again, reading in English, has narrated that uh, it was asked to the Messenger of Allah, salam. listen to this advice Which woman? is best direct question which woman is best the prophet Islam said the one who makes him happy when he looks at her yeah when he looks at her men are seduced by the eyes women are seduced by their ears that's the first thing second obeys him when he commands her and she doesn't go against his wishes with regard to herself nor her wealth so if you want to know what the best is that's answered if you want to know what the worst is that's also answered. We have Islam. Islam is an open book. The worst answer, the worst is when the Prophet said, Islam, said he saw the inhabitants of the hellfire, the majority of them were women. Yes. This is a long hadith. We're not going to get into the whole thing. 
Yeah. But sisters was like, okay, why? What, what what's what's going why? What, what's up with that? And he mentioned about them being ungrateful to their husbands and then gave an example of how they throw all the good he's done for them out the window if he does something they don't like. Yes. So as women, the very first thing is ask ourselves. We have to ask, of course, you being a woman, have to ask yourself, and am I, are my emotions over the top? Are they level? Is it right here in the middle? Where is it? And how am I displaying that? How am I displaying that? We're men. How am I men displaying in general? That? Excuse me? Yeah, so, so, sorry, I just, I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd just, just uh, wanted to cut and ask, ask that question really. The how do, how do the brothers? Uh, sorry, sorry to cut you. I thought I think I, I didn't hear. I thought it was a natural, natural pause. But how should brothers then deal with, with these, with these emotions? Are there any guidelines here? Because you know, yeah. Allah, men are from Mars and women are from Venus, that type of stuff. But Shalatan, if you could shed a bit of light on that, and the it. first thing a man should do is listen, and also understand that we are just as emotional as women, but we usually tend to have different ones. When we, when we are hurt, we default to anger. And the Prophet said, let's talk to them, control your anger, control your anger. So to listen, listen, listen between the lines, listen between the lines. It might, she may be complaining about something, maybe crying about something. Maybe it's a hug that's needed. Maybe she's just saying she's lonely or she doesn't feel supported. Many times we jump in as men and we like to solve things. We're problem solvers. That's what we're taught to do. We fix stuff. We move on. This is what we have to do. Stop fixing stuff right away. Stop fixing stuff right away. You would, if you have a wife, like my wives, they, they talk much more than me. All right. They do. So when they talk, they want to feel heard. So if you're listening actively, not with a device in your hand or anything, if you're listening, they can talk for an hour and feel like, oh, this was a great conversation. You make it feel great. You might know the solution right away. Well, if you did this or do that or don't do this or don't do that, or maybe if this person, but you, you're listening and you're asking, well, what do you think? Or how do you think? Listen, active listening goes farther because many people don't feel listened to, especially if it's a mother and she's having a lot of baby conversations all day. And you're the only other adult around in humanity that she talks to outside of social media or something like that. One is listening. Two is asking questions. What is she saying between the lines? Maybe she's missing something from, I think, going on with this event is one of the five love languages. Maybe it's a simple touch. You know, maybe it's a kiss on the forehead. Maybe it's a, you know, help me understand. All right. But now at the same time, here's the trick. I would advise getting books like How to Win, um, not How to Win Friends and Influence People, but win, win. Winning, winning with win, People, win. Winning with People with John C. Maxwell. Winning with People gives you some very good strategies. And you look at this and you look at Life of Prophet Lee Sattu Salam, when he needed advice, when he was, he didn't know what to do with Trigal Huvdavia, he went to go talk to his wife. She's the one who gave him advice when every single companion that we love and that we honor was so emotional that they disobeyed him when he told him to do something. But his wife gave him comfort, just like, our mother Khadija anha, right, gave him comfort when he went to her. Now, we also must understand as our wives are coming to us, they're coming to us for that protection. They're coming to us for providing that good advice. This is our time to step our leadership skills up. It may not be easy because you might not want to hear it or you might have a solution that may be busy. But at the same time, you also have to decipher when it becomes on a line of emotional manipulation. Women are masters at that. Because Prophet Lee Sattu Islam also let us know that a right-minded man can be led astray, all right? So we have to make sure we are clear in what we do. Meaning that if you're doing something halal, something that is right, something that you have to do, all right? You might leave the bed and you make it to, you make it qiyam, or you have to take another job. You have to do whatever it is you're doing, or you're spending more time with the children or, or taking something, and she may want some time, and you, can, you have to be able to discern the difference between manipulation and what must need to be done. Because of the fact of the matter is we're men and men were built to protect and to go out and to provide. And even if that time might be missed, you're doing that for your Lord and understanding that we are checking in and checking out just like a hotel. Anyway, I'm sorry, brother, go ahead. Um, I just wanna take us back to the definition of a good wife. The Surah said, you can marry a woman for her beauty, her wealth, her genealogy, and her piety. And he said he will rub the face of the one who marries a woman other than her piety. Now, 
the question of manipulation. In every marriage, there is, there is the honeymoon period. It could last six months. It could last nine months. You really don't know each other that well at that time. Forget about the courtship. I courted Marion for three years. And after getting married, of all the discussions we've had, everything we I thought we should have discussed, we did. But upon getting married, of course, you learn new things. Now, we had problems for six years, communication problem. We had ineffective listening. We had poor communication skills. One day, Mariam said to me, I want you to tell me what it is I'm doing that you don't like, what it is I'm doing that you like, what it is I'm not doing that you like me to start doing. I took a moment and I said, wow. But then she wanted to say, all I'm asking is be kind and merciful. Absolutely. I made a list, laid them out. But then it occurred to me to be fair and just, I should reciprocate. And I said, Miriam, I'd like you to make the same list about me. That was a key to the solutions to our problems. Now, we've made it a point every six months to revisit that, to go back like a refresh. It's constant. The level of communication is so advanced that we can finish each other's sentences. We have no locks on our phones. She can access my phone. I can access hers. She can access my bank account. I can access hers. We've worked on this so much that we've become almost, we are the best of friends. The issue of emotion is she had to tell me, this is what I'm feeling when I'm going through this. So I got to know and know what to do when she's having those challenges. I'm not guessing anything. I'm not supposing anything. It's not a trial and error. I know what she's going through. I know what she needs and I give her what she needs. Same thing applies to me. So knowing one another, growing together, reading together, sharing hadith, course of the Quran together, constant communication. I talk to my wife, if it's low, three times a day. That's how often we communicate. I'm present, deliberate intent, and quest, always curious what's happening. I know my wife very well. We've gone beyond manipulation. That doesn't exist. We're straightforward, we're honest with each other. But then as you talked about something, being physically able and strong, that's a problem, not just in polygamy or polygynies, but even in monogamies. My and I have been counseling women for 20 years. And the complaint of lack of involvement, lack of emotional attachment, not being heard. Brother Nazir talked about it. But honestly speaking, when we have lectures and we invite people to come, 80% of those attending those lectures are women. 20% men. Our concern is if you were supposed to be the leaders of the family, you don't come to seek knowledge. You don't come to deliberate, to interact, to learn. Then we're complaining. We, the men, are complaining, but we're not stepping up to the plate. We're not living up to our responsibilities. Rasulullah said, the best amongst you are those who are best to their wives, and I am the best amongst you. How many of us are really that good to our wives without expectations, certain rules, certain targets, and so on? It's not just about us. It's about us combined, husbands and wives. Not just about the men. If anything, when I talk about, when I counsel and I talk about the rights and responsibilities of husbands and wives in Islam, I'm tempted to think that women may have a tad bit more rights or privileges than we do. And that is what I focused on. There's no competition between my wife and I. No, it's together growing together, raising children together. Hopefully, inshallah, out of Allah's Ramad, we go to Jannah together. That's the ultimate goal. 
Now, if men and women would not see as us versus them and living up to the expectations as stipulated in the Holy Quran and according to Sunnah Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we shouldn't be having these problems. But are we as attentive to our women with all that they give us? Are we as attentive as we should be? I'm concerned, very concerned about the designation of their manipulation. I'm worried about that because some men will take it and run with it. So we need to be careful. If we make the right selection based on the guidelines as stipulated by Rasulullah, investigate whether it's the man or the woman, embark on istihara seeking Allah's guidance, if this is the best for me, my family, and the ummah, then inshallah, we shouldn't encounter those things. But in the event that we do, as the heads of the households, we have a responsibility to set them right and say, no, that is wrong and it's a sin. Because fulfilling the rights and responsibilities of husbands and wives by both men and women are acts of ibadah. Not fulfilling them is an offense to Allah. Uh, let me stop here. I just want to quickly um, mention this point. I think, subhanAllah, beautiful pertinent points mentioned. But I have a slightly different, myself and, 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 and the brothers that, alhamdulillah, that you know, we're in touch with, slightly different to, 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 to Sheikh Saeedu in terms of what you, what, what you mentioned there in terms of the, the proximity between man and wife. Now, I, thought, I was actually having this conversation with, 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 my, with my wife uh, about friendship. Can, can a husband and wife actually be friends? Uh, and, and what we what we spoke about is there's this air of respect and authority that that she has for me, and she 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 actually said, you know what, I don't think we can be be friends because friendship. Uh, it, it, when we talk about friends in, in a general sense, it, it that then correlates to equality, right? We're talking about friends as in the same same type of thing, and this and the, this idea of desire requires some sort of space. What my brother said to me in a very poetic way, he said, between the two lovers, there needs to be the, the, the breeze of love needs to flow. And this kind of idea of being so close, again, the, the, the men, if they, they may become fully absorbed into their into their women folk, they become they lose their masculine edge. If you know iron sharpens iron, if the brothers are spending the whole day with their wives and they're not out there, you know, in the gym or you know in the halaqat al ilm with, with with other brothers seeking knowledge or or, or doing things that are boosting their testosterone, they're, they're going to lose uh, that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them as, as an incredible edge. And, and, and we're, we're, we're suffering a, a pandemic, we can say, whereby now the, the pound for pound uh, you know, force of, of, of a male handshake is, is, is mm -hmm. now the average of that is, is less than a woman's <laughs> strength mm -hmm. of her handshake, mm -hmm. subhanAllah. And testosterone is at an all-time low subhanallah wallahu, wallahu musta'an ala dhalik so this type of you know just to kind of inshallah i'm, I'm sure you know uh, our dear brother saeed is not alluding to us you know men losing that edge keeping no. the edge inshallah ta'ala but this idea you know uh, when i'm hearing about <laughs> sharing passwords i'm like there's no way i'm going to share my phone with my i need to have my own space you know what i'm saying I, she, she can't be seeing seeing the dms i'm getting you know what i'm saying so <laughs> brother muhammad may i may i be so rude as to butt in here um i'd like to i'd like to inshallah for the sake of the panel and for the sake of the audience as well just provide some context and i think this is really crucial um brother saeed is based in nigeria the nigerian culture nigerian men nigerian women and whatever issues they have very different to what we're facing in the west so you know, the things you're talking about, probably Brother Muhammad, lack of testosterone, men not being men, you know, feeling more feminine and all of that. Brother Said is saying, no, 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 these guys are hyper in certain mm -hmm. ways, you know, and they actually need to come a bit down, you know, and like make it a bit closer to the sunnah, the balance, right? So I think yeah. for the sake of the audience and for the sake of the panel, I'd like to avoid us losing sight of that. Every one of you is operating in a different context. Uh, both demographically and in terms of your own personal situations. Uh, Brother Saeed has been married for th over 30 years. Uh, yeah. Coach Nadir been married. To, he is married to two women, 12, 20 years plus. Brother Muhammad, you're married for a couple of months. So everyone is going to have their own experience. And you've been looking for a long time. You're a millennial. Malish, you're one of the young ones. So you're, the, the world that you inhabit 
is different to the world that uh, Brother Saeed inhabits and even Coach Nadir, even though he's probably more plugged in. So inshallah, so we don't go way over time. Um, and, and so we can make this as beneficial as possible. I think we know that there are certain, we, as you've said, ways that men need to show up. Yeah. And the ways that men need to show up uh, are exemplified by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and require ta'ab, they require work, right? They require, and I think every one of you has said that in different ways, which is that if a man is going to be the man, he yeah. needs to step up. He needs to push himself. He needs to be prepared to grow. He needs to be prepared to, 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 you know, to get out of his comfort zone, as we said yesterday. And that's spiritually with regards to learning Dean, you know, financially with regards to getting his money up, uh, you know, physically with regards to his fitness, you know, and his health and his wellness, you know, we know that that's an issue too. And in the intimate space as well, with regards to his connection with his wife. So, I think this is one of those ones that would have been a three hour stream if we had the time, but unfortunately we don't, but I would like to thank all of you for, you know, for really opening our minds to so many different angles on this conversation. And I hope inshallah that we can continue to have this conversation because they are needed by the yeah. brothers, by the sisters, and also for the next generation, inshallah. Mm -hmm. So jazakumallah khairan. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I just, quickly, okay, I just Brother Mohammed, very quickly, for just to give you a little background. When I was growing up, the mothers are in the, in the separate part of the house. They're nowhere close to my father. When he comes back from work and they bring his lunch, when they serve him the lunch, they kneel down in front of him as a sign of respect. Oh, yeah. That's still happening in our society. Now, Rasulullah said, if I were to ask anybody to bow to anybody, I would ask the wife to bow to the husband. And I raised this with my dad and I said, is what my mother's, what are the things my mothers are doing, is that religion or is that tradition? My father said, that is tradition. And I said, is it right? He said, no, it is wrong. So I grew up in this separation, in this distance. And if you were to talk to Mariam about whether I've lost my testosterone or if I'm the man, she'll be the first person to tell you far from it. And she always cautions people. Forget about this laugh to the smile you see on his face. This guy is a very tough guy, you know, and that, that will never go. I mean, I understand and I draw the line. I, I, I demarcate. I know where things stop and when they start. So I understand that, you know, but. My wife, over 31 years, what we, we've been able to build in terms of a marriage, a family, and what we've been able, alhamdulillah, to, I, I hope, contribute to the ummah is based on that decision that I took, that I'm not going to have the relationship my father had with my mother and his other wives with my wife, because it was very unhealthy and it was not beneficial to the women as far as growing together, learning and raising children. Like I told you, I, I, I got the best of, of, of you know, both sides. You know, I got everybody. But right after me, two or three people down the line out of 26, you can imagine <laughs> what it was like for the others, which Brother Nazir touched upon, you know, but uh, that's the reason. And I totally see where you're coming from, Brother uh, uh, Muhammad. I'm gonna give you 10 years and I'll call you again and see how you guys are doing. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay, you know, I've got Nigerian brothers. Nigerian brothers, I call them Nigerian stallions, bro. Like, no, exactly. like, every, like, I tried I tried rolling with them on, on the mats. Always, Allah, always humbling experience. Allah, my brother. You know, there's no of, of my, my Nigerian brothers. There's, there's no doubt about that. I, I can't even cap. So, is that like, it's, yeah, as Sister Naima said, it's two different mm -hmm. scenarios and environments. And, and over here in the West, inshallah, ta'ala, it would be lovely for you to come down. You'll see. It's a very sad state of affairs. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectify um, affairs and inshallah ta'ala. Look, look, my brothers, do plug in to, to, into uh, Coach Nazir, uh, into, into our dear beloved brother uh, Saeedu as well, inshallah ta'ala, and, and benefit. Benefit, inshallah ta'ala. You, you know, with all that's going on, you do have sources of information and guidance. And as you know, this is the wealth of experience, right? And brothers like myself, inshallah ta'ala, we're, we're, we're benefiting from brothers yeah. like uh, our dear brother Saeedu and, and Coach Azir, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you on the um, straight and narrow, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khairan. Yeah. Uh, wa alaykum wa rahmatullah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Brother Nazir, pleasure meeting you. Brother Nazir, pleasure meeting you. Aikwa <laughs> Zaki, alhamdulillah. Let's definitely connect. Jazakallah khairan. Okay, I'm going to transition to the sisters now, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan, brothers, take, for taking time out of your schedules. And uh, yes. This conference has been very interesting, mashallah. Lots of, um, yeah, lots of thoughts being provoked, which is always good, uh, alhamdulillah. Um, and I think because we've had a whole year of conversations since last year's uh, conference, um, certain ideas have become sort of, yeah. Anyway, people are watching, inshallah. If you would like to know more, about uh, Brother Saeed and Sister Maryam's journey, which has been a very, very interesting journey and maybe not what you'd expect. Do watch their, um, the podcast interview that, we, that I did with them on the Marriage Conversation. It's on my channel. Extremely interesting. Um, and uh, I also have a fantastic interview with uh, Coach Nadir and his wives and the process that they went through. So that's also on the channel. So inshallah, if you're curious and you want to know more about them and their story, then feel free to uh, go and watch their podcast, inshallah. Right, transitioning to the next panel, and it's not over yet. <laughs> We've got uh, our sisters panel, mashallah, this is our wives panel, actually. Um, and this wives panel is built around advice that sisters would give their daughters about being good wives, all right? So, so far, I've got Aisha Mercedes here, and I've got um, Naima Um Isa and Maryam Arafat is here. And if you guys are watching yesterday, you will see, you will know Maryam Arafat. I recognize her from yesterday, inshallah. But I think we are due a couple of other people as well. So we'll just wait for them. Salam alaikum, sis. Salam alaikum, sisters. How is it going? Have you guys managed to watch any of the talks so far? You will have to unmute. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa alaikum. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. All good. Have you managed to see any of the talks so far, sis? Yeah, I've, I've seen a few. The last one was interesting. This um, one just now? This, yeah, the, the one just now. And, and I kind of felt like that joining this panel. I felt a bit like Mohammed. Um, in the, oh, why? Because <laughs> I've only been married a few years and everybody else, you know, mashallah, I'm about it. May Allah bless <laughs> The unions has been married sort of triple, quadruple the amount of time I have. So I felt a bit out of my depth, but alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. you know, it's, uh, it's good to, to, to give different perspectives on things. And, and he's right in saying, you know, in the West, Nigeria, even some of the, you know, Arab countries, very different experiences, isn't it? It is. It's very, very different. And and the, the obviously everybody faces problems and issues and challenges, but those challenges are different. Uh, they are different. Um, and, you know, and, and I think, you know, especially if you're plugged into certain <clears throat> online spaces, um, it's easy to think that what you see is the case for everyone and everywhere. Right. And it's just not the case. It's just not the case. <laughs> it doesn't even matter what you see on social media. It's just not the case because yeah. different demographics, different uh, communities, different um, different ages within those communities, right? Different classes, right? Within those communities, mm -hmm. uh, different levels of practicing, everything all makes such a big difference. There's certain things that we can see societally happening, but how that plays out in individual communities and societies is, is so, mm -hmm. so different, mashallah. Sister Mariam, welcome back. Salam alaikum. Alaikum How are you? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, now the two coaches are there. Both of them have got their their cameras on point. <laughs> that was so funny. <laughs> alhamdulillah, yeah. Uh, let's see. So our sis says, yes, as a Latin revert, I've noticed the sisters in Latin America face different marriage issues than sisters from other countries, cultures, and contexts, 100%. Not to mention the differences between human beings, right? In terms of personality, uh, in terms of temperament, in terms of, you know, jobs and levels of knowledge, so many differences. And it's okay, guys. I just want to say this before we start off. It's okay if someone's view of the world is different to yours. It's okay. Um, their view of the world is informed by their experience and their perspective. And, and I think people seem to, I feel, it seems to me that people forget that. They expect you, if you are Muslim, 
or whatever, if you're a Muslim or if you're married or if you're in polygyny or if you're mixed race or whatever, that you will by default have a certain opinion and a certain perspective. And the reality is it's just not the case because everyone is is, is unfortunately we have to filter reality through our own lens. So for example, how coach Fatima speaks about polygyny versus another initial wife whose husband maybe did it on the sly, uh, you know, dragged her through the mud, you know, started neglecting her and, and her kids were traumatized and all of that. The way she will speak about polygyny is completely different, but they're both Muslim. They're both initial wives. They both have been through the same thing, but their experience of it has led them to a different understanding. Uh, and I think that it's 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 unfair to expect every speaker to have the same opinion, to see things in the same way, to see the, the issue in the same way that you do, or, oh, no, 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 that's a problem. You know, of course, some people have a perspective that's not helpful. Some people have an opinion that you know is that is not going to work, right? But still, I wouldn't like to be in a situation where people who come to this channel expect all our speakers to toe the same line. They don't. Today, subhanAllah, we had like shiuch, like scholars you've studied for decades, right? Look, Dr. Muhammad Salah, how old is he? How many years has he been preaching Islam? Sheikh Abdullah Hakim Quick has been married for 50 years, right? And yes, his advice comes from his experience. Is he a different generation? Yes, he is. Does that mean you discount his, his, his advice? No, because he's got 50 years on you, bruv. Like he's got 50 years on this thing. So he knows something, right? Uh, similarly, somebody else who, you know, you may think, well, that's so different to how I'm doing things. And especially, especially unmarried people. People who've only been married, sorry, Aisha, this is not personal, uh, but uh, people, you know, we're married for a shorter time. People who are, you know, unmarried, never been married, and they they hear a lot of things online and they think they know. You don't know until you know, right? And I'll tell you something else: you won't know what you're going to know until you know, right, sisters? Would you agree with that? You're not going to know what you're going to know until you know. <laughs> Because you don't know what your situation is going to be and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to show you through that situation. Anyway, Sister uh, uh, Naima Um Isa is somewhere. Where is she at? Come on, Naima. We want you on the on the, on the the video, sweetie, so we can start, inshallah. Come on the video if you can, and then I'll start the recording and we'll get to it, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. I'm here. Hey. I'm, just trying to, I'm just literally just, you know, my laptop broke. So I'm just tr trying to log yes. on. So literally Ooh. I'm here on my phone. I'm just going to switch on to my laptop. That's it. Literally. Okay. 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 Inshallah, whichever one you over. use, I'm literally are you using the whole time. All right. No worries. Sis says, I agree hundred percent. We don't all have to have the exact, the same, exact same perspectives and experiences. My perspective as a wife to a husband who has a disability and being his caregiver, aside from being his wife, is very different. Exactly. Alhamdulillah, it has been a great marriage experience for me so far for the last 11, almost 12 years. Come on, like if a sister like that tells you her experience and what's worked for her, you don't have the right to say, well, that's nonsense. Like, how would that ever work? You know what I mean? Because it's working for her. And if a brother, you know, brother or a sister says, well, this is what I do. And this is working for me in my marriage. If you're not married, pipe down because you don't know what's going to work for you. You think, well, when I do it, it's going to be like this and that. And when I have a wife, she's going to be this. And when my husband this, wait until you know what you're going to know. And then you're going to know. Anyway, khalas, let me stop talking. <laughs> so let me, I think Sister Naim was dropped off to get back on, inshallah. So let's start this off. Oh, alhamdulillah. It's been a long day, alhamdulillah. All right. Fix up. Record to the cloud. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome, my lovely ladies. It is our ladies panel, our sisters panel, our queens panel. And we are going to be talking about uh, riffing off what the brothers in the previous panel were talking about. So they were talking about qualities of a Muslim husband. But our angle is advice we would give our daughters. 
So because we've been kind of focusing on parents and parents' role, maybe advice we'd give our daughters and also how we can help our daughters, train our daughters, uh, you know, even encourage our daughters in order for them to be successful wives, I think is a nice a nice kind of uh, way of framing the conversation, inshallah. So maybe if we want to just jump around the room quickly, tell us who you are. I think it's fair to just say who you are, how long you've been married, and that's it. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Coach uh, Mariam, inshallah. My name is Mariam Arafat. I'm a marriage coach, alhamdulillah. Been married for 20 years, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Aisha? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Aisha Mercedes. I've probably been married the least in the chat, but I've been married for three years, alhamdulillah. Oh, and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Um, alhamdulillah. But uh, yeah, and um, I'm a counsellor. So, yeah. Jazakallah khairan for joining us. Nice to have you. First time on the channel. Alhamdulillah. Another first, mashallah. Coach Fatima. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Been married over 27 years. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Coach Naila. Oh, I'm not getting any sound. It's it's funny. It's it's I can hear it, but it's very faint. Can you hear me now? A bit, uh, yeah, if you can raise the volume, if you're raising volume. Yeah, just it's really low. For some reason, it's really low. Let me try to see if I can be a little louder before I fix yeah. this. <laughs> yes, that's good. That's good. That's perfect. That's so, great. Uh, Coach Nyla, one of the co-founders of Outstanding Personal Relationships, married in polygyny for a little over 12 years. Actually, a lot over 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> Mashallah, tabarakallah. Okay, well, let's kick it off. Really easy question, a question that we may have discussed before, which is, what is the maybe what are the three pieces of advice that you would give your daughters with regards to being a good wife? Anybody wants to start it? No, guys, come on now. <laughs> I can go. Um, go ahead, sis. Three pieces, three advices. Okay, the first thing is keep Allah the center, always, always, uh, whether it's in. Uh, hardship or in good times always go to Allah first and uh, the second thing would be to look at your marriage and not anybody else's marriage do not compare your marriage to anybody else and see what's going on in your marriage what is working what is not working and if you need to seek advice then don't seek it from anybody. Seek it from people who actually know and who can guide you. Because uh, that is very, very important. You do need uh, advice. You do need guidance in marriage. You do need that. But you cannot go to anybody for advice or you know discussing, okay, this is not working. How do I approach this? Whether it's family, whether it's friends, no, you cannot go to anyone. You have to go to somebody who is trusted, who knows, who can guide you, and who knows Allah, who is connected to Allah, not anyone else. So the first thing is keep Allah, make Allah the center of your relationship. The second thing would be no comparison. Uh, the third would be speak to professional people. Keep close to people who will give you good feedback and honest feedback. And even if you are wrong, they would just say it that yes, you are wrong. You need to work on yourself. These are the first three pieces of advice I would give my daughter. Jazakallah khairan. Uh, I'm gonna go to my right, which is Coach Naila, inshallah. Advice to your daughter about being a good wife. How are we gonna make these girls wife okay, material? I was guys? Fixing That's my what mind. I wanna know, right? I wanna know how we're gonna make these girls wife material, okay? How are they gonna get picked? <laughs> That's what I wanna know. <laughs> No, I <laughs> alhamdulillah definitely love what um, Miriam said. Definitely um, is 
I'm of course gonna you know, jump on that too as well. Um, definitely keeping the law first and foremost, um, that's key. But to add to that is minding your marriage. <laughs> I say it so much and it's so true. Um, and that goes into the not comparing, um, whether you're in polygyny, whether you're in monogamy, it's, it's not about comparison. And we talked about that earlier on what you were talking about, um, Naima, as far as um, you know, what may be okay for some, may not be okay for others. Um, and it reminds me of that story um, about the sister who had a wonderful marriage and it, everything was all nice and good until her friend came by and started whispering in her ear about, I would never do that. Or he's not taking, you know, he's taking advantage of you and these type of things like that. And it totally changed the trajectory of the marriage. So definitely mind your marriage and mind your marriage um, by doing that, meaning that care about what is gonna make your marriage fulfilling and not what it looks like on to other people. So that's definitely key. Um, realize and embrace your individuality and love that part about you and don't lose that getting into your marriage. A lot of times you lose your individuality and because you think that you have to be a particular way for your husband and your husband married you because of your individuality. He didn't marry you to become this whatever you think that it, you know, that he, you think he might like or whatever the case may be. I remember I had really good advice. It was like, be you, you know, be who you are, because then it gives me the chance to know who you are and figure out if I really like you or not, you know, type of thing. So pretty much embrace that. And uh, another thing, first, uh, I guess, third, not first and foremost, third, is keep your communication open, proper communication at all times, have the courageous conversations, be courageous enough to be vulnerable enough for the person who you had trusted your heart with and trusted your livelihood with. So definitely those are pretty much the three of the many things, <laughs> the advice that I've given my daughter already. Mashallah, Tabarakallah. Okay, Aisha, I've got you up next. Uh, um, yeah, I'm going to echo what the, the two sisters have previously said in, in keeping Allah first, but I think to kind of elaborate a little bit on that, um, I remember I was having some difficulties in my marriage before and I went to the imam and, and the imam was talking about um, that him and his wife were like from two different backgrounds and that's the same as me and my husband, but then it's about if you're Muslim and you believe in the same God and you believe in the Quran and the Sunnah, why are you not then turning back to the Quran and the Sunnah with, with, with regards to your affairs? Because if we all wholeheartedly were, then of course there wouldn't be, I mean, you'd have disagreements, but it wouldn't be major disagreements because you'd say to yourself, okay, we're disagreeing on that. What does Allah, you know, um, what does Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? So although it sounds quite typical, I do feel that definitely kind of, keeping your ha your household fulfilled with the love of Allah and, you know, learning your religion and uh, implementing what you are learning in your marriage. Obviously, I'm, I'm reasonably newly wed. And as you probably all know, it's, you know, the beginning stages, you're, you're kind of, you're getting to know one another. And I think that leads into the kind of second uh, point of advice that I would give my daughter if I had one. Getting to know yourself and also getting to know your spouse. Um, and I think that's sort of a continued uh, thing. I don't think it kind of stops because, um, as Umar Ibn Khattab says in a narration, that, you know, you only really get to know somebody when you travel with them, when you do business with them and when you live with them. And I think, you know, we get caught up in this kind of, well, I got caught up. And I think a few, you know, quite a few young sisters that come to me get caught up in the kind of honeymoon period which is actually a proven psychological uh, theory that the honeymoon period is kind of, you know, psychologically, you are a different person in that period, right? And then as you get to know that person, you do then see different things that, oh, and it's almost like you've changed, but no, they haven't changed. They're just getting more comfortable. And, you know, there's parts of them that you, you didn't see before. So keeping an open mind in that your spouse is it going to be the same spouse necessarily as when you first meet? And again, for myself, going through lots of therapy as a therapist, getting to know myself has allowed me to become more self-aware of the things that I 
might be doing wrong and the things that I need to improve on. And then, you know, it, it can it can help with the kind of conflict resolution, if you like. Um, and just being realistic, again, that kind of whole idea of not not expecting marriage to be a fairy tale, not expecting it to be, you know, every day or every month or every year even to be like really like it was in the first year or two, subhanAllah. So I think, yeah, to, to kind of round up, yeah, definitely being realistic, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan, sis. That's really interesting, actually, because <laughs> I know that there's like a split about which years are the best years. Because some people say that the first year is the hardest year. And then others say that, no, that's the honeymoon period. After that, it gets hard, right? But I think from what I understand of, uh, you know, the psychology of it, as you said, it's that limerence, isn't it? It's that period of, of, of infatuation or falling in love where certain chemicals are activated in order to get you to procreate right and that's the whole that's apparently that's what's happening is that you know the falling in love side of things is to get you to procreate and then it's almost like the fog lifts yeah. and different hormones kick in and now because it's you know it's it's kind of hoped that you managed to secure a baby somewhere in there and and now you're you just literally have like it's almost like you've put on a different set of glasses and now yeah. you see the person without the the, the 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 lens of those rose colored glasses where this person is perfect and he's everything and everything he does is so cute and I love the way he does this and I love the way he does that which is the honeymoon period right but they say that that's the limerence and people think that limerence is love mm-hmm. and in popular culture that limerence, that falling for someone right that's the butterflies the infatuation which is the chemical response is spoken about written about and sung about as if it's love. And I think one thing that I I think I've done with my, with my girls, which I think that we should possibly all do with our daughters is to give them, as you said, a realistic and a correct understanding of what love truly is, Mm -hmm. what it looks like and what it feels like. Because the stuff that they get from social media and from films and from songs, that's setting them up for a world of hurt, <laughs> you know, and, and disappoint, disappointment and kind of crushed hopes and dreams. But anyway, um, Coach Fatima, what say you? What's your advice? How, how are you going to make your daughter wife material? Let's hear it. Well, I think one of the most important things is taking care of our relationship with Allah as women and being mindful that it's, you know, I look at sisters sometime and we love our husbands so much, but I said, do we love ourselves as much as we love them? You know, are we putting that love back in? Are we pouring back into ourselves? So self-love is a big one for me with um, my daughters. I don't want them to go, okay, I'll just, you know, love him, love him, love him, love him, and then forget about me. Uh, Working on that relationship with Allah making the offer oneself, like yourself, in, in not just the marriage, but make the awe and ask Allah to help you and give you guidance and, you know, have that conversation with him and cry to him, you know, uh, that and being very mindful about what you say about yourself to yourself, what you say about your husband to yourself in your marriage is very important. So that self-talk is if I can drive that point home, because whatever you think about is what you're going to be about. So those are probably the three things I would think of most when I um, think of my daughters, you know, inshallah, they'll ask for guidance and have the conversation and take care of that relationship that they have with Allah, because that's the most important one they're going to ever have, because that one continues the rest of these relationships are are fleeting because this world is fleeting so to take care of their akira as much as they invest in this dunya invest more in their akira inshallah so jazakallah and i have two questions on that one the mm-hmm. the first one is what does self love look like to a 17 year old girl to a 17 year old yeah i know what it looked like t- to me it was yeah. taking care of myself mentally, physically. I wasn't at a spiritual point at 17, mm-hmm. but sometimes the people that I look to to love me back didn't. So I learned at an early age 
that I needed to take better care of myself because I was sitting in the disappointment of them not loving me the way I felt like I needed to be loved as a 17 year old black girl in America. Mm -hmm. So you, you're already going out the door with a couple strikes against you in that country, especially. So I, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up with my biological mother. She was gone by the time I was three. So I had to learn about abandonment and that it wasn't a me thing. It was something within her that she needed to fix. So I learned right away, look, this is, you know, not my issue. So self-talk started with me early because of my, my grandparents. They always made it, well, that was your crazy parents, but there's nothing wrong with you. However, it was not easy to continue on like that because you're still sitting in this disappointment that was kind of dumped in your lap. And then you go, okay, let me crawl up out of this and just love on me through clothes, through my art, through getting around people that I felt safe with was important. If I didn't feel safe with somebody, they weren't in my life. And it's been like that since I was young. I couldn't deal with that drama so I like to be around like the theater kids and the happy kids and the nerdy kids, the people that were kind of, you know, looked at as not popular, whatever the case may be. I like that crowd because that crowd was safe to me. So I just was really good at self-talk and cheerleading as a 17 year old. And it was a lot of pressure. However, my, my grandparents were from the South and they were built to last and they poured a lot into me to go, look, that's, that's not your fault. Mm-mm. You know, they didn't have all the tools, but they didn't make breakups and things of that nature, my issue. And they said, you can put, you can do anything you put your mind to. They constantly said that. So because of that, I learned to embrace the parts of me that Allah had gifted me with. I think everybody has something that Allah gives them that he entrusts them with. And mine happened to be art and making people laugh and making things pretty and stuff like that. And I just kept going to this day with those things. So alhamdulillah, self-love is embracing the things that Allah has given us and entrusted us with and put inside of us to share with the world, inshallah. But that's how I looked at it. Jazakallah khairan. So what I'm hearing you say is, you know, having those conversations firstly, because I want to make this something that is inshallah beneficial for people just listening. So if there are any issues in your family, if there's been a divorce, if there's been abandonment, if there's been anything that, you know, has, has had an effect, I think having those conversations, having those, you know, being brave enough to have those conversations early and helping them to heal. Cause I, I say, cause again, I keep pushing you guys. I want to know how these girls are going to be ready to be, you know, happy, healthy, wholesome wives, whenever that age Mm -hmm. is. And one of the things that we can definitely say is dealing with your stuff, right? Yeah. So if you know that your daughter has issues, help her to heal from those issues. The other thing that I heard you say, or that I took from it was teaching them the power of mindset. Because that's the self-talk, that's the story that you're telling that's, you know, deciding how you're going to feel, you know, and just, and choosing the thoughts, you know, we're all personal yeah. development people here. Right. We know. Right. So it's giving right. the, her, giving our daughters the toolkit in order to be able to regulate their own emotions, exactly. which is something else, right. which I think again, will really help them inshallah when they do go into, into the marriage inshallah. Um, okay. Barakallah fiki. Um, sister Neha is here. Mashallah. Assalamu alaikum sis. Wa alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Great to have you with us. Mashallah. Um, so what's your take? Everyone is coming with a slightly different take on, you know, qualities of a Muslim wife, but looking at it from how you would advise your daughters, inshallah. Okay. So I actually had this conversation with my daughters in preparation for oh, this. Wonderful. Um, and subhanAllah, one of the first things that came up when I was speaking to them is, and they're still relatively young, but mm. I was trying to help them understand that it's important to understand marriage for what it is. So yeah. for a lot of us and in our culture, Bollywood, Hollywood, the West, everywhere, the focus is marriage. It's just getting married, right? The wedding, actually, specifically. Yes, the wedding. <laughs> 
But the main point I wanted them to understand is that marriage is a means to an end. It's not the end. So, you know, we think about finding the right man, the right spouse, his qualities, um, what he's going to do for me. But really, that man can quite truly be your vehicle to your end, which is Jannah. And I feel like this perspective is so important because I really hope truly that my daughters, when they get married, they don't attach to a spouse, but they're so truly attached to Allah that when it comes to topics like obedience, for example, they know that they're obeying to Allah when their husband asks something of them, which is within the deen, but that perhaps conditioning from society, media, or even me, may Allah protect us, yeah. when that comes into play, that they remember that when they obey him, they're obeying Allah. So their, mar he, their marriage to him, the state of it, if it's a good brother, if it's a practicing brother, if it's sincere, not perfect, but doing the best that he can, to remember that sometimes you receive guidance on the siha from your spouse, and it might be hard to hear, but truly, perhaps Allah is guiding you through that person who has chosen to be on this journey with you. And um, I hope that they have that perspective going through so that it doesn't become about the little things. It doesn't become about things that truly won't matter in the hereafter, where we're all just people here on this worldly plane trying to return back to our Lord at the end of the day. And when we keep that perspective, when we have that strong why, which is to be pleasing in front of Allah, then being pleasing to our spouse becomes easy because we realize that Allah put him here as a purification for us, as a test for us, you know, as a guidance for us. And so we're able to let go a lot of that resentment, especially as a revert coming in to this scene. I feel like that perspective was really, really helpful for me personally. Jazakallah khairan. I think, yeah, I think what I'm, I, one of the things that I've heard from you is, you know, again, having those honest conversations about kind of the world outside and what is, what the world is saying and then what the Dean says. But I think one, one thing that ties what everybody is saying together, which you all more or less mentioned, is this relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Absolutely. But what do you mean by that? And how are we going to do that? Naima, what say you? Ah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Jazakallah khair, Naima, for having me. Um, absolutely. My number one thing was having a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all the sisters have said the same thing. And it's really key because, especially in relationships, it's not so hard when the things are good. It's when things become challenging. And then, you know, you may have, uh, he's upset with you or th there's some sort of issues that are going on how do you navigate yourself through those emotions when things are so tough and it will be new experiences new emotions as well and when you have that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already it really helps you know it really helps to have that you know you take it back to Allah because ultimately the relief will come from Allah. The guidance comes from Allah. But sometimes we have this relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I say like a doctor, you know, we only call on him when we need him. And so when we're in that habit of having that relationship with Allah, where if you remember him in ease, he'll remember you, knew you in your times of difficulty, to have that already established. And that's ultimately a, a, a believer, isn't it? But I think that... That's the key thing that will really help you navigate yourself through that because seeking counsel with Allah, seeking clarity, people may, may not seem how they you may perceive them to be around you. You may seek advice from people, but it's ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and that's what we want, marriage or not marriage. You know, ultimately we want our children, our daughters, our sons for ourselves to have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the primary goal in our lives, you know, the primary, well, the primary reason why we're here. I think my second advice would definitely be to respect uh, before respecting others. Learn to respect herself. Um, 
know who you are. And I think Aisha said this as well, that you're a Muslim, you're a servant of Allah, a creation of Allah, a worshipper of Allah. And for you to return to him and be respectful to yourself and your thought, your heart, your body. So it's not just like being respectful to others. You can't respect someone else before you respect yourself. You need to know who you are. But being respectful of yourself is your thoughts, your mindset, your body, your cleanliness, your fitness. And then again, you know, the amount of sisters that are contacting me recently saying that they're not able to have children. They've got fertility issues. Um, the honey comes in, you know. And I just feel like lifestyle today, it, traditionally we used to say, how do I know that she's fertile? Or how do I know that she's uh, of childbearing? You know, she, she could have multiple children, look to her family, look to her mother, look to her, uh, you know, extended family. Are they childbearing families, you know, mothers? But it ends up being that, you can't really tell because contraceptions are being used. People are saying, no, I just want one child or I just want two children. So you don't know. But diet, exercise, lifestyle, the effects of sugar, it affects the man, it affects the woman. And we're finding that obviously having children is la qadr Allah, but we don't want to be able to have daughters who are lacking in being, you know, we don't want to be the contributors, basically, yeah. of, 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 of that. And I think, um, yeah, I think definitely, like, being active, because I think one of the big things, shocks for young sisters, I've got a niece who's recently become mother, alhamdulillah, is the, the lifestyle change. And I think that we do tend to have very sedentary lifestyles on our phones, on our gadgets, not being so proactive, not everyone, but I definitely think that being more engaged, I'd like my daughter to be more engaged in communities and society, just so that it would help her as well. Um, but in terms of, you know, definitely managing and navigating through marriage, being able to treat others how she wants to be treated, but I, and that means managing emotions. I think it's definitely given me food for thought, you know, when uh, you said about the advice to daughters. And I felt like holding back, choosing your battles, having that patience, but not being someone who's going to be just taking, taking uh, nonsense. Um, just know how to take care of our home and to take pride in that, I think. And that's someone... And I and I really I think my last advice would definitely be to be invested, to be keenly invested into the marriage. Um, it's a contract. You're coming into it with uh, maybe some sort of expectations, but I really feel like anything that you anything which is say if I'm I've got a business and I want to invest in it, you're my business partner. What are you going to bring to the table? What am I bringing to the table? But regardless, for anything to be successful. You need to have a level of graft, level of, yeah, I'm willing to make sacrifices. I think today, maybe I, I hope that my daughters, inshallah, they, they can and that they want to make sacrifices for the happiness, you know, for the, for the home that they invested in that, they invested into their husbands, they invested into the relationship. They are wanting to put the other before themselves because ultimately, when someone, when you see that someone is invested in you and the other is giving so much, naturally it becomes a two-way thing as well. I can go on. No, that's, that, sorry, can I just say, I'm just going to put it out there. That's the stuff I want, ladies. I want the hard stuff. Okay, self-love mm -hmm. is wonderful, but everyone talks about self-love and the whole society tells them self-love is fantastic. Uh, even certain other things, mashallah, they'll get that from society. But I think the premise that I'm operating from is that society does not teach women how to be wives in general, right? Pop culture doesn't help. Uh, movies hardly help. I've noticed, right, that <laughs> the only time that you see relationships depicted in any depth or detail is when they're haram. 
So when it's, they're not married, right? And they're either courting or they're just messing about or it's a hookup or whatever. Thousands of films about that. And then when it's marriage, all you see from the relationship is usually not in detail. It's a backdrop to the story, right? It's not the story. It's a backdrop to the story. And it's typically not great. It's either the the husband, you know, the husband, like she's unhappy with him or he's unhappy with her or the marriage is in the backdrop and the whole focus is the kids or something else that's happening. Right. So as a culture, we we don't celebrate being married anymore and we certainly mm-hmm. don't sort of teach. And another thing, I think Coach Nyla and Fatima, we talked about this on our podcast, I think, because I was saying how so often in movies they show the man doing things for the woman whether they're married or not he brings her coffee he brings her breakfast in bed he gets the flowers he's always doing nice things for her when was the last time you saw a woman do something nice for a man in a film or in an advert cook him breakfast serve him something nice buy him a gift write him a little note show that she appreciates him show that she loves him show that she's glad that he's around you don't see that so i i'm really kind of want to like push the envelope a little bit and talk about the stuff i mean doing it for allah alhamdulillah we we've covered that in this conference and in general mashallah i think we all have that understanding but what's the stuff that no one's saying what are the qualities that no one's talking about? What's the advice they're not going to hear unless we give it to them? I want to chime in a little bit um, okay. on that. Actually, <laughs> I said it a couple of times um, in the number of videos that I've done, being um, a person who was raised by a single mother who was raised by a single mother. Um, so I had to learn <laughs> how to be a wife. You know, I had to learn these different things. And, and you're not alone, sis. That's going to yeah. be the majority. Unfortunately, <laughs> can I just, just let's keep it real. The majority <laughs> of daughters, if not already, then the majority of daughters within a few years will come from single parent households mm-hmm. or a household where it wasn't her biological father, right? Mm-hmm. That's exactly. big. That is huge. So talk to it, sis. And that's the thing with my daughter, my biological daughter, because I said, you know, I have five biological children and seven bonus children. But out of those five biological children, one (laughs) is a girl. So I only have one biological daughter. And coming from a person who was raised by a single mother, who was raised by a single mother, and it was massive masculine energy um, involved because of, you know, having to be the dad and the mom and the different things like that. And, you know, having to take on both roles type of things, so to speak, because you have to be the provider and the protector and the nurturer and the this, you know, so those type of things where I asked my mother at 14 years old, um, can I have kids? Because I wanted children. I wanted children. Like, can I have kids and kick the guy to the curb? Because I thought that, you know, why be, you know, as if you guys don't know, I'm a, con- I'm a, I'm a convert, revert. <laughs> so my mother is not Muslim. But I was like, can I just, you know, have kids and kick the guy to the curb? Because I thought that it was um, trouble. And my thing is, I have this saying in my head, and I've heard it growing up, I can do bad by myself. I don't need no help to starve to death. (laughs) You know, it's like, I can do it myself. So I had to learn these different things so much to a point where reading different books and watching different programs and watching things about femininity and learning these different things, I decided to create actually a curriculum. I decided to create a framework so I can teach my daughter what it will look like because It feels great to be feminine. It's great to live in your femininity. It feels great to be submissive. You know, it feels great to have that natural nurturing spirit, you know, so those different things. However, there's so much to it. It's so, we're so multifaceted. And to be an amazing wife takes you utilizing all of that. And um, just really quick and just break down some things. I named it spears. I put it, broke it down into a thing called spears. And that's spirituality, your perception, which is your mindset, economics, attractiveness, relationship building, and self-care. And from those things, I teach and train just naturally, normally, um, every day to her. So whether we see something, we discuss about it, uh, (laughs) whether we make things from scratch in the kitchen. My my daughter is not a microwave queen. (laughs) 
<laughs> so, you know, it's these different things where it's just those beautiful nurturing things that allowed you to feel so good to be that woman, but she also still knows how to start a business, how to um, learn things about different economics, whether it's homemaking or at also business building, um, as well as taking care of herself, the self-care that we need to um, utilize, not letting ourselves go, understanding what our individuality um, is, you know, because I didn't have that growing up. I was looking to please everybody else. And I was unhappy, suicidal at 16. So it was just not a beautiful thing. I didn't have that beautiful self-talk. I didn't have that wonderful self-care. I was trying to be you know, pleasing to everybody because I thought that if I made other people happy, I would be happy. So being able to teach these different things to say, you know what? Yes, your spirituality and knowing that it's something greater than you that you know you have to please and push for and you're gonna have to answer for the things that you do that's the first and foremost however how do you do that is um, making sure you have that strong connection but you also have to be intentional with what life looks like for you you have to be intentional and you have to be not only intentional but hold yourself accountable people don't like to hear that you know it's easy to place blame it's easier to be the victim. It's easier to blame drama and traumatic experiences. As I stated before, I came from a single mother who was, who was raised by a single mother. Um, I had a lot of death and a lot of different things in my life, but I, it's up to me to allow that to infect me and allow me to be harsh or hard or not knowing how to move forward in life properly. And if we become harsh and hard, you know, the men are created as the protectors and the providers. They're the, they're the hard ones. We're the soft ones. But to come into that, to come into a marriage with a man, with that masculine energy, is not anything positive is going to come out of that. So, you know, being able to teach these different things, and these are things that I've learned along the way. My mother taught me a number of things, but how to be feminine <laughs> was not one of them. Um, she looked at, she looked apart, great. <laughs> but when it came down to, you know, being that um, submissive person and being submissive doesn't make you weak. But when you grow up thinking that if you are submissive or if you um, are following your husband or these type of things or you know that it makes you weak it makes you a punk it may, I had so many different things that went on in my head that was very wrong and it actually caused drama in relationships that I had to before marriage and then it also caused problems in um, the marriage that I had or the marriage now I, had, because I, I, I want to jump in this is because you mentioned something important right so this is a question to everybody on the panel right and I think it's a very valid question how are you navigating your daughter learning skills and becoming capable right uh, getting her, you know developing her potential and ensuring that she does not out develop a marriage if you understand what I mean by that so, so she's not so independent or kind of hard, like what coach Nyla said and sort of worldly wise and world weary that she finds it difficult to settle into a marriage. How do you, how are you striking that balance? If at all. Can I jump in there? Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, I know for me at least, and I'm sure all of us know kids don't listen. Kids learn more from what you do than what you actually say. So I'm very, very aware of the example that I'm showing them. And I mean, we can do that in a pretty superficial way. And I, I know all of us can think of examples of, you know, the wife who goes and, you know, she serves her husband food, for example, and she's doing it, but you can hear the comments under her breath. She's scoffing a little bit. She's resentful. Um, you know, that, that tray or that plate or that cup hit that table a little harder than it needed to. Um, perhaps there wasn't a lot of love in the salt in that dish or, you know, um, whatever else, that resentment is bubbling up, right? So I know with my daughters or even with my sons, when I'm trying to set an example, I try and make it a really sincere one. And one of the sisters touched on it before in terms of emotion. 
and she touched on some pretty emotion, um, pretty important, you know, types of, you know, knowing when to hold back and being aware of, you know, how to show up in different ways. But I think it's really important to model for our daughters being aware of our emotion and not being, you know, kind of a slave to our emotion. Out of so, control. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So you could be like, okay, so a, a good wife should, um, you know, s- serves her husband in a loving way, right? So you may say that constantly, but then the way you serve your husband could be very resentful, like I said, mm-hmm. you know, or, you know, when you're sitting with your friends, you're complaining about your husband. Or, you know, when your husband is not there, you're chucking underhanded kind of comments, um, you know, like, oh, you know, Bob is like this and Bob is like that. Or, <gasps> wow. You know, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's like we can pretend like that doesn't happen, but it happens a lot. Mm-hmm. And- I'm so glad that Neha has brought this up because this is life, right? This is mm-hmm. it's like you can. Sorry, I just interjected. That's- um, but I, I've, I'm sitting here, actually, I was going to ask this to, to Coach Naila, because when you were describing how beautifully you're raising your daughter, Allah Mubarak, and Allah bless your relationship and make her sadqa jariya for you and an asset for the ummah, mm-hmm. all of our children, inshallah. I really felt that we need to help them regulate their emotions, because that's really difficult. Like when you find that he's not supported her maybe in the way that she wanted or she heard the in-laws say something that wasn't so nice or she did something and it wasn't appreciated these are new emotions and to recognize what triggers you how do you deal with your anger how do you relax how do you let off steam how do you learn to adjust and Mm. it's very difficult no matter how much you try and prepare your children they can never really fully be prepared but like you're saying sister Neha that modeling is so important And I think that this is what we need to speak more about. It's not so much about what you create on the good, but it's also how you manage the bad and the yin and yang of life, you know, to have that kind of seesaw effect. Things go up and things go down, but there still has to be some sort of level of balance and harmony, even when you do go down. Mm. Um, What do you say? And I think, sorry, can I just, yeah, just to that that point, I think something else is kind of tied to the point that I was making before. I think another way that we can prepare our daughters to be wives is to be honest with them about the ups and the downs, right? About the highs and the lows. Um, I used to hate it when we used to go to Walima's and the the main thing that people used to say was have patience, have patience. (laughs) have sabr and I was like what why do you keep telling these women to have sabr like marriage is lit like what do you mean sabr like what is wrong with you you're acting like marriage is this this dreadful like test and it's such a chore and you just have to grin and bear it and just 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 grit your teeth sis you'll be okay I hated that I hated it so much and I thought that it was such a bad example to everybody else who had come to celebrate the marriage that the first thing you say is have sober sis it's like wow thanks a lot mate for the vo- vote of confidence so I would say do you know what sis love on him and enjoy yourself that's what I used to say love on him and enjoy yourself because I I would hate for my daughter to go into marriage with this kind of sense of okay now it's my martyr phase you know, yeah. now it's my sacrificial phase, right? So on the one hand, you I want her to be excited about marriage. It's like some people in the comments were saying, marriage like sounds like such hard work. You guys are making this so hard. And I don't know about you guys. If I think about the high points of my marriage or even just my general memory of my marriage, what a blessing, what a blessing, what what a wonderful adventure we've been on or what we went on, you know, and I can, when I, when I cast my mind to it, I can remember the sweet times, the fun times, the loving times, the crazy times. We all have that. Right. So I want my daughter to have that. And I also want her to know that it's not always going to be like that. There will be times when it's challenging, when you're not, you know, in your best, when you're not at your best, when he's not at his best, he's human. This is how you navigate it, right? But having that balanced approach where it's not all doom and gloom, but it's also not like sunshine and rainbows and oh my God, you know, like what Maryam Lemel was saying, which was she never saw her parents fighting. 
She never saw her parents fighting. So when she had a disagreement with, uh, you know, brother Saeed in the, I think it was the first couple of days, she said, take me to my father's house. This is not going to work. Like it's, it's a divorce. Like I'm out of here, you know, because that was the unrealistic expectation that she had. But anyway, uh, what, what, what does anyone else want to chime in on um, expectations or dealing with the negative or even just like having fun? I don't know. What are your thoughts? Sounding a real quick part. <laughs> so Go ahead. Um, the real quick thing is funny that you said that too, because my daughter and I, we tease about different things and we call, we actually have a name for it. We call it the hunty bunty thing. Like if the husband is uh, being like, quote unquote annoying, I guess. <laughs> I don't really want to say it like that, but it's like, if certain things happen. So it was like even teasing my, um, my bonus baby was like, okay, you're going to have what's called a hunty bunty, you know, events. It'd be times where he wants certain things or be like, I just want to read a book and now he wants to do these things. So just kind of fun stuff, but it's like, you know, just find the fun in it. And, um, you know, so we kind of tease about it. And even if it's, um, something about, um, you might've been tired and, there's, you know, you make food, like that, the comment that was made before is like, oh, you just hear kind of the mumbling or the certain things under the, under the breath. We started to look at it a different way is where it's like, you know, instead of mumbling about, oh my gosh, I got to do this, or um, it's so, you know, it's, it's so late, or, you know, maybe he should have just went and grabbed something while he was out or something on the lines of that, just like, you know what? he's asking me to do something because maybe he likes my food or maybe he enjoys the, you know, the love that's coming from it and these different things like that. So kind of even um, changing the mindset of, you know, what may be an annoyance or a quote unquote annoyance because we are all human, you know, the mindset. Uh, it remind me of a song that yeah. I did that I listened to. He says, sometimes I love you more than you ever know. Other times you get on my nerves. It's just reality. <laughs> Well, that's facts. That's some beautiful words. And I get yeah. it. I get yeah. it. It ain't always be that way. But all in all, it's just a beautiful thing when you look at it. What I what I I mean doing with my daughter now is um, and I think it's if we can pull it off, I think it's an amazing thing. I said, look, this husband here, you know the, you know that book that was written in the I think it was written in the 50s or 60s, The Proper Feeding and Caring of Husbands. Have any, has, yeah. any, has anyone heard of it? Right. And she wrote it at a time when she noticed all around her that the women were just not looking after their men. Like they were trying to deal with these young kids and they had all these appliances at home, but they just were not looking after their men. They didn't know how to cook any of them and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, my point is, when you mentioned about cooking food, right? I know we had conversations about cooking uh, last year. If anybody remembers the videos from last year, this was a, an issue that would cause a lot of fracas. But Hale, Sister Hale Banani put it so beautifully. And I think in terms of mindset, I think this is a beautiful way to frame this, is that this man has been gifted to me as Amana, just as I've been gifted to him. And I get to X, Y, Z. I get mm. to serve him. I get to feed him. I get to look after him as he looks after me. But let's not talk about that. I get to show up for him in the way that shows him that he is loved, that he's appreciated, that he is valued. I get to be intimate with him. I get to be alone with him. I get to enjoy special time with him. I get to try out my recipes on him, right? I get to be the mother of his children. And that's why I say to my daughter, I hope and I pray that she marries a man for whom that's how she feels. I get to do this. Not anyone else. I get to do this. I don't want my husband eating from the takeaway. That's my job. I feed, not, not the guy at the kebab shop. I give you food, bruv. Like <laughs> that food is coming from me. I don't want you to go to your mom's house and eat her food. Come home and eat my food, right? So anyway, that's so, I don't know whether you think that that's a useful a useful mindset to raise our well, daughters I, in go ahead I, Maisha. I, I was i was gonna say because um embarrassingly i i'm a reaver as well i only learned to cook when i became muslim me too so. me too <laughs> first year of marriage my husband oh. used to have to make the rice i didn't know how to cook rice yeah yeah so i, I know it's like a small piece of advice but my, my sister-in-laws my husband's sisters they are one's coming up to 18 and one's 19 and the 19-year-old just gone off to university and now she's starting to cook. But the 18-year-old, 
I guess is more in a position that she would be looking for marriage. But I say to her, you know, you kind of need to start getting into the process. Get some skills. <laughs> yeah. But I, I was going to say, just not just around cooking, but I think in general, this generation um, are quite self-absorbed. I know a lot of, you know, a lot of people are, but they're quite self-absorbed and they're quite focused on themselves. And when you go into marriage, like I think, uh, I, I can't remember who was it, Coach Snyder that was saying, it's like another, it's, like, it's always like you're looking after, I don't want to say a baby, but it, sometimes it can be like, you know, I'm a child or a child that you're you're looking after, and I think when you when you haven't had an experience of cooking, you're kind of coming in from work or coming in from college, getting up when you want, not really cleaning up after yourself. But you okay, that to- that 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 there. Sorry, sis, that is a practical button to put in place. We <laughs> need to train our daughters yeah. properly and our yeah. sons, so they don't make a huge mess behind themselves. But yeah. we can't yeah. be graduating young ladies, young yeah. women who cannot look after themselves and cannot keep their space clean. And I say that, sis, because I was one of those girls. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. I mean, my I mean, my mother-in-law. You know, Mel, bless her. You know, she's very much like the queen of the house and she wants to do everything a certain way in a certain manner um I don't have any children but you know I think it's for for their kind of generation and for their understanding they'd rather do it themselves but then you're you're kind of forgetting the element of they need to grow they need to learn they need to adapt to it because again when they step into that marital home and there's all these things to do it's going to be really overwhelming Yeah. So mothers, if you're doing that thing of like taking care of the family so well that no one even knows how the washing is done, like it just disappears, the dirty clothes disappear and then they reappear clean, ironed, folded in people's drawers. You Mm -hmm. may feel really great about that, mashallah, and I get it, but you may be doing your family a disservice because you're not training them up properly. Tamkeen, I want to go to you because you came in slightly late. Uh, we're talking about how to make our daughter's wife material. So we've covered self, uh, the, the, we've covered the spiritual aspect. We've covered the emotional aspect, I think. Um, I think we've moved more towards the practical side of things, but what's your take on it? Well, alhamdulillah, um, assalamualaikum first everyone, um, but alhamdulillah this past summer my daughter got married um, and so I'm coming from that perspective of having spent six months kind of getting her in the mindset of, of what it's to expect and then now observing her in that element and I think the first and foremost thing is that I tell my daughter to uh, see her life as her, how her mother lived but then also um, see pick up from the good things take advice from those who you would want to their life to turn out to be. So, so now she has girls or anything. Oh, you live with in-laws. Oh, you do this or you do that. And there's all these noises and all these voices coming from all sides. And I said, see what works for everyone. So look at who you would think is a hero. And, um, and Alhamdulillah, we've, we've always surrounded her with people that she, you know, she veered towards, she magnetically went towards. So she liked the fact that, you know, certain um, uh, uh, spiritual teachers were a certain way. And I said, you like your life? And she said, yes. I said, what did she do? What did she put into a place to make that life successful? And so having these real life role models and heroes that she could have and she look at in their life and learn from her mom's experience. Like, what is it that you like about your mother's marriage? What is it that you like about... Um, about people around you and bring that into place. So the six months that I spent with her um, before she got married um, and the, the, the advices I would give her was basically like, you have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And every single person that comes into your life, whether that be your husband or your in-laws or whoever it is going to be, they're either bringing you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or you're, they're moving you away. Because in, in life, there's only two places you end up in, either Jahannam or Jannah. And so you have to decide is this person or this element or this place going to bring me closer or they're going to be the barrier and um and and or are they going to be someone who chooses to make me reflect about myself and choose that uh, and make that decision and make that be the voice in your ears to say okay yes this is going to be someone who I'm going to work and do and help them out and like especially with the husband is this going to be love that dictates or is it going to be my this this uh this uh blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed on me and what I have responsibility to this, this uh, what do you call that relationship, that thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me and I will have to answer for, that I had a husband, did I respect him, did I treat him well, and all that stuff. And you will see, and if he has that God-fearing will as well in him, that he will also reciprocate that. It, it, it was an emotional thing, but I think what I realized the most is that it made me uh, look at my own marriage before I give her advice for it. 
that it was a mirror that I held up in this mm. like what worked for me and what what didn't work for me and and um and that is something that I think all of this listening to all of this is that we can't bring our own baggage into the advice we give to our children we have to see them and meet them at who they are yes that is such key advice I cannot say I put it out on a forum um on, on Facebook like to, to, to Muslim mamas what three advices would you give and I have some fantastic advice because I just thought you know this is really good but let's think practically as well and there was baggage in advice a lot of baggage you know it was like the resentment type thing you know and 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 that was quite quite tough and I think that that's why when we're in a marriage as well I was going to say that talking about managing emotions I know we've moved away but a little bit of when we do things do it really for the sake of Allah and don't hold grudges like don't hold the grudges because I think when things don't work out the way that you want it or it's been appreciated or separated the way that you actually wanted it mm-hmm. or you know the grudges and the hurt it I, I I don't know if it's a woman thing and especially that advice of you know never going to bed angry yes so absolutely. I, I, I say to her um or I say to myself oftentimes so we've been married for over two decades now, me and my husband. And with the advice, the, the thing that I have in my mind is don't go to bed angry. We try to resolve it. But if you're both not at that emotional space, go to your go to bed with an empty heart. Yeah. So that you've already decided to forgive them and that you've already have regret over what you've said or done. So that that place when you wake up in the morning, you wake up where you're waking up with resolve already in your heart and you work from that space. But you know what really helps resolve a conflict as well? Just to kind of tuck it in there. When I'm upset, he's upset. Just make a cup of tea, you know? It's, right. it's, like, it's, it's, it's like you don't even have to talk it through, you know? Do something good. Do an act of khidmah. Do an act of service. Right. And it just kind of, you know, how can you not? It's like there doesn't, doesn't have to be communication. Right. It's like an unsaid common peace treaty, extending out the olive branch, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think that they are like the more practical things as well that will help uh, navigate things. Right. And I, right. I add one quick thing. I'm, I might have to shoot in a minute. I think I said to you, Naima, because I'm kind of at work as well. So, um, yeah. I think for myself in my marriage, um, one, of, one of the most important things that, I, that I've learned along the way is um, not taking personally like the kind of constructive feedback that my husband's given me like in the beginning it was like oh you you know I would take it so personally and I take it as a as a kind of oh you know he he doesn't like me or he's putting me down and that came from my own stuff that came from you know the relationship that I had with my mother in that she was very critical and so whenever my husband would you know try to have an open conversation and you know let me know something that he that he wasn't happy about or that, he, you know, that it wasn't always, it wasn't really big things, but I would just take it so personally and then I would kind of shut off. But in reality, you know, if you're in a, in a marriage where you're, you're both, you know, quite healthy adults and you want the best for each other and you're looking at him as a, you know, as somebody that loves you and cares about you, it's always a good idea to try and get into that mindset of accepting, you know, uh, listening, listening and accepting. yeah listening yeah listening I think listening like you said it's like developing again and I think maybe I see this with my own daughter right girls need to know how to accept feedback just like boys do mm-hmm. but I've noticed with girls nowadays they don't want to get any feedback no, from no. a man or a boy have you know have you guys noticed that it's like no 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 you don't get to tell me whether it's her brother or her father or whoever I've managed to well I'm not managed to but I've started catching my daughter out when she gives her brother back chat right when she's Mm -hmm. like trying to assert herself because that's very masculine right Mm -hmm. there's no need to he's just giving you some advice right what's with the pushback what's with the arguing back and forth and the chat back because for sure if she does that with her brother and she's used to that she grew up with that she's going to want to do that with her husband I don't know coach Fatima do you think that that's the case do you think that's something have you noticed it with your kids because I mean coach Nadir he looks like he runs a tight ship so like (laughs) what's the deal at home here (laughs) well I'll just say this we grew up coach Nyla can speak to this too my grandparents were from the South and you didn't talk back. 
<laughs> you just didn't do it. <laughs> you knew not to do it. We're black, you did it. There was a repercussion for doing so. You don't talk back. You better not say I, before you're, they pop you, <laughs> you know, for saying something back. So there's a, there's a respect level. So one thing our children that were not allowed to do was to hit each other because sometimes children don't know when to stop. They couldn't hit each other with their words, hit each other with their hands. So we wanted them to be safe from each other's words and hand. Now, sometimes it has sound like the OJ trial among my daughters in our home. <laughs> it's not like a bunch of little attorneys going at it. Um, however, it depends on the, the child too. So you, I learned that I can't talk to all my daughters the same way and all my sons the same exact way. So the communication I have with my daughter that's over, she's 27 years old. And then I have one that's 20. We, we have a different conversation, you know? However, I know what, what their triggers are, what their buttons are, but it's like, okay, wait a minute. Let's meet each other with some type of grace and understanding when we're talking to one another, especially their brother who's 15 and then their little brothers. Right. Because he's still learning as a 15 year old how to communicate with women that are there's his sisters. Yeah. So yeah. like, he don't you know, it's like, OK, you got to knock before you go into their room. You can't just knock and go in. You have to be allowed to come in. So there's certain etiquettes he has to learn about them and there's certain etiquettes they must learn about him. So emasculating him at 15, we, we want to make sure we stay away from that. Talk more, to that, wanna... Talk more to that. I, I think for the benefit of those who maybe don't have an idea of what that looks well, like. I think it starts young. You can emasculate at a very young age. And once our sons sit amongst, let's say, a bunch of aunties, a bunch of um, sisters that are older than them, it can tend to feel like they're ganged up on if the wrong communication is going on amongst them. So Such as? If, like what? if my son, if my son um, buys something, if he goes to the store for one of the girls and he'll go to the store and he buys something that's not the right thing. He didn't have malicious intent behind it. So it must be a universal truth that there was not malicious intent to buy the wrong style of bread or the wrong hair comb or the wrong whatever. It is, I'm very conscious that I don't want us to be the ones that are causing this, um, this destruction in his mind of his core memories. It's like, I don't want our core memory for him to be, well, they talk down to me. They talk down to me. They said things about me and it made me feel this uh -huh. big. They ganged up on me, whatever the case may be. So we have to be very careful about that communication. And he's 15. He's still trying to figure it all out. So he's going to, because if he doesn't have prior knowledge or total recall of something happening amongst women, then it's not easily identifiable to him. So I don't want to jump on him and go, you know, I'll say, Suleiman, well, you know, just do it this way next time. You know, I'm not saying your way is wrong, but I just want to kind of show you a better way to do that. Now, why did you do that? Where were you? How come you bought that? And then just bashing, bashing, bashing. Is you that know, for sons and daughters, though? Because I was going to say, Naima, where's the, where's the advice to the sons series? <laughs> <laughs> we did that yesterday, babe. You missed yeah. out. <laughs> oh, so it's, it's not the space for that from, from mothers yeah <laughs> i want friend. my my sons and my bonus sons to understand what healthy communication sounds like with men and women at a very early age so when they if a lot forbid that they they come um, come across a, a sister that they want to marry and she ends up being the opposite of that I want them to know what healthy communication sounds like out of their own home, you know, and then they can go, mm, that's not how we're supposed to communicate. But if they're hearing negativity and toxicity constantly, sometimes people can get accustomed to that and think that's normal behavior. And I don't want that for any of them. So teaching that the girls to go, okay, 
We need a spokesperson and we don't need four sisters going at one brother or whatever, you know, let's pick a spokesperson because you'll have your peacemakers, you'll have your, your daughters that are kind of more blunt and they might have to pull back because the 15 year old is going, what did I do wrong? I didn't even know I did anything, you know? Yeah. So it's that it's going, okay, he's still learning and we're going to give him a chance to learn just like our husbands. They have a learning curve still, just like we have a learning curve. So we have to offer them some grace and go, okay, everybody thought, especially entering into marriage, we should have this thing figured out by now and it's year two. No, Mm -hmm. that's not how that works. (laughs) Because just as we are people that are newlyweds, our husbands are newlyweds too. And they're figuring it out as men that are newlyweds. And we're figuring it out as wives that are newlyweds. Or even if you've been married for 25 years, you are having different relationships with the same person over time. So when I married and he's 19, and I'm married now, and he's not 19, that's two different men. That's two different relationships. So speaking to people are going to evolve here, here, and giving them some patience and going, okay, he's not done this before. And he needs some practice just as I do is important. So to tell my son that I said, Well, Suleiman, how many wives do you have, want to have? How many children do you want to have? And he looked at me and he was about 11 or 12. He said, as many as I can handle. I said, well, what's that? He said, a wife and two kids. (laughs) So that's that's it, sis. And I didn't, it wasn't my job to make him want more than that. Although he might, it was my job to listen to him and not add to it or subtract from it. Agreed, so, yes. and, and I think what you were saying, uh, uh, Naeem, I think uh, another point is obviously healthy communication yeah. across all bounds, yes. you know, across yes. all the, across all the whole, the whole board yes. is what we should be striving for so that our girls and our boys know what it looks like. They know what yeah. it looks like. To ha- they know what a respectful conversation looks like. They and know I what think- an honest conversation looks like. You know, they know what, yes. you know, they know what being yeah. told off and or getting feedback feels like and processing right. feedback, right? And right. not taking feedback personally, right? These are things right. that they have to learn. Uh, so inshallah, we can, you know, be intentional about yeah. teaching them that. But Mediam, you've been very quiet and we have to wrap up. Yeah. So I would love for, to, to, for you to give us maybe a little tidbit, inshallah, before we close out, because we've got Anissa waiting in the wings for the final yeah, talk of the evening. Change. This should be a two hour talk as well, but we just could not. This one I took out. I was thinking that I, know I, have, was going I have no idea. I don't know who's who's where's that's coming from, but go ahead, sis. Okay. I have a son and I have a daughter, and uh, sometimes, you know, uh, when they are talking, I quietly listen, and I just listen where the gap is, because I'm constantly teaching them, I'm telling them, but sometimes I let them fight, I let them be, so that you know I get to see which one is lacking, and where they need the support. So. Uh, my daughter, I have an older daughter, and my son is younger. My daughter is okay to take advice, feedback from my husband, but she's not okay to take it from her younger brother. And that's where the conflict begins. So I was like, how can I navigate that so that my son is okay that if the woman is not listening and she has her own point of view, and my daughter is like, if the man is telling you, like the younger brother is telling you not to do something, you have to listen to him. So it's it's not easy because they have their own mindset and I want them to make the decisions on their own. But with the girls, especially, like we're talking about girls, I feel that the more exposed they are to media, especially the memes and all, like today my daughter was showing me a meme where um, it's a funny video. She's making fun of the husband and she's having crackers. And it's nice. I laughed with her. But then after laughing with her, I made a straight face. She's like, oh, what's wrong? Now tell me what's wrong. You you have a red flag for this as well? I'm like, yes, I have it. This is what we're not supposed to do. You are laughing at it. You are enjoying it only for maybe 15 or 20 seconds. 
but it stays in your mind and it has an impact on you. You cannot be making fun of your husband. And she's like, no, but it's a meme. It's fine. I mean, no, it's not fine. It's not fine because it's there in your mind and you have to not make fun of the relationship. So you're like, okay, I get your point, but still I don't understand. What are you trying to say? You know, the girls are getting impacted with these things. It's very funny. It's humorous. She's like, it's just a meme. I will just uh, watch it and, you know, keep my phone. I'm like, yes, you need to keep your phone and filter whom you watch because this has an impact on you. And the same thing, my son tells my daughter that, Papa, don't watch this show. There are certain bad things. She's like, I'm the older one. I know it. I'm like, no, you have to be okay to take advice from the, uh, your brother. He's looking out for you. It's not easy, mm. but I let them fight. I let them express themselves. But at the same time, tell them it's okay if the other person has their own mind because you can't change the other person. Your point is to warn to tell them what to do, what not to do, then the other person is responsible for making decisions. So I'm at this point in uh, parenting right now with my kids. Obviously, when they get older, I'll have different challenges. But to be present in your kid's life is very, very important and allow them to be the person they want, are going to be. Obviously, we are shaping them, we are doing their therapy, but at the same time, giving them safe space to express themselves. That is to work through to work through the process mm, to work through the process and I think just on that point inshallah before we wrap up and I think that can be a real sticking point I think within families that how come he can tell me what to do like why should I have to listen to him he's my brother he's younger he's older he's this he's that um and I think that that's a conversation to be had because if we are telling the boys that you are Qawam and you're going to be Qawam and you're responsible for your sisters and, you know, if if she's going to go somewhere at night, I need you to go with her. I need you to take her here, take her there and take care of them. She needs to understand that the reciprocal relationship is that you allow him to take some responsibility, right? Which means that you you need to respect, you know, his judgment on something. So, for example, if you say to him, um, I want you to accompany your sister, she's going to a friend's house, right? So, you know, it's nighttime, whatever, walk with her. And they're walking and they're supposed to take a left. And he looks down that road and says, I don't think that's safe. Or I know people on this road or whatever the case may be. I think we should go this way. Obviously, considering that he's a responsible lad, she should understand that I need to turn right and not argue about going left or, you know, like make it uh, like a big deal about going left because he is taking me. He is taking care of me so he's kind of responsible for me he can't be responsible for me if I go down the left alley and then something happens right because well I defied him and I said well I don't care what you think I'm going that way it's shorter for example it's just an example but do you guys think that that's fair do you think that that is breeding something unhealthy <clears throat> what do you what are your thoughts I, I think I think that again I know you guys have touched on various different you know over the period of time of this kind of feeding into this like feminism but I feel like this the women empowerment thing there's a there's a kind of fine line between empowering a woman or empowering a, a young woman and you know making her so empowered that she feels that she has the say above the husband um and that's when like you said for example if you, if you turn it around and it's the husband walking with the wife and the, the husband see something or wants her to do something but she is so empowered if you like that she feels that actually no I think we should go left and not right I think that this is quite common with with young women and, and and older women as well that have been kind of fed this narrative that no you know you you are empowered enough to make your own decisions when it's not really accurate yeah I want to chime in a little bit on that too because it reminds me of how someone told a story it was like they get so empowered and say that, oh, I want to do this and we are the same. But then when a burglar or I mean, not a burglar, when a, a yeah. mugger comes down the street, who do you want? Are you going to you want your husband <laughs> to push you in front of him and say, hey, how about you take care of it since you're so empowered, since you're, you know, we're so much alike um, type of thing. And so it's a meme, that, but it's true. 
It's a yeah. meme, but it's true. It's like, but you it's can't true. argue with that. Because we get into that, that mindset of like, well, you know, but they say, I'm a strong, independent woman. You can't tell me what to do. But the thing is, is that it seems as though you want the, the equality, so to speak, when you want the equality, when it's beneficial or you call it beneficial to you. But then when it's where you have to do the extra work or you have to do these other things that you're not comfortable with, then you don't want it anymore. So the yeah. thing is like, okay, which side do you want to be on? <laughs> it's like, you can't straddle the fence. So, you know, be submissive, you know, be understanding that this person is here to lead you. And they tr- and if you're supposed to, if they're supposed to be, you're supposed to be the trust where they are supposed to take care of you and provide for you and these different things like that. Let, you know, be that supportive system. Don't yeah. be combative, those type of things. So no, I definitely don't think that, you know, it's breeding something negative because when it comes down to it, it's like, okay, if this person knows, you know, that's just the thing, I say the same thing, even when it comes to parenting. If you have a child that's fussing at you and complaining, like they just know it all. And you've been here mm-hmm. a whole lot longer. or You've been around here. Like you said it before. Oh, I know these people around this block or whatever the case may be. Yeah, yeah. Like, why are you fighting me with this? You know, yeah. why are we having this conversation? And it might be interesting, guys, for you, if you have daughters, for example, who have already like exhibited discomfort with the language around uh, being a dutiful wife, being an obedient mm-hmm. wife, do that exercise that I showed you yesterday where you play with language and look at it from the, okay, so the word disobedient, what's coming up for you? What does it bring up for you? Now let's look at the synonyms for that word. And and I, I, I would suggest doing that exercise with them and seeing what comes up for them, um, because I think that it may help to um, de-escalate the emotion, right, that they have tied to that word. Um, and, you know, if you are a dutiful wife, open the, like, pe- peel back the curtain a little bit and let them know sort of, you know, this, this home that you live in, which is, you know, so peaceful and comfortable and you feel safe in, there's a reason why it's like that. It's like that because Baba's taken responsibility for the family and he does X, Y, and Z. It's like that because I support him in this way and that way. It's like that because Baba and I have decided that we're not going to argue about petty things. Uh, It's like that because Baba and I have always decided to put Allah first. Whatever it is that's making your dynamic work, be, I think be open with your children. I think we issued people a challenge, didn't we, yesterday? But sisters, it's been amazing. Like I said, this could have been a two-hour stream. So <laughs> my apologies. We just wanted to pack so much in. So we had to limit everybody to an hour. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you and your families and your daughters and your sons and the rest of your dhuriya, as Um Khalid said today, mashallah. And I hope, inshallah, that you will get to share this stream and the videos with more of your people. And inshallah, we'll see you in in a year's time maybe less but jazakumullah khair and thank you so much for being part of this assalamu alaikum guys sister anisa is in here to boot everybody out assalamu <laughs> alaikum you guys can stay stay and watch if you want but sister anisa is taking over now what's anisa, that anisa you're muted babe you're muted yeah, you're muted. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Listen, I wish I was in there because I could have talked about two of my daughters who are married. Subhanallah. Maybe so you'll it- talk about it now, inshallah. <laughs> alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Well I'm so sorry, sis. We kept you for waiting for half an hour. Astaghfirullah. May Allah forgive us. Alhamdulillah, my love. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Are you good to present or are you wanting us to be together? What's the situation? Um, um, let's, let's do it together. Bismillah. I think it'll be better if you do it by yourself. <laughs> All right. Well, introduce me then, and then I will on. introduce you. Halas, where um, am I? I'm off video. How long have I got? You've got as long as you like. Whoever Isn't stays, it? and okay. you know, and basically, yeah. I mean, like we said, we've been here for eight hours now. It's like an eight-hour stream. Is it eight hours, guys, in YouTube? What is it saying? I think it is. It's been. It's. It's. Oh no, nine hours. Wow. Nine hours ago. All right. Alhamdulillah. Okay, guys. Uh, Bismillah. Let me record to the cloud.
Bismillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, guys. Welcome to the last talk uh, on day two of the Secrets of Successful Marriage uh, Conference 2022, soon to be 2023. Uh, may Allah bless all of you guys who've been watching. Please don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. We reached 49K today. It would be great to get to 50K, inshallah. Um, but hey, alhamdulillah, I'm glad that you've managed to join us and that you've been brought to this video for whatever reason. Our conversation or the presentation that we're going to be having now is from Sister Anissa Kisun, who is too multi-passionate and multi-skilled and multi-talented for me to even go into what she does. But today you're going to be talking about the secret stuff, aren't you? And the secret source. So Sister Anissa, please tell us who you are and what you're going to be talking about, inshallah, and take it away. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I know that you guys are probably really tired. So before I introduce myself, I would like everyone to just do two things. Take a beautiful deep breath in and just move those shoulders around a little bit. Right, your neck a little bit. Okay, stand up if you have to. Shake it all about because I'm going to need you to have a bit of focus and a little bit of energy for what I've got to teach you, inshallah, okay? And the other thing I'd like you to do, actually, is if you can grab a pen and a paper, or, you know, I know people, they, they, they do notes on their phones these days. I'm old-fashioned. I like my notepad and I like my pen, my pen. Okay, and the other thing, if we're allowed to name, let me know if we can actually use the chat as well. I've got my kind of computer down here um, so that I'd like to be able to do a little bit of interaction. Am I okay to do that? All right, VIPs, you're on notice. You're on notice. I know there's not a ton of you in there, but okay. you're on notice because Sister Anissa can only communicate and interact directly with you because okay. she'll you will she'll see your messages right away and you'll see hers um but with youtube it takes like a few seconds for them to hear it and then for them to be involved but i'm watching that chat so i can feed back to you from there no Inshallah. problem so again let's take that nice deep breath in let's just get everything moving because you've had a whirl of a conversation just then I mean I was tuned in as a mother and I was listening going oh my goodness me you know I wanted my girls to jump on as well but it is nice you know to prepare the next generation for marriage uh, it is beautiful for us to be sharing some of our ancient I should say wisdoms with them so that they can learn but also not just for them for us too for us there's a lot of older people that are struggling to get married or entering into new marriages now so like one of the beautiful coaches said on that last panel talk they said that you know we are constantly evolving we are constantly becoming new people and this is why we need to keep learning so I'm going to just jump right in my name is Anissa Kisun, and I am so grateful, first and foremost, one, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this platform, and two, to brave sisters like our beautiful neighbor B. Roberts, who has actually, you know, gone to such lengths to give us these beautiful platforms. And I say that because some of the topics that we are talking about are a little bit taboo for our community, or at least some of the, our communities, right? But... These are conversations that we need to have. We need to be open about it. We need to be bold and we need to not be scared to actually talk because if we don't, then unfortunately our minds are curious. Other things come in the way, you know, whispers and all sorts of stuff. And we get lost in this uh, world of crazy information. So it is safer to have these beautiful spaces so that we can share not just the happy moments, but the absolutely down and, you know, downtrodden moments as well, because that's what life is like. It is like that roller coaster, isn't it? It goes up sometimes and it goes down. And if we keep sharing these happy moments all the time, it won't be realistic. So what we do want to do is we want to learn from each other so that we can hopefully, you know, have a beautiful journey and be able to ride over some of those bumps. OK, alhamdulillah. So like I said, my name is Anissa Kassoon and number one, I've been blessed with Islam for nearly 30 years now, mashallah. And in those 30 years, I have had 
not only five children of my own, I have a beautiful granddaughter, alhamdulillah, but I have many, many extended beautiful children who some of them have actually gone on and got married themselves and have children. So I'm kind of known as the mama of the community here in the UK, alhamdulillah. Now, this is one of the topics that I love. And we are going to be talking about love and intimacy today. When <laughs> Neymar, you know, put the list of topics and, you know, talks that we could talk about, I grabbed mine, like literally probably within five seconds. And it is learning your spouse's love language. I'm going to say that again. You may want to write that down. Learning your spouse's love language. OK, and the reason why I chose this is because love and intimacy is something that we need to be talking about a lot openly. I saw many moons ago our community started to get and this is the ugly part right, so coming up, but we started to get curious and not in a good way, because, like I said, it started to become taboo. If you're curious about something and you don't have the right teachers or you're not able to learn from your parents or your aunties and uncles where do you learn you learn in the playgrounds you learn from the internet unfortunately you learn from you know people talking and like i said it's not necessarily the right conversations now to me love has become something that we don't focus on and i know this very much so because one of the lines of my work is, alhamdulillah, I've been blessed to do healing, healing with hijama, healing with many other modalities. But a lot of the complaints that come to me is actually the roots are coming from marriages. They say, I have no desire anymore. My husband doesn't desire me. I don't feel anything. There's no connection between us. Uh, I, I am depressed i'm literally depressed because i feel neglected again a lot of these are coming from loveless marriages or marriages that are not working and when i have looked at my relationship between my client and the advice that i give them a lot of it comes down to what is love or are you in a marriage where you are just literally the role the role and you're you know you're you're, you're doing roles and responsibilities you know rather than a beautiful partnership and that's one of the issues that we have so today I want to talk about your spouse's love language but what is love and what is a love language we may think that is just you know a bit of intimacy but it's not it is literally the most beautiful the most intimate connection that you can have on the earth and I shook things up on the internet recently because I went live on one of the channels and I said, you know, we need to change this narrative. And this is, and I'm talking about the wives here. And I said that, um, you know, we, over the years, we have had drummed into our head that a way to a man's heart is through his stomach, right? So a lot of cultures have taken that on and they have just decided to become master chefs, right? They're in the kitchen all the time. And again, I see this. I have traveled up and down the countries and I see my clients and I'm like, how many hours do you spend in the kitchen? And literally some of them, it could be all day. And I'm talking about an eight hours, you know, because it's breakfast and it's lunch and it's dinner and it's washing up and it's cleaning and it's all sorts, but they kind of live in the kitchens. And don't get me wrong, they are like master chefs, but I shook things up because I said, ah, if we look at the anatomy, mothers feed naturally. And we can look at our own anatomy as women and we can look at the animal kingdom. And yes, you see that we are designed to feed. As soon as that baby comes out and leaves our womb, what happens? We attach it to our body and we feed it, we nourish it. And as a child, you always know that when you're hungry, you go back to mum. And I feel that that statement about the way to a man's heart is through his stomach has then gone down to being a wife so we put so much focus on this right and we are great in the kitchen well you know those are those who choose to be thinking that the way to the man's uh, heart is through his stomach they, they they spend so much time cooking okay 
and cooking don't get me wrong it's nice and it's therapeutic and it's good but sometimes we're not feeding them the right foods and i'll get onto that a bit later if we have time but when you look at the anatomy between a couple look at our parts our connecting parts right and i was trying to find a decent way of of, of talking about this but i like to look at the plug okay so you've got the the socket and you've got the plug itself and they fit right they fit and when they fit that's when you get the electricity well if you switch the switch on right but you get the electricity right and you get recharged and you power up okay that's what we in my opinion should be focusing on is perfecting the intimacy learning about it because over the last maybe 20 or more years actually to be fair um, I'm showing my age a bit now <laughs> but you know I've been fascinated with this topic I come from the West Indies and this is our this is who we are we are very um, charismatic you know intimate people as a whole um, and you know I was always fascinated with this this area of intimacy um, and then when I came into Islam and I was here amongst uh, a community that don't really focus on it, what I found was there was a lot of newlyweds who didn't know what they were doing. They'd, they'd ask me literally, auntie, I'm getting married. What do I do? I'm nervous. I'm terrified. You know, am I going to be good in that area? Right. So I used to say to them, no, it's OK. It's OK. You know, some cultures are fine. They, they, they have their own way of talking about it. They're open about it. But there's a lot within the Muslim community that don't. And then if you don't know what happens, you end up searching or you end up looking in the wrong places, like I said. So the, the fact that we can talk about these topics openly now is like I said, a major blessing. And if we spend more time, not only talking about it, but learning it and teaching it, then we will become master chefs for in the bedroom where it really matters. Because again, going back to my clientele, not only do I hear this from the women, but I hear this from the men too. I hear the, the classic lines, I'm not attracted to my wife anymore. You know, we've lost the spark. Can you give her some tips so that we can become intimate? Because we are definitely made different, right? And don't get me wrong, I don't want to go into this, this whole, you know, this is the women's job and this is the male job, but we are literally made differently. And for me, love and intimacy is an absolute gift. And I say this because one, it's free. <laughs> right you might spend a little bit of money on on lingerie and some oils and things like this but literally it is free but it is a connection and it has a frequency unlike any other and if you look at it from a perspective of this is what keeps the human race going if we took that away we would cease to exist literally okay so this is how important in my opinion it is and what are we doing about it? Well, then we focus on, like the men will focus on provisions, okay? And I know this, and, and maybe in the West here and the women, you know, we have to do this as well, where we're kind of forced to go out and work because you need two couples working to, in order to support a household nowadays, right? And we spend a lot of time in academia or becoming parents. And I see people dedicating so much time to becoming parents, right? They've got children extra activities and they have tutoring and they've sent their children to private schools etc right but i'd like us to start at least to make the intentions of putting this amount of focus into love and intimacy and i say that because if you're running a business OK, and you want to have a successful business and in your business plans, you want to make a million. You will do whatever you will get business coaches. You will learn. You will go on courses. You will read books and you would have a lot of experience. Right. You will try and, you know, you'll fail and you will try and you'll fail and you'll put your money into it. You'll put your time into it and everything. OK, because you want it to be a success. What do we do with regards to our dean? especially the reverts who come in and they've found this beautiful religion. We need to learn all of our basics, right? We need to learn how to pray, 
you know, how to make wudu, how to put the hijab on. We need to learn the mannerisms. Some of us even go as far as learning Arabic or moving country just so that we can grasp the language of the Quran so that we can understand the Quran more and we can have a deeper connection with it. Uh, recently, I was in Turkey and I was driving with the most beautiful sister, Umayma, right from Sudan. And I was really excited because, you know, it was Asr time and we were doing our uh, adkar, right? And I said, I've just got to pause because I'm trying to get into the adkar or Fajr and, um, and Asr, right? So I started to recite and, you know, I was reciting the Arabic, not very well, by the way, but then I was reciting the English and she stopped and she said, Anissa, is this what you are understanding of the Arabic language with regards to this dua? And I said, yeah, you know, she said, my goodness me, that's nothing. That's nothing. She said, you need to learn the Arabic language. And she broke it down to me. And that translation, that simple translation, when she explained it, it turned into honestly like I was reading a novel. I, I felt like I was actually, you know, in a movie, I was connected with Allah on a different level, subhanAllah, because she got me to understand it more. And that for me made me want to go, right, that's it. You know, I've got to take my Arabic language uh, more seriously because I wanted to connect more. And I was thinking, my goodness, so when I'm reading Surah al ka or I'm just praying even, you know, the translation that I've learned is not actually as meaningful as I should be kind of feeling it if I took more time out, right? So that's one of my biggest intentions. Well, what about the language of love? How much are we really understanding this connection or like I said have marriages become this kind of routine where it's like all right I'm not married I need to get married because I need a husband to provide for me I need a husband to protect me and there's nothing wrong with this by the way sisters but also we're sometimes sometimes missing this really important thing and that's our connection love wise okay and like I said, I've seen a lot of sisters, I know a lot of sisters who actually get divorced because of this too. They get divorced because they've lost that connection. How much time do we put in? How much time do we put into learning our spouse's love language? So again, beautiful title, how to learn about your spouse's love language. Yes, there is a language of love. There's a beautiful language of love. But how much of us are taking that time out to learn our spouse's love language? Because we're all different, okay? Literally, we're all different. It's just like food, okay? We have uh, preferences. Some people are allergic to things. If you're cooking for your husband, right, and you know that he's allergic to nuts, you're going to make sure that the dishes that you learn are not going to have nuts in it because you don't want him to have an allergic reaction. You don't want to reach for that EpiPen or, you know, subhanAllah, right? But how much time are we putting into learning what our spouses need in terms of love and intimacy? Are we really getting to know them? Or have we just become that couple that go to the bedroom and they do certain things? And then they get up in the morning and they discuss uh, bills and uh, schooling for children and visiting parents, etc. Are we taking that time out to know each other? Because that does take time. Again, I like to refer it back to food, even though I'm trying to get everybody out of the kitchen, but I like to refer it back to food because it's simple. If your husband's favorite dish is something complicated, like, mm, what's complicated? I don't know. Well, for me, it would be uh, Trinidadian roti, right? From scratch, okay? And if those of you who don't know what Trinidadian roti is, it's the most beautiful roti, but it has this, like, um, flaky kind of chickpeas in it and it's really it's, it's made in the most delicate and beautiful way right but if that was my husband's favorite dish it would take me a long time to probably master it but I would go out and I would find the recipe and I would buy the ingredients and then I would take time perfecting it right because I want to please him and again for those of you who are sitting down there thinking oh well I don't like to you know I, I don't want to spend all this time focusing on um, my husband or what about him what about what he's doing to me 
This is where we're missing the trick. And I heard some of the sisters say this in the last talk. We need to understand this is the dunya. This is not the akhirah. This is not Jannah. This is the dunya where we have beautiful examples like our beloved Asya. May Allah be pleased with her. Why is she recorded as one of the four best women? Because she was married to the worst of the worst. But she had the most beautiful patience and Allah rewarded her. So let's not look for that kind of Disney fairy tale. But when you do things for the sake of Allah, you do it to the best of your ability anyway. You do it whether or not he's nice to you. You do it whether or not he's given you as much attention as you need. You do it because Allah's watching and in your book, you want it to be written that you were the best wife. You were the best. The same way that we should be with everything that we do within our children. And this is a reminder to myself within our community, within our salat, when we are praying on the mat, we shouldn't just go to the mat, Allah, wake up, the, or just make wudu like this, you know, oh, you know, you know what I mean? We should enter that mat like it is a sacred space. We should be making wudu like it is a sacred act. We should look after our spouses, our children, our parents, the community, because it is all in a manner. For a short amount of time, it is entrusted to us. And like I said, if we understand that Allah is all seeing, we understand this is his attribute, then we would recognize that it is all sacred. How many of us understand that love and intimacy is a gift? It is a treasure, an absolute treasure sent to us by Allah. Like I said, free. But a lot of us take it for granted, right? We don't nurture it. We don't give it the time. We don't learn about what our spouses need. And you know what? There's something in it for us too. And I don't want to focus on it, but it, but it is. But there is. Because if we learn about it from our spouse's perspective and we learn how to please our spouse, we can also spend time learning it for ourselves. And believe me, we want to be doing that more than eating chocolate, right? Because there's a consequence when you eat too much chocolate or you drink too much coffee or tea or you binge watch. There is barakah. There is blessings in it. It's an act of worship if you only understood. It doesn't become wasting time. You know, I mean, yes, you can sit down if you want to, and that's your preference to sit down and watch a movie with your husband. And if your intention is it's, it brings you together, then that's that's a preference. But this act, this beautiful sacred gift, is something that shouldn't be taboo first and foremost. If we are talking about it enough, it should be something that we, like I said, honor, and we're entrusted. And that we treat with absolutely, absolute respect. We should treat it with absolute respect. I want you to join in with the conversation with me because I'm about to get a little bit deeper. But I hope that you understand now the foundation. Yes, is it important to learn about love and intimacy? Of course it is. What are the consequences? The consequences are, unfortunately, things become taboo. We learn from the wrong sources. We have an absolute issue. And I think I can now say this because it is a bit later, but we have a problem in our community with pornography, straight up. We do, not just amongst the males, females, children. I saw this coming 20 odd years ago, tried to speak about it, everybody shut it down. You can't talk about this, Anissa. You can't talk about this, Anissa. What is the problem that we have today? It has now spread and it's become an epi epidemic. The same way 20 years ago, I saw this addiction to sugar. I talked about it. I said, we need to campaign about this more because obesity is on the rise. Nobody really wanted to do much about it. What they wanted to do instead was open up more chicken and chip shops. They wanted to open up more dessert parlors. The, the, the wonderful conference that I want today, what were they selling? 
huge slices of cake like this, huge. They weren't selling any, I, I, in fact, I didn't see any other food. All I saw was huge. So what, what, is, what is this doing? The consequence of that is that it's feeding into an addiction to sugar, which then plays a part in diabetes, in obesity, in so many other things. So with regards to love and intimacy, do we need to talk about it? Yes, we do. If you think that this is taboo, turn away. You know, put that to the side. Because before, in ancient cultures, when this was talked about, it was talked about in such a loving manner. And it was part of society. Yes, it has become a little bit, you know, um, it's become lustful now. But we need to really talk about this. And thank you again to Sister Naima B. Roberts because, mashallah, she's allowed us to open up and talk about this. Let's not let our children find pornography first. Let's teach them the beautiful, beautiful art of love. And alhamdulillah, you know, just for your viewers, I have written a book called The Forgotten Art of Love. And for you, if you go to my website, you can get it for free for this limited period, right? You can go and get it for free. Pre-order it, it's coming out soon, but it talks about this from a beautiful perspective so that we can nurture it. Because you have, you have the side that, okay, if intimacy and love is outside of marriage, then obviously there's that haram element, right? There's the haram element. You've got fornication, you've got adultery. Yes, you know, you have that. However, if it's done within the halal realms, it is an act of worship. It is beautiful. It is pleasurable. It is something that, like I said, it doesn't have a consequence, apart from having lots of children, alhamdulillah. But again, it's not, it's not, um, it's something that is uh, baraka. You know, the Prophet so talked about, you know, having lots of children to spread the ummah. This is a gift. This is beautiful. This is dawah even. Alhamdulillah, but it keeps marriages together. Remember what I said, if we don't nurture this side, we get brothers who are neglected. Let's just talk and let's talk real. We get brothers that are neglected, sisters who are neglected, brothers who want second wives, right? Maybe not necessarily for the right reason. Not necessarily for the right reason. Last year alone, I had one day in particular, I had four brothers contact me. It was supposed to be about health, okay? And as I'm talking to them and I'm explaining to them, they said, oh, Nisa. And it was a bit weird, actually. One day, one was a sheikh. Uh, anyway, <laughs> let's not go into that. But they all said the same thing. Anissa, can you talk to the women about intimacy, please? And I said, okay, what, what, what is the problem? <sighs> We want to take second wives. Okay, brother, it's permissible for you to take second wives if you have the means and you think you're going to be just with your time and she's okay with it. Bismillah, you know, it's permissible. No, we need to take second wives because we get neglected in that area. And a lot of women don't understand. And I was like, continue. You see, some men have more needs than others. And by the way, sisters who are listening, I'd say, the same for sisters. We A lot of us have a lot of needs as well. But these brothers in particular were saying, if we don't get this love and attention from our own wives, then it becomes an issue. It becomes an issue to the point where now we need it from somewhere else. Now, let's push Islam aside for one second. Hold it there and you'll understand why. Because within Islam, alhamdulillah, we are allowed to have multiple wives, right? Men are. But in the non-Muslim relationship space, this then becomes mistresses, mistresses, right? This becomes sneaking out and it leads to sin upon sin upon sin. And of course, even within Islam and within Muslim, not Islam, but within Muslims, you know, there are brothers and sisters who go out there and do that. So again, do you understand how important it is for us to nurture this love? and intimacy just a bit more why is it that when the, there's a the, you know beautiful hadith about if you go and see something outside if a man goes and sees something outside come home and you know 
be with your wife intimately because it is also a protection. So to learn this language of love and specifically your, your husband or your wife's language, it becomes, like I said, an act of ibadah. Now, I'm going to get a bit, shake it up a little bit, okay? Because when I teach <laughs> this language, first and foremost, it's not with words. It's a universal language. And this is where you might want to quickly grab your notepad and pen, right? It's not with, like I said, language. So, you know, as you would go and you'd learn another language and you'd be, you know, conversating, this one doesn't need any words. It is universal. Okay, alhamdulillah. But how do we communicate? Because language is about communication. You communicate with your body parts. Now, I want to touch on something here. Because when I was going out and finding out about ancient cultures, and I looked into some of them, there's some very famous ones that we have, okay? And when I looked at it from a Muslim perspective, because I studied it before Islam, but looking at it from a Muslim perspective, I was quite shocked. There's one love lessons list that has six, 64 different um, components. And those 64 components comprise of spells, love, uh, um, idol worshipping, um, literally gambling, uh, things that were within, within our deen that was just like, hold on a minute, you know, we can't do sorcery, subhanAllah, sorcery. So I was looking at this list and I was going, that one's pretty good. Yep, that one's good. <gasps> That one, idol worship, this is shirk. This we are not allowed to do. So I was going through it again. Oops, gambling. Ah, ah, alcohol. Oh, oh, spells, casting spells. Subhanallah. So I looked at it and I thought, no way. I don't want us to get or even go there. You know, yes, some of us can go and take out the bits that are great, but I don't want us to go there as Muslims. So I was, you know, again, looking at other cultures and there's things that within their uh, intimate acts that we are 100% not allowed to do. We're not allowed to enter from certain bodily parts. So it was like, can we really learn from these people or things where there were multiple partners involved? So Alhamdulillah, we have our boundaries, okay? We have our boundaries. They are only a few, but I feel that definitely we are not utilizing this language of love. If we were using this language of love more, then we'd understand that it doesn't just start off from the bedroom. It starts off way before then. And with these 13 bodily parts, let's just look at the eyes, for instance. There's a whole load of communication that you can do with the eyes. Remember, when it comes to love and intimacy, where is the place that it starts? Not from certain parts of the anatomy that you might think. It starts from up here. If you can connect up here with your spouse, and even if, let's say, for instance, okay, you have an argument. Oh, I don't want to go there because I'm not feeling him and I'm, I'm not feeling her and I don't want to get intimate. Again, remember, it's an act of worship. I'm sure there's many of us that don't want to get out of bed, right? At Fajr, especially on those cold nights. We don't want to get up and go and make wudu, right? And leave our comf the comfort of our bed. But we know we do it because. Why? Because it's an act of worship. And it's a great act of worship. And even before Fajr, there's Tahajr, where if you get up for Tahajr, it's not obligatory, but it's that sacred time that you can have just you and Allah, especially as women. That's the time that normally our children are sleeping or our husbands are sleeping and there's silence. There's no chores to do. It's just you and Allah on that prayer mat. You and Allah when you're in sujood. So you can kind of have a cry and you can have a conversation. 
It's beautiful. It's the same thing. Even if you're not in the mood, right? You can get yourself in that mood for the sake of Allah, for the sake of connection, for the sake of growing love, for the sake of keeping your family strong. The same way you would, like I said, do for your children's education. I'm so sure there's times that it was snowing recently. No parent wanted to get up and try to trundle in the snow. But you did it because you believe in the power of education for your child. The same way as business. You don't want to get up and open up that shop or, you know, fill in those forms or doing whatever you have to do, serving certain customers. But you do it because you understand you need to keep a roof over your head. You need to buy food. You need to buy provisions. Put that energy and time into intimacy and love and look at the barakah that it will bring, inshallah. So take the time to learn, right? Like I said, just your eyes alone. You can call your partner to different ways, right? You can literally communicate. I mean, has anybody ever known in uh, those of you who are British here, maybe those Americans, you won't know this, but we had a fan system, okay, that literally, you know, would send certain messages off to your intended, okay? I mean, it wasn't the best communication skills, okay, but certain ways that you would flicker your, let me just use my book and I'll show you, but certain ways that you would flicker your fan or put your fan up and things like this or put it across, you know, you would do so, you were communicating. Well, imagine learning that and it's just between you and your husband. Let's think about that for a moment, right? Or between you and your, your wife. So that, you know, you, you imagine you've, um, let's, let's, let's get a little scenario going on. You've got family members around, right? And you've got uh, your children and things like this. And, you know, uh, your husband, let's, let's, let's change the scenario. Your husband's in the kitchen. He's doing the dishes, right? because you've shared the responsibility. Let's, let's get real, okay? <laughs> let's, let's paint a beautiful fantasy here, right? So he's washing up, right? He's got the apron on the full nine yards. So he might even have gloves on, right? And um, you're signaling to each other, just using the eyes, okay? What is that doing to your brain? What is that doing to your dopamine? What is that doing? Oof, you can feel yourself starting to get a bit hot now. Oof, you know, and you're there maybe wiping the table and you're giving him these signals and it's a whole communication going, right? But it is between you and him. What is that going to do? What is that going to do? It's going to, like I said, it's going to switch you on because like I said, you have the socket and you have the plug and when you plug it in, unless you turn on that switch, there won't be no power. So you turn on that switch by turning on the mind. And like I said, I do talk about this in the book. I talk about this in the book on how to switch it on because some people have very high libidos. They have higher drives and some people don't. Well, actually, you can help each other. You can manipulate it. There's foods that you can eat. There are triggers that you can do. There are smells. There's all sorts. Because it literally is a whole area. If you, if you think about cooking, okay? Don't just think about your culture's food, okay? Let's, let's take um, Italian, okay? You can just literally, uh, and listen to the fireworks behind, there's fireworks going on because we are seeing in the new year, right? So let's go in with the new year with a bang. But listen, imagine your culture now, okay? And you have, you've got different dishes. You, you, you're, you're Italian and you're going to master here meatballs and, and uh, um, spaghetti bolognese and um, lasagna, for instance, right? And, and that's what you cook and, you know, you're happy cooking that. But then you spend more time learning other cultures. You learn a bit of Indonesian. So now you're, you're cooking beef rendang. You know, you are learning Jamaican and now you've got a bit of curry goat and rice going on here you are learning how to cook some Chinese some Tom Yum soup what is that going to do it's going to add spice to your relationship it's going to leave that element of surprise isn't it so it's not going to be the same all the time and that's what we need because we live in an era of and you can see that I'm getting really passionate and comfortable with you guys now but we live in an era where we are bombarded with so many different things right it wasn't like before 
where we would have small communities. We wouldn't travel that often. You know, we'd see the same people all the time. We'd go to the same job, you know, meet our colleagues, meet the school lot, and then that's it. Now we've been excited. And it's obviously, it's broadened by having the internet. You know, you, you, we now travel a lot more, for instance, or we're exposed, our eyes are exposed to a lot more. You know, we know more, we can communicate. I mean, I'm sure here we have people from different parts of the world, right? And we talk about our, our experiences and we're learning, right? So we kind of need a lot more, okay? So I'm not talking about this from the perspective of just young people, newlyweds. I'm talking about the perspective, this from a perspective of people who have been married for 20 years or more. We need to constantly evolve we need to constantly new, learn new things. We need to constantly spice it up. And for that, it needs to have a holistic approach. We can learn body language. We can learn how to cook certain foods. We can learn how to manipulate mindsets. You know, literally, I mean, I don't like the word manipulate, but you know what I mean. Helping each other to switch it on and off because we're supposed to be there to support one another. In, in one of the courses I teach, I even look at the problem areas because when I used to teach fitness, again, I used to have clients say to me, Nisa, you know, um, I have put on a lot of weight after our baby and I can't shift it. And it's really making me not confident with my husband anymore. And I used to say, OK, I understand that. And, and parts of my body is just not the same anymore. OK, fair enough happens to everyone change it make that intention and do something about it you can lose the weight you can tone up certain bodily parts to make your intimacy experience even better but you've got to want to make that change like like I said when you want to learn the Arabic language you have to go out there and, and buy books and, and and get tutors or even move to countries so that you can submerge yourself in that language. Let's do that with the areas that you're not confident in. You can make changes anywhere, inshallah, okay? So whether or not you have that low libido, you're not confident, you just don't know what to do. Maybe you are, are a newlywed and you're like, I've never been taught before. What do I do? Where do I start? And like I said, I have these conversations with young girls. But also the, the boys, maybe they don't have that auntie or that uncle that they can speak to because they are shy. And shyness is an amazing blessing. It is a beautiful blessing. But so is love and intimacy. Let's not make that taboo anymore. Let's bring it out in the open. Let's honor it and give it that space and nurture it so that it can grow. And it can be something that we can feel comfortable talking about. We can be confident talking about, and we can enjoy it. It's a source of pleasure and it can be the best. I'm telling you, no amount of chocolate ice cream or gattos or whatever it is that you like can beat this. Because once you know what you're doing, and we have some wonderful people out there, we have village auntie, mashallah, tabarakla. I mean, for me, I don't go into the technicality so much because I like to focus on the mindset. I like to focus on the confidence levels, okay? But I like to help you to enhance things, give you certain remedy, give you certain things that you can do. Women, can you imagine being in the, in the kitchen, right? and your husband's coming home and you've mixed up this brew and you give him this brew and that brew takes you to another level, okay? Literally, I have, bless them, um, uncles that hadn't been married for over 20 years say to me, Anissa, I've just got married. I've literally just got married. I haven't been intimate with a woman for over 20 years. What do I do? And they're, they're not looking at me and they're not talking to me, you know, it's whether it's on the phone or it's just, you know, they like this. And I say, uncle, just take these few ingredients, mix them together, say bismillah, 
And then they come back and they're like, oh my goodness me. Subhanallah, look at this. Thank you so much. Because we've helped each other. The same way the sister did Umayma, my beautiful Umayma, did to me when I was trying to get a grasp of the Arabic uh, language with that beautiful dua. She helped me to connect to Allah more by explaining it to me. Because this is something that she is passionate about and good at. I wasn't. I needed that help. I needed that experts. I needed that expertise to guide me, to help me. And again, the same way as yourself, you may need that expertise. And maybe you think you know it all. Don't ever think that, by the way. We're always continuously learning. We are continuously evolving. Our body parts change. And when our body parts change, Sometimes we need to have tips, you know, um, how to make certain body parts work a bit better. Like how many of us take our health in that area and really think about uh, becoming a bit more flexible? How many of us think about uh, our um, strength, our stamina in those areas? You see what I mean? I think you know what I'm getting at. We don't pay it enough attention. So if there's going to be something that you're going to take away from today, I want it to be an intention coupled with an action. One, the intention is to learn the language of love and intimacy. One is for yourself, whether or not you're single, right? Because even though, even the ones who are single, there are certain beautiful things that you can do, you know, certain smells. <sighs> it makes you feel good. It makes you feel like you're in love, okay? Because I know it gets lonely. Let's talk about the ugly side. It gets lonely when you're on your own, right? And we have natural urges within ourselves that we want to fulfill. But did you know that just by putting a few drops of certain smells inhaling it and deep breathing in certain ways it can help that libido or that desire to go down i have so many people that have turned around and said anisa i'm i can't fast anymore you know i can't fast because they're trying to control a desire you know i i can't get married right now because i don't have the means okay that's okay that's fine but what are you going to do if that urge is constantly in you and you can't contain it? And like I said, you've tried fasting. You have tried to you know, switch it off. There's small little things that you can do that actually just help you to lower it and then you can function a bit better. And like I said, whether or not you are a mother and you have children that are growing up, because that's an important part of uh, being a parent, is to not let your children go and learn it off the internet or learn it in the playground, especially not in school right now, so that it doesn't become taboo. It doesn't become a dangerous topic. So that it's a part of parenting. We're supposed to get, as parents, right? We're supposed to get our children prepared and ready for adulthood. Okay, how many women put the emphasis on education? This piece of paper, this piece of paper, this piece. I want my children to have masters. I want them to have GCSEs and A-levels. I want them to have this and this and this and this. And then you have some parents who say, yes, and I want my, my children to learn how to provide and to cook. But we need to teach them about beautification. We need to teach them about intimacy. We need to teach them how to please their husbands and vice versa. The boys, how to please the women, what women need, the romance, the nurturing that they need. We have so many beautiful examples from our beloved Prophet. He wasn't just this prophet that went out there and preached and, and it was dawa. He was everything holistically, literally. So are we teaching our children how to holistically be? And if we are parents, whether it's to sons or it's to daughters. Are we getting them ready to pass them on to their next stages in the most beautiful, dignified matter so that they're not worried and they're not scared? And that they know. I mean, for those of you who do want to know, you know, in terms of cooking, I'm sure you want to send your wives, your, sorry, your daughters and your sons out there and them to be able to cook for their spouses. 
I would, you know, I've got, I've, I've had my first boy, alhamdulillah, right? Five years ago, my little Adam, mashallah. And you don't think I'm going to teach him how to cook and present that food beautifully for his wife, inshallah, and his children and his mother-in-law. We have to do this as parents. And again, for ourselves, okay? This is not about you just, it's becoming a chore and a duty. You're just laying there and you're just connecting the parts. No way. This is a gift. Utilize it. Enjoy it. It's a treasure. It's wonderful. If you know what you're doing, it's really, it's, it's something that is, like I said, no chocolate, no uh, going out shopping and buying all these handbags and whatnot. And no real holiday can do what this can do. And you can do it free and easily. Alhamdulillah. Okay. So let's pay more attention to love and intimacy, inshallah. Okay, let's get our next generation prepared. Let's help them and prevent them. Please, mothers out there, please, fathers out there, please, young people themselves, stop blocking yourself from completing half your deen. I went to a wedding recently and I'm so sad, you know, that, that this beautiful boy who wanted to, you know, get married for so long wasn't supported by his family. Why not? Subhanallah, astaghfirullah. We need to encourage marriage, especially with our young people. Boys and girls out there, you need to not be too picky, by the way. This is ridiculous. Don't, again, stop yourself from getting this ajr, this reward, okay? Go out there, get married, okay? Learn to grow with someone. Learn to, you know, and it's not, like I said, it's not going to be this Disney and this perfect, okay? It's not going to be like that. You need to work at it. We all need to work at things. We are in this culture of just thinking that everything is obtainable and it's, it's instant gratification. You need to work. You need to, you know, nurture things. Just like how we put that seed into the earth, do we expect it to blossom and bear fruit straight away? Of course we don't. That's not the way that Allah made it. Do we, when we are pregnant and we are having babies, do we expect that baby to just pop out in 24 hours? Of course not. Allah nurtures that for nine months. Trees take sometimes years, okay? We need to nurture things and allow the mistakes and the pain and the hardship because the, through the struggles, is where we get the reward through our patience, through our perseverance. So keep your intentions pure and for the sake of Allah and enjoy this gift that he gives us of intimacy. Inshallah, please feel free to pre-order the book because I have so many things that I want to share with you. Inshallah, so many things that I want to share with you because this is going to be one of my missions is to help our community stay away from the haram and keep them together. Keep couples and families together because that's what makes our community strong. Inshallah, bi'idhnillah. Anayma, do we have time if you're still on? Do we have time for any questions? We may have time, but I don't know whether we have any questions. So let's see if we do have any questions. VIPs, please do fastest fingers, get their questions answered. Jazakallah khair and Sister Anissa, uh, so much appreciation for you every time you come on the channel, mashallah. Uh, and just, you know, your your passion for this, uh, no pun intended, uh, really shines through, mashallah, tabarakallah. So please, guys, do post your questions in the chat or in the comments. Uh, I'm keeping a look, um, I'm keeping an eye on both of them. Uh, the link, uh, I have put it in the comments and I'm putting it again. So inshallah, it's www.anisasecrets.com. That's A-N-I-S-A-S secrets.com. As soon as you go onto the homepage, you'll see it there. Uh, so mashallah, honey says that she's just pre-ordered your book, alhamdulillah. So mm -hmm. I'm sure I will put this in the description as well, inshallah, so people can go ahead and do that. Um, but let me know if you have any questions, guys. Otherwise, we are going to let Sister Anissa go. It's getting late. Uh, we've been on streaming for 10 hours, um, wow. over 10 hours. Uh, we've done 
yeah, almost 12 hours of streaming today, mashallah, 10 hours nonstop. Uh, well, it's 10 and a half really nonstop. And then uh, we did an hour before that in the morning, alhamdulillah. So it's been a day and a half, but alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, rabbal alameen. Um, this is this is what we do, mashallah. So I tell you what we're going to do. Because it has been a long day, guys, this is what you need to do. Uh, someone says, how will I tell my parents to order this book for me? <laughs> I don't know what you're going to say to that. Okay. Anyway, the book looked very innocent, Yanni. They they probably yeah. wouldn't even flip through and try and wonder wonder what it is anyway. So, yeah. sis, um, we've got your website. Yeah. And mashallah, we will be pushing people to it. We'll email it to the list as well. Uh, yeah. And I, I guess people can reach you through the website and also on Instagram under Anissa Secrets, which is the, the channel, right? Yes. I am just starting to build yeah. it. So, Again, I will be sharing lots of beautiful tips, inshallah. But just for those who know, I will be doing it in the most dignified manner, inshallah. So you don't need to worry. You know, we're not here to, you know, expose things or to make things look a bit crazy. So it is parent friendly. You know, uh, it won't be child friendly, of course. Um, but, you know, you don't have to worry about it, inshallah. <laughs> Uh, the irony of your parents feeling <laughs> embarrassed to buy you a book about this is not lost on me. But sis, we know that you always approach this with much delicacy, mashallah, and good adab. So alhamdulillah. Sis, may Allah Amen. bless you and your family and your work. Uh, I'm sure everybody's Amen. going to go on from here straight to Instagram, guys. Go look up Anissa Secrets and subscribe to her channel, not her channel, to her, her page, her Instagram, uh, and make sure that you pre-order the book as well. And we will see you guys, inshallah, bright and early tomorrow i do believe we start at 9 a.m uk time so <laughs> our first talk tomorrow is going to be let me tell you um it's 2023 tomorrow and wow. we're going to kick off the new year the gregorian new year uh at 9 a.m UK time and it's sister Khadija al Kadur talking about getting blended families right mashallah so you want to definitely attend for that one inshallah so sis have a have fantastic a evening and we'll see you next time you join us here on the platform inshallah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh okay guys that is it. Jazakumallah kullu khair. Thank you so much, especially those of you who have been here all day. Um, I was saying in YouTube that this reminds me of the old school conferences, those all dayers that you would go to. And there's talks literally back to back all day long from the beginning of the day all the way to the night, subhanAllah, until Aisha. So we've done that today. We're doing something similar tomorrow okay so i'll give you a bit of a heads up about what's on the program tomorrow first so tomorrow we're dealing with some of the more challenging topics okay uh getting blended families right uh is the first talk the next talk is how to make your second marriage better than your first which is super apt i think um we have a bit of a break a couple of hours break and then we'll come back with healing from a traumatic marriage uh, and then after that, it's uh, Sister Farah talking on does infertility have to mean divorce? So if you know anybody who is struggling with infertility right now, please do let them know about that and encourage them to watch. Then we've got at uh, a couple of hours break, mashallah. So tomorrow is a bit, a bit more, Yanni, a bit calmer. Um, Sister Naima, the one who spoke on the panel today, her talk is entitled Don't Push Him Away, Sis. So that's especially for our wives out there. Then we have a short presentation from Brother Wail uh, Ibrahim on how to tell if your spouse is addicted to you know what. Um, and then Raisa Rirawala will be talking about how to avoid divorce. And then after that, there'll be a presentation by Sister Hale Banani on how to cope with infidelity. And then uh, a channel favorite, Amina Jane O'Rourke. I think you guys know her. She is going to be talking about intimacy, the secret ingredient to a happy and healthy marriage. So I don't think you want to miss those, inshallah. Have a fantastic evening, a rest of day, whatever it is. And I'll see you guys in 2023, inshallah. Okay. Jazakallah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Subhanak Allahumma rabbana bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Wa astaghfiruka wa natubu.